glad to be a part of something like this. People flocked to the path of totality, wider than it was in 2017, and stretching across 15 states from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Our correspondents were spread across it as the moon shadow moved from the southwest to the northeast. Morgan Chesky in his hometown of Kerrville, Texas. And everyone is in awe right now of this four minutes and 24 seconds, which I have to tell you is feeling a little like an eternity right now. We, the buildup was so strong as we saw the moon slide in front of the sun that when it finally happened, you almost had to pinch yourself. There it goes. In Dallas, Al Roker. Yeah. And in Maine, Five, four, three, two, one. Kate Snow, surrounded by thousands. I've done this once before and I got emotional then and I feel myself getting emotional now. It's, it's just something about it that is so incredibly special. I think it's the maybe the commonality that we're all experiencing one thing at, at the same, same time. exact time. What was the emotion you guys experienced? It was breathtaking. We were at the Indianapolis Speedway with more than 50,000 other Eclipse chasers. Just it's just sliding away. You know, Tom, you and I cover a lot of uh, a lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is uh, this is magical. And as the sky quickly darkened, I think we're in totality. We took off our glasses. Like exciting, happy. Like my heart beating is fast. I am so happy you guys got to experience this. This is so neat. A special and powerful moment that connected all of us. And our thanks to Lester Holt for that. Let's turn now to the race for the White House. Reproductive rights once again emerging as a major issue on the campaign trail. Donald Trump releasing a statement clarifying his stance on access to abortion. NBC's Drew Petromo joins us now. And Drew, good morning. The former president teased this announcement last week. Where does he stand on the issue? Well, good morning, Francis. The big question was whether or not the former president would endorse a national ban on abortion. But in a video posted to his Truth Social platform, Mr. Trump advocated for leaving the decision up to states. He did not call for a nationwide ban, but he did also not say whether he would sign one into law if he returned to office. President Biden shared his own video reacting to this announcement. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. If MAGA Republicans put a federal ban on his desk, he'd sign it. Donald Trump is the reason Rose ended. If you reelect me, I'll be the reason why it's restored. Mr. Trump is getting backlash from the right as well. His former vice president, Mike Pence, slamming him for not calling for a national ban, saying it's a slap in the face to his pro-life supporters. Trump said in his video that he's proudly responsible for overturning the Roe v. Wade precedent. According to NBC News polling, only 36 percent of Americans support that decision. Democrats are hoping this issue continues to energize voters this November. Francis. Okay, Drew, thank you. The other big topic on the campaign trail is student debt relief. President Biden speaking in Battleground, Wisconsin, revealing new plans to help millions of Americans lower their balances. The White House says their new strategy, combined with other efforts they have taken, could help 30 million Americans either reduce or eliminate their debt, including those who owe more than they did at the start because of interest, and those who started making payments at least 20 years ago. In Gaza, displaced Palestinians are returning to the town of Han Yunus after an Israeli troop withdrawal, many finding only rubble where their homes once stood. One man tells the Associated Press, quote, animals can't live here, so how is a person supposed to? The destruction is unreal. And the ordeal is not over in the south. The Israeli prime minister says he has set a date for an attack on the city of Rafa. For the latest, let's go live to NBC's Chapman Bell. Good morning, Chapman. What did Netanyahu say? 
Good morning, Francis. Yeah, Netanyahu standing firm on his insistence of this invasion, releasing a video message saying victory requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there, and that it'll happen, and there is a date. Now, what that date is, is not sharing, at least publicly as of yet. The Biden administration has called a full-scale ground invasion into Rafah a red line. The Israelis have said that any invasion would be preceded by the evacuation of more than one million people currently sheltering there. Now, this follows the U.S. and Israel holding talks where the U.S. expressed their concerns and offered alternatives to a large invasion by land in Rafah as negotiations for a ceasefire continue. Netanyahu did begin his message saying he had received a full report on those talks in Cairo. And first and foremost, their goals are the release of all hostage in addition to the total victory over Hamas. Now, Hamas has said they are reviewing the current proposal, but it seems that that main sticking point still continues. Hamas will not release the some 130 hostages, though it's not clear how many of those are still alive, until there is a full ceasefire. Israel will not agree to a ceasefire until they release those hostages. So until there can be some sort of a breakthrough in these negotiations, it seems the stalemate will continue. Francis? You're watching closely. Who will be the one to budge? Okay, Chapman, thank you. In Michigan, the parents of the Oxford High School shooter will be sentenced today. James and Jennifer Crumbly were both convicted in separate trials of involuntary manslaughter for negligence for failing to prevent their son Ethan's shooting spree in November of 2021. Prosecutors are asking for between 10 and 15 years in prison each. Back in December, Ethan Crumbly was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Four students were murdered and seven people injured in that shooting. The college basketball season came to an end on Monday night with just one team proving that they have that dog still in them. What an amazing run. It is a Yukon coronation. The Huskies make history. Back to back national champions. The Yukon Huskies closed out their dominant NCAA tournament run with a commanding 75 to 60 win over fellow one seed Purdue. After the Boilermakers kept things tight with the defending champs in the first half, Dan Hurley's squad managed to shut down star Zach Eady before pulling away for their sixth and final double digit victory in the postseason. The Huskies cement their college hoops legacy with their sixth title and the first school to win back to back championships since Florida in 2007. All right, severe weather set to slam the south with rain and potential floods. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman is tracking that system for us. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hi, Francis. Great to see you. And yeah, we're going to see the storms today. We're already seeing them this morning. Heavy, heavy rain falling. And this trend will continue over the next couple of days with a slow moving cold front. So look at all this rain falling this morning where you see those darker colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows showing us where that rain is falling, seeing some lightning strikes too. So it's stormy as we start out this Tuesday and that trend will continue as we go throughout the rest of today. 22 million people at risk for severe storms. That includes large hail. That's going to be dangerous with three inches or greater. A few strong tornadoes are possible. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. That could bring down some power lines, some trees as well, especially where you see the orange shading, the yellow shading. So Dallas, San Angelo, Houston, Waco could see some strong storms on this Tuesday. Also, we're looking at that heavy rain falling. That will continue. Could see up to eight inches in some spots. That's going to cause some flooding. We do have a flood watch. That is in the green. Also, flash flood warnings right now. That means flooding is happening now or it's imminent. So Tyler, Shreveport, Monroe seeing some very heavy rain this morning. And again, we could see up to eight inches in some spots, especially where you see that red and orange. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, it's a stormy day once again in the south. We're looking at the chance for severe weather. That includes a chance for tornadoes and well above average from the Ohio Valley to the mid-Atlantic, the northeast. Temperatures near 80 degrees in Philadelphia, D.C. and also Richmond. That's your Tuesday forecast. Okay, thanks so much, Michelle. Sure. An amazing feat of endurance, all for a good cause. 27-year-old Russ Cook finishing a run across the length of Africa, nearly 10,000 miles in less than a year. Dozens of supporters cheered him along the last leg. During his journey, the endurance athlete from England crossed jungle and desert, also swerved conflict zones, and was delayed by theft, injury, and visa problems. In the end, he was able to raise over $800,000 for two charities. Still to come on early today, there's
there's this we've got for you. A deadly shooting inside a Las Vegas law firm. How investigators say the shooter and his victims may have been connected. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. My I apologize to for the many questions. Now will never be I, questioned. <laughs> Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? Some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Hundreds of people evacuated from an office building in Nevada after a deadly shooting at a law firm near Las Vegas. Three people were killed, including the suspected shooter. Here's Steve Patterson. Gunfire at a law firm after an attorney shot opposing counsel during a deposition, according to two sources familiar with the investigation. Suspect is barricaded. Police say shots rang out at a law firm inside an office complex in Summerlin, Nevada, an affluent community about 10 miles from the Vegas Strip. Gunshot wound to the shooter. Police say the suspected male shooter shot and killed two victims before turning the gun on himself. Sources say the victims were a prominent attorney and his wife. I just want to assure the community now that we believe the suspect is deceased. The gunfire came from inside a law firm on the fifth floor of a mixed office building, leading to hundreds evacuated, according to police. As you can imagine, we have a, a five or six story building. We have people that are hunkered down. We're going door by door and, and making sure that everybody in there is okay. Investigators aren't commenting on the motive, but say it's likely a domestic or personal dispute involving the shooter and victims. The question is, do we know the relationship between the victims? And the answer is, we have a theory at this point. Another American workplace forever marked by the trauma and tragedy of gun violence. Steve Patterson, NBC News. Still to come, Billie Eilish becomes the latest star to unveil her new album. And John Mulaney takes on the role of city correspondent for Netflix. Find out when he'll give his tips for the best spots in L.A. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? Some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it too. News lives in the now. It's coming at us every second from all over the world. We have a full team. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters, they're asking that the hostages, demanding that the hostages be released. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on and on. Now is real. This is it. 
We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. Morning news now, we're breaking news. NBC News special report. You gotta see this. The future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get in. to Netflix this May. Everybody. Everyone. Everybody, okay. John Mulaney presents Everybody's in L.A. It's a celebration of L.A. We'll have music. We'll have one of those delivery card robots. Fingers crossed. We'll have local L.A. County officials talking to the biggest names in comedy. John Mulaney is doing it live as part of the Netflix is a joke comedy fest. The comedian will be hosting John Mulaney presents Everybody's in L.A. So rather than a traditional stand up special, the live six part event will feature Mulaney and a stable of comedy stars exploring this city of angels. It kicks off on May 3rd with additional episodes dropping May 6th through 10th. And I love that it is live. You know, it's basically Netflix's latest here when it comes to live program. They've done it before. Their first was another stand-up special last year with Chris Rock. But I love that they're pushing more and more into this when it comes to comedy. Me too. We need we need a laughter in our mm -hmm. life. And he's so good at it, right? Yeah. Especially with what he's been going through with his partner, mm -hmm. Olivia Munn. Well, this spring's wave of new records isn't showing any sign of stopping. On Monday, Billie Eilish announced that her third studio album titled Hit Me Hard and Soft is coming out on May 7th. Eilish broke the news in an excitedly worded Instagram post where she also unveiled the cover art and that she won't be promoting the album with singles, instead saying she wants fans to have all of it at once. Eilish last record, uh, 2021's Happier Than Ever received acclaim from critics. And that singles comment was sort of, I think, uh, was looking towards Taylor with all the little mm -hmm. singles she's putting out, the vinyl she's putting out, different versions. So yeah. uh, it's kind of nice to have it all at once. And she's saying, you read in that Instagram post that she is so excited. She and Phineas, and I love how she just keeps it in the family. There is nothing yeah. like the work that yes. she and her brother put out together. And they're so talented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now to some rowdy behavior by one of the biggest names in music. Country star Morgan Wallen was arrested in Nashville early Monday morning. He was booked on reckless endangerment charges after police say that he threw a chair from the rooftop of a six-story bar in Music City owned by fellow country star Eric Church. Witnesses told police they saw Wallen pick up and throw the chair and then laugh afterward. Wallen's attorney said the last night singer is cooperating fully with authorities. Every time you see his name or his picture of the headlines, you're like, oh no, oh no, what did he do, right? Yeah. Because the video of him with the racial slurs mm -hmm. a few years back and the apology tour and then the whole yep. SNL thing with COVID. It's one thing after the other, apologies, 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 and then something else. Yeah. We'll see what happens where this one goes for him. All right, when we come back, the record-breaking march that has scientists worried and Spirit Airlines is hunting for bargains to free up cash, how it's impacting hundreds of pilots. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? 
Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News lives in the now. It's coming at us every second from all over the world. We have a full team. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters, they're asking that the hostages, demanding that the hostages be released. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on and on. Now is real. This is it. We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. Morning news now. We're breaking news. NBC News special report. You gotta see this. The future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Here's what you need to know early today. Illinois health officials are warning health care facilities and emergency rooms to be on the lookout for patients with botulism symptoms after two cases were reported there. They think it could be from counterfeit Botox. Both patients had to be hospitalized. Officials say a nurse working outside her authority injected them. Last month marked the hottest march on record. That's according to the European Union's Climate Monitoring Service. It is the 10th consecutive month to set a new temperature record. Scientists say to expect more extreme weather and heat as we head into summer. Spirit Airlines will furlough 260 pilots starting in September after the company announced it's deferring an upcoming order of Airbus planes. The bargain airline says the move will help free up $340 million over the next two years. Actor Jonathan Majors will avoid jail time for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. The former Marvel star is instead on probation and is set to go through a year-long counseling program. Majors faced up to a year in jail after his conviction in December. Early today, we'll be back after this break. A good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Oh, More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? We're back and forth. Go ahead. Nice to see you. Hi. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now.
Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. For millions, Monday's eclipse was once in a lifetime. But for one eclipse chaser in Texas, it was her 21st and counting. Ellison Barber has the story behind her decades-long hobby. All right, guys, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Who's excited? The eclipse is coming. The eclipse is coming. The eclipse is coming. 63-year-old Letitia Ferrer hasn't missed a solar eclipse since 1998. This is flares from the sun. She's seen 21 solar eclipses. It's an embodied experience. It's not just, it's above you, around you, and within you. On seven continents around the world, and even a couple major oceans. And I did one in the 2005, was in the middle of the Pacific for a 30-second eclipse. And it makes me feel immense sense of gratitude for even being here. At the same time, like a little itty bitty ant, because this is going to happen with or without me. This time, she didn't have to travel very far to see the eclipse. Her home state of Texas was directly in the path of totality. It made it more special because I, quite frankly, instead of spending my time planning for the eclipse and just saving up money for it, I basically have spent my time doing outreach. And I'll tell you, my 90 year old parents were with me on this one. It was awesome. Some of Letitia's hardest life moments have happened since she began eclipse chasing. It, life is, can be surprising to you. In 2010, she lost her first husband. And in 2017, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Letitia says she was supposed to have a procedure, but she postponed it because there was an eclipse. It was for me the right decision. It was my choice to pursue my life the best way I can. And yeah, we take risk every day. And you are cancer free now? I'm cancer free now after seven years. Now, Letitia shares her love and knowledge of eclipses with her second husband, Daniel. You know, I just love watching her up there, watching her do her thing. Followers of her podcast, Totality Talks, and students around the state of Texas. Like you're just the sun. And if you're wondering what's next for Letitia, don't worry. She's mapped out all of the solar eclipses till 2060. Honestly, I want everybody to follow their passion. For me, it's the total solar eclipses. And I, if you see one, I hope you understand why, but whatever your passion is, follow it. Wow, and the lessons that she can share with all of us, with all those eclipses and all those years to come in the future too. Thanks to Ellison for that report. And thanks to you for watching Early Today. I'm Francis Rivera. Have a great Tuesday. See you back here early tomorrow morning. Excitement across America for this celestial event. Tens of millions of people gathering to watch the once in a generation moment. We traveled to the path of totality to capture the incredible scene. Former President Donald Trump weighs in on abortion. The GOP's presumptive nominee sidesteps endorsing a national ban, saying it should be up to states. Our team in Washington is live with how this impacts the race for the White House. Tesla reaches a settlement in a fatal 2018 crash. The incident revved concerns over the company's autopilot, which was being used during the crash. CNBC's Arabila Gamede joins us with the details. The Huskies lock in a legacy, and the first team to win back-to-back -back college championships in men's basketball in nearly 20 years. We break down the highlights. 10,000 miles in less than a year, meet the man who ran the length of Africa and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity with each step. It's Tuesday, April 9th. Early today starts right now.
Good morning. Great to be with you this morning. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with a stunning show in the sky, captivating millions at once. Moments of unity across the country as everyone took in the rare view of a solar eclipse. Massive crowds gathered across 15 states to see the full effect from within the path of totality. RJ Gray got this view from Texas. Millions of Americans looking up. This is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. Through glasses and telescopes, everyone eager for a view of total darkness during the eclipse. The moon passing between the sun and earth, visible from 15 U.S. states. Big moment for us, definitely. And to make the moment even more memorable, a couple in Texas exchanging vows during totality. For scientists like Dr. Eric Christian of NASA. It gives us an opportunity to share the exciting science of the sun. He's a part of the Parker Solar Probe Team, which is moving into the sun's atmosphere, providing remarkable observations and data about the sun and its impact on Earth. The Earth lives in the atmosphere of the sun. That's the atmosphere that space weather happens, as opposed to terrestrial weather. So understanding that and how it gets accelerated up to a million miles an hour is very important. A chance to look, learn, and witness a total solar eclipse. Jay Gray, NBC News, Junction, Texas. Let's turn now to the race for the White House. Reproductive rights once again emerging as a major issue on the campaign trail. Donald Trump releasing a statement clarifying his stance on access to abortion. NBC's Drew Petromo joins us now. Hi, Drew, good morning. The former president teased this announcement last week. So where does he stand on the issue? Yeah, good morning, Francis. The big question was whether or not the former president would endorse a national ban on abortion, but in a video, video posted to his Truth Social platform, Mr. Trump advocated for leaving the decision up to states. He did not call for a nationwide ban, but he did also not say whether he would sign one into law if he returned to office. President Biden shared his own video reacting to this announcement. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. If MAGA Republicans put a federal ban on his desk, he'd sign it. Donald Trump is the reason Rose ended. If you reelect me, I'll be the reason why it's restored. Mr. Trump is getting backlash from the right as well. His former vice president, Mike Pence, slamming him for not calling for a national ban, saying it's a slap in the face to his pro-life supporters. Trump said in his video that he's proudly responsible for overturning the Roe v. Wade precedent. According to NBC News polling, only 36 percent of Americans support that decision. Democrats are hoping this issue continues to energize voters in November. Francis. Hey, Drew, thank you. And Donald Trump on Monday losing a last-minute bid to delay his hush money trial. Trump's team tried to push back next Monday's scheduled start date, arguing an impartial jury cannot be selected because of pretrial publicity. An appeals court judge swiftly rejected the request for a delay. Trump's team is also still seeking a change of venue, as well as a stay in the gag order against Mr. Trump. Meanwhile, the judge overseeing the hush money case released the jury questionnaire for next week's selection process. It will be the first of four criminal trials that Trump faces. President Biden made a campaign stop in Battleground, Wisconsin, where he revealed a new plan for eliminating student debt, student loan debt, for millions of Americans. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. It felt almost impossible. Former public school teacher Seth McClure had been paying off his student loans for more than 20 years until $15,000 were forgiven in November, and he's praising the president. Surprise, gratitude. Um, I honestly didn't think it was actually going to happen, and it did. He's one of the now 30 million Americans the White House says will have at least some of their federal student debt eliminated. Today, too many Americans, especially young people, are saddled with unsustainable debts in exchange for a college degree. The announcement in Battleground, Wisconsin, the largest one yet since the Supreme Court struck down the president's earlier attempt to forgive student loans. The White House is now using a different legal justification. But Republicans say taxpayers who did not go to college or already paid back their loans should not have to bail out the 13 percent of Americans with federal student debt. Genocide, Joe! 
the president making the move as he faces mounting outrage from some younger voters over the Israel-Hamas war. If Biden is supporting genocide, there is no lesser evil than that. So we won't vote for him. In the 2020 NBC News exit poll, candidate Biden led former President Trump by 24 percentage points among voters under 30. But an NBC survey in January had President Biden up by just eight percentage points among that group. Another poll last month showed Mr. Trump ahead by 18 points among voters under 30. Are you excited to vote for President Biden? Um, I would personally say no. Haley Rudy and Maya Cohn are both sophomores at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm excited to vote for someone that's not Trump, but I wouldn't say that it is I'm excited for Biden. Even if President Biden is able to win back some younger voters before November, a small shift from 2020 could swing the election. Back to you. Hey, Gabe, thank you. In Gaza, displaced Palestinians are returning to the town of Han Yunus after an Israeli troop withdrawal, many finding only rubble where their homes once stood. One man tells the Associated Press, quote, animals can't live here, so how is a person supposed to? The destruction is unreal. And the ordeal is not over in the south. The Israeli prime minister says he has set a date for an attack on the city of Rafa. For the latest, let's go live to NBC's Chapman Bell. Good morning, Chapman. What did Netanyahu say? Good morning, Francis. Yeah, Netanyahu standing firm, releasing a video message saying victory requires entry into Rafa and the elimination of the terrorist um, battalions there and that it will happen and a date has been set. Now, when this date is, has yet to be uh, released, at least publicly, the U.S. has called a uh, full-scale ground invasion uh, by Israel into Rafah as a red line. And Israel has said such an operation would be preceded by the evacuation of more than one million people sheltering there. This follows the talks between the U.S. and Israel, where the U.S. expressed their concerns as well as offered alternatives to a ground assault in Rafa as this as as negotiations continue for a ceasefire. Now, Netanyahu did begin his message saying he had received a detailed report on these talks in Cairo. And first and foremost, their goal is the release of all the hostages in addition to total victory over Hamas. Now, Hamas has said they will review this latest proposal, but the main sticking point appears to, conti to continue. That is, Hamas will not release the hostages, some 130, though it's not clear how how many are still alive until Israel agrees to a full ceasefire. Israel will not agree to a full ceasefire until all the hostages are released. So until negotiators can make a breakthrough on this point, it seems the stalemate will continue. Francis? All right, Chapman, thank you. In Michigan, the parents of the Oxford High School shooter will be sentenced today. James and Jennifer Crumley were both convicted in separate trials of involuntary manslaughter for negligence for failing to prevent their son Ethan's shooting spree in November of 2021. Prosecutors are asking for between 10 and 15 years in prison each. Back in December, Ethan Crumley was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Four students were murdered and seven people injured in that shooting. Severe weather is set to bring flooding rain across the south. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman is tracking the potential hazards ahead this morning. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Francis. Great to see you. And yeah, we're already seeing those flooding rains this morning. We had a stormy day yesterday. Going to continue that today and over the next several days. It's a slow moving cold front. You could see the heavy rain falling right now. Seeing some lightning, hearing that thunder at this early hour. And that threat will continue as we head throughout the day. 22 million people at risk. We're looking at damaging hail three inches or larger. That could uh, cause some damage for shore looking at a few strong tornadoes as well winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour that could bring down some trees some power lines causing some power outages and where the likeliest chance for any of these severe storms would be in the orange and yellow shading dallas and angelo san antonio houston waco over to alexandria as we head throughout this tuesday the heavy rain is falling it's going to continue to fall we could see up to eight inches in some spots so we do have a flood watch five million people impacted also a flash flood warning that is in the maroon so monroe shreveport tyler seeing that heavy rain and we do have to be careful of that flooding rain as we go throughout the day where you see those darker colors the reds the oranges that is where we are expecting the likeliest amounts of heavy heavy rain and could see up to eight inches even a little higher than that so there's that cold front bringing that warm air in that jet stream fueling these storms rounds of heavy rain also the threat for severe storms expected on this tuesday and then it doesn't let up tomorrow we're looking at the chance for a significant tornado outbreak tomorrow we're going to watch that very very closely and still more storms on thursday that's a look at the big weather 
weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. All right, it's stormy in the south. We're looking at temperatures into the 70s and 80s, but we do have the chance for some damaging hail, some damaging winds, and also the chance of some tornadoes and well above average in the Ohio Valley, the mid-Atlantic, the northeast. Temperatures near 80 degrees in Philly and D.C. All right, that's your Tuesday forecast. Appreciate it. Thanks, mm -hmm. Michelle. Sure. Coming up in just a minute, Tesla reaches a settlement in a fatal 2018 crash. And if you're a Walmart shopper, how you can cash in on a class action lawsuit about overpriced groceries. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? New tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Walmart shoppers could cash out on a recent settlement, but first, Tesla has settled its own lawsuit centered around a deadly crash that happened while the car was on autopilot. CNBC's Arabila Gamede is here to explain those details. Good morning, Arabila. Let's start with that Tesla settlement. What do we know? Yeah, Francis, let's, uh, let's talk about it, right? So it's really a case that happened back in 2018, when right? So Tesla settling what was a wrongful death lawsuit then, uh, which was brought, of course, to it by the family uh, of the Apple engineer then, uh, Walter Huang, who died uh, in a Model X crash uh, while using the autopilot feature of the vehicle then. That happened back in 2018. The NTSB previously investigated the collision and found that Tesla's driver assistance system was partly to blame for the crash. Tesla then uh, ultimately filed to, to seal from public view the amount of the settlement, uh, how the settlement actually uh, got put forward, even the terms of the settlement as a whole then, uh, and uh, indeed has been compensating the family. Elon Musk and others did suggest, of course, as well, uh, some time ago that it did keep you safe and you wouldn't need hands, etc., to actually use the Model X autopilot. But of course, that certainly uh, wasn't in display in this crash. Uh, and the other story that you have brought forward then as well, then if you bought packaged meat or even bagged fruit from Walmart uh, in the past five years or so, you may actually be eligible for a settlement payment. Now, that settlement entitles claimants to 2% of the total cost of those purchased goods, up to $500. And this is because it has agreed in principle to pay back what was a fraction of what affected customers spent on purchases as part of agreement by the plaintiffs who claimed illicitly inflated prices of weighted mm -hmm. goods. So you could go back and get your money from Walmart. All right, Arabile, thank you. Still to come, Purdue is Purdue. UConn solidifies their college hoops dominance with back-to-back -back championships. All that plus the new records broken in women's basketball. Right after this. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now.
Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. How is it that traffic was stopped in time? State law enforcement officers, they undoubtedly saved lives. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> my I apologize to for Jackson the many questions. Now will never be I questioned. <laughs> News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. The rest of the Hurley family. What an amazing run. It is a Yukon coronation. The Huskies make history back-to-back -back national champions. The Yukon Huskies closed out their dominant NCAA tournament run Monday with a commanding 75-60 win over fellow one-seed Purdue. Don Hurley's squad managed to shut down the Boilermakers en route to becoming the first school to win back-to-back -back championships since Florida in 2007. Meanwhile, women's basketball history continues to be rewritten. 18.7 million people tuned in on Sunday to watch the Gamecocks cap off their undefeated season against the Iowa Hawkeyes. It is the biggest audience for any basketball game since 2019. And here's what's going to happen. It's going to roll over, right? Yeah. Caitlin Clark, WNBA. Kids sports now when it comes to, you know, girls basketball, mm -hmm. just, I mean, all across the board. It's awesome. The fandom that's just going to be following. And the boys and the girls, so it doesn't just stay with the girls. And I love watching mm -hmm. that coach. I can't get enough of the coach winning so, mm -hmm. from South Carolina. Uh, from one top tier college coach solidifying his dynasty to another possibly starting a new chapter, ESPN reported Monday that Kentucky coach John Calipari is close to reaching a five-year deal to coach at Arkansas. Hall of Famer Calipari has been with the Wildcats since 2009. He led them to a national championship in 2012 and signed what was called a lifetime contract with the school in 2019. This year, the two seeded Wildcats were bounced in first round of the NCAA tournament by 14 seed Oakland. So I feel like this is happening more and more where they're mm -hmm. signing these lifetime contracts and then things go downhill, yeah. whether it's mental or whatever. Coincidence. Yeah. The fine print, though, in the lifetime contract was just 10 years. So he's supposed yeah. to stay there for a 2028, 20, 29 season. But here we are. Maybe coming to a close. Yeah. All right, sticking with college athletics and a huge decision from one governing body. The National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, or the NAIA, voted Monday to effectively ban transgender women from participating in women's sports. The policy from the NAIA, which oversees mostly smaller colleges, only applies to transgender women while all athletes are still able to compete in male sports. The policy is set to take effect on August 1st. The NCAA allows transgender 
transgender athletes to compete if they adhere to the guidelines of that sport's governing bodies. But when it comes to this policy, it states that only athletes whose biological sex assigned at birth is female and who have not begun hormone therapy will be allowed to participate in women's sports. All right, when we come back, actor Jonathan Majors avoids jail time for assaulting his ex and a scary warning from health officials over counterfeit Botox. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? Going back and forth because they Go ahead, this is it. A good morning begins with hope and optimism. A chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? Going back and forth because they Go ahead, this is it. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, Soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. My I apologize to for Jackson the many questions. Will never be questioned. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Here's what you need to know early today. Illinois health officials are warning health care facilities and emergency rooms to be on the lookout for patients with botulism symptoms after two cases were reported there. They think it could be from counterfeit Botox. Officials say a nurse working outside her authority injected them. Last month marked the hottest march on record. That's according to the European Union's Climate Monitoring Service. It is the 10th consecutive month to set a new temperature record. Spirit Airlines will furlough 260 pilots starting in September after the company announced it's deferring an upcoming order of Airbus planes. The bargain airline says the move will help free up $340 million over the next two years. Actor Jonathan Majors will avoid jail time for assaulting his ex-girlfriend. The former Marvel star is instead on probation and is set to go through a year-long counseling program. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hit. Report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. 
What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just needs to. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. We report live from Tel Aviv from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. A British man running the length of Africa, covering almost 10,000 miles in less than a year and raising over $800,000 for charity. NBC's Matt Bradley has the story. Breathless but triumphant, 27-year-old Russ Cook completing a monumental challenge, running the length of Africa. Very good, I'm a bit tired. That's almost 10,000 miles, or roughly the equivalent of 376 marathons, over 352 days. I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. The realization that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two month old in the time he's done this. The UK native crossing the finish line at the northern tip of the continent in Los Angeles, Tunisia on Sunday. After a grueling and at times perilous journey across 16 countries, starting at the southernmost point in Cape Agula, South Africa, last April. Day 300. Seven. Cook documenting his journey on social media as he tackled different climates and terrains. But he also had to deal with unpredictable and dangerous scenarios. He says in Angola he was robbed at gunpoint of his passport and phones, and that in Congo he escaped locals armed with machetes by paying them off. The scariest moment was uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was, that was pretty nuts. That terrifying ordeal even making him consider quitting. Probably for about one minute thought about quitting and then I realised I couldn't. So that's about as close as he ever got. And if all that wasn't challenging enough, he was initially denied a visa crossing into Algeria from Mauritania when he turned to social media for help. I've been following him since he first started from the very beginning. His supporters finishing with him on the last leg in awe of the man who also ran from Asia to London three years ago. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I was laying on my couch. 20 minutes later, I bought the ticket and here I am. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. His run, dubbed as Project Africa, raising almost $900,000 and will go towards two charities. I'm a big believer in sport, doing wonders for people's lives, and um, it changed my life. Though Russ has more in store, for now, he's just looking to unwind. I've got a whole list of ideas. But, yeah, no, I definitely am um, keen to chill out for, for a moment, like, spend some time with the family and stuff. You know? Matt Bradley, NBC News. He deserves to chill out. What an incredible accomplishment. All right, here's a look now at what's ahead on today. And this morning on the third hour of today, the family behind that famous burger brand, in and out Plus, we're going to celebrate Earth Month by sharing some sustainable ways to care for your plants with our buddy Hilton Carter and then actor Anika Noni Rose, live in Studio 1A. That's all this morning on the third hour of today. Thanks for watching Early Today. I'm Francis Rivera. Have a great Tuesday. Right now on Morning News Now, out of this world, it was a celestial spectacle that won't happen in the U.S. for another 20 years. Millions of people across the country looking up for a glimpse of yesterday's total solar eclipse. Seeing how it got dark, that was an experience that, you know, it's like unforgettable. I'm glad to be a part of something like this. We'll take you along the path of totality for the once in a generation event. Also this morning, denied a New York appeals court rejecting former President Donald Trump's request to delay his hush money trial. Plus, President Biden working to make good on his promise to cancel student debt. We'll have the latest from the campaign trail. And attention, pro-taxinators. You now have six days to file your taxes, but if you're scrambling to get them done, don't worry. We will give you some expert advice on how to file in time, plus what you need to know if you're considering an extension. 
And you can do it. That's right. The madness is over and hoop dreams now a reality for the UConn men's basketball team. Now back to back champs after last night's thrilling title game against Purdue. We'll talk to star center Donovan Klingen live about his team's back to back championships and what's next as the projected first round pick gets ready to go pro. Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is off this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to get started this morning with that out of this world solar eclipse that captured the attention and the imagination of the nation. Tens of millions of people gathered for the once in a generation look at a total solar eclipse. The moon came between the earth and the sun, casting a path of total darkness that extended diagonally across the eastern half of the country from Texas to Maine. Some were brought to tears. Not going to lie, I had a couple tears. Others to laughter and joy as they witnessed this remarkable experience. I took it all in across the street right here at Radio City Music Hall, surrounded by crowds of New Yorkers who paused their day to get a glimpse of the eclipse. We had 89% totality here, but honestly, it was still 100% amazing. Our friend NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt traveled right to the path of totality in Indianapolis to get a front row seat to the day, turning to night, and then back to day again. It didn't matter where you were. The reactions were the same. The diamond ring! Joy, awe, and wonder. A shared experience for millions of people who had a front row seat to history on the horizon. Just seeing how it got dark, that was an experience that, you know, it's like unforgettable. I'm glad to be a part of something like this. People flocked to the path of totality, wider than it was in 2017, and stretching across 15 states from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Our correspondents were spread across it as the moon shadow moved from the southwest to the northeast. Morgan Chesky in his hometown of Kerrville, Texas. And everyone is in awe right now of this four minutes and 24 seconds, which I have to tell you is feeling a little like an eternity right now. We, the buildup was so strong as we saw the moon slide in front of the sun that when it finally happened, you almost had to pinch yourself. Soaking up the moment with his family. Little 10 month old Eleanor about to get her very first eclipse. I know it's a lot to take in, honey, but Olivia, oh, it's a lot. I I know, I know. I wouldn't be anywhere else other than with y'all right now. There it goes. In Dallas, Al Roker. Yeah! Woo! Oh! <laughs> yeah! There are the beads! There are the beads! You saw Al, oh, look at this! Look at this! And in Maine... Five, four, three... Kate Snow, surrounded by thousands. I've done this once before and I got emotional then and I feel myself getting emotional now. It's, it's just something about it that is so incredibly special. I think it's the maybe the commonality that we're all experiencing one thing at, at the same, same time. exact time. For some, it was about checking something off that bucket list. I'm from East Africa and I couldn't believe what I just seen. For others, it marked a new beginning. Hundreds of couples exchanged vows in Russellville, Arkansas, including Michelle and Randy Weller. We will always remember our wedding <laughs> How day because we of this that? day. And despite concerns about the cloudy forecast, the views did not disappoint. You can right see now. the bottom corner coming I out. I think it's coming out right now. There you go, right there, there on the right. Yep, here it comes. Woo! Pure magic, inviting all of us who paused for a few minutes and simply looked up. What was the emotion you guys experienced? It was breathtaking. We were at the Indianapolis Speedway with more than 50,000 other Eclipse chasers. Just it's just sliding away. You know, Tom, you and I cover a lot of uh, a lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is uh, this is magical. And as the sky quickly darkened, I think we're in totality. We took off our glasses. Like exciting, happy, like my heart beating is fast. I am so happy you guys got to experience this. This is so neat. A special and powerful moment that connected 
all of us. My mom yeah. always promised me a trip to the moon, so this is as close as we get. 1969, watching the first moon landing together. She made it an event that we would never forget. And this is to her. her. Well, she's with you today. Thank you. Ooh, see, it gets you emotional. If you missed Monday's solar eclipse or regret that you didn't travel to a spot in the path of totality, don't worry. Here's the deal. You can start planning for next time. Even though there's not going to be another one here in the U.S. for 20 years, several total eclipses are going to take place around the world in the coming years. With that next U.S. one, coast to coast, that's August 12th, 2045. So you've got some time to plan. Well, while millions of us witnessed the total solar eclipse from down here on the ground, a lucky few got to see it from 20,000 feet in the air, including one of my best friends, NBC News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz. He takes us up, up, and away. How lucky are we to have a moon and sun so perfectly aligned that every so often their magical dance allows us to stare straight at the sun for a celestial show like no other. It turned dark fast and then it turned morning fast. From the youngest viewers to those waiting for this moment for decades, many were simply overcome by the beauty of total eclipse while we set out for a different view. We're going to be flying in formation for a little bit. The plan is that that jet is going to uh, stay on the outside of the edge of totality. A front row seat to history from above. All right, so right now we are in full on totality. Let me see if I can show you. Look! <laughs> we are, what, about 20,000 feet? Right. The view's breathtaking. When you're up here and you see, you see the movement of this shadow, Shadow is, is very dark on this side, very light on this side. The team from B-Speed capturing a moon shadow passing over Arkansas. Look at this. Wow. Now it's like this sunrise, but the, but the sunrise is a color I've never seen before. It is like a, a deep purple. This is incredible. And what a happy coincidence. A cosmic wink to all of us that we share this planet united under our sun. Super excited. I love hearing the uh, joy behind me with uh, when all of that went down. It is uh, it's a, a life, it's a life changing experience. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, somewhere over Arkansas. <laughs> and God, he's just as awesome as you would imagine hearing that. We're so happy he got that experience. All right, let's switch gears here. A New York State appeals court judge has denied former President Trump's last minute attempt to delay the start of his hush money criminal trial, which is scheduled to start next week. The former president's lawyers argued the trial needed to be halted, saying an impartial jury can't be selected in Manhattan. Trump is accused of falsifying business records related to alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The former president has pleaded not guilty to the charges. The judge overseeing the trial has approved a questionnaire for jury selection. Meanwhile, in the race for the White House on Monday, Trump announced on his social media site Truth Social that he thinks abortion laws should be left to the states in the wake of overturning Roe v. Wade. For more on all of this, we are joined now by NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns and NBC News legal analyst Danny Sabalos. Good morning to both of you. I am so sorry that you were not on Eclipse duty, and that's not what I'm talking to you all about. Thank you very much for joining us. So let's get started, Dasha, with you and the hush money criminal case. So the ruling by this appeals court, it impacted Trump's request for a delay, not his change of venue motion. We are still waiting for a ruling on that. Walk us through this decision and what this ultimately could mean for the case going forward. Well, it means just that. What you said there, Savannah, it is going forward. Uh, former president's lawyers were arguing that because of pretrial publicity that an impartial jury couldn't be selected right now, the judge just denied that delay flat out. One sentence ruling, no explanation. And this is going against what the, the Trump team has really been trying to do with all of these cases, Savannah, which is just push and delay, delay, delay. Danny, let's bring you in here. So Trump's attorney also filed a challenge to the gag order in the case. This was in the form of a lawsuit that invokes something called Article 78. What is that? How would that work? Yeah, I filed Article 78s myself. Basically what they are is they're like a lawsuit that challenges the decision of an agency or a judge. For example, journalists may be familiar with freedom of information requests. And often a government agency will say, no, we're not going to give you those documents. Well, in New York, an Article 78 is a way of challenging 
challenging what an agency did, a decision it made. And that's exactly what Trump's lawyers are doing here. They filed an Article 78 to challenge the decision of a judge. So that is the mission, but it's going to be really, really difficult because judges have incredible discretion when it comes to these things. So this is a huge long shot at best. Danny, we also learned last night that special counsel Jack Smith has filed a brief ahead of this month's oral arguments calling on the Supreme Court to reject the former president's presidential immunity claim. So this is a big one here that's kind of they've been using as the sort of spoke to impact a lot of other things or, or request delays here. What are the broad outlines of this argument? Yeah, Jack Smith really in a way has a decision. Do you challenge the concept of presidential immunity? Do you say it never exists mm. or do you really focus on the facts and say under these facts what this president did there should be no immunity. In my view, the stronger case is the second one because it's dangerous to argue that there is zero presidential immunity after a president leaves office. The simplest example is virtually every president has, in, has been involved in some form of military activity and zero presidents have ever been charged with deaths that occur, whether it be service folks or uh, innocents who are injured or killed in military actions because it's kind of assumed that presidents have to make those tough decisions and they're not liable for crimes after they leave office for that kind of presidential conduct. So no court has ever come out and really said that explicitly. The challenge here is really determining whether what Trump did under these facts, is he entitled to immunity? And secondly, is that immunity determined before he even goes to trial? Got it. Dasha, let's bring you back in here and now talk about the former president's comments on social media yesterday. Regarding abortion, this is big news. He said it should be decided by the states. What else did he have to say on this and what's the reaction been? Yes, Vanna, he'd been teasing that announcement for uh, a while. And in this four minute video, approximately, he spent a long time talking about his support for IVF, which, as, a, as you might remember, in Alabama, uh, a court case there paused IVF treatments for folks um, across the state because of a, a ruling from their state Supreme Court. So, supporting IVF. Um, but he talked about how he believes this should be left to the states, that different states are going to have different rules. Um, he took credit once again for overturning Roe versus Wade, um, but he left a lot of questions on the table still, namely, uh, what is what would he do if a federal abortion ban a piece of legislation were to come to his desk if we, he were in the Oval Office? He's also a resident of Florida, which has just recently put in place a six-week abortion ban and will also put abortion on the ballot in November. And he uh, saw reaction from both sides yesterday, President Biden and the Democrats criticizing him from the left, saying that he he would allow draconian policies to uh, continue in, in many of these states. And from the right, you've got anti-abortion groups that were critical, saying that they were disappointed uh, with his announcement. But he is really sort of trying to say, look, I overturned Roe versus Wade, and now it is in the hands of the states, but not going to be so easy given this is such a hot topic and something that the Democrats have really seen success on in these elections, Savannah. Yeah, so for voters, Dasha, to, to watch him not really take a stand definitively one way or the other on the potential of a federal ban, uh, is that kind of saying to voters, you know, trust me, this, this is what I think I'm going to do, and how do you think that plays? Well, he said in interviews before, you know, I'm going to do something that's going to make both sides happy. We're going to have consensus on this issue like never before. But it is a really thorny issue, particularly for Republicans right now. I know from my reporting, the former president has really been focused on this issue. He saw those losses in the midterms and he felt even the candidates that he endorsed in 2022 went too far to the right on this issue. So he's really focused on trying to uh, message this for Republicans in a way that might be more palatable to most voters, given this is an issue we've consistently seen polling on, uh, the vast majority of Americans support uh, abortion rights to a certain extent. But again, it's a it's a tough line to walk for him, uh, given he's got folks on his right um, and folks in the middle that uh, are, are not necessarily in the same place on this. Dasha Burns, Danny Savalos, thank you both very much. Well, the Biden administration has announced a new attempt to provide federal student loan debt relief to millions of Americans. It's part of an effort to keep a promise he made when he ran for office back in 2020. Well, President Biden outlined the new plan during a trip yesterday to Madison, Wisconsin. The new efforts come nearly a year after the Supreme Court rejected the White House's first attempt to provide relief that would have canceled up to $20,000 for borrowers. The president says the relief will be a boost for the economy. 
I will never stop to deliver student debt relief and hardworking Americans, and it's only in the interest of America that we do it. And again, it's for the good of our economy that's growing stronger and stronger, and it is. By freeing millions of Americans from this crushing debt of student debt, it means they can finally get on with their lives. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us this morning with more. Hey, Gabe, good to see you. So walk us through the highlights of the White House's new effort here to tackle student debt. Who's most likely to benefit from this plan? And is it expected that this will be challenged? Uh, hi there, Savannah. Good morning. Well, it is expected to be challenged. And as you said, though, the White House uh, believes that this will impact millions of Americans. And there are several targeted groups. Let's walk through those uh, right now. Among them, borrowers um, who are experiencing hardships like child care costs, but also borrowers, and this is probably the largest group, those who have seen their interest balloon over the last several years. They can have up to $20,000 uh, forgiven. There are also uh, people that have been paying undergraduate loans for more than 20 years, also graduate loans for more than 25 years, they're also eligible. Now, these are all more targeted groups than the Biden administration tried the last time. You mentioned when the Supreme Court blocked it. President Biden, as you said, was in Madison yesterday talking about this. Let's listen to some of that. Tens of millions of people's debt was literally about to get canceled. But then some of my Republican friends and elected officials and special interests sued us, and the Supreme Court blocked us. But that didn't, well, that didn't stop us. I've been pushing this, and if I'm reelected, I'm going to push it hard. We're going to get it done next time, is I want to make community college tuition free. Some of the details of this plan have yet to be finalized, but the White House says that they plan to implement it by this fall, just in time for the November election, Savannah. Yes, so Gabe, how is the Biden administration looking to push forward with this plan, despite that opposition that the plan received back in the first place, back in 2022? You mentioned it is expected to be challenged. How does he move through that? How does he continue to try to make this a political selling point, knowing that that's coming? Well, the White House is trying a different legal justification here. When the Supreme Court blocked the previous plan uh, last summer, uh, they said that uh, the Biden administration did not have the proper authority, and that was because the administration was using the HEROES Act, which was passed in the wake of 9-11. Uh, this is a more targeted approach. It's not as broad as the plan that the administration had put forward before. And so the White House is using uh, the Higher Education Act, which was passed in the mid-60s, which gives the education secretary broad powers when it comes uh, to student debt. So that's how the White House plans to fight back against critics who say that, look, taxpayers should not be footing the bill for people who went to college and racked up all this debt. Samantha. Gabe, so as we've been discussing, President Biden is looking to, you know, do this, provide this relief ball, of course, also attempting to drum up this support from young voters ahead of the election, even from older voters who might still have some of that student debt sticking around. That's that is a super important group when it comes to younger voters, part of the coalition that helped him win the White House in the first place. How much of their support does he have now and how impactful is an initiative like this anticipated to be? Yes, Savannah, it's uh, pretty remarkable according to the latest polls, and it is no coincidence that uh, the White House is racing to implement this before uh, the November election. But according to 2020 exit polls uh, by NBC News, uh, President Biden was well ahead of Donald Trump, was ahead by 24 points among voters under 30 years old. But that support has been dropping recently in the last several months, partly because uh, young voters have uh, sharply criticized his handling of the Israel Hamas war. One of the latest polls, a Fox News poll last month, actually had uh, former President Trump up by 18 points among voters under 30 years old. So pretty significant as uh, President Biden tries to win back some of that support. But because that young vote is so critical in states like Battleground and Wisconsin, even a small shift in mm. that electorate could swing the election, Savannah. So true and important one. Gabe Gutierrez, great reporting. Thank you so much.
Well, it is time now for some weather. Severe storms are threatening the south this morning. But you know what? I think we can call the eclipse forecast sort of a win in a lot of places. Right, Michelle? I'm going to give you credit for some of that. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Savannah. I know. It was so awesome. In Doylestown, Pennsylvania, where I live, we had clouds right at that time. But it was still so fun, awesome to see all that and see everyone come together. Now, today we were watching severe storms. We watched them yesterday afternoon. We're going to watch them again tomorrow into Thursday. So this is a multi-day event. Uh, we're talking the chance of tornadoes. Also, really large hail once again and heavy, heavy rain that's going to lead to some flooding. You can see heavy rain uh, even at this hour. I've been tracking this since 1 a.m. and it's pretty much looked like this. Where you see those darker colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's where we're looking at the heaviest rain falling. So from Texas all the way across the southeast, you see some lightning too. We're hearing some thunder and we are looking at the threat of severe weather as we go throughout today. 22 million people at risk for really large hail, softball size hail once again, strong tornadoes and winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour now that could bring down some power lines some power trees leading uh trees leading to power outages where you see the yellows and the oranges that's where we're seeing the likeliest chance for seeing some of those strong storms so places like dallas san angelo san antonio houston over to alexandria also waco could see some pretty gusty thunderstorms this afternoon into the evening hours lots of rain too you saw that on radar eight million people impacted by flood watches we're not looking at flood warnings at this hour right now but we're going to see them pop in throughout the day and I saw them earlier this morning too in Shreveport, Monroe and also Tyler so certainly we could see more flash flood warnings throughout the afternoon hours. This is why we're looking at a whole lot of rain from portions of Texas all the way up through the Ohio Valley. This is all going to move to the east. It's a very slow moving system with a cold front with that rain along the cold front so locally up to eight inches of rain. We could see that little plus next to it. We could see a locally higher amounts as well. So there's that cold front. We're looking at rounds of heavy rain. Severe storms are expected. Then by tomorrow we're looking at that low pressure system moving across Texas and then a significant tornado outbreak is possible. That is something we're going to watch very, very closely on Wednesday and they could be powerful uh, tornadoes tomorrow. So by Thursday, so looking at the threat for severe storms from Ohio uh, to Florida, also risk of flooding from east of the Appalachian. So lots of rain over the next few days. For Wednesday, we're looking at 16 million people at risk. Where you see that red there, this is where we're talking about the chance of a tornado outbreak. Again, some could be very, very uh, strong. We're looking at red. That's moderate. That's the highest level uh, when you're looking at the threat for severe storms. We also have that orange and yellow. So Texarkana, Delufkin, over to Panama City could also see some strong storms. We're not looking at hail too, but not that's not the biggest threat. Then by Thursday, 26 million people at risk for severe storms. So again, as I mentioned, this is a multi-day event. We're looking at portions of Central Florida. Florida, all the way up to parts of the Northeast. That includes D.C., also Raleigh, Wilmington, looking at the threat for some severe storms. So we're going to keep our eyes open. But if you live in Texas, the mm. Gulf Coast states, you want to keep your tornado plan in place today and then also tomorrow. Important safety reminder. Michelle yeah. Grossman, thank you so sure. much. See you in a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, are you feeling isolated in the office? Well, it turns out you're not alone. Why researchers say more people are experiencing loneliness at work. At first, though, tension rising in the Middle East as Israel vows to move ahead with its ground offensive in Gaza. We will be right back.
fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Oh, pretty, pretty bad. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Welcome back. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he has set a date to carry out new ground operations in the city of Rafah. According to Netanyahu, Hamas militants are hiding in the area. But the plan is drawing sharp criticism from President Biden because of the potential impact to nearly two million Gazans seeking refuge in the city. NBC's Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv with the details. After that Israeli military withdrawal from southern Gaza, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing to mount a controversial ground offensive in the southern city of Rafah. There is a date. It will happen, he said, though not revealing when. Israel says Rafah is the last Hamas stronghold, but President Biden opposes an attack on the city where over a million Palestinian civilians are currently taking shelter. Meantime, Palestinians returning to the areas Israeli forces left behind survey their shattered neighborhoods in disbelief. You can't live here. Animals can't live here, this man says in Khan Yunus. All of this as there's increasing pressure from the U.S. to reach a ceasefire agreement. Marking the six-month anniversary of the Hamas terror attack, Netanyahu saying there will be no ceasefire unless Hamas frees hostages. While ordinary Palestinians are desperate for any kind of respite after half a year of death and destruction. Meantime, we're hearing that plans promised by Benjamin Netanyahu to open new aid crossings into Gaza are still in the works, but could take several more days. All right, Hala Garani, thank you so much. Let's get you other international headlines now, starting with the Vatican, under fire from the LGBTQ community after declaring gender-affirming surgery and surrogacy, quote, violations of human dignity. NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now. Hey, Megan, good morning. Yeah, guys, good morning. That's right. We start in Rome where the Vatican has weighed in on gender-affirming surgery and surrogacy, saying it rejects God's plan for human life and declaring it a grave violation of human dignity. Now, this is a big blow to the LGBTQ community, uh, who Pope Francis has made strides with. You could even call it a hallmark of his agenda in reaching out and including LGBTQ people into the church. The Vatican says God created men and women biologically, and it must not be tinkered with. Turning now to Nepal, where the army says a massive cleanup mission will soon be underway on Mount Everest to collect around 10 tons of trash with the support of Sherpas. The army also says they plan to bring bodies down of those who have died while trying to reach the top of the world's highest peak. And finally, to the Australian outback, we go where this extremely rare blind mole has been spotted and photographed. Uh, these things are so uncommon that wildlife experts say they don't even know how many are left in the world. It's a small little thing with these big hands, golden fur, stumpy tail, no eyes. I mean, I think it's cutish. What do you guys think? Cute we only have that one photo, I guess. It's hard to say. That's it. Hard to say. <laughs> All right, Megan, thank you so much. Coming up, sentencing day, the parents of mass school shooter Ethan Crumbly set to learn their fate today, what to expect from the first of their kind cases. And a new way to get all your stress to float away. We'll dive into the benefits of float therapy next on Morning News Now.
really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for our horses in the Iowa caucuses. By the way, we never did. All right, it just did too. Welcome back. The first parents to be convicted in connection with their child's mass school shooting are expected to be sentenced today in Michigan. Two sources close to the case tell NBC News James and Jennifer Crumbly will appear in court together later this morning. They were convicted of involuntary manslaughter in separate trials earlier this year. Their son, Ethan Crumbly, is serving life in prison for the 2021 mass shooting at a high school in Oxford, Michigan, that left four students dead and several others injured. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us from the Oakland County Courthouse in Pontiac with a preview. Maggie, thanks for joining us. What can we expect from today's proceedings? Yeah, so Savannah, we can expect, as you said, to see Jennifer and James Crumbly together inside that courtroom for the first time since these criminal proceedings began. That's according to two sources familiar with this case. We're told essentially that the judge and attorneys involved in this case don't want to make victims give impact statements twice. So they're going to do this once, and then we're going to see two sentences handed down, one for James, one for Jennifer. The state is asking for 10 to 15 years in prison for each parent. That would be the maximum allowed in this case, because even though it was four counts of involuntary manslaughter, they stemmed from the same incident. So Michigan law requires that these sentences be served concurrently, meaning at the same time. So we're talking about 15 years max. That's more than what state guidelines recommend in this case. But prosecutors are pointing to what they call a total and complete lack of remorse from James and Jennifer. So they really want to go uh, for, for the maximum here, Savannah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, so let's talk through that. So, I mean, the, uh, recommending this the, it's, would exceed state guidelines, as you just point out, what they are asking right. the judge to do here in imposing these sentence. And you mentioned that lack of remorse. Meanwhile, though, both defense attorneys have asked that their clients be sentenced to time served. Tell us about that. Tell us about the difference there and exactly what the defense has put forward. Yeah, essentially, both defense attorneys point out that both parents have been in jail during these proceedings for more than two years. So both of them are asking for time served. They've maintained throughout this entire case, and they've had separate defense teams, but both teams have maintained that the parents didn't know, couldn't have known that their son Ethan was planning this shooting. This was a tragedy, they say, that just basically uh, impacted both families and impacted the community, impacted the parents just like that. Uh, so they're basically asking for time served, best case scenario. There also was a really unusual uh, request from the defense attorney for Jennifer Crumbly asking that she be allowed to serve out the rest of her sentence in her uh, guest house. Writing in a sentencing memo, Mrs. Crumbly is terrified for her own safety and has developed social anxiety throughout her time in jail, adding she can contribute more to society by not being incarcerated. Savannah. So Maggie, what are the Crumbly's options for appealing whatever sentence is handed down to them? It seems we may have lost Maggie's IFB, basically just a phone call. We're connected to her with and now she can no longer hear us. We'll check back in with her. Maggie Vespa, thank you for your reporting. Let's turn now to our weekly mental health check in. This morning, we're taking a closer look at what researchers are calling workplace loneliness. Plus, spring has sprung, so let's talk about some spring cleaning for our minds. Love that. Joining us to help break down these headlines is psychiatrist and author of What a Happy Family, Dr. Somia Dave. Dr. Dave, always great to have you with us. So let's jump right in with this concept of workplace loneliness. Now the U.S. Surgeon General announced last year that we are in this loneliness epidemic. We've talked a lot about this on our show, but this is specifically what researchers are pointing to at work, experiencing this unique kind of loneliness when it comes to your profession. And, and the fix isn't necessarily just as simple as coming back to the office in person. Tell us about this. Right. So like you said, this loneliness epidemic does apply to the workplace. And when we're thinking about that context, there are three specific things that can help. Now, the first is to normalize that sense of loneliness. People are feeling lonely across workplaces everywhere. So for that to be brought to the surface and for people to know they're not alone in feeling lonely. The second step is for workplaces to facilitate open, engaging, deep conversations, which research has shown can decrease feelings of loneliness. So that might mean leaders talk about the struggles they feel comfortable sharing, mm -hmm. or teams are encouraged to talk about what gives them a sense of purpose, but really having those conversations be a part of the workplace. 
A third is to practice because those conversations can seem a little awkward or uncomfortable sometimes, right? And like any skill, they're one that that's one that needs to be built. And so practicing and making it a part of a sustainable workplace situation can go a very long way. Mm, really, really good ideas there for managers really to pay attention to mm -hmm. and try to help implement for those that work for them. Um, let's talk about something else we teased a minute ago. So this is a new kind of mental health treatment. It's called flotation therapy. Some researchers are saying that actually floating in a specialized tank of warm salt water can reduce some of our mental health symptoms. First, I'm just going to say that sounds kind of expensive. I don't know where you're getting a warm salt water type of tub, um, but tell us why it is that this would be helpful and other ways that we could sort of achieve the same benefits in a way that might actually be possible at home or cheaper. So you're absolutely right. This can be expensive and it involves being in one of these salt water saturated tanks for usually about an hour. The time can vary. Now, for many people, they feel like it reduces symptoms of anxiety and depression, decreases stress, decreases muscle soreness if they're experiencing that. And one of the thoughts behind this is that actually having that sensory deprivation from the physical self helps people actually be more in touch with their emotional selves and what's going on internally for them. Some people also describe feeling like they're in a meditative state when they're in this. Now, we've talked before about how actually being in water itself and even looking at bodies of water can be calming. So I think people obviously do need support and we do need different forms of emotional wellness in, in different ways. And so if anybody is near a body of water and can be part of that for a little bit, that can be a way to at least get some of that exposure if we don't have access to a saltwater saturated body of water for an hour at a time. Mm, pretty good advice there. That sounds kind of nice. All right, finally, let's get to that spring cleaning of the mind they mentioned so of course you know it's getting warmer out uh that can be helpful in and of itself for those who struggle with seasonal affective disorder or seasonal depression as there's more sunshine things like that some mental health experts are saying that now might be a good time to start trying to give our minds a little refresh as much as we can walk us through how to do that I love the idea of emotional or mental spring cleaning as we're going into this new season. And a technique called behavioral activation involves intentionally performing certain behaviors for a boost in mood. Now, the good news about this is that it doesn't take very big steps. So it can include eating lunch outside, meeting with a friend, opening the blinds first thing in the morning so we get that sunlight exposure, which we know can help us in so many different ways, and even trying a new hobby. And so we know that small changes can add up over time to make a very big difference. And as we head into spring and summer and the rest of the year, this can be a great opportunity to try incorporating some new things for those benefits. Dr. Dave, we love when you join us. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Coming up, it is tax time. That's right, the deadline to file taxes now less than one week away. We're going to get some expert advice for filing on time and how to get your documents ready. This is Morning News Now.
going to happen now. We're back and forth because they Go ahead. This is it. News lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Welcome back. For the second year in a row, UConn men's basketball reigns supreme in a top-seeded battle for the national championship. A thrilling March Madness ended with a dominant UConn beating out Purdue 70-65. to The Huskies are now the first back-to-back -back champs in 17 years. So exciting. Star sophomore center and now two-time national champion Donovan Klingen joins us this morning. Donovan, thank you so much for being here. First, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, you really, for having me. You got it. We appreciate you taking time for us this morning. So just two years into your college career, you've got two national championships. How does that feel? Whew. Um, it's hard <laughs> to describe the feeling right now. Um, you know, it doesn't feel real. You know, people dream of, you know, just winning one national title, you know, just make it to to the Final Four and, you know, to be able to go out there and, you know, win two national titles in two years of college. You know, that's special and, you know, it means a lot to me. Yeah, it's going quite well, to put it mildly. Um, going into the game, there was a lot of discussion about your matchup with Purdue's Zach Eady. What was it like to go against him in that particular game? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's physical. He's really strong. He's, he's big. He's tall, um, you know, and he's really, he's got really good touch around the rim and in the post. Um, you know, but really just the game plan of, you know, letting him score as many hook shots as he needs without following him and don't let the three point shooters get the threes off. And mm -hmm. the game plan worked. Um, I think they had, I think he had like 37, 38 points, but the team had about 60 total. So, you know, we really just tried to force Zach Eady to, you know, score as many hook shots as he can. And, you know, he was taking 18 to 20 seconds, you know, off the shot clock every time. So, you know, it was. He was wasting time and only scoring twos. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the culture at UConn, what it's like, and if you think it helps fuel your success on the court? Yeah, um, you know, we, it's just a winning culture. You know, we want to win championships. You come to UConn to win championships and do something special. Um, you know, Coach Hurley really just, you know, pushes you to a level you've never been pushed to. And, you know, he just... He's always hungry and he really like, you know, instills that into us. You know, he, we, we always are hungry throughout the year, even though we were winning a lot of games, you know, winning regular season, the biggest tournament, you know, we were never, you know, satisfied. You know, we stayed hungry and we just kept going and, you know, we were able to come out with the national title. You were really able to step up and take a leading role as center this season. Also though, as a sophomore, what was that like and what were some of the biggest challenges of that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a difficult jump just because, you know, I went from, you know, playing 12, 13 minutes a game, you know, behind the best big man in the country to, you know, starting playing, you know, 25, 30 minutes a game. <laughs> um, you know, I really just had to try to lead the team, lead the new guys, lead the lead the transfers, the young guys, and just show them what it takes to win. And, you know, Andre, Adama, and Jordan really did a great job with, you know, teaching me, Alex, Tristan, and, you know, all these other returners about what it, what, what it is you need to do to be a leader and the right way to be a leader and be a great leader. Um, you know, Coach Early is a tough coach, and he always coaches us and pushes us to the max. And, you know, you got to be able to, you know, push your teammates and, you know, help your teammates out. You know, it's not the easiest practices, it's not the easiest game plan, but, you know, once you figure it out and you have the right leaders, you know, the team will merge together and, you know, good things will happen. Donovan, we so appreciate you joining us this morning. Congratulations again, back to back. So cool to watch you play. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Coming up, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty fitting finale to one of the longest-running shows of all time. Up next, how the highly anticipated last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm paid tribute to Larry David's other successful sitcom. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now.
Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. It's still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the ground zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. You are some resilient folks. Let me get you hit. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. That is the sound of Taylor Swift making magic. And if you're one of her nearly 300 million Instagram followers, you might have caught that video on her story yesterday. Well, as the solar eclipse swept across the country, our girl was busy eclipsing our hearts, teasing what fans are pretty sure are lyrics from her upcoming album, The Tortured Poets Department. So here's what she wrote. It says, crowd goes wild at her fingertips, half moonshine, full eclipse obviously fitting because she's a magician the teaser also included a link to pre-order the project so we will find out more because the new album drops next friday april 19th and we are ready for it that is for sure all right now let's talk taxes it may be hard to believe but the deadline to file them now just six days away if you haven't filed yet don't worry you're not alone but the clock is ticking and the april 15th deadline is really just around the corner. That's why we want to bring in our friend, the tax man himself, Chief Tax Information Officer at Jackson Hewitt, Mark Stieber. Mark, always wonderful to see you. First, are you a Taylor Swift fan? I'm not so much. My wife and my daughter, they're Swifties. Well, then you, you got to get in on it with I, them. You know, I get everything I need to know from them at the kitchen table. Okay, so. there you go. Well, <laughs> at least you could spend some time. Okay, what do people need to know? This really soon, are they behind, well, I guess they are behind the eight ball, but are they in trouble if they don't have this done quite yet? Well, not in trouble. You still have about 140 hours left, not that <laughs> I'm counting. counting. And all I would simply say to your viewers, do something. You mm. cannot just kick the can down the road and handle it the summer. So you either file your tax return, and there's still plenty of time for that. Lots of people out there with extra hours, extra staff, you know, extra capabilities, and even online if you want to do it yourself, or file an extension. But do something, because that failure to file penalty can get big really quick as the interest and, you know, all that accumulates. So file something. You should have all your stuff. There's plenty of people. No reason. And three out of four are still getting a refund. Go get your money. Mm, three out of four is pretty good. Let's walk us through if we can pull that graphic back up. Some of these last minute tips uh, in order to file. What should people be keeping in mind? Well, accuracy counts. No guesstimating and no estimating. Mm. You've been down here at the last hour, and some people take that shortcut, and that can create problems later when the IRS says, hey, this number doesn't exactly match. And more than anything, it can delay your refund rather than get you audited. There's that you know myth out there as well. So don't rush. Don't mm. hurry. Find your documents. They should be there by now. And if you don't have one, you need to go track that down. Between technology, downloading websites, you can go get that W-2, 1099, or broker statement a lot faster than you could, say, 10 years ago, where it was mailed to you. So all you really need to do is find the source, and a good pro can help you with that. There's a lot of online tools and technology that can help you. You can update your own information on your My IRS account. You can file electronically yourself or with a tax pro. You have lots of options, and time is dwindling, but you can get this done. About 60 million people as of Friday have not, so that just tells you you're kind of in good company. But that does not give you a reason to wait till after the 15th. It really doesn't work that way. Mm, absolutely. Okay, let's talk about extensions. It was the last bullet on that graphic there. What do people need to know if that's where they think this is headed for them? Well, the beauty of the American tax system, it's an automatic six-month extension. I mean, that's what the 4868 form says. You can file it electronically. You can file it as long as it's paid, uh, postmarked by midnight. What it's not, though, and this is the big myth and misinformation on social media, mm. it's not an extension of time to pay your taxes. Just send your form in. If you 
owe money and you file your extension, you do prevent the failure to file penalty, but not the failure to pay penalty. So you can kick the can down the road to send in your forms later on with an extension, federal and state, but you can't delay paying the man. He wants his money by midnight on the 15th. So how does that work then? What, well, what would you do? Great, great question there as well. There's a host of new technologies out there uh, at irs.gov that will allow you to direct pay. You can pay with a credit card, get those points. You can have your bank account drafted if you want. You can even set the day that you want the money pulled out if you want to when you know you're going to get you know, paid or you have your draw. Uh, so you can pay electronically, you can pay with a credit card, you can have your money automatically pulled, or more importantly, you can just put it in the mail by the 15th, your check if you owe, make sure you mail it registered mail because you want to be able to Prove that in case there's any question and it gets mm. lost. But you have lots of choices and lots of options. The only one you don't have is to miss the deadline. Mm, there you go. Okay, also, I know that the IRS had this important update on what's called direct file. It's their free tax filing program. What was that update and how does this work? Well, there's a new pilot program, and I want to emphasize that because it was rolled out late. It hasn't gotten completely updated to handle mm. all states. Uh, but you can file for free, but there's always been a free filing option at irs.gov. It's existed for decades. So this is just a new entry into the free tax prep. It is unfortunately a do-it-yourself engine, which means you're doing it yourself. There's a bit of a firewall to authenticate and prove who you are. But for some people, and they've had you know modest you know, success so far, or at least reported success so far this year, it might be an option to consider. But it is a do-it-yourself. It doesn't apply in all the states that have a state income tax, and you do have to have some rudimentary you know identity proofing to get it done on the front end. So if you don't want that. Just go see a dude down the street. Make sure it's the right guy. You don't want a ghost. They've warned about that, too. A lot of bad people creep into the system at this time of year with great promises. Don't worry about it. I know a guy. We'll take this deduction, fuel tax credit, or what have you. So you want to be cautious on who you share your most intimate financial information with and to make a relationship for life. It's a best practice on your largest single financial transaction. Oh, great advice there. So if somebody's watching right now, they have not dealt with this at all yet. After morning news now, if they shut the TV off and they're going to go handle their taxes, what's the number one thing that you would say, this is what you got to go try to do today? Find your stuff. You should have an envelope. That's the first thing. You can't go see a pro and you can't do it yourself without your stuff. So start that. But assuming you've got your W-2s and your other stuff, find a pro. Go to your website. Google your favorite tax engine. Somebody you walk down the street and see it. JacksonHewitt.com. Just like a pizza. You put your zip code in. They'll show you the addresses. Other companies do the same. Walk right in. Call them up. Make an appointment. Whatever your you know choice is. But go see see someone if you just want to offshore this to somebody else and not do it yourself. Otherwise, same thing. Go back to your favorite search engine, tax software. Use a credible one. You might have to pay a little bit for it, but there's a lot of sketchy stuff out there. So just like when you're hiring any professional, do your homework. Read the reviews. Is it easy to use? Is it hard to use? You know, find what you want to do. If you want to do it yourself, that's great. Do it yourself, but you have to put in the work. If you want to find a pro, I promise you, on your commute in the way this morning, you passed a tax pro. <laughs> They're ready to wait for you to get it done. They'll be there until you're serviced, all of us are in that Probably past right a pizza shop, too. I there promise you, you they are Just there. like a pizza. Mark Stieber, thank you very much. Always wonderful to have you. Savannah. Finally this morning, Larry David's beloved Curb Your Enthusiasm has come to an end. The highly anticipated final episode paid tribute to the controversial Seinfeld finale that David served as a co-creator of. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has the story. And a warning to viewers, there are spoilers here. After 12 seasons spanning 25 years full of awkward and cringeworthy behavior, Larry David's caricature of himself in Curb Your Enthusiasm came to an end with an homage. If you get convicted, you'll be a felon. And a return to the scene of the Seinfeld finale, which at the time many considered a crime. All right. David returned to Seinfeld for that finale in 1998, where Jerry and the cast were on trial for being insensitive, allowing for fan favorites of past seasons to make cameos. <laughs> the Curb episode uses a similar plot, where TV Larry breaks a local election law and characters from his past come back to claim revenge. He came back in and he said he was opening up what he called a spite store. I will not tolerate corruption from Trump, Putin, or Larry David. Oh, come on. It was a perfect call. Even the boss, Bruce Springsteen, appearing as a witness. What kind of guy is Larry David? He's the kind of man who carelessly, maybe even maliciously, had me drink from his glass and gave me COVID. As he awaits a verdict, the characters take shots at the other ending. I binge all those Seinfeld episodes. Oh, yeah? All I got left is a finale. Wow. 
Although, I heard some terrible things about it. The evidence of David's maddening personality is not lost on the jury, who find him guilty of rubbing people the wrong way. We find the defendant guilty. As he is sitting in his cell, it appears he is determined to have his show suffer the same fate. The second button is the key button. It literally makes or breaks the shirt. Until none other than Jerry swoops in. You're a free man. Freeing David's character on a technicality and some advice that comes from experience. You don't want to end up like this. Nobody wants to see it. Trust me. And while it seems Larry learned a lesson. This is how we should have ended the finale. His fans know better than that. I'm 76 years old, and I have never learned a lesson in my entire life. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. We warned you about those spoilers. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News. Now stay with us so the news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe Fryer is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, a celestial spectacle for the ages. Americans from Texas to Maine and beyond will show you the celebrations across the country from yesterday's jaw-dropping total solar eclipse and the front row seat mid-air. You'll have to see to believe. Also, former President Trump is under fire from both sides of the aisle this morning after taking a state-by-state -state stance on abortion in a social media post. Voices on the right now saying it's not going far enough, while those on the left are unsure whether he'd change his mind if he takes the White House again. We'll bring you the latest. Also this morning, we'll dig into how artificial intelligence is impacting the beauty industry, the pledge one popular name is making to keep beauty real. And kings of the dance, the Yukon Huskies are back on top this morning, besting Purdue last night for their second straight national title. We've got all the highlights later in the hour. But of course, we're going to get started with what everyone can't stop talking about this morning, myself included. The solar eclipse. Did you see it? Millions of Americans in cities across the country sure did. They came together to take in the joy and wonder of one of the most anticipated celestial events of the year. I took it all in right here in New York City, across the street at Radio City Music Hall, along with crowds of New Yorkers who stopped their day to get a glimpse. Look at this. It was so cool. We had only actually 89% totality here. But it still was so incredible to witness and certainly incredible to be with a crowd like that in the streets of Manhattan. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello is in Indianapolis, Indiana, one of the best places to see the total eclipse. Yeah, good morning. I mean, what a phenomenal day. And we had spectacular weather here in Indianapolis in the heartland. 75 degrees, blue skies absolutely perfect for the moment of totality. You know, nationwide, hundreds of millions of people collectively saw this together. Uh, and people were speechless, people were crying. Some people got married underneath the eclipse. A lot of people just held hands and they were quietly watching this together as we all enjoyed the singular moment of celestial alignment. It's the moment that left millions of Americans in total awe. Look at this! Whoa! Yeah! Is this exciting? Yes, this is so incredible! It's amazing! From Texas to Maine, a once-in-a-lifetime experience and a collective pause to take in one of nature's greatest phenomena. You know, Tom, you and I cover a lot of... Uh... A lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is uh, this is magical. It is. I think it's a it's a moment in which all of us feel connected to each other as members of the human family, but also to the galaxy. Millions of Americans gathering across the path of totality, stretching through 15 states. In Cleveland, baseball fans at the Guardians' home opener were treated to an out-of-this-world pregame show unlike any other. Our NBC team also watched from around the country. Three, two, one! Even a partial eclipse stunned New Yorkers. You walk through New York City and everyone is doing the same yeah. thing yeah. Yeah. collectively. Right? Well, not looking at their phones, they're yes. looking at us. And totality inspiring wonder. Look, we can see Venus. From Texas. What was it like uh, to see that, babe? Emotional. Brought tears through my eyes. To 20,000 feet up in the air over Arkansas. Now it's like this sunrise, but the 
But the sunrise is a color I've never seen before. It is like a, a deep purple. And check out this spectacular view from an orbiting Starlink satellite for NASA an incredible learning opportunity. So one of the things we were really looking at today was the corona. The moon blocked out the sun so that we could see that's part of the sun's atmosphere. We were also looking a lot at how the eclipse affect, affected Earth. So we had a citizen science project that looked at how the eclipse changed temperatures and clouds. An emotional and magical experience. Wow. There's Venus, there's Jupiter, there's Mars. For people to pause and look up at the sky. Like a once in a lifetime thing, you know? Yeah, you know what else was nice about this? Despite all the divisions in this country, nobody was talking politics. Nobody was talking about social divisions. This was a moment when we all came together, kind of in a shared humanity, uh, and really just kind of uh, leaned on each other and celebrated together. And that was really refreshing. Uh, we're not going to have another total eclipse in this country until 2044. Here in Indianapolis, 2153 is the next total eclipse. I've already booked my hotel room because I know you guys are going to want me back. But uh, what a spectacular experience. By the way, more total eclipses around the world if you want to chase them throughout the rest of this century. Back to you. Yeah, Tom Costello, those eclipse chasers, it's so neat. Thank you so much. Well, while tens of millions of Americans took in the eclipse on the ground, a few lucky people were able to enjoy it from the sky. Courtney Kazaya snapped these pictures from onboard a Delta flight. From, look at how beautiful that is. From Austin to Detroit, this passed through the path of totality this morning. We are lucky enough to have Courtney here with us to tell us all about it. Courtney, thanks for joining us. What an incredible experience. We understand the flight that you were on sold out 24 hours after Delta announced. To tell us, how did you manage to get on this flight? Well, I knew about it because I have a really good friend who's a Delta enthusiast, and she let me know that Delta tweeted that they would be flying this route. So I tried to get on, grab a seat. Unfortunately, it was sold out. However, they opened another route going from Dallas to Detroit. And once they did that, I thought, you know what? I bet there are going to be some seats that open on the Austin to Detroit. So sure enough, I went in and they had released more seats. So I was able to snag one. That's so cool. So what was the mood like on the plane? It was really like a huge celebration. It was like a party plane. Everyone was excited to be there. Um, there were celebrations at the departure gate as well as the arrival gate with balloons, a DJ, etc. It was so fun. And tell us what it was like when you actually did see this eclipse in the sky. What was that moment like? I mean, you snapped these beautiful pictures. Tell us when you realized, okay, this is happening right now and I'm up in the sky with this. <laughs> well, so the pilot um, obviously came over the PA and he announced that we would be um, approaching the path of totality and we all were uh, getting anxious as the the atmosphere um, was changing. You could kind of sense this energy. So everything started to go dark. And then the pilots had rehearsed this maneuver where the right side of the plane would get to see uh, part of the eclipse. And then they did a dip and turn the plane so that the people on the left side would be able to view it as well. So everyone was just, you know, in awe and gasping. And it was just so much fun. That is so cool that they made sure that you could all see it and turn the plane like that. It was each time were cheers breaking out on the plane? Yes. So full on claps and everyone shouting and it was just so much fun. Um, Everyone was just really excited to be there. Okay, Courtney, something also that you shared with us when we were able to talk with you before you were live on our show is something that I just find so funny, so I have to ask you about it. That there were, what did you say, about seven people who had no idea this was the flight they signed up for. They were just trying to go from Austin to Detroit. Correct, yes. Uh, the flight attendant did a poll at the beginning of the flight to ask, you know, are there any people on this flight that were not aware this was an eclipse flight? And it's about seven people raised their hand. So I'm sure that that was a, a, a welcome surprise. Well, hopefully a welcome surprise anyway. <laughs> just can't even imagine like the confusion and then the fun and then just all the things if it's not what you were planning for. It's so funny to me. Also, I understand love was in the air, right? Yes. About 15 minutes after we passed through uh, the path of totality, um, we heard cheers coming from the back of the plane. And my friend and I turned around and 
we're like, what's going on? And it turns out a man had just proposed to his girlfriend. Um, oh. So that was very exciting to witness as well. She said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Courtney, yeah. that is just so much fun. I, seriously, I don't know why. I hope other people think it's as funny as I do, imagining those seven walking up to the gate with balloons. It's just such a funny thing. Courtney, because I what a cool experience. I'm so happy for you that you got a seat on that plane, and thanks for sharing it with us. Thanks for having me, Savannah. You got it. Have a good one. All right, let's talk weather. Severe weather is headed our way. It's going to bring rain across the south while unseasonably warm temperatures are going to hit the northeast. Michelle Grossman is here to walk us through it all. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Great to see you. And yes, we are looking at stormy, stormy weather once again in the south. Started yesterday, and this is a slow-moving front, so we're going to be dealing with this for a couple of days in spots. And we're talking heavy rain, flooding rains, a chance for severe storms, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, and even the chance of some tornadoes. So that's going on in the south. Uh, rain and storms extend all the way up to portions of the Ohio Valley. Again, this will move off to the east over the next couple of days. Behind this front, though, we've cleared out in the northern plains, sunny and mild. We're looking at some showers and some snow showers in parts of the Pacific Net Northwest into the Intermountain West. The southwest looks good with lots of sunshine and mild temperatures as well. But this is the focus of weather today because we are looking at really active weather in the south into the lower Mississippi Valley, portions of the southeast, the Gulf Coast. Uh, heavy rain is falling right now. It's been falling for hours. I'm pretty much training over the same area. Uh, that means we're going to look at the chance for flooding, and we have seen flash flooding this morning. Looking at some lightning, too, hearing the thunder out there, where you're looking at those bright colors on the map here, that's where the heaviest rain is falling. And notice it's sort of just like a plume of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and that's where we're seeing it over the same areas. And even the panhandle of Texas now seeing another batch of really heavy rain. So today, 22 million people at risk for severe storms. That means we're going to see some really large hail once again, three inches or greater. What is that mean that's about softball size hail that can cause some damage on its own a few tornadoes are possible winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour especially where you see those dark uh, the oranges the yellows that's where we're looking at the chance the likeliest chance for seeing some strong storms dallas san angelo waco houston san antonio alexandria i know you went through this yesterday but you're gonna have to keep your eye to the sky for some storms and we are looking to savannah for the risk of ef2 or larger tomorrow we could see a tornado outbreak with some really large storms and then another chance for storms on thursday so we have some really busy days over the next few days we sure do michelle grossman thank you so much sure. well there's new fallout this morning from former president donald trump's announcement that his view on on abortion, that the policy should be left to the states. The former president made the comments yesterday in a post on the social media platform Truth Social. It immediately drew criticism from the left and right. NBC's Garrett Haight covers the Trump campaign and has the latest. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Donald Trump had teased this announcement for weeks, but his promise of a hands-off approach to legislating on the issue now has him taking fire from every side of this debate. As the right says he's refusing to protect the unborn, the left fears he'll change his mind again and would support states enacting draconian abortion bans. Donald Trump is under fire this morning from across the political spectrum after unveiling his latest stance on abortion. Leave any restrictions to the states. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others and that's what they will be. The former president also claiming credit for the 2022 Supreme Court decision backed by three Trump appointed justices that overturned Roe v. Wade and returned the abortion issue to the states, some of which have enacted near total bans on the procedure. President Biden responding in this campaign video. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. This is just filled with some of the things. The president's campaign also releasing a new ad highlighting the story of a Texas woman denied medical care after a miscarriage, placing blame on the state's strict abortion ban passed after Roe was overturned. Mr. Trump's stance also criticized from the right, including by his former VP, Mike Pence, who slammed him on social media for not calling for a national ban, writing, quote, President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans who voted for him in 2016 and 2020. For Mr. Trump, Monday's announcement, the latest step in a long public evolution on abortion. I'm very pro-choice. I'm pro-life. Do you believe in punishment for abortion, yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. Both sides are going to come together. It could be state or it could be federal. I don't frankly care. 
Mr. Trump has long said he's personally in favor of allowing abortions in cases of rape, incest, and protecting the life of the mother. But his new policy doesn't even allow for a national way to enshrine those protections, opening him up to still more criticism. Savannah. All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. Well, there's much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including a story close to my California heart, my conversation with the woman who is behind one of America's most popular fast food chains. There's a little hint, we saw some of it there. First, though, heightening tensions in the Middle East this morning. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu defying President Biden, setting a date for a Rafah invasion. We will bring you the latest up next. Morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Welcome back. Tensions between the U.S. and Israel are continuing to grow this morning after Prime Minister Netanyahu said a date has been set to send his defense forces into Rafah. That is in defiance of President Biden. The move comes as ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas are once again stalled. Hamas leaders are now saying the latest proposals from Israel did not meet their demands. Here in the U.S., Vice President Kamala Harris is set to meet today with families whose loved ones were taken hostage. It's been just over six months since the those hostages were taken into Gaza by Hamas terrorists. NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us from London with the details here. Megan, good morning. So what more do we know at this point about Netanyahu's plan to carry out this operation in Rafah? We've heard about this for quite some time now. There's been so much pushback. Tell us how yep. the U.S. is responding and the details we have. Well, look, Israel's prime minister has repeatedly said that there will be an invasion of Rafah. He went a step further yesterday in a video message saying it will happen and that a date has been set. 
Now, Netanyahu has been very vocal about Rafa being what he describes as the last stronghold of Hamas and how a ground invasion is needed to complete this war. But again, you know, the, the big concern here is that we're talking about more than a million people that are sheltering in Rafa, displaced from other parts of the enclave. Uh, the United States has been very clear that a ground operation would be a mistake, that President Biden has even called it a red line and has demanded a plan from Israel on how they would protect those civilians. We are hearing from State Department spokesman uh, Matthew Miller, and I want you to take a listen to a little bit of what he had to say. We have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafa would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. So it's not just a question of Israel presenting uh, a plan to us. We have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. So despite warnings from the U.S., Israel's closest ally, Netanyahu, says a date in to invade Rafah has been set. And though he stopped short of any details on exactly when that attack would happen. Guys. Megan, we are also learning new details about those ceasefire negotiations, as I mentioned, in Egypt. Hamas leaders say Israel's latest proposal doesn't meet their demands. What do we know about this this morning? Remind us what Hamas is looking for in these talks. Yes, yeah, so we actually have new reporting from our Halagarani, who's on the ground in Israel. Uh, we're hearing from a source in the Israeli prime minister's office that beyond issues like the return of hostages and the length of a ceasefire, a major sticking point here in Cairo negotiations are centered around the return of Palestinians Palestinians to northern Gaza. Uh, Hala has confirmed with the source that Hamas representatives are asking for the complete unfettered return of all Palestinians to the northern half of the besieged enclave uh, and that according to this source Israeli negotiators are instead demanding airport style security checks on anyone traveling back to the north and have so far agreed only to a significantly reduced number of authorized returnees. Now Hamas releasing a statement last Last night saying that they're keen to reach an agreement that stops the fighting but that Israel remains stubborn and has not responded to any of their demands guys and also meanwhile Han Yunus residents have started returning to the area after Israeli troops pulled out of the region that's another city where many people in fact who lived there who were from there had moved to areas such as Rafa what are we hearing on the ground now as people return there how serious is the damage left behind are people where are they going yeah, so Savannah, you know, I had an opportunity to uh, keep in touch with a family who escaped Gaza. Uh, I've talked to them about this, and they said that, uh, of course, they're in the U.K. now, but they have family and friends still in Gaza. And what she told me is that Han Yunus is unrecognizable. People are returning to complete devastation. Uh, she said up until now, some of her family held out hope that their homes would still be intact. But now that people are returning, the reality is settling in, is setting in, rather, that there's really just nothing left. People are struggling to find where they had their homes because of the destruction and the rubble of the buildings that are still standing. They're gutted. People are digging through the rubble, desperate to find anything uh, from the life that they lived before this war broke out. Mm. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you for your reporting. Well, a British man has completed the run of a lifetime. Russ Cook spent the last year running nearly 10,000 miles through Africa, all in the name of charity. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has the details. Breathless but triumphant, 27-year-old Russ Cook completing a monumental challenge, running the length of Africa. Very good, I'm a bit tired. That's almost 10,000 miles, or roughly the equivalent of 376 marathons over 352 days. I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. The realization that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two-month-old in the time he's done this. The UK native crossing the finish line at the northern tip of the continent in Los Angeles, Tunisia on Sunday. After a grueling and at times perilous journey across 16 countries, starting at the southernmost point in Cape Agula, South Africa, last April. Day 337. Cook documenting his journey on dangerous scenarios. He says in Angola he was robbed at gunpoint of his passport and phones, and that in Congo he escaped locals armed with machetes by paying them off. The scariest moment was... Uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was that was pretty nuts. That terrifying ordeal even making him consider quitting. Probably for about one minute thought about 
quitting and then I realised I couldn't. So that's about as close as he ever got. And if all that wasn't challenging enough, he was initially denied a visa crossing into Algeria from Mauritania when he turned to social media for help. I've been following him since he first started from the very beginning. His supporters finishing with him on the last leg in awe of the man who also ran from Asia to London three years ago. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I was laying on my couch. 20 minutes later, I bought the ticket and here I am. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. His run, dubbed as Project Africa, raising almost $900,000 and will go towards two charities. I'm a big believer in sport, doing wonders for people's lives, and um, it changed my life. Though Russ has more in store, for now, he's just looking to unwind. I've got a whole list of ideas. But, yeah, no, I definitely am um, keen to chill out for, for a moment. Like, spend some time with the family and stuff, you know. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Coming up, more legal trouble for controversial country star Morgan Wallen. What his fans are now saying after the artist was arrested in Nashville on Monday for allegedly throwing a chair off of a rooftop bar. Stay with us. That's up next. lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. A good morning begins with hope and optimism. A chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. NBC News Daily is number one for afternoon news across all of television. I'm Morgan Radford. I'm Vicki Wynn. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zing Playa Samoa. What's happening around the world? Israel's military is building up there along the border. And what matters here at home? New numbers are out today showing more encouraging signs for our economy. Let's zero in on exercise. We know we're supposed to be doing it. What does it do for our health? What needs to change for social media to be a safer place? NBC News Daily, weekdays from 12 to 4 on NBC News Now. We are back now with a closer look at the recent headlines involving crime here in New York City. You might have seen these viral videos, people being attacked on the subway, even on the sidewalks of the Big Apple. But the city's top cop says those fears don't reflect reality. For more, we are joined by NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas. He sat down exclusively with the police commissioner here. Tom, good morning. Thanks for joining us on this. Savannah, great to be with you here this morning. We spoke exclusively with the NYPD commissioner, Edward Caban. He says crime rates have actually dropped over the past few years here in New York City. But that one of his biggest battles, actually, we should say it's, it's dropped over the last year, uh, is convincing New Yorkers of that reality. He's gone from a beat cop in the South Bronx to now leading one of the largest police forces in the world. Stop! Stop it! Stop it! 
From mayhem on the subways to unprovoked attacks on women to a young police officer shot and killed in the line of duty, these headlines and viral videos paint a picture of a big city with a big problem. New York City went from clean and safe to dirty and dangerous. What happened in New York City? January 2022, New York City was up in crime over 48 percent, up in violence. And we looked at just making more felony arrests. And slowly by slowly, the violence began to come down. Edward Caban is in charge of the NYPD and it's more than 35,000 police officers. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, he says crime is trending down in New York City, but not fast enough because of repeat offenders. We're seeing that we're locking up the same people over and over again. In his most forceful statements yet, the NYPD commissioner calling bail reform laws ineffective. We lock someone up, district attorney puts bail on them, the judges let them go to walk our streets again. It's a broken system. A system that has come into sharper focus after the killing of Detective Jonathan Diller, allegedly by two career criminals with long records. How many more police officers and how many more families need to make the ultimate sacrifice before we start protecting them? Is she right? Absolutely. You know, that's the one thing that no police commissioner wants to do during their tenure is bury one of their own. Whether it's a family of blood or a family of blue, it hurts to the core. Part of Commissioner Caban's mission now, separating perception versus reality. According to NYPD stats, overall crime is down in the city and subways, but that's not how many New Yorkers feel about their own safety. I want my legacy to be that New Yorkers felt not only that they were safe, but that they felt safe too. If they don't feel that way, I'm not doing my job. Now, bail reform advocates argue it helps the poor who are disproportionately jailed because they don't have the means to post bail. But in New York, it seems the governor, who is a Democrat, has seen enough, recently announcing reforms to hold violent criminals accountable, giving more power to judges to put offenders in jail. There are more than a dozen states right now currently debating legislation over bail reforms. The commissioner, who is the first Hispanic to run the department, is also working to tackle two other major issues here of concern, right? Safety on the subway, but also the migrant crisis, which we will have, Savannah, much more of later tonight. Yeah, that's right, because you can see more, right? This is going to be, there's going to be on NBC Nightly News as well, of course, your own show, Top Story with Tom Yamastein, is that right? So it, that is right, and it's one of the greatest shows people have said that, it, that has ever been broadcast. That's so. true. You should just Some keep the TV say on now or your computer, whatever, all the way through 8 p.m. tonight. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. Really, though, you, interesting thank as a you. New Yorker to hear his perspective yeah. on this because we are seeing a lot of those videos. We appreciate you coming by. Thanks yeah. for being here early. Well, country music star Morgan Wallen is facing his latest controversy behind bars this morning. The singer was arrested yesterday after he allegedly threw a chair off a rooftop bar in Nashville over the weekend. Here with more is NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas. Chloe, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. You know, Morgan Wallen's career, it has been a roller coaster ride of ups and downs, and this latest incident threatening the rise of this country star. The question is, what are his fans saying now? The latest controversy for one of country music's biggest stars, Morgan Wallen. The chart topping singer arrested after allegedly throwing a chair off of a six story bar in the center of Nashville's bustling entertainment district early Monday morning. Police reviewed surveillance footage they say shows Wallen lunging and throwing an object over the roof, the chair falling just a few feet from two officers standing below. Bystanders posting police carrying the chair later. The singer was released after posting an over $15,000 bond. He now faces felony charges for reckless endangerment and disorderly conduct. His lawyer telling NBC News Wallen is cooperating fully with authorities. As now we let the the 30-year-old Tennessee native has had a meteoric rise since his debut on the country music scene in 2016 with two chart-topping albums, with his most recent one, One Thing at a Time, breaking the record for the country album with the most weeks at the top of the Billboard 200 chart. But Wallen's musical success has been frequently overshadowed by his controversial behavior, including a 2020 arrest for public intoxication and disorderly conduct. Prosecutors dropped the charges. 
Less than five months later, Wallen was dropped from his SNL debut for violating COVID protocols. I have some growing up to do. Two months later, they brought him back. Hi, I'm you from the future, and I came back here to stop you from partying tonight. The following year, his career taking a major hit after he was caught on camera using a racial slur, his record label and radio stations temporarily dropping him, while in spending time in rehab away from the spotlight. I was wrong. But throughout, fans stayed loyal. His One Night at a Time tour was the highest grossing country tour of 2023. But will this latest run-in with the law shake his fan base? He's just a heck of a singer, never made a bad song, but he seriously needs some help. So Wallen, he's expected back in court on May 3rd in Nashville, Savannah. And this is actually going to happen just hours before he's set to take the stage at his latest tour stop, also in Nashville. So we'll see if that tour stop even happens on May 3rd. But he's also touring through the summer. Yeah, Chloe Milos, really interesting there. Obviously, a lot of fans interested in what is going on exactly. Thank you so much for that. Coming up, a closer look at artificial intelligence and the beauty industry, the pledge one popular company is making to keep beauty real. That is all right after this break. Morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. News lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand, and officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Welcome back. The use of artificial intelligence in the advertising industry is growing at a fast pace, really in all industries. But now some experts are estimating that as much as 90% of the content we see on the internet could be generated by AI, get this, as soon as next year. Well, one beauty brand is taking a stand against the technology in its latest advertisement. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung joins us for more on this. Kaylee, good morning. 
Hey, good morning, Savannah. You're right. Personal care brand Dove has committed to never use AI to represent real people in its advertising. And they've released a video exclusively to NBC News to make the big announcement. They say it illustrates the type of perfect images young girls and women are increasingly inundated with online and in ads, making it impossible to distinguish between what's real and what's not. As part of their Keep Beauty Real campaign, personal care brand Dove has released this two minute video. It features images of AI generated women that pop up online when you search terms like perfect skin and the most beautiful woman in the world. They then compare those to images generated under Dove's beauty standards, as well as the faces of real women. It's part of the company's pledge to never use AI to create or distort images of women, a pledge they hope other companies will also consider signing on to. A global beauty study by Dove found that 9 out of 10 women and girls say they've been exposed to harmful beauty content online, and 1 in 3 say they feel pressure to alter their appearance because of what they see online, even when they know it's fake. AI-generated images in the beauty space is a growing concern, especially for parents. I'm disgusted, horrified. Naveen Radwan says she believes altered images of women on social media contributed to her teenage daughter's anorexia. What are they going to do to themselves when they try to attain a level of perfection that doesn't even exist? Earlier this year, more than 12,000 parents signed an online petition urging TikTok to more clearly label AI-generated influencers over concerns that showing things like flawless skin and perfect bodies creates extreme and utterly unattainable beauty standards for children. It might say, hey, this isn't a real picture. This person actually didn't look like this. But subconsciously, your brain saying, yep, that's what I'm supposed to look like. They're very bad for our well-being and our mental health. Clothing brand Levi Strauss reversed course after facing major backlash over an announcement it planned to experiment with AI-generated body-inclusive avatars like this image on their app and website. Nike promoted its use of advanced AI to create this video, featuring Serena Williams playing a tennis match against her 16-year-old self. The game was the result of more than 130,000 games generated using vid-to-player technique. Coca-Cola owned sports drink Body Armor poked fun at AI content in a recent Super Bowl ad. Artificial flavor optimized for victory times. Artificial? No. Major fashion brands like Revolve are using AI generated models on some billboards. Ad agencies say this trend is growing mostly because it saves brands big bucks. But some wonder at what cost. And we could see this campaign evolve into some action. Lawmakers in the House are considering bipartisan legislation that would require any online images, video, or audio generated using artificial intelligence to be identified and labeled. But as of now, there are no rules when it comes to the use of this technology. And Savannah, experts say that would be a good start, but that consuming this kind of content can still be dangerous for impressionable young minds. It's so true. It's, it, this is good to see. Kaylee Hartung, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us live. Let's get to some financial headlines. General Motors is revving up its robo-taxi project. Again, CNBC's Silvana Hanau turns us with more on that. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, so General Motors self-driving car business is getting ready to resume testing with robo-taxis with safety drivers in Phoenix. So crews suspended operations last year after Bloomberg says it's been in talks with officials in 20 metro areas where it previously tested cars. The company has been working to restore public trust after one of its cars struck and dragged a pedestrian in San Francisco last fall. That eventually led California regulators to pull its license in the state. The airline industry is struggling with a lack of planes ahead of a summer travel season that could hit record levels. Airlines are spending billions of dollars to repair and maintain older and less fuel efficient planes and paying a premium to secure aircraft from leasing companies and some have had to trim their schedules. Deliveries of new planes have dropped sharply due to production problems at Boeing and Airbus. And Target has launched its new membership program as it takes on Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus, Target Circle 360. It costs $49 a year for now, but the price will increase to $99 when the promotional period ends on May 18th. Members will be able to get same-day delivery for food, clothes, and most other products on orders of at least $35. 
They can also get same-day delivery from more than 100 of Target's retail partners, including Ulta Beauty, Petco, and Sephora. Savannah, just All right, another so subscription service. The, uh, right, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, we've got <laughs> quite a bit. All right, Savannah, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Well, now let's get to the story of a family-run burger business with a devoted following. In-N-Out Burger is iconic, and for a lot of people, it's the very first stop when they arrive on the West Coast, or home in my case. But while you may know their burgers, you might not know their story or the woman who's now running the show. Lindsay Snyder is not your average president of a multi-billion dollar company, but In-N-Out Burger is not your average fast food chain. That's what is all about. Founded in 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder, it all started as a little hamburger stand with a pioneering drive through speaker system. My grandparents, you know, came from very humble beginnings. Now they have 402 stores across eight states, and they've amassed quite the following, even with the rich and famous. I'll have a plain cheeseburger with light onions. Current President Lindsay Snyder grew up at In N Out, but her path to leadership has no shortage of twists and turns. It really was like that family pain and tragedy that really put each leader in its place. After Harry died in 1976, Esther handed control to Lindsay's uncle, Rich, but he was killed in a plane crash. The next leader, Lindsay's father, died of an overdose. At just 17, Lindsay was the only blood relative left. She started just like every other employee. You waited two hours to apply to work at a new store in Redding, California, even though your family began in and out. Is that right? I think that there's a stigma that can come with being, you know, the owner's kid and just wanting to be respected like others doing it the right way and not having the special treatment. At 27 years old, Lindsay stepped into the role of president of In-N-Out Burger. You were very young when you come in to this now multi-billion dollar corporation. What's this been like for you? In the earlier days, I actually wore um, pantsuits and I did that because I felt like I was supposed to and then I finally you know just was confident in who I am and who I'm not you're gonna get judged either way so you might as well be judged for being who you are she's made specific and strategic choices especially in an age of inflation and increasing minimum wage how do you keep those prices and keep a profit margin I was sitting in VP meetings going toe-to-toe -to -toe saying we can't raise the prices that much we can't you know because i felt such an obligation to look out for our customer when everyone else was taking these jumps we weren't when you think about innovation or tech or artificial intelligence where does that intersect with in and out no to mobile ordering um, because that greatly impacts the customer service experience there's a lot of things that could be cheaper easier and all, but that's not that's not the system we go through. I know your faith is important to you. It is proudly a part of this company, a Bible versus on most pieces of packaging. Well, my uncle started it with the verses on the packaging and, you know, he felt we're a family company, we're a private company, and, you know, this is who we are, and I'm unashamed of my faith. You're a private company. <laughs> as long as you're here, will that stay that way? Absolutely. Because you get calls all the time. Yeah, messages, emails, Instagram <laughs> messages. People DM to buy the company. Basically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not interested in franchising? No. <laughs> what about an IPO? No. It's staying in the family and the menu staying simple, except for those in the know. Their famous secret menu includes animal style burgers and fries, named for the rowdy teens who would order extra spread pickles and grilled onions back in the day. Another favorite? The famous Flying Dutchman. You know, the Flying Dutchman was my dad's burger. Two meat patties with two slices of cheese, and um, his nickname was the Flying Dutchman. What's your order? Mine is double meat with pickles, spread, and chopped chilies only. A burger that keeps customers coming back for more. Looking at 75 years, so many customers that have made us who we are today. It's just incredible. So there's just so much gratitude. Who's hungry, right? All right, the burning question, where will they head next? I asked about expanding to the East Coast. Lindsay said as long as she's around, the answer is probably never, but not necessarily. I never say never. As for the future and the legacy of the company, Lindsay's oldest son has now jumped into the family burger business. By the way, you can learn more secrets of the business in Lindsay's book, The Ins and Outs of In-N-Out Burger.
Coming up, back to back champs. UConn's Huskies are once again the kings of college basketball this morning after a dramatic championship matchup last night, beating out fellow top seed Purdue for their second straight national title. We've got all the highlights and the celebrations up next. lives in the now. It's coming at us every second. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on. Now is real. We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. You gotta see this. Future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. NBC News Daily is number one for afternoon news across all of television. I'm Morgan Radford. I'm Vicki Wynn. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zinc Clea Samoa. What's happening around the world? Israel's military is building up there along the border. And what matters here at home? New numbers are out today showing more encouraging signs for our economy. Let's zero in on exercise. We know we're supposed to be doing it. What does it do for our health? What needs to change for social media to be a safer place? NBC News Daily, weekdays from 12 to 4 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. She's the bad guy, and she's back with another album. Singer Billie Eilish just announced her third full-length project. It's called Hit Me Hard and Soft. Fans even got a sneak peek of the cover art on Instagram, where she just gained millions of new followers in a matter of days after word got out that she was adding her followers to her close friends list. That's the thing on Instagram where you can see specific things posted only for certain people. Well, it's been three years since Eilish released her last album, Happier Than Ever, back in 2021. But it's been anything but slow rolling for the nine-time Grammy winner between co-writing her hit song, What Was I Made For, for the Barbie movie soundtrack, and then winning an Oscar for it. Let's just say she's been busy. Well, there is no stopping her. The new album drops on May 17th. Her voice is out of control amazing, so I cannot wait for that. All right, let's stay on some music. This ain't Texas, but it is Beyonce's world. That's right, Queen B has just made music history as the first black woman to ever lead Billboard's top country album charts just two weeks after releasing her eighth studio album, Cowboy Carter. Marcus Dowling is back with me again to talk about Beyonce's latest feat. He's the Nashville country music reporter for the Tennessee. And Marcus, welcome back. I'm so excited to get to talk with you with this incredible news because you joined us the day that Beyonce released Cowboy Carter, two weeks later, leading the charts. How significant is this moment? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an unbelievable moment, but it speaks more to the... Uh, potential of the dynamic power of genre bending music being actualized. I think that that's the, the biggest takeaway of uh, Cowboy Carter's success so far. 
Beyonce is often referenced, of course, her Texas roots throughout her career. I mean, that, that is well known. She is proud of it. We hear about Houston in a lot of her songs. How does this album blend, you know, kind of her background, where she came from, with that iconic Beyonce sound that we've come to know that was decidedly not country, right? And now she's kind of switched to this. Do you think this is firmly a country album? Tell us about the sound here. I'd say that it is a firmly country album in the sense that it plays well with the traditions of folk and bluegrass and uh, contemporary country for the last 50 years. Uh, there's pieces of that all throughout this uh, this album. And it's the sense that uh, Beyonce is uh, aware and cognizant of Black artists' spaces within the, the history of country music and uh, more so being in conversation with that more so than anything else. I think that's the most important takeaway there. Absolutely. One of the coolest things I think about this album are these collaborations. Uh, first, I just want to say, I think my favorite song on the album is the song with Miley Cyrus, Two Most Wanted. Do you have a favorite song? Right. I have to ask you that first. Do you have a favorite song? Oh, gosh. Well, it changes day by day. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so true. So I'd say that, yeah, for me currently, it's uh, it's Spaghetti with mm. uh, Shibuzi and uh, Linda Martell. I'd also uh, say that the, uh, the, the fascination of Blackbird being... Uh, five African-American female voices. It's Beyonce along with Tanner Adele and Britney Spencer and mm -hmm. Raina Roberts and Tierra Kennedy. I think that's just a, a cool thing that opens up the door for young black women worldwide to be able to have space to be able to sing together and to do it in country music is a really cool thing. Big time. And I know that you've actually been speaking to some of these featured artists on the album, kind of just about what this is doing for them. Tell us what they're Absolutely. telling you. Absolutely. They're they're excited. Uh, if if you look at say uh, all of these artists, for instance, I, I would limit it, but it, it's actually unlimited. The uh, the <laughs> scope of being an artist who makes music ideally for uh, the broader audience, but because of a number of counteracting issues, uh, you end up making it for a smaller audience that's typically online and for 200 to 500 person venues. When a 32 time Grammy award winning artist takes uh, awareness and appreciation of your art and your craft and and also just the amount of uh, sweat equity that's put into your work and then puts you on her album and your your streams grow and your renown grows and your visibility grows. I think it's a win for everybody involved. Absolutely. Is Beyonce pushing the country genre forward? Is she changing it? What's her impact? Well, Luke Bryan likes the album and, and Lainey mm -hmm. Wilson likes the album and then obviously Willie Nelson likes the album and uh, Dolly Parton does too. So <laughs> I think that minimally the, the awareness has grown exponentially for, uh, for extraordinary change in the genre. And I think that the artists who are on the ground, the ones who were just referenced, uh, getting more opportunities. Like Britney Spencer was just in a duet with... Uh, Parker McCollum at the CMT Awards on uh, Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just moments like that and just increasing people's comfort with the potential of what uh, broad-based uh, equity looks like in country music. Oh. I think that's the, 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 the greatest part of this. Absolutely. It's so fun, too, when you hear her say, it's Dolly P, and you actually hear her voice on this album, too. It's very neat. Right. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. So fun to get to talk about this. Incredible to see this happen. We appreciate you coming back to us. Absolutely. It's sincerely a pleasure. Anytime. Talk to you soon. UConn fans are enjoying a bit of deja vu this morning now that its men's basketball team capped off one of the most exciting March Madness tournaments to date with a historic victory. The Huskies beat top-seeded Purdue 75-60 to in a thrilling national title game, becoming the first men's team to win back-to-back -back championships in 17 years. NBC News correspondent Sam Brack has been following the tournament for us. He joins us from Miami with the very latest here. Sam, good morning. Savannah, good morning. I know you've been following this very closely. And yes, UConn, you might say they are the bluest of blue bloods this morning. You talked about the two best teams playing each other. It's where that actually happens, UConn and Purdue. They certainly have the two largest human beings on the court. Now, Purdue, this was the first time in more than 50 years, Savannah, they made the national title game. They just happened to run into a buzzsaw that is the UConn Huskies, who won back-to-back -back titles on the men's side for the first time in almost two decades. It was as sweet and about as close to a sure thing as you can get. It is a UConn coronation. The Huskies make history. Back-to-back -back national champions. A storied basketball power, UConn, putting a bow on a dominant tournament run. Oh, yeah, we, we uh, set out to make this a goal and go back-to-back, -back and, you know, that's what we did tonight. The Huskies vanquishing Purdue 75-60 with rim-rocking slams. 
Johnson. And crafty play, clinching the program's sixth national title all time, tying with North Carolina, and now one more than Duke and Indiana. In the process, becoming the first men's squad to win consecutive trophies since the Florida Gators in 2007. What a special group of people, a special coaching staff, uh, an incredible group of players. Overnight in stores, Connecticut, students packing Gamble Pavilion for an on-campus watch party, cheering their team to victory and overcoming 37 points from seven foot four National Player of the Year, Zach Eady. Uh, nice step. Hey, step the Huskies leaving no doubt about their on-court bona fides. The victory coming as South Carolina's women's team returning to their Columbia campus champions. They did it in a way in which they lifted up each other. After defeating the Hawkeyes, though Iowa superstar Caitlin Clark still racked up points and eyeballs. That game shattering records, the most watched sporting event outside of the Olympics or football since 2019. You need three things in sports, household names, rivalries, and games of consequence, and March Madness had all of that. Now the UConn men claiming their victory after a banner year for college hoops. And Savannah, the UConn Huskies, now the men have won 12 consecutive tournament games by at least 13 points. That had never happened before. And Coach Hurley has them in position now. They are the favorites for next year to win the title as well. And I am so sorry that I don't have a basketball to crush a three-pointer for you right now. Next time, though, Savannah, I got you 100%. Mm -hmm. Back to you. Yeah, we, we all heard it bouncing, though, in your intro. So you could have asked, but you decided not to, maybe because you're scared. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't want to humiliate myself again. That is I correct. I did ask him to do that for y'all. Sam Brock, thank you very much. We appreciate it. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now. Right now on Morning News Now, out of this world, it was a celestial spectacle that won't happen in the U.S. for another 20 years. Millions of people across the country looking up for a glimpse of yesterday's total solar eclipse. Seeing how it got dark, that was an experience that, you know, it's like unforgettable. I'm glad to be a part of something like this. We'll take you along the path of totality for the once in a generation event. Also this morning, denied a New York appeals court rejecting former President Donald Trump's request to delay his hush money trial. Plus, President Biden working to make good on his promise to cancel student debt. We'll have the latest from the campaign trail. And attention pro-taxinators. You now have six days to file your taxes, but if you're scrambling to get them done, don't worry. We will give you some expert advice on how to file in time, plus what you need to know if you're considering an extension. And you can do it. That's right. The madness is over and hoop dreams now a reality for the UConn men's basketball team. Now back to back champs after last night's thrilling title game against Purdue. We'll talk to star center Donovan Klingen live about his team's back to back championships and what's next as the projected first round pick gets ready to go pro. Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is off this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to get started this morning with that out of this world solar eclipse that it captured the attention and the imagination of the nation. Tens of millions of people gathered for the once in a generation look at a total solar eclipse. The moon came between the earth and the sun, casting a path of total darkness that extended diagonally across the eastern half of the country from Texas to Maine. Some were brought to tears. Not gonna lie, I had a couple tears. Others to laughter and joy as they witnessed this remarkable experience. I took it all in across the street right here at Radio City Music Hall, surrounded by crowds of New Yorkers who paused their day to get a glimpse of the eclipse. We had 89% totality here, but honestly, it was still 100% amazing. Our friend NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt traveled right to the path of totality in Indianapolis to get a front row seat to the day, turning to night, and then back to day again. It didn't matter where you were. The reactions were the same. The diamond ring! Joy, awe, and wonder. A shared experience for millions of people who had a front row seat to history on the horizon. Just seeing how it got dark, that was an experience that, you know, it's like unforgettable. I'm glad to be a part of something like this. 
People flocked to the path of totality, wider than it was in 2017, and stretching across 15 states from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Our correspondents were spread across it as the moon shadow moved from the southwest to the northeast. Morgan Chesky in his hometown of Kerrville, Texas. And everyone is in awe right now of this four minutes and 24 seconds, which I have to tell you is feeling a little like an eternity right now. We, the buildup was so strong as we saw the moon slide in front of the sun that when it finally happened, you almost had to pinch yourself. Soaking up the moment with his family. Little 10 month old Eleanor about to get her very first eclipse. I know it's a lot to take in, honey, but Olivia, oh, it's a lot. I know, I know. I wouldn't be anywhere else other than with you all right now. There it goes. In Dallas, Al Roker. Yeah. And in Maine, Five, four, three, two, one. Kate Snow, surrounded by thousands. I've done this once before, and I got emotional then, and I feel myself getting emotional now. It's, it's just something about it that is so incredibly special. I think it's the, maybe the commonality that we're all experiencing one thing at, at the same, same time. exact time. For some, it was about checking something off that bucket list. I'm from East Africa, and I couldn't believe what i just seen. For others, it marked a new beginning. Hundreds of couples exchanged vows in Russellville, Arkansas, including Michelle and Randy Weller. We will always remember our wedding day <laughs> because we of this that? day. And despite concerns about the cloudy forecast, the views did not disappoint. You can right see now. the bottom corner coming out. I think it's coming out right now. There you go, right there, there on the right. Yep, here it comes. Woo! Pure magic, inviting all of us who paused for a few minutes and simply looked up. What was the emotion you guys experienced? It was breathtaking. We were at the Indianapolis Speedway with more than 50,000 other Eclipse chasers. Just it's just sliding away. You know, Tom, you and I cover a lot of uh, a lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is uh, this is magical. And as the sky quickly darkened, I think we're in totality. We took off our glasses. Like exciting, happy, like my heart beating is fast. I am so happy you guys got to experience this. This is so neat. A special and powerful moment that connected all of us. My mom yeah. always promised me a trip to the moon, so this is as close as we get. 1969, watching the first moon landing together. She made it an event that we would never forget. This is to her. Well, she's with you today. Thank you. Ooh, see, it gets you emotional if you missed Monday's solar eclipse or regret that you didn't travel to a spot in the path of totality. Don't worry, here's the deal. You can start planning for next time. Even though there's not going to be another one here in the U.S. for 20 years, several total eclipses are going to take place around the world in the coming years with that next U.S. one coast to coast. That's August 12th, 2045. So you've got some time to plan. Well, while millions of us witnessed the total solar eclipse from down here on the ground, a lucky few got to see it from 20,000 feet in the air, including one of my best friends, NBC News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz. He takes us up, up, and away. How lucky are we to have a moon and sun so perfectly aligned that every so often their magical dance allows us to stare straight at the sun for a celestial show like no other. It turned dark fast and then it turned morning fast. From the youngest viewers to those waiting for this moment for decades, many were simply overcome by the beauty of total eclipse while we set out for a different view. We're going to be flying in formation for a little bit. The plan is that that jet is going to uh, stay on the outside of the edge of totality. A front row seat to history from above. All right, so right now we are in full on totality. Let me see if I can show you. Look! <laughs> we are, what, about 20,000 feet? Right. The view's breathtaking. When you're up here and you see, you see the movement of this shadow, Shadow is, is very dark on this side, very light on this side. The team from B-Speed capturing a moon shadow passing over Arkansas. 
Look at this. Wow. Now it's like this sunrise, but the, but the sunrise is a color I've never seen before. It is like a, a deep purple. This is incredible. And what a happy coincidence. A cosmic wink to all of us that we share this planet united under our sun. Super excited. I love hearing the uh, joy behind me with uh, when all of that went down. It is uh, it's a, a life it's a life changing experience. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, somewhere over Arkansas. <laughs> and Gotti's just as awesome as you would imagine hearing that. We're so happy he got that experience. All right, let's switch gears here. A New York State appeals court judge has denied former President Trump's last minute attempt to delay the start of his hush money criminal trial, which is scheduled to start next week. The former president's lawyers argued the trial needed to be halted, saying an impartial jury can't be selected in Manhattan. Trump is accused of falsifying business records related to alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The former president has pleaded not guilty to the charges. The judge overseeing the trial has approved a questionnaire for jury selection. Meanwhile, in the race for the White House on Monday, Trump announced on his social media site Truth Social that he thinks abortion laws should be left to the states in the wake of overturning Roe v. Wade. For more on all of this, we are joined now by NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Good morning to both of you. I am so sorry that you were not on Eclipse duty, and that's not what I'm talking to you all about. Thank you very much for joining us. So let's get started, Dasha, with you and the hush money criminal case. So the ruling by this appeals court, it impacted Trump's request for a delay, not his change of venue motion. We are still waiting for a ruling on that. Walk us through this decision and what this ultimately could mean for the case going forward. Well, it means just that, what you said there, Savannah, it is going forward. Uh, former president's lawyers were arguing that because of pretrial publicity that an impartial jury couldn't be selected right now, the judge just denied that delay flat out. One sentence ruling, no explanation. And this is going against what the, the Trump team has really been trying to do with all of these cases, Savannah, which is just push and delay, delay, delay. Danny, let's bring you in here. So Trump's attorney also filed a challenge to the gag order in the case. This was in the form of a lawsuit that invokes something called Article 78. What is that? How would that work? Yeah, I filed Article 78s myself. Basically what they are is they're like a lawsuit that challenges the decision of an agency or a judge. For example, journalists may be familiar with freedom of information requests. And often a government agency will say, no, we're not going to give you those documents. Well, in New York, an Article 78 is a way of challenging what an agency did, a decision it made. And that's exactly what Trump's lawyers are doing here. They filed an Article 78 to challenge the decision of a judge. So that is the mission, but it's going to be really, really difficult because judges have incredible discretion when it comes to these things. So this is a huge long shot at best. Danny, we also learned last night that special counsel Jack Smith has filed a brief ahead of this month's oral arguments calling on the Supreme Court to reject the former president's presidential immunity claim. So this is a big one here that's kind of they've been using as the sort of spoke to impact a lot of other things or, or request delays here. What are the broad outlines of this argument? Yeah, Jack Smith really in a way has a decision. Do you challenge the concept of presidential immunity? Do you say it never exists mm. or do you really focus on the facts and say under these facts what this president did there should be no immunity. In my view, the stronger case is the second one because it's dangerous to argue that there is zero presidential immunity after a president leaves office. The simplest example is virtually every president has, in, has been involved in some form of military activity and zero presidents have ever been charged with deaths that occur, whether it be service folks or uh, innocents who are injured or killed in military actions because it's kind of assumed that presidents have to make those tough decisions and they're not liable for crimes after they leave office for that kind of presidential conduct. So no court has ever come out mm. and really said that explicitly. The challenge here is really determining whether what Trump did under these facts, is he entitled to immunity? And secondly, is that immunity determined before he even goes to trial? Got it. Dasha, let's bring you back in here and now talk about the former president's comments on social media yesterday. Regarding abortion, this is big news. He said it should be decided by the states. What else did he have to say on this and what's the reaction been? 
Yes, yeah, Savannah, he'd been teasing that announcement for uh, a while. And in this four minute video, approximately, he spent a long time talking about his support for IVF, which, as, a, as you might remember, in Alabama, uh, a court case there paused IVF treatments for folks um, across the state because of a, a ruling from their state Supreme Court. So, supporting IVF. Um, but he talked about how he believes this should be left to the states, that different states are going to have different rules. Um, he took credit once again for overturning Roe versus Wade, um, but he left a lot of questions on the table still, namely, uh, what is what would he do if a federal abortion ban a piece of legislation were to come to his desk if we, he were in the Oval Office? He's also a resident of Florida, which has just recently put in place a six-week abortion ban and will also put abortion on the ballot in November. And he uh, saw reaction from both sides yesterday, President Biden and the Democrats criticizing him from the left, saying that he would allow draconian policies to uh, continue in, in many of these states. And from the right, you've got anti-abortion groups that were critical, saying that they were disappointed uh, with his announcement. But he is really sort of trying to say, look, I overturned Roe versus Wade, and now it is in the hands of the states. But not going to be so easy, given this is such a hot topic and something that the Democrats have really seen success on in these elections, Savannah. Yeah, so for voters, Dasha, to, to watch him not really Really take a stand definitively one way or the other on the potential of a federal ban. Uh, is that kind of saying to voters, you know, trust me, this, this is what I think I'm going to do? And how do you think that plays? Well, he said in interviews before, you know, I'm going to do something that's going to make both sides happy. We're going to have consensus on this issue like never before. But it is a really thorny issue, particularly for Republicans right now. I know from my reporting, the former president has really been focused on this issue. He saw those losses in the midterms, and he felt even the candidates that he endorsed in 2022 went too far to the right on this issue. So he's really focused on trying to uh, message this for Republicans in a way that might be more palatable to most voters, given this is an issue we've consistently seen polling on, uh, the vast majority of Americans support uh, ab abortion rights to a certain extent. But again, it's a it's a tough line to walk for him, uh, given he's got folks on his right um, and folks in the middle that uh, are, are not necessarily in the same place on this. Dasha Burns, Danny Savalos, thank you both very much. Well, the Biden administration has announced a new attempt to provide federal student loan debt relief to millions of Americans. It's part of an effort to keep a promise he made when he ran for office back in 2020. Well, President Biden outlined the new plan during a trip yesterday to Madison, Wisconsin. The new efforts come nearly a year after the Supreme Court rejected the White House's first attempt to provide relief that would have canceled up to $20,000 for borrowers. The president says the relief will be a boost for the economy. I will never stop to deliver student debt relief on hardworking Americans, and it's only in the interest of America that we do it. And again, it's for the good of our economy that's growing stronger and stronger, and it is. By freeing millions of Americans from this crushing debt of student debt, it means they can finally get on with their lives. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us this morning with more. Hey, Gabe, good to see you. So walk us through the highlights of the White House's new effort here to tackle student debt. Who's most likely to benefit from this plan? And is it expected that this will be challenged? Uh, hi there, Savannah. Good morning. Well, it is expected to be challenged. And as you said, though, the White House uh, believes that this will impact millions of Americans. And there are several targeted groups. Let's walk through those uh, right now. Among them, borrowers um, who are experiencing hardships like child care costs, but also borrowers, and this is probably the largest group, those who have seen their interest balloon over the last several years. They can have up to $20,000 uh, forgiven. There are also uh, people that have been paying undergraduate loans for more than 20 years, also graduate loans for more than 25 years, they're also eligible. Now, these are all more targeted groups than the Biden administration tried the last time. You mentioned when the Supreme Court blocked it. President Biden, as you said, was in Madison yesterday talking about this. Let's listen to some of that. Tens of millions of people's debt was literally about to get canceled. But then some of my Republican friends and elected officials and special interests sued us, and the Supreme Court blocked us. But that didn't, well, that didn't stop us. I've been pushing this, and if I'm reelected, I'm going to push it hard. And we're going to get it done next time, is I want to make community college tuition free. 
Now, some of the details of this plan have yet to be finalized, but the White House says that they plan to implement it by this fall, just in time for the November election, Savannah. Yes, so Gabe, how is the Biden administration looking to push forward with this plan, despite that opposition that the plan received back in the first place, back in 2022? You mentioned it is expected to be challenged. How does he move through that? How does he continue to try to make this a political selling point, knowing that that's coming? Well, the White House is trying a different legal justification here. When the Supreme Court blocked the previous plan uh, last summer, uh, they said that uh, the Biden administration did not have the proper authority, and that was because the administration was using the HEROES Act, which was passed in the wake of 9-11. Uh, this is a more targeted approach. It's not as broad as the plan that the administration had put forward before. And so the White House is using uh, the Higher Education Act, which was passed in the mid-60s, which gives the education secretary broad powers when it comes uh, to student debt. So that's how the White House plans to fight back against critics who say that, look, taxpayers should not be footing the bill for people who went to college and racked up all this debt. Savannah. Gabe, so as we've been discussing, President Biden is looking to, you know, do this, provide this relief ball, of course, also attempting to drum up this support from young voters ahead of the election, even from older voters who might still have some of that student debt sticking around. That that is a super important group when it comes to younger voters, part of the coalition that helped him win the White House in the first place. How much of their support does he have now and how impactful is an initiative like this anticipated to be? Yes, Savannah, it's uh, pretty remarkable according to the latest polls, and it is no coincidence that uh, the White House is racing to implement this before uh, the November election. But according to 2020 exit polls uh, by NBC News, uh, President Biden was well ahead of Donald Trump, was ahead by 24 points among voters under 30 years old. But that support has been dropping recently in the last several months, partly because uh, young voters have uh, sharply criticized his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. One of the latest polls, a Fox News poll last month, actually had uh, former President Trump up by 18 points among voters under 30 years old. So pretty significant as uh, President Biden tries to win back some of that support. But because that young vote is so critical in states like Battleground and Wisconsin, even a small shift in that mm -hmm. electorate could swing the election, Savannah. So true and important one. Gabe Gutierrez, great reporting. Thank you so much. Well, it is time now for some weather. Severe storms are threatening the south this morning. But you know what? I think we can call the eclipse forecast sort of a win in a lot of places. Right, Michelle? I'm going to give you credit for some of that. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Savannah. I know. It was so awesome. In Doylestown, Pennsylvania, where I live, we had clouds right at that time. But it was still so fun, awesome to see all that and see everyone come together. Now, today we were watching severe storms. We watched them yesterday afternoon. We're going to watch them again tomorrow into Thursday. So this is a multi-day event. Uh, we're talking the chance of tornadoes also really large hail once again and heavy, heavy rain that's going to lead to some flooding. You can see heavy rain uh, even at this hour. I've been tracking this since 1 a.m. and it's pretty much looked like this. Where you see those darker colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's where we're looking at the heaviest rain falling. So from Texas all the way across the southeast, you see some lightning too. We're hearing some thunder and we are looking at the threat of severe weather as we go throughout today. 22 million people at risk for really large hail, softball size hail once again, strong tornadoes and winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour now that could bring down some power lines some power trees leading uh trees leading to power outages where you see the yellows and the oranges that's where we're seeing the likeliest chance for seeing some of those strong storms so places like dallas san angelo san antonio houston over to alexandria also waco could see some pretty gusty thunderstorms this afternoon into the evening hours lots of rain too you saw that on radar eight million people impacted by flood watches we're not looking at flood warnings at this hour right now but we're going to see them pop in throughout the day and I saw them earlier this morning too in Shreveport, Monroe and also Tyler. So certainly we could see more flash flood warnings throughout the afternoon hours. This is why we're looking at a whole lot of rain from portions of Texas all the way up through the Ohio Valley. This is all going to move to the east. It's a very slow moving system with a cold front with that rain along the cold front. So locally up to eight inches of rain. We could see that little plus next to it. We could see a locally higher amount as well. So there's that cold front. We're looking at rounds of heavy rain. Severe storms are expected. Then by tomorrow we're looking at that low pressure system moving across Texas and then a significant tornado outbreak is possible. That is something we're going to watch very, very closely on Wednesday and they could be powerful uh, tornadoes tomorrow. So by Thursday, still looking at the threat for severe storms from Ohio uh, to Florida. Also risk of flooding from east of the Appalachian. So lots of rain over the next few days. 
for Wednesday, we're looking at 16 million people at risk. Where do you see that red there? This is where we're talking about the chance of a tornado outbreak. Again, some could be very, very uh, strong. We're looking at red. That's moderate. That's the highest level uh, when you're looking at the threat for severe storms. We also have the orange and yellow. So Texarkana, Delufkin, over to Panama City could also see some strong storms. We're looking at hail too, but not that's not the biggest threat. Then by Thursday, 26 million people at risk for severe storms. So again, as I mentioned, this is a multi-day event. We're looking at portions of Central Florida all the way up to parts of the Northeast. That includes D.C., also Raleigh, Wilmington, looking at the threat for some severe storms. So we're going to keep our eyes open. But if you live in Texas, the mm. Gulf Coast states, you want to keep your tornado plan in place today and then also tomorrow. Important safety reminder. Michelle yeah. Grossman, thank you so sure. much. See you in a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, are you feeling isolated in the office? Well, it turns out you're not alone. My researchers say more people are experiencing loneliness at work. At first, though, tension rising in the Middle East as Israel vows to move ahead with its ground offensive in Gaza. We will be right back. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. What is going to happen now? We're back and forth, Kristen. Go ahead. This is it. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he has set a date to carry out new ground operations in the city of Rafah. According to Netanyahu, Hamas militants are hiding in the area. But the plan is drawing sharp criticism from President Biden because of the potential impact to nearly two million Gazans seeking refuge in the city. NBC's Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv with the details. After that Israeli military withdrawal from southern Gaza, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowing to mount a controversial ground offensive in the southern city of Rafah. There is a date. It will happen, he said, though not revealing when. Israel says Rafah is the last Hamas stronghold, but President Biden opposes an attack on the city 
where over a million Palestinian civilians are currently taking shelter. Meantime, Palestinians returning to the areas Israeli forces left behind survey their shattered neighborhoods in disbelief. You can't live here. Animals can't live here, this man says in Khan Yunus. All of this as there's increasing pressure from the U.S. to reach a ceasefire agreement. Marking the six-month anniversary of the Hamas terror attack, Netanyahu is saying there will be no ceasefire unless Hamas frees hostages. While ordinary Palestinians are desperate for any kind of respite after half a year of death and destruction. Meantime, we're hearing that plans promised by Benjamin Netanyahu to open new aid crossings into Gaza are still in the works, but could take several more days. All right, Hala Garani, thank you so much. Let's get you other international headlines now, starting with the Vatican, under fire from the LGBTQ community after declaring gender-affirming surgery and surrogacy, quote, violations of human dignity. NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now. Hey, Megan, good morning. Yeah, guys, good morning. That's right. We start in Rome, where the Vatican has weighed in on gender-affirming surgery and surrogacy, saying it rejects God's plan for human life and declaring it a grave violation of human dignity. Now, this is a big blow to the LGBTQ community, uh, who Pope Francis has made strides with. You could even call it a hallmark of his agenda in reaching out and including LGBTQ people into the church. The Vatican says God created men and women biologically, and it must not be tinkered with. Turning now to Nepal, where the army says a massive cleanup mission will soon be underway on Mount Everest to collect around 10 tons of trash with the support of Sherpas. The army also says they plan to bring bodies down of those who have died while trying to reach the top of the world's highest peak. And finally, to the Australian outback, we go where this extremely rare blind mole has been spotted and photographed. Uh, these things are so uncommon that wildlife experts say they don't even know how many are left in the world. It's a small little thing with these big hands, golden fur, stumpy tail, no eyes. I mean, I think it's cutish. What do you guys think? Cutish. We only have that one photo, I guess. It's hard to say. That's it. Hard to say. <laughs> All right, Megan, thank you so much. Coming up, sentencing day, the parents of mass school shooter Ethan Crumbly set to learn their fate today, what to expect from the first of their kind cases. And a new way to get all your stress to float away. We'll dive into the benefits of float therapy next on Morning News Now. from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> I apologize to for the many questions. Will never be questioned. I 
Welcome back. The first parents to be convicted in connection with their child's mass school shooting are expected to be sentenced today in Michigan. Two sources close to the case tell NBC News James and Jennifer Crumbly will appear in court together later this morning. They were convicted of involuntary manslaughter in separate trials earlier this year. Their son, Ethan Crumbly, is serving life in prison for the 2021 mass shooting at a high school in Oxford, Michigan, that left four students dead and several others injured. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us from the Oakland County Courthouse in Pontiac with a preview. Maggie, thanks for joining us. What can we expect from today's proceedings? Yeah, so Savannah, we can expect, as you said, to see Jennifer and James Crumbly together inside that courtroom for the first time since these criminal proceedings began. That's according to two sources familiar with this case. We're told essentially that the judge and attorneys involved in this case don't want to make victims give impact statements twice. So they're going to do this once, and then we're going to see two sentences handed down, one for James, one for Jennifer. The state is asking for 10 to 15 years in prison for each parent. That would be the maximum allowed in this case, because even though it was four counts of involuntary manslaughter, they stemmed from the same incident. So Michigan law requires that these sentences be served concurrently, meaning at the same time. So we're talking about 15 years max. That's more than what state guidelines recommend in this case. But prosecutors are pointing to what they call a total and complete lack of remorse from James and Jennifer. So they really want to go uh, for, for the maximum here, Savannah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. So let's talk through that. So, I mean, the, uh, recommending this, the, it would exceed state guidelines, as you just point out, what they are asking right. the judge to do here in imposing these sentence. And you mentioned that lack of remorse. Meanwhile, though, both defense attorneys have asked that their clients be sentenced to time served. Tell us about that. Tell us about the difference there and exactly what the defense has put forward. Yeah, essentially, both defense attorneys point out that both parents have been in jail during these proceedings for more than two years. So both of them are asking for time served. They've maintained throughout this entire case, and they've had separate defense teams, but both teams have maintained that the parents didn't know, couldn't have known that their son Ethan was planning this shooting. This was a tragedy, they say, that just basically uh, impacted both families and impacted the community, impacted the parents just like that. Uh, so they're basically asking for time served, best case scenario. There also was a really unusual uh, request from the defense attorney for Jennifer Crumbly asking that she be allowed to serve out the rest of her sentence in her uh, guest house. Writing in a sentencing memo, Mrs. Crumbly is terrified for her own safety and has developed social anxiety throughout her time in jail, adding she can contribute more to society by not being incarcerated. Savannah. So Maggie, what are the Crumbly's options for appealing whatever sentence is handed down to them? It seems we may have lost Maggie's IFB, basically just a phone call we're connected to her with and now she can no longer hear us. We'll check back in with her. Maggie Vespa, thank you for your reporting. Let's turn now to our weekly mental health check-in. This morning we're taking a closer look at what researchers are calling workplace loneliness. Plus, spring has sprung, so let's talk about some spring cleaning for our minds. Love that. Joining us to help break down these headlines is psychiatrist and author of What a Happy Family, Dr. Somia Dave. Dr. Dave, always great to have you with us. So let's jump right in with this concept of workplace loneliness. Now the U.S. Surgeon General announced last year that we are in this loneliness epidemic. We've talked a lot about this on our show, but this is specifically what researchers are pointing to at work, experiencing this unique kind of loneliness when it comes to your profession. And, and the fix isn't necessarily just as simple as coming back to the office in person. Tell us about this. Right. So like you said, this loneliness epidemic does apply to the workplace. And when we're thinking about that context, there are three specific things that can help. Now, the first is to normalize that sense of loneliness. People are feeling lonely across workplaces everywhere. So for that to be brought to the surface and for people to know they're not alone in feeling lonely. The second step is for workplaces to facilitate open, engaging, deep conversations, which research has shown can decrease feelings of loneliness. So that might mean leaders talk about the struggles they feel comfortable sharing, mm. or teams are encouraged to talk about what gives them a sense of purpose, but really having those conversations be a part of the workplace. A third is to practice because those conversations can seem a little awkward or uncomfortable sometimes, right? And like any skill, they're one that that's one that needs to be built. And so practicing and making it a part of a sustainable workplace situation can go a very long way. Mm, really, really good ideas there for managers really to pay attention to mm -hmm. and try to help implement for those that work for them. Um, let's talk about something else we teased a minute ago. So this is a new kind of mental health treatment. It's called flotation therapy. Some researchers are saying that actually floating in a specialized tank of warm 
salt water can reduce some of our mental health symptoms. First, I'm just going to say that sounds kind of expensive. I don't know where you're getting a warm salt water type of tub. Um, but tell us why it is that this would be helpful and other ways that we could sort of achieve the same benefits in a way that might actually be possible at home or cheaper. So you're absolutely right. This can be expensive and it involves being in one of these salt water saturated tanks for usually about an hour. The time can vary. Now, for many people, they feel like it reduces symptoms of anxiety and depression, decreases stress, decreases muscle soreness if they're experiencing that. And one of the thoughts behind this is that actually having that sensory deprivation from the physical self helps people actually be more in touch with their emotional selves and what's going on internally for them. Some people also describe feeling like they're in a meditative state when they're in this. Now, we've talked before about how actually being in water itself and even looking at bodies of water can be calming. So I think people obviously do need support and we do need different forms of emotional wellness in, in different ways. And so if anybody is near a body of water and can be part of that for a little bit, that can be a way to at least get some of that exposure if we don't have access to a saltwater saturated body of water for an hour at a time. Mm, pretty good advice there. That sounds kind of nice. All right, finally, let's get to that spring cleaning of the mind they mentioned so of course you know it's getting warmer out uh that can be helpful in and of itself for those who struggle with seasonal affective disorder or seasonal depression as there's more sunshine things like that some mental health experts are saying that now might be a good time to start trying to give our minds a little refresh as much as we can walk us through how to do that I love the idea of emotional or mental spring cleaning as we're going into this new season. And a technique called behavioral activation involves intentionally performing certain behaviors for a boost in mood. Now, the good news about this is that it doesn't take very big steps. So it can include eating lunch outside, meeting with a friend, opening the blinds first thing in the morning so we get that sunlight exposure, which we know can help us in so many different ways, and even trying a new hobby. And so we know that small changes can add up over time to make a very big difference. And as we head into spring and summer and the rest of the year, this can be a great opportunity to try incorporating some new things for those benefits. Dr. Dave, we love when you join us. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Coming up, it is tax time. That's right, the deadline to file taxes now less than one week away. We're going to get some expert advice for filing on time and how to get your documents ready. This is Morning News Now. Fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Um, pretty, pretty bad. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. My I apologize for the many questions. will never be I questioned. <laughs> Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This book to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now. It's NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. lives in the now. It's coming at us every second from all over the world. We have a full team. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters, they're asking that the hostages, demanding that the hostages be released. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on and on. Now is real. This is it. We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. Morning news now, we're breaking news. NBC News special report. You gotta see this. The future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore.
News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? We're back and forth because they can Go ahead. Let's see you. Welcome back. For the second year in a row, UConn men's basketball reigns supreme in a top-seeded battle for the national championship. A thrilling March Madness ended with a dominant UConn beating out Purdue 70-65. to The Huskies are now the first back-to-back -back champs in 17 years. So exciting. Star sophomore center and now two-time national champion Donovan Klingen joins us this morning. Donovan, thank you so much for being here. First, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, you really, for having me. You got it. We appreciate you taking time for us this morning. So just two years into your college career, you've got two national championships. How does that feel? Whew. Um, it's hard <laughs> to describe the feeling right now. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel real. You know, people dream of, you know, just winning one national title, you know, just make it to the, to the Final Four. And, you know, to be able to go out there and, you know, win two national titles in two years of college, you know, that's special and, you know, it means a lot to me. Yeah, it's going quite well, to put it mildly. Um, going into the game, there was a lot of discussion about your matchup with Purdue's Zach Eady. What was it like to go against him in that particular game? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's physical. He's really strong. He's, he's big. He's tall, um, you know, and he's really, he's got really good touch around the rim and in the post. Um, you know, but really just the game plan of, you know, letting him score as many hook shots as he needs without following him and don't let the three point shooters get the threes off. And mm -hmm. the game plan works. Um, I think they had, I think he had like 37, 38 points, but the team had about 60 total. So, you know, we really just tried to force Zach Eady to, you know, score as many hook shots as he can. And, you know, he was taking 18 to 20 seconds, you know, off the shot clock every time. So, you know, it was. He was wasting time and only scoring twos. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the culture at UConn, what it's like, and if you think it helps fuel your success on the court? Yeah, um, you know, we, it's just a winning culture. You know, we want to win championships. You come to UConn to win championships and do something special. Um, you know, Coach Hurley really just, you know, pushes you to a level you've never been pushed to. And, you know, he just... He's always hungry and he really like, you know, instills that into us. You know, he, we, we always are hungry throughout the year, even though we were winning a lot of games, you know, winning regular season, the biggest tournament, you know, we were never, you know, satisfied. You know, we stayed hungry and we just kept going and, you know, we were able to come out with the national title. You were really able to step up and take a leading role as center this season. Also though, as a sophomore, what was that like and what were some of the biggest challenges of that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a difficult jump just because, you know, I went from, you know, playing 12, 13 minutes a game, you know, behind the best big man in the country to, you know, starting playing, you know, 25, 30 minutes a game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really just had to try to lead the team, lead the new guys, lead the lead the transfers, the young guys, and just show them what it takes to win. And, you know, Andre, Adama, and Jordan really did a great job with, you know, teaching me, Alex, Tristan, and, you know, all these other returners about what it, what, what it is you need to do to be a leader and the right way to be a leader and be a great leader. Um, you know, Coach Early is a tough coach, and he always coaches us and pushes us to the max. And, you know, you got to be able to, you know, push your teammates and, you know, help your teammates out. You know, it's not the easiest practices, it's not the easiest game plan, but, you know, once you figure it out and you have the right leaders, you know, the team will merge together and, you know, good things will happen. Donovan, we so appreciate you joining us this morning. Congratulations again, back to back. So cool to watch you play. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Coming up, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty fitting finale to one of the longest-running shows of all time. Up next, how the highly anticipated last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm paid tribute to Larry David's other successful sitcom. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now. Democracy is happening. 
now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. How is it that traffic was stopped in time? State law enforcement officers, they undoubtedly saved lives. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. That is the sound of Taylor Swift making magic. And if you're one of her nearly 300 million Instagram followers, you might have caught that video on her story yesterday. Well, as the solar eclipse swept across the country, our girl was busy eclipsing our hearts, teasing what fans are pretty sure are lyrics from her upcoming album, The Tortured Poets Department. So here's what she wrote. It says, crowd goes wild at her fingertips, half moonshine, full eclipse, obviously fitting because she's a magician. The teaser also included a link to pre-order the project. So we will find out more because the new album drops next Friday, April 19th, and we are ready for it. That is for sure. All right, now let's talk taxes. It may be hard to believe, but the deadline to file them now just six days away. If you haven't filed yet, don't worry, you're not alone, but the clock is ticking and the April 15th deadline is really just around the corner. That's why we want to bring in our friend, the tax man himself, Chief Tax Information Officer at Jackson Hewitt, Mark Steber. Mark, always wonderful to see you. First, are you a Taylor Swift fan? I'm not so much. My wife and my daughter, they're Swifties. Well, then you got to get in on it with I, them. You know, I get everything I need to know from them at the kitchen table. Okay, so. there you go. Well, <laughs> at least you could spend some time. Okay, what do people need to know? This really soon, are they behind, well, I guess they are behind the eight ball, but are they in trouble if they don't have this done quite yet? Well, not in trouble. You still have about 140 hours left, not that <laughs> I'm counting. counting. And all I would simply say to your viewers, do something. You mm. cannot just kick the can down the road and handle it this summer. So you either file your tax return, and there's still plenty of time for that. Lots of people out there with extra hours, extra staff, you know, extra capabilities, and even online if you want to do it yourself, or file an extension. But do something, because that failure to file penalty can get big really quick as the interest and, you know, all that accumulates. So file something. You should have all your stuff. There's plenty of people. No reason. And three out of four are still getting a refund. 
go get your money. Mm, three out of four is pretty good. Let's walk us through if we can pull that graphic back up. Some of these last minute tips uh, in order to file. What should people be keeping in mind? Well, accuracy counts. No guesstimating and no estimating, even mm. down here at the last hour. And some people take that shortcut and that can create problems later when the IRS says, hey, this number doesn't exactly match. And more than anything, it can delay your refund rather than get you audited. There's that you know myth out there as well. So don't rush, don't mm. hurry. Find your documents. They should be there by now. And if you don't have one, you need to go track that down. Between technology, downloading websites, you can go get that W-2, 1099, or broker statement a lot faster than you could, say, 10 years ago where it was mailed to you. So all you really need to do is find the source, and a good pro can help you with that. There's a lot of online tools and technology that can help you. You can update your own information on your My IRS account. You can file electronically yourself or with a tax pro. You have lots of options, and time is dwindling, but you can get this done. About 60 million people as of Friday have not, so that just tells you you're kind of in good company, but that does not give you a reason to wait till after the 15th. It really doesn't work that way. Mm, absolutely. Okay, let's talk about extensions. It was the last bullet on that graphic there. What do people need to know if that's where they think this is headed for them? Well, the beauty of the American tax system, it's an automatic six-month extension. I mean, that's what the 4868 form says. You can file it electronically. You can file it as long as it's pay, uh, postmarked by midnight. What it's not, though, and this is the big myth and misinformation on social media, mm. it's not an extension of time to pay your taxes. Just send your form in. If you owe money and you file your extension, you do prevent the failure to file penalty, but not the failure to pay penalty. So you can kick the can down the road to send in your forms later on with an extension, federal and state, but you can't delay paying the man. He wants his money by midnight on the 15th. So how does that work then? What, well, what would you do? Great, great question there as well. There's a host of new technologies out there uh, at irs.gov that will allow you to do direct pay. You can pay with a credit card, get those points. You can have your bank account drafted if you want. You can even set the day that you want the money pulled out if you want to when you know you're going to get you know, paid or have your draw. Uh, so you can pay electronically, you can pay with a credit card, you can have your money automatically pulled, or more importantly, you can just put it in the mail by the 15th, your check if you owe, make sure you mail it registered mail because you want to be able to prove that in case there's any question and it gets mm. lost. But you have lots of choices and lots of options. The only one you don't have is to miss the deadline. Mm, there you go. Okay, also, I know that the IRS had this important update on what's called direct file. It's their free tax filing program. What was that update and how does this work? Well, there's a new pilot program, and I want to emphasize that because it was rolled out late. It hasn't gotten completely updated to handle mm. all states. Uh, but you can file for free, but there's always been a free filing option at irs.gov. It's existed for decades. So this is just a new entry into the free tax prep. It is unfortunately a do-it-yourself engine, which means you're doing it yourself. There's a bit of a firewall to authenticate and prove who you are. But for some people, and they've had you know modest you know, success so far, or at least reported success so far this year, it might be an option to consider. But it is a do-it-yourself. It doesn't apply in all the states that have a state income tax, and you do have to have some rudimentary you know identity proofing to get it done on the front end. So if you don't want that. Just go see a dude down the street. Make sure it's the right guy. You don't want a ghost. They've warned about that, too. A lot of bad people creep into the system at this time of year with great promises. Don't worry about it. I know a guy will take this deduction, fuel tax credit, or what have you. So you want to be cautious on who you share your most intimate financial information with and to make a relationship for life. It's a best practice on your largest single financial transaction. Oh, great advice there. So if somebody's watching right now, they have not dealt with this at all yet. After morning news now, if they shut the TV off and they're going to go handle their taxes, what's the number one thing that you would say, this is what you got to go try to do today? Find your stuff. You should have an envelope. That's the first thing. You can't go see a pro and you can't do it yourself without your stuff. So start that. But assuming you've got your W-2s and your other stuff, find a pro. Go to your website. Google your favorite tax engine. Somebody you walk down the street and see it. JacksonHewitt.com. Just like a pizza. You put your zip code in. They'll show you the addresses. Other companies do the same. Walk right in. Call them up. Make an appointment. Whatever your you know choice is. But go see someone if you just want to offshore this to somebody else and not do it yourself. Otherwise, same thing. Go back to your favorite search engine, tax software, use a credible one. You might have to pay a little bit for it, but there's a lot of sketchy stuff out there. So just like when you're hiring any professional, do your homework, read the reviews. Is it easy to use? Is it hard to use? You know, find what you want to do. If you want to do it yourself, that's great. Do it yourself, but you have to put in the work. If you want to find a pro, I promise you on your commute in the way this morning, you passed a tax pro. <laughs> they are ready to wait for you to get it done. They'll be there to 
until you're serviced. All of us are in that. Probably past right a pizza shop, too. I promise you, you they are Just there. like a pizza. Mark Stever, thank you very much. Always wonderful to have you. Savannah. Finally, this morning, Larry David's beloved Curb Your Enthusiasm has come to an end. The highly anticipated final episode paid tribute to the controversial Seinfeld finale that David served as a co-creator of. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has the story. And a warning to viewers, there are spoilers here. After 12 seasons spanning 25 years full of awkward and cringeworthy behavior, Larry David's caricature of himself in Curb Your Enthusiasm came to an end with an homage. If you get convicted, you'll be a felon. And a return to the scene of the Seinfeld finale, which at the time many considered a crime. All right. David returned to Seinfeld for that finale in 1998, where Jerry and the cast were on trial for being insensitive, allowing for fan favorites of past seasons to make cameos. <laughs> the soup Nazi. The Curb episode uses a similar yes, plot where yes. TV Larry breaks a local election law and characters from his past come back to claim revenge. He came back in and he said he was opening up what he called a spite store. I will not tolerate corruption from Trump, Putin, or Larry David. Oh, come on. It was a perfect call. Even the boss, Bruce Springsteen, appearing as a witness. What kind of guy is Larry David? He's the kind of man who carelessly, maybe even maliciously, had me drink from his glass and gave me COVID. As he awaits a verdict, the characters take shots at the other ending. I've been to all those Seinfeld episodes. Oh, yeah? Well, I got left with the finale. Wow. Although, I heard some terrible things about it. The evidence of David's maddening personality is not lost on the jury, who find him guilty of rubbing people the wrong way. We find the defendant guilty. As he is sitting in his cell, it appears he is determined to have his show suffer the same fate. The second button is the key button. It literally makes or breaks the shirt. Until none other than Jerry swoops in. You're a free man. Freeing David's character on a technicality and some advice that comes from experience. You don't want to end up like this. Nobody wants to see it. Trust me. And while it seems Larry learned a lesson. This is how we should have ended the finale. His fans oh gosh, know better than that. I'm 76 years old, and I have never learned a lesson in my entire life. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. We warned you about those spoilers. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News. Now stay with us, so the news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe Fryer is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, a celestial spectacle for the ages. Americans from Texas to Maine and beyond will show you the celebrations across the country from yesterday's jaw-dropping total solar eclipse and the front row seat mid-air. You'll have to see to believe. Also, former President Trump is under fire from both sides of the aisle this morning after taking a state-by-state -state stance on abortion in a social media post. Voices on the right now saying it's not going far enough, while those on the left are unsure whether he'd change his mind if he takes the White House again. We'll bring you the latest. Also this morning, we'll dig into how artificial intelligence is impacting the beauty industry, the pledge one popular name is making to keep beauty real. And kings of the dance, the Yukon Huskies are back on top this morning, besting Purdue last night for their second straight national title. We've got all the highlights later in the hour. But of course, we're going to get started with what everyone can't stop talking about this morning, myself included, the solar eclipse. Did you see it? Millions of Americans in cities across the country sure did. They came together to take in the joy and wonder of one of the most anticipated celestial events of the year. I took it all in right here in New York City, across the street at Radio City Music Hall, along with crowds of New Yorkers who stopped their day to get a glimpse. Look at this. It was so cool. We had only actually 89% totality here. But it still was so incredible to witness and certainly incredible to be with a crowd like that in the streets of Manhattan. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello is in Indianapolis, Indiana, one of the best places to see the total eclipse. Yeah, good morning. I mean, what a phenomenal day. And we had spectacular weather here in Indianapolis in the heartland. 75 degrees, blue skies, 
absolutely perfect for the moment of totality. You know, nationwide, hundreds of millions of people collectively saw this together. Uh, and people were speechless, people were crying. Some people got married underneath the eclipse. A lot of people just held hands and they were quietly watching this together as we all enjoyed the singular moment of celestial alignment. It's the moment that left millions of Americans in total awe. Look at this! Whoa! Yeah! Is this exciting? Yes, this is so incredible! It's amazing! From Texas to Maine, a once-in-a-lifetime experience and a collective pause to take in one of nature's greatest phenomena. You know, Tom, you and I cover a lot of... Uh... A lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is uh, this is magical. It is. I think it's a it's a moment in which all of us feel connected to each other as members of the human family, but also to the galaxy. Millions of Americans gathering across the path of totality, stretching through 15 states. In Cleveland, baseball fans at the Guardians' home opener were treated to an out-of-this-world pregame show unlike any other. Our NBC team also watched from around the country. Three, two, one! Even a partial eclipse stunned New Yorkers. You walk through New York City and everyone is doing the same yeah. thing yeah. Yes. collectively. Right. Well, not looking at their phones, they're yes. looking at us. And totality inspiring wonder. Look, we can see Venus. From Texas. What was it like uh, to see that, babe? Emotional. Brought tears through my eyes. To 20,000 feet up in the air over Arkansas. Now it's like this sunrise, but the, but the sunrise is a color I've never seen before. It is like a, a deep purple. And check out this spectacular view from an orbiting Starlink satellite for NASA, an incredible learning opportunity. So one of the things we were really looking at today was the corona. The moon blocked out the sun so that we could see that's part of the sun's atmosphere. We were also looking a lot at how the eclipse effect, affected Earth. So we had a citizen science project that looked at how the eclipse changed temperatures and clouds. An emotional and magical experience. Wow. There's Venus, there's Jupiter, there's Mars. For people to pause and look up at the sky. It's like a once in a lifetime thing, you know? Yeah, you know what else was nice about this? Despite all the divisions in this country, nobody was talking politics. Nobody was talking about social divisions. This was a moment when we all came together, kind of in a shared humanity, uh, and really just kind of uh, leaned on each other and celebrated together. And that was really refreshing. Uh, we're not going to have another total eclipse in this country until 2044. Here in Indianapolis, 2153 is the next total eclipse. I've already booked my hotel room because I know you guys are going to want me back. But uh, what a spectacular experience. By the way, more total eclipses around the world if you want to chase them throughout the rest of this century. Back to you. Yeah, Tom Costello, those eclipse chasers at Sony. Thank you so much. Well, while tens of millions of Americans took in the eclipse on the ground, a few lucky people were able to enjoy it from the sky. Courtney Kazaya snapped these pictures from onboard a Delta flight. From, look at how beautiful that is. From Austin to Detroit. This passed through the path of totality this morning. We are lucky enough to have Courtney here with us to tell us all about it. Courtney, thanks for joining us. What an incredible experience. We understand the flight that you were on sold out 24 hours after Delta announced. To tell us, how did you manage to get on this flight? Well, I knew about it because I have a really good friend who's a Delta enthusiast, and she let me know that Delta tweeted that they would be flying this route. So I tried to get on, grab a seat. Unfortunately, it was sold out. However, they opened another route going from Dallas to Detroit. And once they did that, I thought, you know what? I bet there are going to be some seats that open on the Austin to Detroit. So sure enough, I went in and they had released more seats. So I was able to snag one. That's so cool. So what was the mood like on the plane? It was really like a huge celebration. It was like a party plane. Everyone was excited to be there. Um, there were celebrations at the departure gate as well as the arrival gate with balloons, a DJ, et cetera. It was so fun. And tell us what it was like when you actually did see this eclipse in the sky. What was that moment like? I mean, you snap these beautiful pictures. Tell us when you realized, okay, this is happening right now, and I'm up in the sky with this. <laughs> well, so the pilot um, obviously came over to the PA, and he announced that 
we would be um, approaching the path of totality. And we all were uh, getting anxious as the the atmosphere um, was changing. You could kind of sense this energy. So everything started to go dark. And then the pilots had rehearsed this maneuver where the right side of the plane would get to see uh, part of the eclipse, and then they did a dip and turned the plane so that the people on the left side would be able to view it as well. So everyone was just, you know, in awe and gasping, and it was just so much fun. That is so cool that they made sure that you could all see it and turn the plane like that. It was each time were cheers breaking out on the plane? Yes. So full on claps and everyone shouting, and it was just so much fun. Um, Everyone was just really excited to be there. Okay, Courtney, something also that you shared with us when we were able to talk with you before you were live on our show is something that I just find so funny, so I have to ask you about it. That there were, what did you say, about seven people who had no idea this was the flight they signed up for. They were just trying to go from Austin to Detroit. Correct, yes. Uh, the flight attendant did a poll at the beginning of the flight to ask, you know, are there any people on this flight that were not aware this was an eclipse flight? And it's about seven people raised their hand. So I'm sure that that was a, a, a welcome surprise. Well, hopefully a welcome surprise anyway. <laughs> just can't even imagine like the confusion and then the fun and then just all the things if it's not what you were planning for. It's so funny to me. Also, I understand love was in the air, right? Yes. About 15 minutes after we passed through uh, the path of totality, um, we heard cheers coming from the back of the plane. And my friend and I turned around and we're like, what's going on? And it turns out a man had just proposed to his girlfriend. Um, oh. So that was very exciting to witness as well. She said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Courtney, yeah. that is just so much fun. I seriously, I don't know why. I hope other people think it's as funny as I do imagining those seven walking up to the gate with balloons. It's just such a funny thing. Courtney, because I what a cool experience. I'm so happy for you that you got a seat on that plane and thanks for sharing it with us. Thanks for having me, Savannah. You got it. Have a good one. All right, let's talk weather. Severe weather is headed our way. It's going to bring rain across the south while unseasonably warm temperatures are going to hit the northeast. Michelle Grossman is here to walk us through it all. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Great to see you. And yes, we are looking at stormy, stormy weather once again in the south. Started yesterday, and this is a slow moving front. So we're going to be dealing with this for a couple of days in spots. And we're talking heavy rain, flooding rains, a chance for severe storms, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, and even the chance of some tornadoes. So that's going on in the south. Uh, rain and storms extend all the way up to portions of the Ohio Valley. Again, this will move off to the east over the next couple of days. Behind this front, though, we've cleared out in the northern plains, sunny and mild. We're looking at some showers and some snow showers in parts of the Pacific net northwest into the Intermountain West. The southwest looks good with lots of sunshine and mild temperatures as well. But this is the focus of weather today because we are looking at really active weather in the south into the lower Mississippi Valley, portions of the southeast, the Gulf Coast. Uh, heavy rain is falling right now. It's been falling for hours and pretty much training over the same area. Uh, that means we're going to look at the chance for flooding, and we have seen flash flooding this morning. Looking at some lightning, too, hearing the thunder out there, where you're looking at those bright colors on the map here, that's where the heaviest rain is falling. And notice it's sort of just like a plume of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and that's where we're seeing it over the same areas. And even the panhandle of Texas now seeing another batch of really heavy rain. So today, 22 million people at risk for severe storms. That means we're going to see some really large hail once again, three inches or greater. What is that mean that's about softball size hail that can cause some damage on its own a few tornadoes are possible winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour especially where you see those dark uh, the oranges the yellows that's where we're looking at the chance the likeliest chance for seeing some strong storms dallas san angelo waco houston san antonio alexandria i know you went through this yesterday but you're gonna have to keep your eye to the sky for some storms and we are looking to savannah for the risk of ef2 or larger tomorrow we could see a tornado outbreak with some really large storms and then another chance for storms on thursday so we have some really busy days over the next few days we sure do michelle grossman thank you so much sure. well there's new fallout this morning from former president donald trump's announcement that his view on on abortion, that the policy should be left to the states. The former president made the comments yesterday in a post on the social media platform Truth Social. It immediately drew criticism from the left and right. NBC's Garrett Haight covers the Trump campaign and has the latest. 
Hey, Savannah, good morning. Donald Trump had teased this announcement for weeks, but his promise of a hands-off approach to legislating on the issue now has him taking fire from every side of this debate. As the right says he's refusing to protect the unborn, the left fears he'll change his mind again and would support states enacting draconian abortion bans. Donald Trump is under fire this morning from across the political spectrum after unveiling his latest stance on abortion. Leave any restrictions to the states. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others and that's what they will be. The former president also claiming credit for the 2022 Supreme Court decision backed by three Trump appointed justices that overturned Roe v. Wade and returned the abortion issue to the states, some of which have enacted near total bans on the procedure. President Biden responding in this campaign video. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. This is just filled with some of the things. The president's campaign also releasing a new ad highlighting the story of a Texas woman denied medical care after a miscarriage, placing blame on the state's strict abortion ban passed after Roe was overturned. Mr. Trump's stance also criticized from the right, including by his former VP, Mike Pence, who slammed him on social media for not calling for a national ban, writing, quote, President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans who voted for him in 2016 and 2020. For Mr. Trump, Monday's announcement, the latest step in a long public evolution on abortion. I'm very pro-choice. I'm pro-life. Do you believe in punishment for abortion, yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. Both sides are going to come together. It could be state or it could be federal. I don't frankly care. Mr. Trump has long said he's personally in favor of allowing abortions in cases of rape, incest, and protecting the life of the mother. But his new policy doesn't even allow for a national way to enshrine those protections, opening him up to still more criticism. Savannah? All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. Well, there's much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including a story close to my California heart, my conversation with the woman who is behind one of America's most popular fast food chains. There's a little hint, we saw some of it there. First, though, heightening tensions in the Middle East this morning. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu defying President Biden, setting a date for a Rafah invasion. We will bring you the latest up next. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. A good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? Going back and forth, because I'm going to turn. Oh, yeah, this is it, right? The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Let's do 
Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Welcome back. Tensions between the U.S. and Israel are continuing to grow this morning after Prime Minister Netanyahu said a date has been set to send his defense forces into Rafah. That is in defiance of President Biden. The move comes as ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas are once again stalled. Hamas leaders are now saying the latest proposals from Israel did not meet their demands. Here in the U.S., Vice President Kamala Harris is set to meet today with families whose loved ones were taken hostage. It's been just over six months since the those hostages were taken into Gaza by Hamas terrorists. NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us from London with the details here. Megan, good morning. So what more do we know at this point about Netanyahu's plan to carry out this operation in Rafah? We've heard about this for quite some time now. There's been so much pushback. Tell us how yeah. the U.S. is responding and the details we have. Well, look, Israel's prime minister has repeatedly said that there will be an invasion of Rafah. He went a step further yesterday in a video message saying it will happen and that a date has been set. Now, Netanyahu has been very vocal about Rafah being what he describes as the last stronghold of Hamas and how a ground invasion is needed to complete this war. But again, you know, the, the big concern here is that we're talking about more than a million people that are sheltering in Rafah, displaced from other parts of the enclave. Uh, the United States has been very clear that a ground operation would be a mistake, that President Biden has even called it a red line and has demanded a plan from Israel on how they would protect those civilians. We are hearing from State Department spokesman uh, Matthew Miller, and I want you to take a listen to a little bit of what he had to say. We have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. So it's not just a question of Israel presenting uh, a plan to us. We have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. So despite warnings from the U.S., Israel's closest ally, Netanyahu, says a date in to invade Rafah has been set. And though he stopped short of any details on exactly when that attack would happen. Guys. Megan, we are also learning new details about those ceasefire negotiations, as I mentioned, in Egypt. Hamas leaders say Israel's latest proposal doesn't meet their demands. What do we know about this this morning? Remind us what Hamas is looking for in these talks. Yeah, so we actually have new reporting from our Halagarani, who's on the ground in Israel. Uh, we're hearing from a source in the Israeli prime minister's office that beyond issues like the return of hostages and the length of a ceasefire, a major sticking point here in Cairo negotiations are centered around the return of Palestinians to northern Gaza. Uh, Hala has confirmed with the source that Hamas representatives are asking for the complete unfettered return of all Palestinians to the northern half of the besieged enclave uh, and that according to this source Israeli negotiators are instead demanding airport style security checks on anyone traveling back to the north and have so far agreed only to a significantly reduced number of authorized returnees. Now Hamas releasing a statement last Last night saying that they're keen to reach an agreement that stops the fighting but that Israel remains stubborn and has not responded to any of their demands guys and also meanwhile Han Yunus residents have started returning to the area after Israeli troops pulled out of the region that's another city where many people in fact who lived there who were from there had moved to areas such as Rafa what are we hearing on the ground now as people return there how serious is the damage left behind are people where are they going yeah, so Savannah, you know, I had an opportunity to uh, keep in touch with a family who escaped Gaza. Uh, I've talked to them about this, and they said that, uh, of course, they're in the U.K. now, but they have family and friends still in Gaza. And what she told me is that Han Yunus is unrecognizable. People are returning to complete devastation. Uh, she said up until now, some of her family held out hope that their homes would still be intact. But now that people are returning, the reality is settling in, is setting in, rather, that there's 
really just nothing left. People are struggling to find where they had their homes because of the destruction and the rubble of the buildings that are still standing. They're gutted. People are digging through the rubble, desperate to find anything uh, from the life that they lived before this war broke out. Mm. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you for your reporting. Well, a British man has completed the run of a lifetime. Russ Cook spent the last year running nearly 10,000 miles through Africa, all in the name of charity. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has the details. Breathless but triumphant, 27-year-old Russ Cook completing a monumental challenge, running the length of Africa. Very good, I'm a bit tired. That's almost 10,000 miles, or roughly the equivalent of 376 marathons over 352 days. I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. The realization that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two-month-old in the time he's done this. The UK native crossing the finish line at the northern tip of the continent in Los Angeles, Tunisia on Sunday. After a grueling and at times perilous journey across 16 countries, starting at the southernmost point in Cape Agula, South Africa, last April. Day 337. Cook documenting his journey on social media as he tackled different climates and terrains. But he also had to deal with unpredictable and dangerous scenarios. He says in Angola he was robbed at gunpoint of his passport and phones, and that in Congo he escaped locals armed with machetes by paying them off. The scariest moment was... Uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was that was pretty nuts. That terrifying ordeal even making him consider quitting. Probably for about one minute thought about quitting and then I realised I couldn't. So that's about as close as he ever got. And if all that wasn't challenging enough, he was initially denied a visa crossing into Algeria from Mauritania when he turned to social media for help. I've been following him since he first started from the very beginning. His supporters finishing with him on the last leg in awe of the man who also ran from Asia to London three years ago. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I was laying on my couch. 20 minutes later, I bought the ticket and here I am. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. His run, dubbed as Project Africa, raising almost $900,000 and will go towards two charities. I'm a big believer in sport, doing wonders for people's lives, and um, it changed my life. Though Russ has more in store, for now, he's just looking to unwind. I've got a whole list of ideas. But, yeah, no, I definitely am um, keen to chill out for, for a moment. Like, spend some time with the family and stuff, you know. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Coming up, more legal trouble for controversial country star Morgan Wallen. What his fans are now saying after the artist was arrested in Nashville on Monday for allegedly throwing a chair off of a rooftop bar. Stay with us. That's up next. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the ground zero as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get you in. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore.
live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. My I apologize for the many now questions. will never be I questioned. <laughs> We are back now with a closer look at the recent headlines involving crime here in New York City. You might have seen these viral videos, people being attacked on the subway, even on the sidewalks of the Big Apple. But the city's top cop says those fears don't reflect reality. For more, we are joined by NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas. He sat down exclusively with the police commissioner here. Tom, good morning. Thanks for joining us on this. Savannah, great to be with you here this morning. According to the NYPD, crime is actually coming down in most metrics. But when you talk to New Yorkers or read the papers, it feels like a much different story. I sat down with the commissioner of the NYPD who rose from the ranks of a beat cop in the South Bronx to now leading a police department larger than most armies. He told me fighting crime in New York now is even tougher than when he started. From mayhem on the subways to unprovoked attacks on women to a young police officer shot and killed in the line of duty. These headlines and viral videos paint a picture of a big city with a big problem. New York City went from clean and safe to dirty and dangerous. What happened in New York City? January 2022, New York City was up in crime over 48 percent, up in violence. And we looked at just making more felony arrests. And slowly by slowly, the violence began to come down. Edward Caban is in charge of the NYPD and it's more than 35,000 police officers. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, he says crime is trending down in New York City, but not fast enough because of repeat offenders. We're seeing that we're locking up the same people over and over again. In his most forceful statements yet, the NYPD commissioner calling bail reform laws ineffective. We lock someone up, district attorney puts bail on them, the judges let them go to walk our streets again. It's a broken system. A system that has come into sharper focus after the killing of Detective Jonathan Diller, allegedly by two career criminals with long records. How many more police officers and how many more families need to make the ultimate sacrifice before we start protecting them? Is she right? Absolutely. You know, that's the one thing that no police commissioner wants to do during their tenure is bury one of their own. Whether it's a family of blood or a family of blue, it hurts to the core. Part of Commissioner Caban's mission now, separating perception versus reality. According to NYPD stats, overall crime is down in the city and subways, but that's not how many New Yorkers feel about their own safety. I want my legacy to be that New Yorkers felt not only that they were safe, but that they felt safe too. If they don't feel that way, I'm not doing my job. Now, bail reform advocates argue it helps the poor who are disproportionately jailed because they don't have the means to post bail. But in New York, it seems the governor, who is a Democrat, has seen enough, recently announcing reforms to hold violent criminals accountable, giving more power to judges to put offenders in jail. There are more than a dozen states right now currently debating legislation over bail reforms. The commissioner, who is the first Hispanic to run the department, is also working to tackle two other major issues here of concern, right? Safety on the subway, but also the migrant crisis, which we will have, Savannah, much more of later tonight. Yeah, that's right, because you can see more, right? This is going to be, there's going to be on NBC Nightly News as well, of course, your own show, Top Story with Tom Yamastan. Is that right? See, it, that is right, and it's one of the greatest shows people have said that, it, that it has ever been broadcast. That's so. true. You should just Some keep the TV on now or your computer, whatever, all the way through 8 p.m. tonight. Tom, thank you very much. Really, though, interesting, interesting as a you. New Yorker to hear his perspective yeah. on this because we are seeing a lot of those videos. We appreciate you coming by. Thanks yeah. for being here early. Well, country music star Morgan Wallen is facing his latest controversy behind bars this morning. The singer was arrested yesterday after he allegedly threw a chair off a rooftop bar in Nashville over the weekend. Here with more is NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas. Chloe, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. 
Now, you know, Morgan Wallen's career, it has been a roller coaster ride of ups and downs, and this latest incident threatening the rise of this country star. The question is, what are his fans saying now? The latest controversy for one of country music's biggest stars, Morgan Wallen. Lies, lies, lies. Look into my eyes, eyes, eyes. The chart topping singer arrested after allegedly throwing a chair off of a six story bar in the center of Nashville's bustling entertainment district early Monday morning. Police reviewed surveillance footage they say shows Wallen lunging and throwing an object over the roof, the chair falling just a few feet from two officers standing below. Bystanders posting police carrying the chair later. The singer was released after posting an over $15,000 bond. He now faces felony charges for reckless endangerment and disorderly conduct. His lawyer telling NBC News Wallen is cooperating fully with authorities. As now we let the liquor talk. The 30-year-old Tennessee native has had a meteoric rise since his debut on the country music scene in 2016 with two chart-topping albums, with his most recent one, One Thing at a Time, breaking the record for the country album with the most weeks at the top of the Billboard 200 chart. But Wallen's musical success has been frequently overshadowed by his controversial behavior, including a 2020 arrest for public intoxication and disorderly conduct. Prosecutors dropped the charges. Less than five months later, Wallen was dropped from his SNL debut for violating COVID protocols. I have some growing up to do. Two months later, they brought him back. I am you from the future, and I came back here to stop you from partying tonight. The following year, his career taking a major hit after he was caught on camera using a racial slur, his record label and radio stations temporarily dropping him, Wallen spending time in rehab away from the spotlight. I was wrong. But throughout, fans stayed loyal. His One Night at a Time tour was the highest grossing country tour of 2023. But will this latest run in with the law shake his fan base? He's just heck of a singer and never made a bad song, but he seriously needs some help. So Wallen, he's expected back in court on May 3rd in Nashville, Savannah. And this is actually going to happen just hours before he's set to take the stage at his latest tour stop also in Nashville. So we'll see if that tour stop even happens on May 3rd. But he's also touring through the summer. Yeah, Chloe Milos, really interesting there. Obviously, a lot of fans interested in what is going on exactly. Thank you so much for that. Coming up, a closer look at artificial intelligence and the beauty industry. The pledge one popular company is making to keep beauty real. That is all right after this break. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> my I apologize to for Jackson the many questions. Now will never be I, questioned. 
now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? Going back and forth, because they Go ahead, this is it. Report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? Going back and forth, because they Go oh, ahead, this is it. Right? Welcome back. The use of artificial intelligence in the advertising industry is growing at a fast pace, really in all industries. But now some experts are estimating that as much as 90% of the content we see on the internet could be generated by AI. Get this, as soon as next year. Well, one beauty brand is taking a stand against the technology in its latest advertisement. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung joins us for more on this. Kaylee, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. You're right. Personal care brand Dove has committed to never use AI to represent real people in its advertising. And they've released a video exclusively to NBC News to make the big announcement. They say it illustrates the type of perfect images young girls and women are increasingly inundated with online and in ads, making it impossible to distinguish between what's real and what's not. As part of their Keep Beauty Real campaign, personal care brand Dove has released this two minute video. It features images of AI generated women that pop up online when you search terms like perfect skin and the most beautiful woman in the world. They then compare those to images generated under Dove's beauty standards, as well as the faces of real women. It's part of the company's pledge to never use AI to create or distort images of women, a pledge they hope other companies will also consider signing on to. A global beauty study by Dove found that 9 out of 10 women and girls say they've been exposed to harmful beauty content online. And 1 in 3 say they feel pressure to alter their appearance because of what they see online, even when they know it's fake. AI-generated images in the beauty space is a growing concern, especially for parents. I'm disgusted, horrified. Naveen Rodwan says she believes altered images of women on social media contributed to her teenage daughter's anorexia. What are they going to do to themselves when they try to attain a level of perfection that doesn't even exist? Earlier this year, more than 12,000 parents signed an online petition urging TikTok to more clearly label AI-generated influencers over concerns that showing things like flawless skin and perfect bodies creates extreme and utterly unattainable beauty standards for children. It might say, hey, this isn't a real picture. This person actually didn't look like this. But subconsciously, your brain saying, yep. That's what I'm supposed to look like. They're very bad for our well-being and our mental health. Clothing brand Levi Strauss reversed course after facing major backlash over an announcement it planned to experiment with AI-generated body-inclusive avatars like this image on their app and website. Nike promoted its use of advanced AI to create this video, featuring Serena Williams playing a tennis match against her 16-year-old self. The game was the result of more than 130,000 games generated using vid-to-player techniques. Coca-Cola owned sports drink Body Armor poked fun at AI content in a recent Super Bowl ad. Artificial flavor optimized for victory times. Artificial? No. Major fashion brands like Revolve are using AI generated models on some billboards. Ad agencies say this trend is growing mostly because it saves brands big bucks. But some wonder at what cost. And we could see this campaign evolve into some action. Lawmakers in the House are considering bipartisan legislation that would require any online images, video, or audio generated using artificial intelligence to be identified and labeled. But as of now, there are no rules when it comes to the use of this technology. And Savannah, experts say that would be a good start, but that consuming this kind of content can still be dangerous mm. for impressionable young minds. It's so true. It's, it, this is good to see. Kaylee Hartung, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us live. Let's get to some financial headlines. General Motors is revving up its robo-taxi project. Again, CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with more on that. Hey, Silvana, good morning. 
Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, so General Motors self-driving car business is getting ready to resume testing with Throbo Taxis with safety drivers in Phoenix. So Cruz suspended operations last year after Bloomberg says it's been in talks with officials in 20 metro areas where it previously tested cars. The company has been working to restore public trust after one of its cars struck and dragged a pedestrian in San Francisco last fall. That eventually led California regulators to pull its license in the state. The airline industry is struggling with a lack of planes ahead of a summer travel season that could hit record levels. Airlines are spending billions of dollars to repair and maintain older and less fuel efficient planes and paying a premium to secure aircraft from leasing companies and some have had to trim their schedules. Deliveries of new planes have dropped sharply due to production problems at Boeing and Airbus. And Target has launched its new membership program as it takes on Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus, Target Circle 360. It costs $49 a year for now, but the price will increase to $99 when the promotional period ends on May 18th. Members will be able to get same-day delivery for food, clothes, and most other products on orders of at least $35. They can also get same-day delivery from more than 100 of Target's retail partners, including Ulta Beauty, Petco, and Sephora Savannah. Just All right, another so subscription service. The, uh, right? I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, we've got quite a bit. All right, so yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, now let's get to the story of a family-run burger business with a devoted following. In-N-Out Burger is iconic, and for a lot of people, it's the very first stop when they arrive on the West Coast, or home in my case. But while you may know their burgers, you might not know their story, or the woman who's now running the show. Lindsay Snyder is not your average president of a multi-billion dollar company, but In-N-Out Burger is not your average fast food chain. That's Founded in 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder, it all started as a little hamburger stand with a pioneering drive through speaker system. My grandparents, you know, came from very humble beginnings. Now, they have 402 stores across eight states, and they've amassed quite the following, even with the rich and famous. They all have a plate cheeseburger with light onions. Current President Lindsay Snyder grew up at In-N-Out, but her path to leadership has no shortage of twists and turns. And it really was like that family pain and tragedy that really put each leader in its place. After Harry died in 1976, Esther handed control to Lindsay's uncle, Rich, but he was killed in a plane crash. The next leader, Lindsay's father, died of an overdose. At just 17, Lindsay was the only blood relative left. She started just like every other employee. You waited two hours to apply to work at a new store in Redding, California, even though your family began in and out is that right i think that there's a stigma that can come with being you know the owner's kid and just wanting to be respected like others doing it the right way and not having the special treatment at 27 years old lindsay stepped into the role of president of in and out burger you were very young when you come in to this now multi-billion dollar corporation what's this been like for you in the earlier days i actually wore um, pantsuits and I did that because I felt like I was supposed to and then I finally you know just was confident in who I am and who I'm not you're gonna get judged either way so you might as well be judged for being who you are she's made specific and strategic choices especially in an age of inflation and increasing minimum wage how do you keep those prices and keep a profit margin I was sitting in VP meetings going toe-to-toe -to -toe saying we can't raise the prices that much we can't you know because i felt such an obligation to look out for our customer when everyone else was taking these jumps we weren't when you think about innovation or tech or artificial intelligence where does that intersect with in and out no to mobile ordering um, because that greatly impacts the customer service experience there's a lot of things that could be cheaper easier and all, but that's not that's not the system we go through. I know your faith is important to you. It is proudly a part of this company, a Bible versus on most pieces of packaging. Well, my uncle started it with the verses on the packaging and, you know, he felt we're a family company, we're a private company, and, you know, this is who we are, and I'm unashamed of my faith. You're a private company. <laughs> as long as you're here, will that stay that way? Absolutely. 
Because you get calls all the time. Yeah, messages, emails, Instagram <laughs> messages. People DM to buy the company. Basically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not interested in franchising? No. <laughs> what about an IPO? No. It's staying in the family and the menu staying simple, except for those in the know. Their famous secret menu includes animal style burgers and fries, named for the rowdy teens who would order extra spread pickles and grilled onions back in the day. Another favorite? The famous Flying Dutchman. You know, the Flying Dutchman was my dad's burger. Two meat patties with two slices of cheese, and um, his nickname was the Flying Dutchman. What's your order? Mine is double meat with pickles, spread, and chopped chilies only. A burger that keeps customers coming back for more. Looking at 75 years, so many customers that have made us who we are today. It's just incredible. So there's just so much gratitude. Who's hungry, right? All right, the burning question, where will they head next? I asked about expanding to the East Coast. Lindsay said, as long as she's around, the answer is probably never, but not necessarily. I never say never. As for the future and the legacy of the company, Lindsay's oldest son has now jumped into the family burger business. By the way, you can learn more secrets of the business in Lindsay's book, The Ins and Outs of In and Out Burger. Coming up, back to back champs. UConn's Huskies are once again the kings of college basketball this morning after a dramatic championship matchup last night, beating out fellow top seed Purdue for their second straight national title. We've got all the highlights and the celebrations up next. Report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. NBC News Daily is number one for afternoon news across all of television. I'm Morgan Radford. I'm Vicki Wynn. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zinclair Samoan. What's happening around the world? Israel's military is building up there along the border. And what matters here at home? New numbers are out today showing more encouraging signs for our economy. Let's zero in on exercise. We know we're supposed to be doing it. What does it do for our health? What needs to change for social media to be a safer place? NBC News Daily, weekdays from 12 to 4 on NBC News Now. Studio. Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Democracy is happening. Now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. 
Welcome back. She's the bad guy, and she's back with another album. Singer Billie Eilish just announced her third full-length project. It's called Hit Me Hard and Soft. Fans even got a sneak peek of the cover art on Instagram, where she just gained millions of new followers in a matter of days after word got out that she was adding her followers to her close friends list. That's the thing on Instagram where you can see specific things posted only for certain people. Well, it's been three years since Eilish released her last album, Happier Than Ever, back in 2021. But it's been anything but slow rolling for the nine-time Grammy winner between co-writing her hit song, What Was I Made For, for the Barbie movie soundtrack, and then winning an Oscar for it. Let's just say she's been busy. Well, there is no stopping her. The new album drops on May 17th. Her voice is out of control amazing, so I cannot wait for that. All right, let's stay on some music. This ain't Texas, but it is Beyonce's world. That's right, Queen Bee has just made music history as the first black woman to ever lead Billboard's top country album charts just two weeks after releasing her eighth studio album, Cowboy Carter. Marcus Dowling is back with me again to talk about Beyonce's latest feat. He's the Nashville country music reporter for the Tennessee. And Marcus, welcome back. I'm so excited to get to talk with you with this incredible news because you joined us the day that Beyonce released Cowboy Carter, two weeks later, leading the charts. How significant is this moment? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an unbelievable moment, but it speaks more to the potential of the dynamic power of genre bending music being actualized i think that that's the the biggest takeaway of uh, cowboy carter's success so far beyonce's often referenced of course her texas roots throughout her career i mean that that is well known she is proud of it we hear about houston in a lot of her songs how does this album blend you know kind of her background where she came from with that iconic Beyonce sound that we've come to know that was decidedly not country right and now she's kind of switched to this do you think this is firmly a country album tell us about the sound here I'd say that it is a firmly country album in the sense that it plays well with the traditions of folk and bluegrass and uh contemporary country for the last 50 years uh, there's pieces of that all throughout this uh this album and it's the sense that uh, Beyonce is uh, aware and cognizant of black artists' spaces within the, the history of country music and uh, more so being in conversation with that more so than anything else. I think that's the most important takeaway there. Absolutely. One of the coolest things I think about this album are these collaborations. Uh, first, I just want to say, I think my favorite song on the album is the song with Miley Cyrus, Two Most Wanted. Do you have a favorite song? Right. I have to ask you that first. Do you have a favorite song? Oh, gosh. Well, it changes day by day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I'd say that, yeah, for me currently, it's uh, it's Spaghetti with mm. uh, Shibuzi and uh, Linda Martell. I'd also uh, say that the, uh, the the fascination of Blackbird being uh, five African-American female voices, it's Beyonce along with Tanner Riddell and Britney Spencer and mm -hmm. Raina Roberts and Tierra Kennedy. I think that's just a, a cool thing that opens up the door for young black women worldwide to be able to have space to be able to sing together and to do any country music is a really cool thing. Big time. And I know that you've actually been speaking to some of these featured artists on the album, kind of just about what this is doing for them. Tell us what they're telling Absolutely. you. Absolutely. They're, they're excited. Uh, if, if you look at, say, uh, all of these artists, for instance, I, I would limit it, but it, it's actually unlimited. The, uh, the <laughs> scope of being an artist who makes music ideally for uh, the broader audience, but because of a number of counteracting issues, uh, you end up making it for a smaller audience that's typically online and for 200 to 500 person venues when a 32 time Grammy award winning artist takes uh, awareness and appreciation of your art and your craft and, and also just the amount of uh, sweat equity that's put into your work and then puts you on her album and your, your streams grow and your renown grows and your visibility grows, I think it's a win for everybody involved. Absolutely. Is Beyonce pushing the country genre forward? Is she changing it? What's her impact? Well, Luke Bryan likes the album and, and Lainey mm -hmm. Wilson likes the album. And then obviously Willie Nelson likes the album and uh, Dolly Parton does too. So <laughs> I think that minimally the, the awareness has grown exponentially for uh, for extraordinary change in the genre. And I think that the artists who are on the ground, the ones who were just referenced, uh, getting more opportunities. Like Britney Spencer was just in a duet with uh, Parker McCollum at the CMT Awards on uh, Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And you know, just moments like that and just increasing people's comfort with the potential of what uh, broad-based uh, equity looks like in country music. Oh. I think that's the, the, the greatest part of this. 
Absolutely. It's so fun, too, when you hear her say, it's Dolly P, and you actually hear her voice on this album, too. It's very neat. Right. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. So fun to get to talk about this. Incredible to see this happen. We appreciate you coming back to us. Absolutely. It's sincerely a pleasure. Anytime. Talk to you soon. UConn fans are enjoying a bit of deja vu this morning now that its men's basketball team capped off one of the most exciting March Madness tournaments to date with a historic victory. The Huskies beat top-seeded Purdue 75-60 to in a thrilling national title game, becoming the first men's team to win back-to-back -back championships in 17 years. NBC News correspondent Sam Brack has been following the tournament for us. He joins us from Miami with the very latest here. Sam, good morning. Savannah, good morning. I know you've been following this very closely. And yes, UConn, you might say they are the bluest of blue bloods this morning. You talked about the two best teams playing each other. It's where that actually happens, UConn and Purdue. They certainly have the two largest human beings on the court. Now, Purdue, this was the first time in more than 50 years, Savannah, they made the national title game. They just happened to run into a buzzsaw that is the UConn Huskies, who won back-to-back -back titles on the men's side for the first time in almost two decades. It was as sweet and about as close to a short thing as you can get. It is a UConn coronation. The Huskies make history. Back-to-back -back national champions. A storied basketball power, UConn, putting a bow on a dominant tournament run. All year we, we uh, set out to make this a goal and go back-to-back, -back and, you know, that's what we did tonight. The Huskies vanquishing Purdue 75-60 with rim-rocking slams. And crafty play, clinching the program's sixth national title all time, tying with North Carolina, and now one more than Duke and Indiana. In the process, becoming the first men's squad to win consecutive trophies since the Florida Gators in 2007. What a special group of people, a special coaching staff, uh, an incredible group of players. Overnight in stores, Connecticut, students packing Gamble Pavilion for an on-campus watch party, cheering their team to victory. And overcoming 37 points from 7'4 National Player of the Year, Zach Eady. The Huskies leaving no doubt about their on-court bona fides. The victory coming as South Carolina's women's team returning to their Columbia campus, champions. They did it in a way in which they lifted up each other. After defeating the Hawkeyes, though Iowa superstar Caitlin Clark still racked up points and eyeballs. That game shattering records, the most watched sporting event outside of the Olympics or football since 2019. We need three things in sports, household names, rivalries, and games of consequence, and March Madness had all of that. Now the UConn men claiming their victory after a banner year for college hoops. And Savannah, the UConn Huskies, now the men have won 12 consecutive tournament games by at least 13 points. That had never happened before. And Coach Hurley has them in position now. They are the favorites for next year to win the title as well. And I am so sorry that I don't have a basketball to, to crush a three-pointer for you right now. Next time, though, Savannah, I got you 100%. Mm -hmm. Back to you. Yeah, we, we all heard it bouncing, though, in your intro. So you could have asked, but you decided not to, maybe because you're scared. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't want to humiliate myself again. That is correct. I did ask him to do that for y'all. Sam Brock, thank you very much. We appreciate it. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe Fryer is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, a celestial spectacle for the ages. Americans from Texas to Maine and beyond will show you the celebrations across the country from yesterday's jaw-dropping total solar eclipse and the front row seat mid-air. You'll have to see to believe. Also, former President Trump is under fire from both sides of the aisle this morning after taking a state-by-state -state stance on abortion in a social media post. Voices on the right now saying it's not going far enough, while those on the left are unsure whether he'd change his mind if he takes the White House again. We'll bring you the latest. Also this morning, we'll dig into how artificial intelligence is impacting the beauty industry, the pledge one popular name is making to keep beauty real. 
And kings of the dance, the Yukon Huskies are back on top this morning, besting Purdue last night for their second straight national title. We've got all the highlights later in the hour. But of course, we're going to get started with what everyone can't stop talking about this morning, myself included, the solar eclipse. Did you see it? Millions of Americans in cities across the country sure did. They came together to take in the joy and wonder of one of the most anticipated celestial events of the year. I took it all in right here in New York City, across the street at Radio City Music Hall, along with crowds of New Yorkers who stopped their day to get a glimpse. Look at this. It was so cool. We had only actually 89% totality here. But it still was so incredible to witness and certainly incredible to be with a crowd like that in the streets of Manhattan. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello is in Indianapolis, Indiana, one of the best places to see the total eclipse. Yeah, good morning. I mean, what a phenomenal day. And we had spectacular weather here in Indianapolis in the heartland. 75 degrees, blue skies absolutely perfect for the moment of totality. You know, nationwide, hundreds of millions of people collectively saw this together. And people were speechless, people were crying. Some people got married underneath the eclipse. A lot of people just held hands and they were quietly watching this together as we all enjoyed the singular moment of celestial alignment. It's the moment that left millions of Americans in total awe. Look at this! Whoa! Yeah! Is this exciting? Yes, this is so incredible! It's amazing! From Texas to Maine, a once-in-a-lifetime experience and a collective pause to take in one of nature's greatest phenomena. You know, Tom, you and I cover a lot of... Uh... A lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is uh, this is magical. It is. I think it's a it's a moment in which all of us feel connected to each other as members of the human family, but also to the galaxy. Millions of Americans gathering across the path of totality, stretching through 15 states. In Cleveland, baseball fans at the Guardians' home opener were treated to an out-of-this-world pregame show unlike any other. Our NBC team also watched from around the country. Three, two, one! Even a partial eclipse stunned New Yorkers. You walk through New York City and everyone is doing the same yeah. thing yeah. Yeah. collectively. Right? Well, not looking at their phones, they're yes. looking at us. And totality inspiring wonder. Look, we can see Venus. From Texas. What was it like uh, to see that, babe? Emotional. Brought tears through my eyes. To 20,000 feet up in the air over Arkansas. Now it's like this sunrise, but the, but the sunrise is a color I've never seen before. It is like a, a deep purple. And check out this spectacular view from an orbiting Starlink satellite for NASA, an incredible learning opportunity. So one of the things we were really looking at today was the corona. The moon blocked out the sun so that we could see that part of the sun's atmosphere. We were also looking a lot at how the eclipse effect, affected Earth. So we had a citizen science project that looked at how the eclipse changed temperatures and clouds. An emotional and magical experience. Wow. There's Venus, there's Jupiter, there's Mars. For people to pause and look up at the sky. It's like a once in a lifetime thing, you know? Yeah, you know what else was nice about this? Despite all the divisions in this country, nobody was talking politics. Nobody was talking about social divisions. This was a moment when we all came together, kind of in a shared humanity, uh, and really just kind of uh, leaned on each other and celebrated together. And that was really refreshing. Uh, we're not going to have another total eclipse in this country until 2044. Here in Indianapolis, 2153 is the next total eclipse. I've already booked my hotel room because I know you guys are going to want me back. But uh, what a spectacular experience. By the way, more total eclipses around the world if you want to chase them throughout the rest of this century. Back to you. Yeah, Tom Costello, those eclipse chasers, it's so neat. Thank you so much. Well, while tens of millions of Americans took in the eclipse on the ground, a few lucky people were able to enjoy it from the sky. Courtney Kazaya snapped these pictures from onboard a Delta flight. From, look at how beautiful that is. From Austin to Detroit, this passed through the path of totality this morning. We are lucky enough to have Courtney here with us. Tell us all about it. Courtney, thanks for joining us. What an incredible experience. We understand the flight that you were on sold out 24 hours after Delta announced. Announced it. Tell us, how did you manage to get on this flight? 
Well, I knew about it because I have a really good friend who's a Delta enthusiast, and she let me know that Delta tweeted that they would be flying this route. So I tried to get on, grab a seat. Unfortunately, it was sold out. However, they opened another route going from Dallas to Detroit. And once they did that, I thought, you know what? I bet there are going to be some seats that open on the Austin to Detroit. So sure enough, I went in, and they had released more seats. So I was able to snag one. That's so cool. So what was the mood like on the plane? It was really like a huge celebration. It was like a party plane. Everyone was excited to be there. Um, there were celebrations at the departure gate as well as the arrival gate with balloons, a DJ, et cetera. It was so fun. And tell us what it was like when you actually did see this eclipse in the sky. What was that moment like? I mean, you snapped these beautiful pictures. Tell us when you realized, okay, this is happening right now and I'm up in the sky with this. <laughs> well, so the pilot um, obviously came over to the PA and he announced that we would be um, approaching the path of totality. And we all were uh, getting anxious as the, the atmosphere um, was changing. You could kind of sense this energy. So everything started to go dark. And then the pilots had rehearsed this maneuver where the right side of the plane would get to see uh, part of the eclipse, and then they did a dip and turned the plane so that the people on the left side would be able to view it as well. So everyone was just, you know, in awe and gasping, and it was just so much fun. That is so cool that they made sure that you could all see it and turn the plane like that. It was each time were cheers breaking out on the plane? Yes. So full-on claps and everyone shouting, and it was just so much fun. Um, Everyone was just really excited to be there. Okay, Courtney, something also that you shared with us when we were able to talk with you before you were live on our show is something that I just find so funny, so I have to ask you about it. That there were, what did you say, about seven people who had no idea this was the flight they signed up for. They were just trying to go from Austin to Detroit. Correct, yes. Uh, the flight attendant did a poll at the beginning of the flight to ask, you know, are there any people on this flight that were not aware this was an eclipse flight? And it's <laughs> about seven people raised their hand. So I'm sure that that was a, a, a welcome surprise. Well, hopefully a welcome surprise anyway. <laughs> I just can't even imagine like the confusion and then the fun and then just all the things if it's not what you were planning for. It's so funny to me. Also, I understand love was in the air, right? Yes. About 15 minutes after we passed through uh, the path of totality, um, we heard cheers coming from the back of the plane. And my friend and I turned around and we're like, what's going on? And it turns out a man had just proposed to his girlfriend. Um, oh. So that was very exciting to witness as well. She said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Courtney, yeah. that is just so much fun. I seriously, I don't know why. I hope other people think it's as funny as I do imagining those seven walking up to the gate with balloons. It's just such a funny thing. Courtney, because I what a cool experience. I'm so happy for you that you got a seat on that plane, and thanks for sharing it with us. Thanks for having me, Savannah. You got it. Have a good one. All right, let's talk weather. Severe weather is headed our way. It's going to bring rain across the south while unseasonably warm temperatures are going to hit the northeast. Michelle Grossman is here to walk us through it all. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Great to see you. And yes, we are looking at stormy, stormy weather once again in the south. Started yesterday, and this is a slow moving front. So we're going to be dealing with this for a couple of days in spots. And we're talking heavy rain, flooding rains, a chance for severe storms, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour, and even the chance of some tornadoes. So that's going on in the south. Uh, rain and storms extend all the way up to portions of the Ohio Valley. Again, this will move off to the east over the next couple of days. Behind this front, though, we've cleared out in the northern plains, sunny and mild. We're looking at some showers and some snow showers in parts of the Pacific Net Northwest into the Intermountain West. The southwest looks good with lots of sunshine and mild temperatures as well. But this is the focus of weather today because we are looking at really active weather in the south into the lower Mississippi Valley, portions of the southeast, the Gulf Coast. Uh, heavy rain is falling right now. It's been falling for hours and pretty much training over the same area. Uh, that means we're going to look at the chance for flooding, and we have seen flash flooding this morning. Looking at some lightning, too, hearing the thunder out there, where you're looking at those bright colors on the map here, that's where the heaviest rain is falling. And notice it's sort of just like a plume of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, and that's where we're seeing it over the same areas. And even the panhandle of Texas now seeing another batch of really heavy rain. So today, 22 million people at risk for severe storms. That means we're going to see some really large hail once again, three inches or greater. What is 
does that mean? That's about softball size hail. That can cause some damage on its own. A few tornadoes are possible. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Especially where you see those dark, uh, the oranges, the yellows. That's where we're looking at the chance, the likeliest chance for seeing some strong storms. Dallas, San Angelo, Waco, Houston, San Antonio, Alexandria. I know you went through this yesterday, but you're going to have to keep your eye to the sky for some storms. And we are looking to Savannah for the risk of EF2 or larger. Tomorrow we could see a tornado outbreak with some really large storms and then another chance for storms on Thursday. So we have some really busy days over the next few days. We sure do. Michelle Grossman, thank you so much. Sure. Well, there's new fallout this morning from former President Donald Trump's announcement that his view on on abortion, that the policy should be left to the states. The former president made the comments yesterday in a post on the social media platform Truth Social. It immediately drew criticism from the left and right. NBC's Garrett Haight covers the Trump campaign and has the latest. Hey, Savannah. Good morning. Donald Trump had teased this announcement for weeks, but his promise of a hands-off approach to legislating on the issue now has him taking fire from every side of this debate. As the right says he's refusing to protect the unborn, the left fears he'll change his mind again and would support states enacting draconian abortion bans. Donald Trump is under fire this morning from across the political spectrum after unveiling his latest stance on abortion. Leave any restrictions to the states. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others and that's what they will be. The former president also claiming credit for the 2022 Supreme Court decision backed by three Trump appointed justices that overturned Roe v. Wade and returned the abortion issue to the states, some of which have enacted near total bans on the procedure. President Biden responding in this campaign video. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. This is just filled with some of the things. The president's campaign also releasing a new ad highlighting the story of a Texas woman denied medical care after a miscarriage, placing blame on the state's strict abortion ban passed after Roe was overturned. Mr. Trump's stance also criticized from the right, including by his former VP, Mike Pence, who slammed him on social media for not calling for a national ban, writing, quote, President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans who voted for him in 2016 and 2020. For Mr. Trump, Monday's announcement, the latest step in a long public evolution on abortion. I'm very pro-choice. I'm pro-life. Do you believe in punishment for abortion, yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. Both sides are going to come together. It could be state or it could be federal. I don't frankly care. Mr. Trump has long said he's personally in favor of allowing abortions in cases of rape, incest, and protecting the life of the mother. But his new policy doesn't even allow for a national way to enshrine those protections, opening him up to still more criticism. Savannah? All right, Garrett Haig, thank you so much. Well, there's much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including a story close to my California heart, my conversation with the woman who is behind one of America's most popular fast food chains. There's a little hint, you saw some of it there. First, though, heightening tensions in the Middle East this morning. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu defying President Biden, setting a date for a Rafah invasion. We will bring you the latest up next. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. What is going to happen now? We're back and forth. Go ahead. This is it. Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Democracy is happening. Now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024. Who's your candidate? The race is on. 
now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses, by the man with the riches. All right, it just did too. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Tensions between the U.S. and Israel are continuing to grow this morning after Prime Minister Netanyahu said a date has been set to send his defense forces into Rafah. That is in defiance of President Biden. The move comes as ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas are once again stalled. Hamas leaders are now saying the latest proposals from Israel did not meet their demands. Here in the U.S., Vice President Kamala Harris is set to meet today with families whose loved ones were taken hostage. It's been just over six months since those hostages were taken into Gaza by Hamas terrorists. NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us from London with the details here. Megan, good morning. So what more do we know at this point about Netanyahu's plan to carry out this operation in Rafah? We've heard about this for quite some time now. There's been so much pushback. Tell us how yep. the U.S. is responding and the details we have. Well, look, Israel's prime minister has repeatedly said that there will be an invasion of Rafah. He went a step further yesterday in a video message saying it will happen and that a date has been set. Now, Netanyahu has been very vocal about Rafah being what he describes as the last stronghold of Hamas and how a ground invasion is needed to complete this war. But again, you know, the, the big concern here is that we're talking about more than a million people that are sheltering in Rafah, displaced from other parts of the enclave. Uh, the United States has been very clear that a ground operation would be a mistake, that President Biden has even called it a red line and has demanded a plan from Israel on how they would protect those civilians. We are hearing from State Department spokesman uh, Matthew Miller, and I want you to take a listen to a little bit of what he had to say. We have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. So it's not just a question of Israel presenting uh, a plan to us. We have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. So despite warnings from the U.S., Israel's closest ally, Netanyahu, says a date in to invade Rafah has been set. And though he stopped short of any details on exactly when that attack would happen. Guys. Megan, we are also learning new details about those ceasefire negotiations, as I mentioned, in Egypt. Hamas leaders say Israel's latest proposal doesn't meet their demands. What do we know about this this morning? Remind us what Hamas is looking for in these talks. Yeah, so we actually have new reporting from our Hala Garani, who's on the ground in Israel. Uh, we're hearing from a source in the Israeli prime minister's office that beyond issues like the return of hostages and the length of a ceasefire, a major sticking point here in Cairo negotiations are centered around the return of Palestinians to northern Gaza. Uh, Hala has confirmed with the source that Hamas representatives are asking for the complete unfettered return of all Palestinians to the northern half of the besieged enclave. 
uh, and that, according to this source, Israeli negotiators are instead demanding airport-style security checks on anyone traveling back to the north and have so far agreed only to a significantly reduced number of authorized returnees. Now, Hamas releasing a statement last night saying that they're keen to reach an agreement that stops the fighting, but that Israel remains stubborn and has not responded to any of their demands. Guys. And also, meanwhile, Han Yunus residents have started returning to the area after Israeli troops pulled out of the region. That's another city where many people, in fact, who lived there, who were from there, had moved to areas such as Rafah. What are we hearing on the ground now as people return there? How serious is the damage left behind? Are people, where are they going? Yeah, so Savannah, you know, I had an opportunity to uh, keep in touch with a family who escaped Gaza. Uh, I've talked to them about this, and they said that, uh, of course, they're in the U.K. now, but they have family and friends still in Gaza. And what she told me is that Han Yunus is unrecognizable. People are returning to complete devastation. Uh, she said up until now, some of her family held out hope that their homes would still be intact. But now that people are returning, the reality is settling in, is setting in, rather, that there's really just nothing left. People are struggling to find where they had their homes because of the destruction and the rubble of the buildings that are still standing. They're gutted. People are digging through the rubble, desperate to find anything uh, from the life that they lived before this war broke out. Mm. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you for your reporting. Well, a British man has completed the run of a lifetime. Russ Cook spent the last year running nearly 10,000 miles through Africa, all in the name of charity. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has the details. Breathless but triumphant, 27-year-old Russ Cook completing a monumental challenge, running the length of Africa. Very good, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> That's almost 10,000 miles, or roughly the equivalent of 376 marathons over 352 days. I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. The realization that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two-month-old in the time he's done this. The UK native crossing the finish line at the northern tip of the continent in Los Angeles, Tunisia, on Sunday. After a grueling and at times perilous journey across 16 countries, starting at the southernmost point in Cape Agula, South Africa, last April. Day 337. Cook documenting his journey on social media as he tackled different climates and terrains. But he also had to deal with unpredictable and dangerous scenarios. He says in Angola he was robbed at gunpoint of his passport and phones, and that in Congo he escaped locals armed with machetes by paying them off. The scariest moment was... Uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was that was pretty nuts. That terrifying ordeal even making him consider quitting. Probably for about one minute thought about quitting and then I realised I couldn't. So that's about as close as he ever got. And if all that wasn't challenging enough, he was initially denied a visa crossing into Algeria from Mauritania when he turned to social media for help. I've been following him since he first started from the very beginning. His supporters finishing with him on the last leg in awe of the man who also ran from Asia to London three years ago. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I was laying on my couch. 20 minutes later, I bought the ticket and here I am. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. His run, dubbed as Project Africa, raising almost $900,000 and will go towards two charities. I'm a big believer in sport, doing wonders for people's lives, and um, it changed my life. Though Russ has more in store, for now, he's just looking to unwind. I've got a whole list of ideas. But, yeah, no, I definitely i am keen to chill out for, for a moment, like spend some time with the family and stuff. Yeah. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Coming up, more legal trouble for controversial country star Morgan Wallen. What his fans are now saying after the artist was arrested in Nashville on Monday for allegedly throwing a chair off of a rooftop bar. Stay with us. That's up next. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. 
Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News lives in the now. It's coming at us every second. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on. Now is real. We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. You gotta see this. Future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Democracy is happening. Now, welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We are back now with a closer look at the recent headlines involving crime here in New York City. You might have seen these viral videos, people being attacked on the subway, even on the sidewalks of the Big Apple. But the city's top cop says those fears don't reflect reality. For more, we are joined by NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas. He sat down exclusively with the police commissioner here. Tom, good morning. Thanks for joining us on this. Savannah, great to be with you here this morning. According to the NYPD, crime is actually coming down in most metrics. But when you talk to New Yorkers or read the papers, it feels like a much different story. I sat down with the commissioner of the NYPD who rose from the ranks of a beat cop in the South Bronx to now leading a police department larger than most armies. He told me fighting crime in New York now is even tougher than when he started. From mayhem on the subways to unprovoked attacks on women to a young police officer shot and killed in the line of duty. These headlines and viral videos paint a picture of a big city with a big problem. New York City went from clean and safe to dirty and dangerous. What happened in New York City? January 2022, New York City was up in crime over 48 percent, up in violence. And we looked at just making more felony arrests. And slowly by slowly, the violence began to come down. Edward Caban is in charge of the NYPD and it's more than 35,000 police officers. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, he says crime is trending down in New York City, but not fast enough because of repeat offenders. We're seeing that we're locking up the same people over and over again. In his most forceful statements yet, the NYPD commissioner calling bail reform laws ineffective. We lock someone up, district attorney puts bail on them, the judges let them go to walk our streets again. It's a broken system. A system that has come into sharper focus after the killing of Detective Jonathan Diller, allegedly by two career criminals with long records. How many more police officers and how many more families need to make the ultimate sacrifice before we start protecting them? Is she right? Absolutely. You know, that's the one thing that no police commissioner wants to do during their tenure is bury one of their own whether it's a family of blood or a family of blue, it hurts to the core. Part of Commissioner Caban's mission now, separating perception versus reality. According to NYPD stats, overall crime is down in the city and subways, but that's not how many New Yorkers feel about their own safety. I want my legacy to be 
that New Yorkers felt not only that they were safe, but that they felt safe too. Because they don't feel that way. I'm not doing my job. Now, bail reform advocates argue it helps the poor who are disproportionately jailed because they don't have the means to post bail. But in New York, it seems the governor, who is a Democrat, has seen enough, recently announcing reforms to hold violent criminals accountable, giving more power to judges to put offenders in jail. There are more than a dozen states right now currently debating legislation over bail reforms. The commissioner, who is the first Hispanic to run the department, is also working to tackle two other major issues here of concern, right? Safety on the subway, but also the migrant crisis, which we will have, Savannah, much more of later tonight. Yeah, that's right, because you can see more, right? This is going to be, there's going to be on NBC Nightly News as well, of course, your own show, Top Story with Tom Yamastein. Is that right? So it, that is right, and it's one of the great shows people have said that it, that it has ever been broadcast. That's so. true. You should just Some keep the TV on that. now or your computer, whatever, all the way through 8 p.m. tonight. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. Really, though, you, interesting thank as a you. New Yorker to hear his perspective yeah. on this because we are seeing a lot of those videos. We appreciate you coming by. Thanks yeah. for being here early. Well, country music star Morgan Wallen is facing his latest controversy behind bars this morning. The singer was arrested yesterday after he allegedly threw a chair off a rooftop bar in Nashville over the weekend. Here with more is NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas. Chloe, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. You know, Morgan Wallen's career, it has been a roller coaster ride of ups and downs, and this latest incident threatening the rise of this country star. The question is, what are his fans saying now? The latest controversy for one of country music's biggest stars, Morgan Wallen. The chart topping singer arrested after allegedly throwing a chair off of a six story bar in the center of Nashville's bustling entertainment district early Monday morning. Police reviewed surveillance footage they say shows Wallen lunging and throwing an object over the roof, the chair falling just a few feet from two officers standing below. Bystanders posting police carrying the chair later. The singer was released after posting an over $15,000 bond. He now faces felony charges for reckless endangerment and disorderly conduct. His lawyer telling NBC News Wallen is cooperating fully with authorities. As now we let the the 30-year-old Tennessee native has had a meteoric rise since his debut on the country music scene in 2016 with two chart-topping albums, with his most recent one, One Thing at a Time, breaking the record for the country album with the most weeks at the top of the Billboard 200 chart. But Wallen's musical success has been frequently overshadowed by his controversial behavior, including a 2020 arrest for public intoxication and disorderly conduct. Prosecutors dropped the charges. Less than five months later, Wallen was dropped from his SNL debut for violating COVID protocols. I have some growing up to do. Two months later, they brought him back. I am you from the future, and I came back here to stop you from partying tonight. The following year, his career taking a major hit after he was caught on camera using a racial slur, his record label and radio stations temporarily dropping him, Wallen spending time in rehab away from the spotlight. I was wrong. But throughout, fans stayed loyal. His One Night at a Time tour was the highest grossing country tour of 2023. But will this latest run-in with the law shake his fan base? He's just a heck of a singer, never made a bad song, but he seriously needs some help. So Wallen, he's expected back in court on May 3rd in Nashville, Savannah. And this is actually going to happen just hours before he's set to take the stage at his latest tour stop, also in Nashville. So we'll see if that tour stop even happens on May 3rd. But he's also touring through the summer. Yeah, Chloe Milos, really interesting there. Obviously, a lot of fans interested in what is going on exactly. Thank you so much for that. Coming up, a closer look at artificial intelligence and the beauty industry. The pledge one popular company is making to keep beauty real. That is all right after this break. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now.
the NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. How is it that traffic was stopped in time? State law enforcement officers, they undoubtedly save lives. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> I apologize for the many questions. We'll never be questioned. <laughs> Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Welcome back. The use of artificial intelligence in the advertising industry is growing at a fast pace, really in all industries. But now some experts are estimating that as much as 90% of the content we see on the internet could be generated by AI, get this, as soon as next year. Well, one beauty brand is taking a stand against the technology in its latest advertisement. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung joins us for more on this. Kaylee, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. You're right. Personal care brand Dove has committed to never use AI to represent real people in its advertising. And they've released a video exclusively to NBC News to make the big announcement. They say it illustrates the type of perfect images young girls and women are increasingly inundated with online and in ads, making it impossible to distinguish between what's real and what's not. As part of their Keep Beauty Real campaign, personal care brand Dove has released this two minute video. It features images of AI generated women that pop up online when you search terms like perfect skin and the most beautiful woman in the world. They then compare those to images generated under Dove's beauty standards, as well as the faces of real women. It's part of the company's pledge to never use AI to create or distort images of women, a pledge they hope other companies will also consider signing on to. A global beauty study by Dove found that 9 out of 10 women and girls say they've been exposed to harmful beauty content online. And 1 in 3 say they feel pressure to alter their appearance because of what they see online, even when they know it's fake. AI-generated images in the beauty space is a growing concern, especially for parents. I'm disgusted, horrified. Naveen Radwan says she believes altered images of women on social media contributed to her teenage daughter's anorexia. What are they going to do to themselves when they try to attain a level of perfection that doesn't even exist? Earlier this year, more than 12,000 parents signed an online petition urging TikTok to more clearly label AI-generated influencers over concerns that showing things like flawless skin and perfect bodies creates extreme and utterly unattainable beauty standards for children. It might say, hey, this isn't a real picture. This person actually didn't look like this. But subconsciously, your brain saying, yep. That's what I'm supposed to look like. They're very bad for our well-being and our mental health. 
Clothing brand Levi Strauss reversed course after facing major backlash over an announcement it planned to experiment with AI-generated body-inclusive avatars like this image on their app and website. Nike promoted its use of advanced AI to create this video, featuring Serena Williams playing a tennis match against her 16-year-old self. The game was the result of more than 130,000 games generated using vid-to-player technique. Coca-Cola owned sports drink Body Armor poked fun at AI content in a recent Super Bowl ad. Artificial flavor optimized for victory times. Artificial? No. Major fashion brands like Revolve are using AI generated models on some billboards. Ad agencies say this trend is growing mostly because it saves brands big bucks. But some wonder at what cost. And we could see this campaign evolve into some action. Lawmakers in the House are considering bipartisan legislation that would require any online images, video, or audio generated using artificial intelligence to be identified and labeled. But as of now, there are no rules when it comes to the use of this technology. And Savannah, experts say that would be a good start, but that consuming this kind of content can still be dangerous for impressionable young minds. It's so true. It's, it, this is good to see. Kaylee Hartung, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us live. Let's get to some financial headlines. General Motors is revving up its robo-taxi project. Again, CNBC's Silvana Hanau turns us with more on that. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. Yeah, so General Motors self-driving car business is getting ready to resume testing with robo taxis with safety drivers in Phoenix. So crews suspended operations last year after Bloomberg says it's been in talks with officials in 20 metro areas where it previously tested cars. The company has been working to restore public trust after one of its cars struck and dragged a pedestrian in San Francisco last fall. That eventually led California regulators to pull its license in the state. The airline industry is struggling with a lack of planes ahead of a summer travel season that could hit record levels. Airlines are spending billions of dollars to repair and maintain older and less fuel efficient planes and paying a premium to secure aircraft from leasing companies and some have had to trim their schedules. Deliveries of new planes have dropped sharply due to production problems at Boeing and Airbus. And Target has launched its new membership program as it takes on Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus. Target Circle 360. It costs $49 a year for now, but the price will increase to $99 when the promotional period ends on May 18th. Members will be able to get same-day delivery for food, clothes, and most other products on orders of at least $35. They can also get same-day delivery from more than 100 of Target's retail partners, including Ulta Beauty, Petco, and Sephora. Savannah, just All right, another so subscription service. The, uh, right, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, we've got quite a bit. All right, Savannah, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Well, now let's get to the story of a family-run burger business with a devoted following. In-N-Out Burger is iconic, and for a lot of people, it's the very first stop when they arrive on the West Coast or home in my case. But while you may know their burgers, you might not know their story or the woman who's now running the show. Lindsay Snyder is not your average president of a multi-billion dollar company. But In-N-Out Burger is not your average fast food chain. That's what is all about. Founded in 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder, it all started as a little hamburger stand with a pioneering drive through speaker system. My grandparents you know, came from very humble beginnings. Now they have 402 stores across eight states and they've amassed quite the following, even with the rich and famous. They all have a plain cheeseburger with light onions. Current President Lindsay Snyder grew up at In-N-Out, but her path to leadership has no shortage of twists and turns. It really was like that family pain and tragedy that really put each leader in its place. After Harry died in 1976, Esther handed control to Lindsay's uncle, Rich, but he was killed in a plane crash. The next leader, Lindsay's father, died of an overdose. At just 17, Lindsay was the only blood relative left. She started just like every other employee. You waited two hours to apply to work at a new store in Redding, California, even though your family began in and out. Is that right? I think that there's a stigma that can come with being, you know, the owner's kid and just wanting to be respected like others, doing it the right way and not having the special treatment. At 27 years old, Lindsay stepped into the role of president of In-N-Out Burger. You were very young when you come in 
to this now multi-billion dollar corporation. What's this been like for you? In the earlier days, I actually wore um, pantsuits and I did that because I felt like I was supposed to. And then I finally, you know, just was confident in who I am and who I'm not. You're gonna get judged either way. So you might as well be judged for being who you are. She's made specific and strategic choices, especially in an age of inflation and increasing minimum wage. How do you keep those prices and keep a profit margin? I was sitting in VP meetings going toe to toe, saying we can't raise the prices that much. We can't, you know, because I felt such an obligation to look out for our customer. When everyone else was taking these jumps, we weren't. When you think about innovation or tech or artificial intelligence, where does that intersect with in and out No to mobile ordering um, because that greatly impacts the customer service experience. There's a lot of things that could be cheaper, easier, and all, but that's not, that's not the system we go through. I know your faith is important to you. It is proudly a part of this company of Bible verses on most pieces of packaging. Well, my uncle <laughs> started it with the verses on the packaging and, you know, he felt we're a family company, we're a private company, and, you know, this is who we are, and I'm unashamed of my faith. You're a private company. <laughs> as long as you're here, will that stay that way? Absolutely. Because you get calls all the time. Yeah, messages, emails, Instagram <laughs> messages. People DM to buy the company. Basically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not interested in franchising? No. <laughs> what about an IPO? No. It's staying in the family and the menu staying simple, except for those in the know. Their famous secret menu includes animal style burgers and fries, named for the rowdy teens who would order extra spread pickles and grilled onions back in the day. Another favorite, the famous Flying Dutchman. You know, the Flying Dutchman was my dad's burger. Two meat patties with two slices of cheese and um, his nickname was the Flying Dutchman. What's your order? Mine is double meat with pickles, spread, and chopped chilies only. A burger that keeps customers coming back for more. Looking at 75 years, so many customers that have made us who we are today. It's just incredible. So there's just so much gratitude. Who's hungry, right? All right, the burning question, where will they head next? I asked about expanding to the East Coast. Lindsay said as long as she's around, the answer is probably never, but not necessarily. I never say never. As for the future and the legacy of the company, Lindsay's oldest son has now jumped into the family burger business. By the way, you can learn more secrets of the business in Lindsay's book, The Ins and Outs of In and Out Burger. Coming up, back to back champs. UConn's Huskies are once again the kings of college basketball this morning after a dramatic championship matchup last night, beating out fellow top seed Purdue for their second straight national title. We've got all the highlights and the celebrations up next. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. How is it that traffic was stopped in time? State law enforcement officers, they undoubtedly saved lives. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now.
Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. Democracy is happening. Now, welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now, never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Welcome back. She's the bad guy, and she's back with another album. Singer Billie Eilish just announced her third full-length project. It's called Hit Me Hard and Soft. Fans even got a sneak peek of the cover art on Instagram, where she just gained millions of new followers in a matter of days after word got out that she was adding her followers to her close friends list. That's the thing on Instagram where you can see specific things posted only for certain people. Well, it's been three years since Eilish released her last album, Happier Than Ever, back in 2021. But it's been anything but slow rolling for the nine-time Grammy winner between co-writing her hit song, What Was I Made For, for the Barbie movie soundtrack, and then winning an Oscar for it. Let's just say she's been busy. Well, there is no stopping her. The new album drops on May 17th. Her voice is out of control amazing, so I cannot wait for that. All right, let's stay on some music. This ain't Texas, but it is Beyonce's world. That's right, Queen Bee has just made music history as the first black woman to ever lead Billboard's top country album charts just two weeks after releasing her eighth studio album, Cowboy Carter. Marcus Dowling is back with me again to talk about Beyonce's latest feat. He's the Nashville country music reporter for the Tennessee. And Marcus, welcome back. I'm so excited to get to talk with you with this incredible news because you joined us the day that Beyonce released Cowboy Carter, two weeks later, leading the charts. How significant is this moment? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an unbelievable moment, but it speaks more to the... Uh, potential of the dynamic power of genre bending music being actualized. I think that that's the, the biggest takeaway of uh, Cowboy Carter's success so far. Beyonce's often referenced, of course, her Texas roots throughout her career. I mean, that, that is well known. She is proud of it. We hear about Houston in a lot of her songs. How does this album blend, you know, kind of her background, where she came from, with that iconic Beyonce sound that we've come to know that was decidedly not country, right? And now she's kind of switched to this. Do you think this is firmly a country album? Tell us about the sound here. I'd say that it is a firmly country album in the sense that it plays well with the traditions of folk and bluegrass and uh, contemporary country for the last 50 years. Uh, there's pieces of that all throughout this uh, this album. And it's the sense that uh, Beyonce is uh, aware and cognizant of Black artists' spaces within the, the history of country music and uh, more so being in conversation with that more so than anything else. I think that's the most important takeaway there. Absolutely. One of the coolest things I think about this album are these collaborations. Uh, first, I just want to say, I think my favorite song on the album is the song with Miley Cyrus, Two Most Wanted. Do you have a favorite song? Right. I have to ask you that first. Do you have a favorite song? Oh, gosh. Well, it, it changes day by day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Uh, I'd say that, yeah, for me currently, it's uh, it's Spaghetti with mm. uh, Shibuzi and uh, Linda Martell. I'd also uh, say that the, uh, the, the fascination of Blackbird being... Uh, five African-American female voices. It's Beyonce along with Tanner Adele and Britney Spencer and mm -hmm. Raina Roberts and Tierra Kennedy. I think that's just a, a cool thing that opens up the door for young black women worldwide to be able to have space to be able to sing together and to do any country music is a really cool thing. Big time. And I know that you've actually been speaking to some of these featured artists on the album, kind of just about what this is doing for them. Tell us what they're telling Absolutely. you. Absolutely. They're they're excited. Uh, if if you look at say uh, all of these artists, for instance, I, I would limit it, but it, it's actually unlimited. The uh, the <laughs> scope of being an artist who makes music ideally for uh, the broader audience, but because of a number of 
counteracting issues. Uh, you end up making it for a smaller audience that's typically online and for 200 to 500 person venues when a 32 time Grammy award winning artist takes uh, awareness and appreciation of your art and your craft and, and also just the amount of uh, sweat equity that's put into your work and then puts you on her album and your, your streams grow and your renown grows and your visibility grows. I think it's a win for everybody involved. Absolutely. Is Beyonce pushing the country genre forward? Is she changing it? What's her impact? Well, Luke Bryan likes the album and, and Lainey mm -hmm. Wilson likes the album. And then obviously Willie Nelson likes the album and uh, Dolly Parton does too. So <laughs> I think that minimally the, the awareness has grown exponentially for, uh, for extraordinary change in the genre. And I think that the artists who are on the ground, the ones who were just referenced, uh, getting more opportunities. Like Britney Spencer was just in a duet with uh, Parker McCollum at the CMT Awards on uh, Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just moments like that and just increasing people's comfort with the potential of what uh, broad-based uh, equity looks like in country music. Oh. I think that's the, 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 the greatest part of this. Absolutely. It's so fun, too, when you hear her say, it's Dolly P, and you actually hear her voice on this album, too. It's very neat. Right. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. So fun to get to talk about this. Incredible to see this happen. We appreciate you coming back to us. Absolutely. It's sincerely a pleasure. Anytime. Talk to you soon. UConn fans are enjoying a bit of deja vu this morning now that its men's basketball team capped off one of the most exciting March Madness tournaments to date with a historic victory. The Huskies beat top-seeded Purdue 75-60 to in a thrilling national title game, becoming the first men's team to win back-to-back -back championships in 17 years. NBC News correspondent Sam Brack has been following the tournament for us. He joins us from Miami with the very latest here. Sam, good morning. Savannah, good morning. I know you've been following this very closely. And yes, UConn, you might say they are the bluest of blue bloods this morning. You talked about the two best teams playing each other. It's where that actually happens, UConn and Purdue. They certainly have the two largest human beings on the court. Now, Purdue, this was the first time in more than 50 years, Savannah, they made the national title game. They just happened to run into a buzzsaw that is the UConn Huskies, who won back-to-back -back titles on the men's side for the first time in almost two decades. It was as sweet and about as close to a sure thing as you can get. It is a UConn coronation. The Huskies make history. Back-to-back -back national champions. A storied basketball power, UConn, putting a bow on a dominant tournament run. Oh, yeah, we... we... Uh, set out to make this a goal and go back to back and you know that's what we did tonight. The Huskies vanquishing Purdue 75-60 with rim rocking slams. Special delivery to Johnson. And crafty play clinching the program's sixth national title all time tying with North Carolina and now one more than Duke and Indiana. In the process, becoming the first men's squad to win consecutive trophies since the Florida Gators in 2007. What a special group of people, a special coaching staff, uh, an incredible group of players. Overnight in stores, Connecticut, students packing Gamble Pavilion for an on-campus watch party, cheering their team to victory and overcoming 37 points from 7'4 National Player of the Year, Zach Eady. Nice step. The Huskies leaving no doubt about their on-court bona fides. The victory coming as South Carolina's women's team returning to their Columbia campus champions. They did it in a way in which they lifted up each other. After defeating the Hawkeyes, though Iowa superstar Caitlin Clark still racked up points and eyeballs. That game shattering records, the most watched sporting event outside of the Olympics or football since 2019. You need three things in sports, household names, rivalries, and games of consequence, and March Madness had all of that. Now the UConn men claiming their victory after a banner year for college hoops. And Savannah, the UConn Huskies, now the men have won 12 consecutive tournament games by at least 13 points. That had never happened before. And Coach Early has them in position now. They are the favorites for next year to win the title as well. And I am so sorry that I don't have a basketball to, to crush a three-pointer for you right now. Next time, though, Savannah, I got you 100%. Mm -hmm. Back to you. Yeah, we, we all heard it bouncing, though, in your intro. So you could have asked, but you decided not to, maybe because you're scared. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't want to humiliate myself again. That is I correct. I did ask him to do that for y'all. Sam Brock, thank you very much. We appreciate it. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now.
Hey everyone, good Tuesday. So glad you could be with me. I'm Vicki Wynn. My co-anchor Morgan is off today. NBC News Daily starts right now. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, back in court in Michigan. The first parents to be convicted after their son killed four classmates in a school shooting will soon learn their sentence. What prosecutors are asking the judge to do after emotional testimony from the victim's families. In the spotlight, country music star Morgan Wallen arrested for allegedly throwing a chair off the rooftop of a bar in Nashville. What his fans are saying and what this means for the rest of his tour. Cause for concern, election officials across the country are leaving their jobs at record high rates. How they're being pushed to the brink and what it means for the high stakes November election. Mind your manners. We all have different parenting styles, which begs the question, is it okay to criticize other people's methods or discipline their children? We'll talk to a psychotherapist about how to be careful with your critiques. Welcome to NBC News Daily. We start in Michigan, where sentencing is underway for the first parents in the U.S. to be convicted in connection to their child's school shooting. James and Jennifer Crumbly appearing in court together this morning. Earlier this year, two separate juries found the Crumblies guilty on four counts of involuntary manslaughter, one for each student their son Ethan killed back in 2021. Now, during both trials, prosecutors accused James and Jennifer of ignoring their son's pleas for mental health treatment. Today, they're asking the judge to sentence the Crumblies to at least 10 years in prison, accusing the mother and father of showing, quote, a total and complete lack of remorse for their son's actions. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster is outside the courthouse for us this afternoon. Shaq, walk us through what's happening in court today and what happened when Jennifer and James Crumbly came face to face today. Yeah, well, we're right now hearing emotional and heartbreaking statements from the parents, from the family of each of the four students who were killed in that Oxford High School shooting. We also just in the past couple of minutes heard from Jennifer Crum Crumbly herself reading from a legal pad, a yellow legal pad with handwritten notes. I want you to listen to what we heard from one of the parents here, the parent of Madison Baldwin. Listen to what she said uh, to when she had the opportunity to address the parents of the school shooter. While your son was hearing voices and asking for help, I was helping Madison pick out her senior classes. While you were perching, seeing a gun for your son and leaving it unlocked, I was helping her finish her college essays. According to our reporter in the room, uh, we saw James Crumbly shed some tears there, sometimes uh, scrunch his face. We saw Jennifer Crumbly put her head down, not making eye contact with that mother. You mentioned that it was the first time in some years that we saw Jennifer and James Crumbly together. You see their pictures there. James was wearing that orange jumpsuit, Jennifer wearing that jumpsuit with uh, white and gray. While there was no direct interaction between the two, we did see Jennifer look towards James a couple of times as he just stared straight ahead. You know, Shaq, just days before the jury convicted James Crumbly, it came out that he'd allegedly threatened prosecutors while he was in jail. How is that perhaps playing into yeah. his sentencing today? Well, it's definitely something that prosecutors mentioned in sentencing memo as they in sentencing memos as they asked for the judge to sentence them to a higher sentence. The state guidelines suggest that they should be sentenced to somewhere between four and seven years, but the prosecution is asking for 10 to 15 years, partially because of those threats. We know that in one of the calls that he made from his jail cell to his sister, according to a source familiar, uh, as his trial was going on, it directly threatened the prosecutor in this case saying that there will be retribution. Believe me, those mm. were his words in that. Those are words that were quoted in that sentencing memo. By the way, the or the defense teams are asking that these parents essentially serve the time that they've already been served and have a supervised release. Mm. We'll see what the judge determines in a little bit. We expect that decision to come later this afternoon. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster-Shack, thank you. 
We are also waiting on a landmark decision from the Arizona Supreme Court. Any minute now, we're expecting a ruling on whether the state's 15-week abortion ban is legal. Now, if the court decides it is not, Arizona will revert back to a near total ban. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins me now. So, Dasha, tell us more about the decision that we are expecting today and what it could mean for women in that state. So, Vicki, in Arizona, back in 2022, shortly after the overturning of Roe versus Wade, the state implemented a 15-week abortion ban. That is now in the court, and the court's going to decide whether to keep that in place or revert to a much, much narrower ban, a law from 1864. Arizona wasn't even in state back then, but that law outright fully bans abortion except to save the life of the mother. So we're looking at 15 weeks of holding that or going back to this uh, law that predates the statehood of Arizona. And we're waiting to hear the decision from the justices at any moment. You know, Dasha, last week, an abortion rights group in the state announced it had gathered enough signatures for a ballot measure that would ask voters to enshrine abortion rights in the Arizona Constitution. Will this ultimately be up to the voters in November anyway? Uh, potentially, yes. But here's the problem, Vicki, and this is why the landscape post row is so complicated and so difficult for, for clinics, providers, and patients to navigate. Because say the a Supreme Court upholds or, or reverts back to this 1864 law, banning abortions outright, that could go into effect and be uh, enforced as soon as 45 days mm. after the Supreme Court decision. The ballot initiative, voters aren't going to get to vote on that until November. And so what happens to those clinics? What happens to those providers in the meantime. Arizona already saw back in 2022 some temporary closures after the fall of Roe. So we've got these uh, this legislation, you've got courts making decisions, and you've got ballot initiatives. And that's happening in states all across the country. And the providers and patients that I've been talking to say it's just created a lot of chaos and confusion and really trouble for people who are uh, looking to find care and doctors who are trying to understand what can and can't I do in this new sort of wild, wild west landscape of reproductive health. That is the scenario in so many states playing out. Before you go, Dasha, any idea when this ruling could come down? Uh, we have been hurt hearing is uh, around 10 a.m. Pacific time. I am bad with the <laughs> time math, but hopefully within the next hour, we will have uh, some more news for you, Vicki. All right, Dasha Burns. Dasha, thank you so much. We're going to turn now to country music star Morgan Wallen. He's once again at the center of controversy. Police say the 30-year-old singer is facing multiple felony counts of reckless endangerment for allegedly throwing a chair off the roof of a Nashville bar. Wallen was arrested. He posted bond early yesterday morning, and his attorney says he is fully cooperating with police. NBC Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas here now with more. So, Chloe, this isn't the first time we've had headlines like this about Morgan Wallen. He's right in the middle of his spring tour, too. So tell us what happened? I mean, first of all, I mean, last year, his tour was the highest grossing country music tour. Mm. I mean, he has been on this meteoric rise, Vicky, and he has legions of millennial and Gen Z fans and people of all ages. I mean, even my children love his music. But the thing is, is that he's in the headlines more for what he's doing offstage than what he's, his music. And so this latest incident, he's at a bar Sunday night in Nashville. He's from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually opening a bar in restaurant in Nashville separately. So he's there, he's on the sixth floor rooftop of this bar and then throws a chair over and it lands right next to two police officers. And so obviously they go up and he's arrested. Obviously he posts about a little over $15,000 in bond and he has a hearing on May 3rd. Ironically, the same night is actually he's going to be performing in Nashville on this tour that is incredibly successful. He's touring throughout the summer. No word from Morgan Wallen. He usually addresses his fans during these controversial times. Mm -hmm. But like you said, he's been arrested previously for an incident at a bar. He, you know, was suspended from his music label and his music was stopped playing on radio stations after he was heard on tape using a racial slur, he even dropped from his SNL debut here then eventually being back on the show. So, you know, it's just one of those situations where his fans, most of them standing by him, yeah. but 
I think you reported earlier that he actually did some time in rehab after being sort of suspended from his label for a time. This is like the third public scandal in the last four years for Morgan Wallen. What are you hearing at this point from fans? And frankly, he's really lucky that chair didn't land on a police officer or someone else. Or a child. Yeah. I mean, even though it was late at night, yeah. I mean, you never know. It's just so terrifying. We have a little bit that you guys can listen to uh, of what fans are saying on social. Morgan, Morgan, Morgan. Bro, we gotta talk. Morgan Wallen, what? on earth are you doing? Why are we allegedly throwing chairs off rooftops? And why are you so proud? I think Morgan really does need some help. As you see, he's smiling inside his picture, this mugshot, he's very intoxicated. Again, the focus should be on his music, on the mm -hmm. fact that he has chart-topping albums and sold out arenas, but again, he courts controversy, mm -hmm. gets arrested, gets in trouble, but you know, Hollywood and the music industry is a forgiving place, and he does usually come out and apologize and say something, and I know fans are waiting to hear from him directly. Yeah, I think we all are. But for now, you think the tour is going to continue? It appears so. If you go on his website, all the tour dates through the end of the summer are still listed. Even that May 3rd date, when he will be in court that morning as of now, and then performing down the road that night. All right. And NBC News Entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas, as always, thank you, Chloe. Thank you. It is time now for our CNBC Money Minute. With inflation still weighing on the U.S. economy, entrepreneurs are starting to lose their confidence in sales prospects. Small business optimism dropped to a low that we haven't seen in more than 11 years. This is all according to the National Federation of Independent Business. CNBC correspondent Contessa Brewer joins me now. So Contessa, this is the seventh time in the last eight months that that particular sentiment fell. What are the biggest concerns for small business owners right now? Yeah, so Vicki, inflation is the biggest concern across small businesses in the U.S., but another major concern is the sticky labor market. 18% of respondents said labor quality was a major concern. Only 11% of small businesses say they plan to hire in the next three months. We're looking at Tesla. It has settled a wrongful death lawsuit over the death of an Apple engineer who died in a car crash in 2018 while using autopilot. The settlement comes as a trial was beginning yesterday with jury selection, and it would allow Tesla to keep from having to show its evidence and testimony, Tesla has filed to seal the settlement terms that include the amount that was paid to the family. And Google is partnering with the German healthcare company Bayer to build a new AI-powered product for radiologists. The platform would be used to help the doctors flag problems within images, as well as summarize a patient's history to help diagnose quickly but effectively. It comes as radiologists face a labor shortage themselves and mounting workloads and of course, the population is aging, Vicki. Yeah, it sounds like it's a very effective tool when it's used in certain medical applications, Contessa. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we'll keep our eye to see how this moves forward and how it pushes all of medical uh, technology forward, but for right now, radiologists. All right, CNBC correspondent Contessa Brewer. Contessa, thank you so much. Coming up, light a candle, slip into some pajamas and get ready to exercise. We're gonna explain the new fitness trend that is getting people motivated to work out. That's next to you're watching NBC News Daily.
Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Well, if you are having a hard time getting your workouts going or you're feeling intimidated by the thought of working out, there's a growing trend that just might be for you that makes cardio a lot cozier. NBC News Daily anchor Zinkle SMW explains. Whether your workout includes strength training, cardio, or high-intensity intervals, it can also be cozy. Now let's do some cozy cardio. Today, fitness fiends are reinventing workouts with a new trend. Here's how it works. You grab your favorite cozy loungewear, you want to set the mood, grab a drink, beverage, and then put on your favorite TV show or podcast and get started with your low-impact mood. It's a practice Megan Ruth, now in her 30s and a mother of two, has leaned heavily on for her postpartum recovery. You are not new to fitness, but when did cozy cardio get on your radar? I saw this trend happen on TikTok, and it really resonated with me, especially in that postpartum phase that I was in. It just felt like less of a hurdle to get dressed. I was already in my pajamas. I was already in my sweats has always been active. Once a professional dancer and fitness instructor, she says she worked to deal with her views of body image in her 20s. But when she got pregnant, a lot of those feelings came up for me again. How were you dealing you know, and feeling? I struggled in pregnancy and postpartum with all the changes and um, someone who's super active. I'm not able to do everything I used to do. This new kind of workout was a welcome reframe. For it, and you're ready to go. Lighting a candle, having my warm cup of coffee, standing by, music that I enjoy with my workout, those are things that just create an atmosphere, an environment that I look forward to. I always say, too, that the movement also needs to be something that resonates with you, right? We can feel when we're enjoying movement or not. On a treadmill, counting every calorie as I ran in my early 20s, I, my, my body could tell I didn't enjoy that. The term was popularized by health and wellness creator Hope Zucker Brown. I really want cozy cardio to be a movement where people can reclaim their relationships with exercise. Let's do some cozy cardio before work. The trend encouraging people to view fitness as a joyful experience. It was meant for you to just enjoy yourself, to take a little bit of time to do the things that feel good for you. The trend comes as mounting research finds being sedentary increases your risk of illness, including dementia, cancer, and heart disease. Cozy cardio is a great way for people to kind of get started with exercise. Cozy cardio is not always a high enough intensity to actually meet our physical activity guidelines. The Center for Disease Control currently recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week with at least two days of strength training. For Megan Roop, this new trend has revolutionized her ongoing fitness work. People are so compelled to this cozy form of working out. It's just removing that barrier to entry, right? So if you can roll out of bed, be in your sweats, be in something comfortable, it feels like you can show up to it. Yeah, I can do that. It doesn't feel so overwhelming. I am all for this. I love it so much. Right? Whatever you can do to get people more into exercising, yes. moving their bodies. Tell us more about Hope Zuckerbrow, who founded this term, Cozy yes. Cardio, and the yes. community she's creating. Absolutely. So I love this, too. And Hope's first videos on Cozy Cardio actually racked up nearly 2 million views. She told us she really wants those who participate in the practice to lean into doing things that feel good and said it's turned into a form of meditational self-love mm. for her and for others. I have to say my favorite part, yeah. the water walking pad, and I know you're a fan of that as yeah, well. Yeah, it's just a little, we have it under our desks yes. in our office. It's yes. a nice way to be mindful and to move around during the day when you got meetings and that sort of thing. But and what about the candles and like the sweats? You know I love I, that. I think that's my favorite part because so often workouts can just feel like they're about the intensity, yes. the sweat, the uncomfortable spandex. Right. But it can be something you enjoy, look forward to, light a candle, set the mood, yeah. have your favorite drink, cozy cardio folks. It's like the answer to 75 hard. I like it. <laughs> All right, NBC News Daily anchor, Zinc Lassemont, always great to see you. Thank you. Stay with us later this hour, giving our everyday actions meaning. How our daily rituals can actually amount to much more than just simple routine. And maybe you're going to add some cozy cardio to that ritual. We love it. You're watching NBC News Daily.
the state of emergency here in Baltimore. How is it that traffic was stopped in time? State law enforcement officers, they undoubtedly saved lives. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Mexico's government is cutting ties with Ecuador after police stormed the Mexican embassy in Quito and arrested Ecuador's former vice president. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has more on the growing tensions there and why Mexico says the raid violated international law. Mexico! Mexico! Mexico breaking diplomatic ties with Ecuador after an unprecedented use of force. Police in Ecuador's capital, Quito, raiding the Mexican embassy over the weekend and arresting former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass, who had been granted political asylum by Mexico. Video shared by Mexico's foreign minister shows the moment Roberto Canseco, a Mexican diplomat, tries to stop the caravan with the VP from driving away and is tackled by police outside the embassy. Como delincuentes. Allanaron la embajada de México en Ecuador. Mexican officials say the officers entered by force, jumping over the wall, forcing the gate, and hurting Mexican personnel. México reitera su condena por la violación de la inmunidad de su embajada en Quito y la agresión a su personal. Glass, who was moved to a high-security prison in Guayaquil on Sunday, arrived at the Quito embassy in December after he was indicted on corruption charges, charges he claimed were politically motivated. Now some residents in Ecuador concern this stunning arrest is yet another political play. I think it was a decision very political, just for in consequence of the support of the president is descending. Ecuador's foreign minister defending the move, saying that there was a risk of imminent escape and that Mexico violated the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries when they gave glass asylum. The U.S. State Department condemning any violation of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, writing on X, we encourage our partners Mexico and Ecuador to resolve their differences in accord with international norms. On Sunday, Mexican diplomats returning back home to an outpour of support. As Mexican officials say, their embassy in Ecuador will remain closed indefinitely. Guad Venegas, NBC News. A man from the UK just finished running the entire length of Africa. In the process, he helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has our story. Breathless but triumphant, 27-year-old Russ Cook completing a monumental challenge, running the length of Africa. Very good, I'm a bit tired. That's almost 10,000 miles, or roughly the equivalent of 376 marathons over 352 days. I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. The realization that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two-month-old in the time he's done this. The UK native crossing the finish line at the northern tip of the continent in Los Angeles, Tunisia, on Sunday. After a grueling and at times perilous journey across 16 countries, starting at the southernmost point in Cape Agula, South Africa, last April. Day 337. Cook documenting his journey on social media as he tackled different climates and terrains. But he also had to deal with unpredictable and dangerous scenarios. He says in Angola he was robbed at gunpoint of his passport and phones, and that in Congo he escaped locals armed with machetes by paying them off. The scariest moment was... Uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was that was pretty nuts. That terrifying ordeal even making him consider quitting. Probably for about one minute thought about quitting and then I realised I couldn't. So 
that's about as close as he ever got. And if all that wasn't challenging enough, he was initially denied a visa crossing into Algeria from Mauritania when he turned to social media for help. I've been following him since he first started. His supporters finishing with him on the last leg, in awe of the man who also ran from Asia to London three years ago. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. His run, dubbed as Project Africa, raising almost $900,000 and will go towards two charities. I'm a big believer in sport doing wonders for people's lives and um, it changed my life. Though Russ has more in store, for now, he's just looking to unwind. I've got a whole list of ideas. But yeah, no, I definitely, I'm keen to chill out for, for a moment, spend some time with the family and stuff. You know? Matt Bradley, NBC News. Congratulations, nearly a year on the run. Incredible. Stay with us. You're watching NBC News. Dave. Tel Aviv from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What are the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. It is 12.30 in Burlington, Vermont, and right here in New York City. I'm Vicki Wynn. So glad you could be with us. Here's what's making news right now. An appeals court judge has denied former President Donald Trump's bid to delay his criminal hush money trial that was scheduled to begin in New York in a week. Trump's attorneys argued the trial should be pushed back because an impartial jury can't be guaranteed. Now, this trial centers around claims that Trump falsified business records to make hush money payments. He has pleaded not guilty. Well, lawmakers in Maryland have passed a first-of-its-kind in the nation law to stop gift card scams. The bill, sponsored by Maryland Senator Ben Kramer, comes after an NBC News investigation into gift card draining. That's when a scammer steals money from a physical gift card. The new law would require gift cards to be sealed in a way that can't easily be opened or stored in a location that only employees can access. And concerns over eye discomfort are growing after yesterday's total solar eclipse. Google searches for hurt eyes spiked, suggesting people are worried about looking at the sun for too long. Now, experts say there have been complaints about eye issues after previous eclipses, but long-term damage is not common. 
Well, election workers are leaving their jobs at the highest rate in decades, according to new research shared with NBC News. At least 36 percent of local election offices have changed hands since just 2020. That means the high stakes 2024 presidential election will be overseen by thousands of new officials. NBC News senior reporter Jane Tim joins me now. Jane, this is a really fascinating look at what's going on in our election work uh, offices. Why are these officials leaving? And is this turnover, what p impact could it have in 2024? You know, what we're learning from this data from the Bipartisan Policy Center is that there's no one answer to that question. So after 2020, conspiracy theories flourished, election workers started getting harassed, over scrutinized and attacked for doing their jobs. And many people worried that denialism would essentially push all these people out of their jobs. But what we're learning from this new research is that people have been leaving their jobs gradually and increasingly over the last 20 years. So that there's old problems and there's new problems here. This trend was absolutely escalated by what happened in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not a new one. There's definitely problems at work that were long before President Trump ever ran for office. Yeah, and until recently, we know that the bulk of the turnover was driven by small towns and counties, but what changed in 2020? And did you talk to some of these folks? Yeah, so in 2020, uh, we saw a lot of officials who got, um, you know, harassed. I've listened to the threats that were on voicemails in Fulton sure. County. You remember those Detroit ballot counters where there were protesters outside thinking they were stealing the election, yeah. claiming they were stealing the election. And we should say there's no evidence of that. Uh, but, you know, when you talk to these officials, they say it wears very heavily on them. I spoke in, with an old official in Charleston County who ran elections there for about a decade. He resigned December 2020 and said, you know what, I just can't can't take it anymore. Mm. I asked him what he thought about this turnover that he's seen with his colleagues. It does break my heart a little bit because there's some really super great people across this country who put their heart and soul into what they do. And for them to walk out means that there's this huge gap of knowledge that um, maybe the next folks coming in don't even have information from or know who to contact or how to build those programs, to continue to make the office successful. You know, as Cho says there, turnover isn't always a good thing. These are very difficult jobs, and institutional right. knowledge is critical. You know, when you talk to people about what it's like to start a job in elections, they say it's drinking from a fire hose. Oh, absolutely. We need that valuable experience. You think about election workers, librarians, which you've reported on to, who are facing kind of unheard of harassment that nobody should have to deal with. So anyway, uh, NBC News senior reporter Jane Tim, thank you so much. Really important insight there. In New York City, officials are trying to ease fears following a recent string of violent and unprovoked crimes. According to the NYPD, crime is actually down, but a lot of people who live in the city say they don't feel that way. In an exclusive interview, Top Story anchor Tom Yamas sat down with the city's police commissioner, who says that what people are seeing in the papers and online doesn't reflect what's happening in the streets. Stop it! From mayhem on the subways to unprovoked attacks on women to a young police officer shot and killed in the line of duty. These headlines and viral videos paint a picture of a big city with a big problem. New York City went from clean and safe to dirty and dangerous. What happened in New York City? January 2022, New York City was up in crime over 48% up in violence. And we looked at just making more felony arrests. And slowly by slowly, the violence began to come down. Edward Caban is in charge of the NYPD and it's more than 35,000 police officers. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, he says crime is trending down in New York City, but not fast enough because of repeat offenders. We're seeing that we're locking up the same people over and over again. In his most forceful statements yet, the NYPD commissioner calling bail reform laws ineffective. We lock someone up, district attorney puts bail on them. The judges let them go to walk our streets again. It's a broken system. A system that has come into sharper focus after the killing of Detective Jonathan Diller, allegedly by two career criminals with long records. How many more police officers and how many more families need to make the ultimate sacrifice before we start protecting them? Is she right? Absolutely. You know, that's the one thing that no police commissioner wants to do during their tenure is bury one of their own. Whether it's a family of blood or a family of blue, it hurts to the core. Part of Commissioner Caban's mission now, separating perception versus reality. 
According to NYPD stats, overall crime is down in the city and subways, but that's not how many New Yorkers feel about their own safety. I want my legacy to be that New Yorkers felt not only that they were safe, but that they felt safe too. Because they don't feel that way. I'm not doing my job. Our thanks to top story anchor Tom Yamas for that report. Well, the Yukon Huskies, they are national champions once again. They dominated Purdue last night, 76 to 60, to win their second straight men's title. The top seeded Huskies jumped out to an early lead in the first half. They never looked back. This is Yukon's sixth NCAA championship. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock live in Miami for us. So, Sam, Yukon joining some really elite company here. They have back to back national titles. That is rare. Put their win into context for us. What's so amazing about this, Vicky, is that in this climate of college basketball, one and done, where the best players generally play one year of college ball mm. and then go pro, you have the transfer portal where in any given year, the elite talent can seek out better NIL opportunities mm. and jump from one school to the next or whatever it might be, playing time. In that environment, UConn just won back-to-back -back titles. And I think we flashed a second ago the all-time number of trophies per program. Well, they now rank third. Number one is UCLA. That goes all the way back oh. to the 60s and 70s with John Wooden, then Kentucky at eight, and then there's UConn with North Carolina, six titles, one above the likes of Duke and Indiana. So it is really remark remarkable. And to your earlier point, the last time any program won back to back on the men's side of things was in 2006 and seven with the Florida Gators. Before that, it was Duke in the early 90s. It does not happen often. And Dan Hurley and the Huskies just accomplished that feat. Uh, Sam, there were also some record-setting moments for the women's championship. We were glued to watching that as well. How many people joined us on that one? This was so incredible. Almost 19 million people, viewers on ABC and ESPN. That is, as you see on your screen, up almost 90% from just the year before, up 285% from two years prior. That is not just the biggest number for any women's game or any men's game this year or these last several years. It's the most watched basketball game since 2019. The only thing that outrated this particular game, the Olympics, Vicky, and football over that last four-year time span, and that is it. The question becomes, was this the Kate and Clark effect, or is there sustained interest and explosion in the women's game? We'll find out when she matriculates to the WNBA next year, but right now, women's basketball is red hot. Oh, man, we are loving it. I certainly hope it's here to stay. Sam, let me ask you about this. Did you have any brackets? How'd you do? You know what? I'm embarrassed to say I didn't fill out a single bracket this year. I always look forward to it. And stop me if you've been here, but it's like you don't have enough time in the day, not even 15 minutes in the morning to fill one out. I regret it. It would have been horrible. I would have lost, but at least I could have said I did it. How did you do? Listen, your bracket is perfect. I think I actually did okay. I mean, we had UConn to win for the men's, uh, and I had, did I have South Carolina? I think I might have had Iowa, actually, for the women's. Mm, um, okay, I, it was so a, it was a co, That's pretty uh, solid. co-bracket with my husband. Anyway, <laughs> nice. we'll do it again next year head to head you and me okay thanks Vicky Looking thanks so forward much to Sam we appreciate you and coming up next it can be tough to talk to a friend about their unruly child so we have some tips to help you approach this conversation without criticizing anyone's parenting more NBC News Daily right after this
We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. A good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Now to breaking news in Michigan where the parents of school shooter Ethan Crumbly were just sentenced to 10 to 15 years each. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa standing by outside the courthouse where the sentence just came down. So Maggie, we know both Crumbly's just addressed the court moments ago. Walk us through what happened and what they said to the families of the victims who were there today. Yeah, that was a surprise, Vicky. Both parents, as you said, back to back giving speeches. It was the first time that we had heard from James Crumbly because remember, he didn't take the stand like his wife did. Uh, basically, Jennifer Crumbly spoke first and she addressed the court saying that she uh, a number of times apologized to the family, says that she feels uh, their grief and that she's hurting with them. And a number of times kind of going over that she is heartbroken by what her son has done. But she also touched on the uh, testimony that rubbed so many families in this case the wrong way, saying that she wouldn't have done anything differently. She says that the way she interpreted the question, she said it was kind of taken out of context. And she now, knowing what she, uh, knowing what she knows now about what her son was planning, she says I absolutely would have done things differently. So her speech kind of took a number of twists and turns in that way. At one point, she also uh, admonished the prosecution for, she said, persecuting her, which you have to imagine didn't go over well with the judge. Mm -hmm. James Crumbly also talking about uh, how much he's hurting for the families, hurting for the parents who address the court here today uh, for their loss, uh, also apologizing for what they've been through, then kind of turning his attention to the schools, saying that the families need to be told the whole truth and that change mm -hmm. needs to be uh, sort of Change is just beginning in this case. In other words, he putting some blame on the schools in mm. this case for not stopping their son before he carried out this massacre. A lot of that kind of in line, prosecutors later pointed out, with what they say is a lack of remorse from both parents. And the judge kind of spoke to that as she handed down her sentences. 10 to 15 years is the maximum that was allowed by law because we're talking about four counts of involuntary manslaughter. But because these all happened, these all these deaths stem from the same incident, uh, these 10 to 15 year sentences are served concurrently at the same time. So both parents got the max and the judge in her speech just now inside that courtroom talked about the lack of remorse, talked about the behavior that she saw from both parents during their trials and today during the sentencing hearing and saying that they have not showed nearly enough remorse to basically warrant any mercy during the sentencing hearing. And she indeed, Vicki, handed down the maximum, which was exactly what prosecutors were hoping for in this case. Maggie, I know that parents were there, families of the victims. They gave their victim impact statements today. Can you tell us a little bit more about what they said and what was their reaction when these, these maximum sentences were handed down? Yeah, all of them asked for the maximum. In fact, one parent, uh, Steve St. Juliana, uh, his daughter, Hannah, was one of the four killed, said, you know, initially going into this, all I really wanted was a guilty verdict. He said, I wasn't really too focused on the sentence. That seemed kind of like a calculation that the system would make for us. He said, and then as I watched their behavior during the trial. He said, as I watched Jennifer Crumbly testify that she wouldn't have done anything differently, as headlines came out about James Crumbly allegedly making mm -hmm. threats against a prosecutor from inside jail, vowing retribution, he said, that's when I decided that this needed to be the maximum sentence in this case and needed to send Vicki a message to parents across America. So an emotional day there and the maximum sentence as a result. Really feel for those families. This will not bring their children back, but it is the maximum sentence that could be handed down 10 to 15 years for the Crumblies. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa. Maggie, thank you so much. Well, a recent uh, Reddit thread, it is sparking a larger conversation around criticizing someone's parenting skills. Now, this all started when one woman who doesn't appear to have children herself made a post asking if she was wrong to tell a friend that her four-year-old son had no manners. She says it happened after the kid threw a wedding ring that belonged to her partner out the window. 
Psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig joins me now. So, Dr. Ludwig, this Reddit post, it's since been deleted, but thousands of people were debating. It's a conversation that's had, I think, probably in living rooms everywhere. You know, what gives here? I don't think that it's ever necessarily appropriate to critique someone else's parenting, but people feel compelled to do that sometimes. Yeah, and it's understandable. Sure. We all have, you know, our own individual observations. We may think the way we do things are right. And especially in this Reddit case, the person didn't have kids. <laughs> and when you have kids, you have an understanding. They wear you down and you feel more empathy for parents. So it was probably more of the way something is being said. Because if you say something in a critical manner, mm -hmm. that's problematic. But it's always a gamble. Would you criticize your friend about anything else? It's probably even worse when you criticize their child. And here's the thing. We're not saying everybody is a good parent. Some people are not great parents. Yeah. So at, is there any time you can tactfully bring this up or within a family when you've got parents who are talking to their adult children about their parenting styles? Is there a tactful or productive way to have conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always best to stop and pause and think, hey, is there something I can learn? from this criticism, I may not like the way it was said, but maybe there's a way I can grow. Maybe I did do something uh, that was wrong that I could do better. And so that's always the best position uh, to be in. If you feel someone is constantly criticizing you, you can say, you know what, I've got this. Thank you for sharing. Look at the intent. And if you want to be a helpful friend, mm -hmm. get creative in how you approach a situation. It doesn't have to be critical. It could be, hey, you know, in this house, we wash our hands before we eat our food. Yeah. Or, you know, we don't bang a teddy bear against the wall. We're going to change direction here. It's all how you say it. If you say it in a kind way and your role model for change, that's always the best way to approach a difficult situation like this. I love that. And when you are maybe taking care of someone else's kids yeah. or someone's over for a play date and you feel like, oh, we got to work on this or talk about this, what is the most appropriate way to approach that? Well, first of all, you want to ask a parent, like, what are the rules in your house? So you get a sense of what they do. And it's perfectly okay to set boundaries and say, you know what, in this house, we have a rule. Nobody calls each other names. And you can enlighten the child and get them to move in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's okay to tell a parent, you know what, I'm sure you're not aware of this. This is what happens. But give the parent the space to figure out how they want to parent. I love that. And here you're talking about keeping a neutral tone, as we said, and focusing on the behavior of yeah. the child or the parent. Yes. Walk us through some examples of how to do that without making it feel so personal. So let's say you have a child who developmentally can't sit still mm -hmm. and you're in a restaurant. If you know this about your friend and the child, you can't say, don't bring your child. That wouldn't work. But you might say, you know what? It's a beautiful day. Why don't we have lunch to go in the park so that the child can enjoy yeah. themselves and you don't get in trouble as a friend. Set everyone up for success. Psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig, as always, we love having you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Robbie. Stay with
for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. A simple menu, a secret menu, whatever you're craving, In-N-Out Burger has been serving it up to the West Coast for more than seven decades. And while you might know some of its iconic dishes, animal style, anyone? Yes. You might not be familiar with the woman who is running the company. NBC Morning News Now anchor Savannah Sellers introduces us. Lindsay Snyder is not your average president of a multi-billion dollar company, but In-N-Out Burger is not your average fast food chain. That's what I Founded in 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder, it all started as a little hamburger stand with a pioneering drive through speaker system. My grandparents, you know, came from very humble beginnings. Now, they have 402 stores across eight states, and they've amassed quite the following, even with the rich and famous. I'll have a plain cheeseburger with light onions. Current President Lindsay Snyder grew up at In-N-Out, but her path to leadership has no shortage of twists and turns. It really was like that family pain and tragedy that really put each leader in its place. After Harry died in 1976, Esther handed control to Lindsay's uncle, Rich, but he was killed in a plane crash. The next leader, Lindsay's father, died of an overdose. At just 17, Lindsay was the only blood relative left. She started just like every other employee. You waited two hours to apply to work at a new store in Redding, California, even though your family began in and out. Is that right? I think that there's a stigma that can come with being, you know, the owner's kid and just wanting to be respected like others, doing it the right way and not having the special treatment. At 27 years old, Lindsay stepped into the role of president of In-N-Out Burger. You were very young when you come in to this now multi-billion dollar corporation. What's this been like for you? In the earlier days, I actually wore um, pantsuits and I did that because I felt like I was supposed to and then I finally you know just was confident in who I am and who I'm not you're gonna get judged either way so you might as well be judged for being who you are she's made specific and strategic choices especially in an age of inflation and increasing minimum wage how do you keep those prices and keep a profit margin I was sitting in VP meetings going toe-to-toe -to -toe saying we can't raise the prices that much we can't you know because i felt such an obligation to look out for our customer when everyone else was taking these jumps we weren't when you think about innovation or tech or artificial intelligence where does that intersect with in and out no to mobile ordering um, because that greatly impacts the customer service experience there's a lot of things that could be cheaper easier and all, but that's not that's not the system we go through. I know your faith is important to you. It is proudly a part of this company of Bible verses on most pieces of packaging. Well, my uncle <laughs> started it with the verses on the packaging and, you know, he felt we're a family company, we're a private company, and, you know, this is who we are, and I'm unashamed of my faith. You're a private company. <laughs> as long as you're here, will that stay that way? Absolutely. Because you get calls all the time. Yeah, messages, emails, Instagram <laughs> messages. People DM to buy the company. Basically, yes. <laughs> Not interested in franchising? No. <laughs> what about an IPO? No. It's staying in the family and the menu staying simple, except for those in the know. Their famous secret menu includes animal style burgers and fries, named for the rowdy teens who would order extra spread pickles and grilled onions back in the day. Another favorite, the famous Flying Dutchman. You know, the Flying Dutchman was my dad's burger. Two meat patties with two slices of cheese, and um, his nickname was the Flying Dutchman. What's your order? Mine is double meat with pickles, spread, and chopped chilies only. A burger that keeps customers coming back for more. Looking at 75 years, so many customers that have made us who we are today. It's just incredible, so there's just so much gratitude. 
So the big question, where will they head next? I asked about expanding to the East Coast. Lindsay said as long as she's around, the answer is probably never. But the company does confirm to us that they are going to move into Washington State. And as for the legacy of the company, Lindsay's oldest son has now jumped into the family burger business. By the way, you can learn more secrets of their business in Lindsay's book, The Ins and Outs of In and Out Burger. Vicki, back to you. Savannah, Savannah, what a great conversation. And man, you and I got to team up to try to bring her to the East Coast. Stay with us. I'm Vicki Wynn. You're watching NBC News Daily. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Oh, pretty, pretty bad. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Good Tuesday. I'm Vicki Wynn. My co-anchor Morgan is off today. NBC News Daily starts right now. Today, Tuesday, April 9th, abortion ruling. Arizona Supreme Court just issued its decision in a case that determines whether the procedure is legal or banned in the state. We're going to break it down and explain what it could mean for the broader battle over reproductive rights. Rust movie shooting, new developments in the case against Alec Baldwin. Why prosecutors say the actor had no control over his emotions on set when a cinematographer was fatally shot. Tax scams, the deadline to file is now just six days away. We have some tips on what you can do to keep your information safe during this last minute rush. Understanding autism. A new documentary is working to reshape the perception of people with autism. We'll talk with the film's director about his own personal journey with a developmental disorder. Welcome to NBC News Daily. So glad you could be with me. Within the last hour, Maryland officials announced plans to fully reopen that major shipping channel in the Baltimore Harbor after last month's bridge collapse. This all comes after crews started cleaning up debris on Sunday with the hopes of finding the three victims who are still unaccounted for. They're also ready to rebuild. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali is following the developments for us at this hour. Ali, it's good to see you. What else did we hear from Maryland state officials about the cleanup and this whole rebuilding process. 
Well, look, Wes Moore made the point there as he stood next to the rest of the Maryland delegation that this is still very much a community that's in mourning with three folks still unaccounted for and a community that's very much trying to rebuild both physically and emotionally. Of course, a huge part of that is going to be the money perspective of how much it will cost to ultimately do that rebuilding. That's something that Congress is going to begin taking up now in earnest now that both the Senate and the House are back in town after a two-week recess. Says. But I think what was so striking to me is that in this current climate of hyper partisanship, you did see moments of bipartisanship there in just even in terms of who was standing in the frame. You had Republicans standing next to Democrats, a real sign that this community is coming together, politics aside, at least for now. You know, Ali, Congress back in session after a two week recess. One of the top discussions is funding. How are they going to pay for all of this? What's under consideration right now? Yeah, and that's why I say for now, because there is going to be a larger conversation at play about how this bridge recovery is paid for. Of course, you're going to see this go back up into the billions in terms of what they're asking for for recovery efforts. You've got some Republicans who are likely to say that they're going to want to see offsets. They're going to want to see that paid for, especially on the House side. It's why this becomes such a tricky dance, but it's also why we're watching the Maryland delegation do as they did today and stand together in bipartisan fashion again, we've seen what happens during these appropriations and funding fights during the course of this Congress, Vicky. It gets thorny, it gets sticky, and they already have a very long to-do list in terms of money that they're trying to get out the door for anything from Ukraine aid to Israel aid, and now, of course, looking just to a state that's a neighboring state here, uh, what they're going to end up doing with the funding. But this is not a building known for moving quickly, though, of course, there is urgency around getting this cash out the door to the folks that need it. Uh, Ali, can you talk to about the families that are still waiting for word three people three of the workers who were on that bridge you know these families don't have answers yet yeah, certainly. And that's something that Governor Moore here was clear about. The fact that while they are turning their attention to actually recovering and getting the economic portion of this back into effect, they are very much still a community in mourning because there are three people who have not yet been found. He made the point during his remarks here that they were doing dangerous work mm -hmm. overnight, but that this should not have been deadly work. Mm -hmm. And so while they celebrate the fact that they were able to save lives through quick responses and the ability to get folks off that bridge as quickly as they possibly could. Of course, we know that there were many lives lost still, and that's not far from mine for the folks who are beginning the funding battle, but very much still looking at the tragedy that happened just a few weeks ago. Yeah. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali, we appreciate these updates coming in live as all of this is developing. That is a major shipping channel, really important news. Ali Vitali, thank you so much. We have breaking news now in Arizona to tell you about. Moments ago, the state Supreme Court ruled that a 15-week abortion ban is not legal and cannot go into effect. It is a win for anti-abortion advocates because Arizona will now revert back to a near total ban that has roots in the Civil War era. NBC News correspondent Yamish Alcindor joins me now. So Yamish, Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs is, expressed, uh, is expected to have a press briefing on this any minute now, but walk us through this, this decision and what it means for families in that state of Arizona. Well, this really is a decision that's already creating waves across the country. The Arizona State Supreme Court just announced that a state ban on nearly all abortions that was part of a law in, that was passed in 1864, that that will now be the law of the land in Arizona. And that law um, was first passed by a legislator, and it bans anyone from providing abortion services except to save the life of the mother. Now, people found in violation of that law could face a mandatory two to five years in prison if convicted. This decision was up to six state Supreme Court justices they were all appointed by Republicans. Now, the current law for now, because this law is going to be stayed, at least this decision is going to be stayed for at least 14 days, the mm -hmm. current law is still that if abortions are illegal at least up until 15 weeks. That law was signed in 2022 by then Arizona Governor Doug Ducey, and it allowed, again, for abortions up to 15 weeks, though it did not have exceptions for rape and incest. It really only was immediately, if it was immediately necessary to avert the death of a mother. So this is really a big decision in Arizona. 
Arizona, definitely one that's going to have a lot of effect. And I should, of course, also note that there is a ballot initiative that is underway. There are there's a move to try to get signatures to enshrine abortion rights into the state constitution there. And that's going to be pick up even more, I think, um, more momentum now that the state is banning nearly all abortions. Vicky? Yeah, it could be a real driver in November to get people to the ballots. It gathered enough signatures just last week so that it will be on the, the ballot in November. Is that your understanding, Yamish? That's my understanding. That's what the advocates are saying. We're still waiting to see if it's actually going to be on the ballot. Um, another thing to note, apart from that ballot initiative, I think if we go back to what this ruling means, it's really a big question of how it's going to be enforced because mm -hmm. the governor of uh, Arizona has said that she wasn't going to allow anybody to be prosecuted for violating mm -hmm. abortion laws. And the attorney general also said that that was going to be the case when they were running for election. But now that this Supreme Court, state Supreme Court decision has been made, it's going to be very tricky to figure out whether or not the attorney general is going to be bound um, to try to enforce this and to try to possibly even imprison people if they're found in violation of the abortion laws in that state, Vicki. Yeah, a lot of questions. You said 14-day stay, so we'll be watching this issue. NBC News correspondent Yamish Alcindor with that breaking news out of Arizona. Thank you. Busy news day for us here. Now to breaking news in Michigan, where the parents of school shooter Ethan Crumbly were just sentenced to 10 to 15 years each in prison. James and Jennifer Crumbly appeared in court together earlier this year. Two separate juries found the Crumblies guilty on four counts of involuntary manslaughter slaughter, stemming from the 2021 shooting by their son at Oxford High School that took the lives of four classmates. During both trials, prosecutors accused James and Jennifer of ignoring their son's pleas for mental health treatment and providing him with the gun that he used in that mass shooting. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster live outside the courthouse for us. So, Shaq, the judge had some really harsh words for the Crumblies during this sentencing, did not show any mercy. Tell us more about what she said and what the Crumblies said to the court. Yeah, you saw the judge side with the prosecution in this. The prosecution was, uh, initially was asking for 10 to 15 years behind bars, and that is exactly what the judge ended up doing, essentially ignoring what those two parents were asking for, which was essentially time served and extended probation. And we heard the judge explain some of the reasoning as to why she gave that higher sentence. She said that this is not about bad parenting, somewhat dismissing the arguments that you heard from the Crumblies, but she said that instead this was about them not taking actions to stop, in her words, what was in a runaway train. I want you to listen to what we heard from Jennifer and James Crumbly before that sentence came down as they addressed both the court and the families of those four students who were killed. This tragedy has changed who I am and has taught me some very valuable lessons. It said in suffering, we gain wisdom. I've also gained God. In the quiet hours of myself, I pray to him about the deep impact this tragedy has had on the families and the endless pain no one should ever have to feel. I can't imagine the pain and agony that the families, for the families that have lost their children and what they're experiencing and what they're going through. Again, the judge siding with the prosecution, sentencing them to 10 to 15 years in prison. You know, Shaq, I think it's so important to hear from the families of these four teenagers who were killed. I, one of the moms said that, you know, while the Crumblies were ignoring their son, she was trying to help her daughter with college applications. There was real impact that will never go away for these families. Tell us about what they had to say in court today. Yeah, it was emotional and heartbreaking statements that we heard from those parents, from the sister of one of the victims at one point. I want you to listen to a little bit of what we heard directly from the families. While your son was hearing voices and asking for help, I was helping Madison pick out her senior classes. While you were purchasing, seeing a gun for your son and leaving it unlocked, I was helping her finish her college essays. The overarching message that you heard from the family, from the prosecution during the trial, and now from the judge, is that these two parents were in a unique position. They could have done more to stop this shooting, this massacre back in 2021. And it was the inaction that led to their conviction and now their sentence. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster. Shaq, thank you so much.
Well, up next, a video you have to see to believe. A man fights back against someone trying to steal his truck from his own driveway. More of this dramatic video and what happened next. You're watching NBC News Daily. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. What is going to happen now? Going back and forth, Kristen. Go ahead. This is it. Report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. New fallout today in the high-profile case against actor Alec Baldwin. According to newly released court documents, prosecutors are accusing Baldwin of having, quote, absolutely no control over his emotions before a cinematographer was shot and killed on the Rust movie set. NBC News legal analyst Angela Senadella joins me now. Sen Angela, it's great to see you. So Baldwin is now set to go on trial in July for involuntary manslaughter. He has already pleaded not guilty. But talk about these new accusations and what was most revealing to you in these documents. Yes. So these accusations are almost a response to Baldwin's accusations that he lobbed first. So his team, in this motion to dismiss that they filed, claimed that the prosecutors were abusing the system, just dragging this innocent man through two and a half years when they had no case. Mm -hmm. So the prosecutors, in response here, almost detailed in excruciating detail wow. all of the terrible things they believed Baldwin and his team did. Chief among those, lying. They accuse him multiple times of lying. As a lawyer, you know there's a difference between bluffing, getting the best deal for your client, mm -hmm. and actually lying. And they accuse not just Baldwin, but also his lawyers of, of, of lying. Now, we also learned with confirmation there was a plea deal on the table. This could have all been avoided, potentially? Yes, most likely no jail time. Wow. Because in this document, it says the plea deal was very similar to the assistant directors. Now, we know that he got no jail time, and he was just supposed to testify mm -hmm. about what happened, likely against Hannah Gutierrez-Reed in the last trial. But they pulled this plea deal back even before the expiration because they accused him of just not playing fight a fair ball of of going to the press and also of trying to file a complaint and more concerned about his PR than about the actual trial. So Angela, if you were the defender in this case, what would your strategy be at this point going into this trial in July? And also remind our viewers, what kind of punishment could Baldwin face if he is convicted? So now he could really face 18 months in jail and wow. also a fine. So his biggest thing he has to worry about is keeping his story straight because also in this detailed complaint was an, it was 
all the clarifications about how he changed his story. First at on the ABC News interview, and then also talking to OSHA, also talking to interviewers. And it really goes line by line in the transcript saying how he changed his story. So if he gets up on that stand, or even regardless if he does, he has to be consistent. That is what a jury is going to look for. And they are just not going to believe him if they see these discrepancies. That's what prosecutors are going to really pick apart. They don't like inconsistency. Well, they do if it's not their client. They like inconsistency, exactly. right? Right. And but a jury does not like a liar. All right. NBC News legal analyst Angela Senadella with this breaking news in the Baldwin case. Thank you so much, Angela. Well, a dramatic car theft attempt caught on camera. Video shows the moment a man was knocked down by a getaway car in his own driveway after fighting off a would-be thief who was trying to steal his truck. You see it all there unfolding on your screen. Dana Griffin spoke to that man about how he's doing and what made him choose to fight back. Just seconds after getting a notification in the middle of the night, Eric Smith captured on his own ring camera tackling a suspected car prowler who had been sitting in the passenger side of his truck. I put my hands on him and grabbed him. Uh, at that point, he started screaming, yelling for um, the driver of the vehicle uh, to help him out. Help, help. Then the driver of this getaway car backs up, angles toward them, and accelerates. Felt kind of like a movie, you know. I, I just end up on the hood, held on, turned around to see where I was going to impact. I saw I was going straight for my truck. Saw my truck door was open. Uh, just happened to pick up my legs um, and kick my door closed. After being hurled off the vehicle and slamming into his own truck, Smith stands up without a scratch to snap a photo before the suspect sped away. I was a little shaky, so the photos came out a little blurry. The incident happened last month outside his Pierce County, Washington home. His family now sharing it online to help authorities identify the suspects. And I give a lot of credit to social media. The Pierce County Sheriff's Department tells NBC News those images led to a potential arrest in a different city, but they have yet to confirm if the suspect is tied to their investigation. The department writing in a statement in part, we have seen a significant rise in motor vehicle thefts with juvenile suspects. This incident is particularly scary since it shows how bold these suspects are getting and at what costs they will take to get away. According to the department, motor vehicle thefts were up 27% in the county last year. Just 30 minutes prior to, you know, another person on social media reached out and provided footage of them uh, hitting their vehicles. Deputies say it's likely the suspects were casing nearby homes, but no other reports were filed with the department. They got nothing out of it. I have nothing. I don't keep anything in my vehicle, um, but they were certainly lucky. Lucky, Eric says, because everyone involved could have been hurt. Would you have done anything different? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, absolutely not. You know, there's so many different ways this could have gone, and I think I had probably the best outcome. Dana Griffin, NBC News. A uh, lucky homeowner there. Well, we are less than a week from a tax day. What you can do today to get everything in on time, plus some of the often overlooked ways that you can maximize your refund. That's coming up. Stay with us. You're watching NBC News Daily.
if the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just did. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Mexico's government is cutting ties with Ecuador after police stormed the Mexican embassy in Quito and arrested Ecuador's former vice president. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has more on the growing tensions there and why Mexico says the raid violated international law. Mexico! Mexico! Mexico breaking diplomatic ties with Ecuador after an unprecedented use of force. Police in Ecuador's capital, Quito, raiding the Mexican embassy over the weekend and arresting former Ecuadorian Vice President Jorge Glass, who had been granted political asylum by Mexico. Video shared by Mexico's foreign minister shows the moment Roberto Canseco, a Mexican diplomat, tries to stop the caravan with the VP from driving away and is tackled by police outside the embassy. Como delincuentes. Allanaron la Embajada de México en Ecuador. Mexican officials say the officers entered by force, jumping over the wall, forcing the gate, and hurting Mexican personnel. México reitera su condena por la violación de la inmunidad de su embajada en Quito y la agresión a su personal. Glass, who was moved to a high-security prison in Guayaquil on Sunday, arrived at the Quito embassy in December after he was indicted on corruption charges, charges he claimed were politically motivated. Now some residents in Ecuador concerned this stunning arrest is yet another political play. Pienso que fue una decisión muy política, eh, justamente para, eh, en consecuencia de que el apoyo de, del presidente está descendiendo. Ecuador's foreign minister defending the move, saying that there was a risk of imminent escape and that Mexico violated the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries when they gave glass asylum. The U.S. State Department condemning any violation of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, writing on X, we encourage our partners Mexico and Ecuador to resolve their differences in accord with international norms. On Sunday, Mexican diplomats returning back home to an outpour of support. As Mexican officials say, their embassy in Ecuador will remain closed indefinitely. Guad Venegas, NBC News. A man from the U.K. just finished running the entire length of Africa. In the process, he helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley has our story. Breathless but triumphant, 27-year-old Russ Cook completing a monumental challenge, running the length of Africa. Very good, I'm a bit tired. That's almost 10,000 miles, or roughly the equivalent of 376 marathons, over 352 days. I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. The realization that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two-month-old in the time he's done this. The UK native crossing the finish line at the northern tip of the continent in Los Angeles, Tunisia, on Sunday. After a grueling and at times perilous journey across 16 countries, starting at the southernmost point in Cape Agula, South Africa, last April. Day 337. Cook documenting his journey on social media as he tackled different climates and terrains. But he also had to deal with unpredictable and dangerous scenarios. He says in Angola he was robbed at gunpoint of his passport and phones, and that in Congo he escaped locals armed with machetes by paying them off. The scariest moment was... Uh, in the Congo when I was on the back of a motorbike thinking I was about to die. <laughs> um, yeah, getting driven into the jungle. That was that was pretty nuts. That terrifying ordeal even making him consider quitting. Probably for about one minute thought about quitting and then I realised I couldn't. So that's about as close as it ever got. And if all that wasn't challenging enough, he was initially denied a visa crossing into Algeria from Mauritania, 
when he turned to social media for help. I've been following him since he first started. His supporters finishing with him on the last leg in awe of the man who also ran from Asia to London three years ago. I saw the post on Instagram where he invited everyone out. I just couldn't miss a crazy historic opportunity like this. His run, dubbed as Project Africa, raising almost $900,000 and will go towards two charities. I'm a big believer in sport doing wonders for people's lives and um, it changed my life. Though Russ has more in store, for now, he's just looking to unwind. I've got a whole list of ideas. But yeah, no, I definitely am um, keen to chill out for, for a moment, spend some time with the family and stuff. You know? Matt Bradley, NBC News. Congratulations, nearly a year on the run. Incredible. Stay with us. You're watching NBC News. Dave. News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. A good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Welcome back. It is 12.30 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and 1.30 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm Vicki Wynn. Here's what's making news right now. Police in Idaho have arrested an 18-year-old for allegedly planning to kill people during church services in his hometown, all in the name of ISIS. The teenager was arrested Saturday, just one day before he planned to carry out his attacks. If he's convicted, he faces up to 20 years in federal prison. Norfolk Southern is agreeing to a $600 million settlement in a class action lawsuit related to the East Palestine train derailment back in 2023. The settlement covers all claims within 20 miles of the derailment site, including health care costs and local business expenses. One lucky person in Oregon is coming forward to claim their $1.3 billion dollar jackpot prize. Officials say the winning Powerball ticket was sold at a convenience store in Portland. This prize is the fourth largest Powerball jackpot in history. Well, right now, millions of Americans are set to face a line of severe storms moving from Texas to Louisiana. Forecasters say tornadoes are possible, but the main threat is very large hail. As you can see in this video, hail has already started to hit overnight in parts of the Lone Star State. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins me now in studio. Bill, always great to see you. So 
Which cities are going to see the worst of this storm and where is it headed next? Yeah, Vicki, we're focusing on Texas and then we're going to slide into Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi as we go into tomorrow. Currently, we have a tornado watch. Haven't had any tornadoes reported. Yesterday, we actually made it through fairly well unscathed also. This goes until 5 o'clock, Austin, the Waco to Corsicana. And the other issue is a lot of this heavy rain is sitting over the same spots and we're starting to get issues with flash flooding. We'll talk about that in a second. So we're waiting to see if we get any tornadoes today or even tornado warnings. Warnings. We got a couple rotating storms in this, but no tornado warnings. We only have one active severe thunderstorm warning, ping pong ball size hail with this just south of Hamilton, Texas, and this will be moving to the north or as we go throughout the next hour or two. Most of the big storms, by the way, have been avoiding the Dallas Fort Worth area, which has been good for especially you know, everyone traveling uh, post eclipse. Now, the areas of concern later today will slide into East Texas and eventually into Louisiana. Dallas, you are in that slight risk, but we do think some of the worst of the storms and the highest concentration will be in East Texas. And if we get any stronger tornadoes, it would be in this hatched area from College Station and eventually this evening here to Fort Polk, maybe towards Alexandria. Uh, we don't expect a tornado outbreak today, but we do expect some strong storms. And if we get a tornado outbreak, tomorrow is the day where it could more likely happen. Already the Storm Prediction Center has issued what we call a moderate risk of severe weather, and that means widespread from central Louisiana heading through the southern half of Mississippi. We could have even a few strong tornadoes if conditions are, you know, if they happen just right, if the air is not too contaminated with a lot of clouds and moisture, we get any sunshine early in the day. This is the region from New Orleans to Jackson, Hattiesburg, Neumopolis, all the way to Mobile. This will be the area of greatest concern tomorrow. So again, two days of pretty strong storms and possible tornadoes. And then flash flooding. Notice I told you all those storms around Waco. Flash flood warnings are current there. About one to three inches has fallen up to Corsicana. Also right near Greenville, Mississippi, here into areas of southern Arkansas, one little flash flood warning. But you can see see how many areas here have a chance for flash flooding over the next couple days. Very dangerous conditions, especially tomorrow, Vicki. That'll be the day of uh, greatest con you know, concentration of strong storms. All right, NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, thanks for the uh, information on what to watch out for. All right, well, there is a new book out today looking at the idea of rituals and how they enhance our lives, whether it is how you make your morning coffee before you head to work or your skincare routine. Those simple acts can actually have a much longer lasting effect than a lot of us might think. Now, the book is called The Ritual Effect from Habit to Ritual, Harness the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. Joining me now is the author, Professor Michael Norton. He teaches at Harvard's Business School. Michael, it's great to have you with us. Thank Thanks you so, so much for being here. So first, let's talk about rituals. How are they different from something like just a, an everyday habit or a tradition? Can I ask you, in the morning, do you brush your teeth first and then shower, or do you shower and then brush your teeth? I shower the night before, and then I wake up and I brush my teeth. How would you floss. feel if I said to do it differently? Yeah, it'd be weird. Weird? Uh, yeah, it'd be weird. <laughs> so that's kind of what we see is that habits are things that we do just to get them done, to yeah. check them off. And rituals tend to be something where we like the way we do it. We have a certain way of doing it. And if I say, we well, do it differently, people say, no, I don't want to. I'd feel weird all day. I wouldn't feel right. And that's when we get toward emotion and meaning in our actions instead of just a habit where it's kind of dry. I'm trying to think of anything that I'm ritualistic about. What, what's an example of a ritual that you partake in? Have you ever made a cake that's frosted very carefully and then put wax candles in it and lit them on fire? And then the wax drips on the candle and then you put it in front of a kid and they blow out the candles and they're probably sick and then you eat the cake? Very, very weird thing that we do, but obviously it's a birthday cake. So we take a, a normal thing and turn it into something that's really very fun. And we put meaning into it. So you write about ritual signatures in your book. What is that? We see that people have their own little way of doing things. I was actually talking to some athletes last week about how they tie their shoes. And tying shoes is boring. Mm -hmm. It's just a thing that we do. But athletes have a very specific way that they tie, all different from each other, but very specific, like left shoe, double knot, right shoe, double knot. And when they do that, the way that they like to do it, they say, now I feel ready to go out there and play. It's their little signature of how they do their shoes. Mm -hmm. And that makes them feel differently about what they're gonna do next. Interesting, Some, it sort of reminds me of um, people who are superstitious. We had the UConn coach on Today's Show earlier talking about you know the special dragon underwear and like the way he does his M&Ms but it's it's a little bit different from that but they kind of share a commonality you also found that in your book 60 to 75 percent of people in relationships have a ritual that they do together as a couple how does that strengthen a relationship yes yeah, so if we ask people you know there's something special and cute that you and your partner make sure to do every day or every week or every month Many, many couples say, yes, we do. And there are these little cute things. My favorite one ever for some reason is they said we clink our silverware together 
every time oh, before that's we so eat. Cute. Yeah. And it's a very random little tiny gesture, but for them it means something. We've been together forever. We're going to keep doing this forever. It really shows that you're committed to your partner, and that's what we see in the data. And that is something that helps you maintain that relationship. Okay, Professor Michael Morton, thank you so much for teaching us about the importance of rituals today. Well, March Madness is now officially over after UConn beat Purdue last night to win its second straight national title. There were some historic moments during both the men's and women's tournaments, but off the court, the game set new sports betting records as well. CNBC correspondent Contessa Brewer joins me now. So, Contessa, I know you have been covering sports betting, this industry this emerged over the last few years. Walk us through what this all means for the future of legal gambling on women's sports in particular. It this is so unbelievable, Vicky, because the sports books themselves hit the jackpot with women's college basketball. South Carolina's undefeated season, and then, of course, Iowa's Caitlin Clark. Both of those storylines fed into a narrative that then fueled the biggest single women's betting event of all time for hmm. FanDuel and BetMGM. Caesars told us that it doubled the previous record for handle. That is the amount that people wager. Hmm. And it says, look, Imagine what would have happened if this was a game that had been shown in prime time instead of some like afternoon slot mm. when it got buried. Even so, where the wagers are concerned, Vicky, the game far outperformed even the NBA games on Sunday. So the growth of women's sports could mean big business for the sports books because right now only about a quarter of their customers, give or take, are women. Yeah, I heard someone saying that these matches, when there's a household name and it's game of consequence, like the NCAA final was, you get everybody tuning in. What about the men's championship last night? How much did people bet there? Who cashed in? FanDuel tells us that the uh, men's championship game saw a 52% increase in the number of bets over last year and then a 42% jump in the handle. Again, that's the amount wagered. DraftKings told us that last night's game was the most bet on college basketball game of all time and Caesars saw the most single game parlays on a college basketball game. That's where you add in all these different things in order of how, okay, first, the, you know, UConn's going to end the first half up and you, you label them all. Usually that's good for the sports books and not so great for the gamblers, but we'll see how that turns out. Speaking of storylines, Barstool founder Dave Portnoy made a $600,000 bet on UConn March 20th, did it with DraftKings for a win of $2.76 million. He wow. says his biggest win ever. Good for him, bad for DraftKings. In fact, the whole tournament, I think, the customers won out because they had favorites covering the spread 61% of the time. Yeah. When customers are lucky, sometimes that shows up in the company's earnings. Well, sports betting is here to stay, it sounds like. CNBC correspondent Contessa Brewer, thank you so much. Sure. Well, there are exactly six days left to the tax day deadline, and according to the IRS, more than 90 million people have already filed their returns. But you, if you are running behind, experts say don't rush, don't get confused, and don't become the victim of a long list of tax filing scams. We have with us Chief Tax Information Officer at Jackson Hewitt, Mark Steber. Mark, so good to have you here. So Monday, April 15th, that is the deadline day. What are some of your tips for people who are filing last minute right now? Don't forget, if you won on FanDuel, winnings go on your tax return. If you you're so lucky, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you're so lucky, and you'll probably get a 1099 if you win more than 600, like uh, the good man who won his two million. Yeah, Dave Portner. Wow. Uh, I would simply say, don't panic. There's still plenty of time, even though we're down to about 140 hours and you know an odd 30 odd minutes. No stress. Uh, because accuracy and a complete return is very important, not mm -hmm. just to avoid IRS audits or letters or those pesky in inquiries, but also it can delay your refund. It's uh -huh. Still, six out of seven or seven out of ten people are getting refunds. Okay. Refunds are up. You know, we expect about 100 million people to get about 300 billion dollars. So you don't want to delay that. So yeah. accuracy matters. And as you get into these final hours, you'll just want to get it done. So right. you'll hurry through it, and you may leave something off. And it may even cost you money in addition to the delay. So be accurate. Be forthright. You can file an extension uh, to file your paperwork, not to pay if you owe. Mm -hmm. So there's some things to fall into. But be careful. What are some of the life events and tax credits that people often overlook? Well, getting married, having a child, those are kind of obvious, mm -hmm. right? But the ones that people have been overlooking for the last couple of years since the pandemic, side hustle income. Right. You know, oh, it's just a hobby. 
hobby. I just do it part time. Doesn't matter if you're making money, or even worse, if you're losing money, you might have a tax deduction. Oh, that's Going good. back to school, half a dozen benefits for tax credits on education. Okay. Uh, complicated family structure, shared custody, for example, taking care of dependent parents, and the list goes on and on and on. I saw moving as well in bankruptcy. Moving into a new state, so having some financial difficulty, those scammers that show up on your TV at night yes. saying, "We know a guy." Don't fall prey to that either. And there are a lot of forgiveness programs at IRS. So there's really no small definition of a life event. You know it. If it's causing you trouble, tell your tax pro and then say benefit, credit, election may save you money and you're not going to lose out. We got 20 seconds. What's the biggest scam or a couple to watch out for? Well, the people who promise you these unbelievable returns on mm -hmm. their tax refunds, guarantee it. Don't worry. They know a guy mm -hmm. and then don't sign it. A lot of unscrupulous people creep in. Don't get your tax guidance off social media or TikTok. A lot of guys out there posting fake stuff just because it's funny, get you into trouble. You can do it yourself. Have a pro on your contact list and ask them, hey, can I take the fuel tax credit because I bought a Tesla? No. You know, get some good advice from a good tax pro. It'll pay dividends over your lifetime. Chief Tax Information Officer at Jackson Hewitt. Mark Steber, you're the best. Thank you so much. Happy Steber. Tax Day. Changing the narrative, the common misconceptions about people with autism and how we can support friends and family who are neurodivergent. That is next. Stay with us. More NBC News Daily right after this. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Well, April is Autism Acceptance Month, and today we are highlighting a new documentary called Understanding Autism. In it, filmmaker and advocate Scott Steindorf opens up about his personal journey and tackles the misconceptions and challenges surrounding life on the spectrum. My name is Scott Steindorf, and I'm autistic. I struggle with social cues, organization planning, emotional regulation, and it's made my journey in life a struggle. Scott is here with us now, and he's joined by Dr. Roseanne Capana hodge She's a licensed professional counselor and founder of the Global Institute of Children's Mental Health. Thank you to you both. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Scott, let me start with you. Why did you make this film, and what did you learn about autism? 
It's genetic, most likely. My father had was on the spectrum. My sibling, my brother was on the spectrum. My adult children are on it. And I wanted to understand what is it? There's so many misconceptions. For example, that we don't feel. We feel too much. And, you know, we also have extraordinary intellectual capabilities. So I don't like using the word disability. And even those that can't speak, I have found on this journey, have higher intelligence. And they used to say that they were less intelligent. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kapanahaj, we heard what Scott just said there about some of the common misperceptions. Explain to us what you see in your clinical practice and what are some of the things you want people to know? I think one of the greatest disservices that I see to neurodivergence in general and individuals with autism is delayed diagnosis. Mm. So many families, particularly mothers, ask their pediatricians and physicians and say, is this normal? Is this speech regression normal? Is this toe walking normal? Mm. And they get told they'll outgrow it. Mm -hmm. And we know from the CDC that we can reliably diagnose most kids with autism by age two, but yet oh, wow. the average age is five. And so that means delayed intervention mm -hmm. and intervention is so critical for particularly social communication and we can better the lives of individuals with neurodivergence when we identify them earlier. Wow, so people are typically diagnosed at five when you think it's reliable and you can actually put that diagnosis in at age two. Yeah, CDC says as that as a fact and, and you know with one in 36 children now being diagnosed with autism one in 45 adults we need to do a better job of getting this out there to the masses not mm -hmm. just for parents but for the physicians who really are those frontline workers absolutely to identify it Scott I know you met and spoke with so many different people who were neurodivergent tell us about some of the memorable characters in your film I think a lot of the families have this autistic love autistic joy that I've never seen. It was beautiful. Oh, you're getting emotional just talking about it. Tell us a little bit more about that and why. It's just that these families come together. To support their person support, who's on the spectrum. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Oh. And it's in my movie. We can't wait to see it. So tell us a little bit more, doctor, in terms of, you know, what does neurodiversity look like in adulthood, especially if you missed the boat completely in childhood and were not diagnosed? Yeah, I mean, we're opening our ideas of what neurodivergence is. It's brain differences, and we have to start thinking of it, about it, as Scott said, that it's about differences of abilities, mm -hmm. right? We focus on the deficit. So when it comes to adults, right, many people wind up coming to this diagnosis of autism because maybe they've had difficulty with social um, reciprocity, mm -hmm. meaning that they want to be social, they lack the skills in doing it. So they might have had a history of difficulty in relationships, at work, um, but they have many assets. They can have um, hyper-focusing skills, they can have giftedness in certain areas, but it's that social piece that often is lacking for them, not because they don't want it, it's because their environment isn't set to support what they can do. Is there a website or a place people can go to learn a little bit more about this? Well, I mean, you can go to many, there are many things about, including talk about curing autism now. Mm -hmm. There's different websites. You can go to CDC. There are, there are many places where you can get accurate information about autism. Okay. The ARC is a great the resource. The ARC, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Terrific. The film is called Understanding Autism. Filmmaker Scott Steindorf, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Roseanne Kapanahaj, it was great to talk with you and learn a little bit more for Autism Month. Stay with us, everyone. You're watching Daily.
you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A simple menu, a secret menu, whatever you're craving, In-N-Out Burger has been serving it up to the West Coast for more than seven decades. And while you might know some of its iconic dishes, animal style, anyone? Yes. You might not be familiar with the woman who is running the company. NBC Morning News Now anchor Savannah Sellers introduces us. Lindsay Snyder is not your average president of a multi-billion dollar company, but In-N-Out Burger is not your average fast food chain. That's what I Founded in 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder, it all started as a little hamburger stand with a pioneering drive through speaker system. My grandparents, you know, came from very humble beginnings. Now, they have 402 stores across eight states, and they've amassed quite the following, even with the rich and famous. They all have a plain cheese with light onions. Current President Lindsay Snyder grew up at In-N-Out, but her path to leadership has no shortage of twists and turns. It really was like that family pain and tragedy that really put each leader in its place. After Harry died in 1976, Esther handed control to Lindsay's uncle, Rich, but he was killed in a plane crash. The next leader, Lindsay's father, died of an overdose. At just 17, Lindsay was the only blood relative left. She started just like every other employee. You waited two hours to apply to work at a new store in Redding, California, even though your family began in and out, is that right? I think that there's a stigma that can come with being, you know, the owner's kid and just wanting to be respected like others doing it the right way and not having the special treatment. At 27 years old, Lindsay stepped into the role of president of In-N-Out Burger. You were very young when you come in to this now multi-billion dollar corporation. What's this been like for you? In the earlier days, I actually wore um, pantsuits and I did that because I felt like I was supposed to and then I finally you know just was confident in who I am and who I'm not you're gonna get judged either way so you might as well be judged for being who you are she's made specific and strategic choices especially in an age of inflation and increasing minimum wage how do you keep those prices and keep a profit margin I was sitting in VP meetings going toe-to-toe -to -toe saying we can't raise the prices that much. We can't, you know, because I felt such an obligation to look out for our customer. When everyone else was taking these jumps, we weren't. When you think about innovation or tech or artificial intelligence, where does that intersect with in and out No to mobile ordering um, because that greatly impacts the customer service experience. There's a lot of things that could be cheaper, easier, and all, but that's not that's not the system we go through. I know your faith is important to you. It is proudly a part of this company of Bible verses on most pieces of packaging. Well, my uncle <laughs> started it with the verses on the packaging and, you know, he felt we're a family company, we're a private company, and, you know, this is who we are, and I'm unashamed of my faith. You're a private company. <laughs> as long as you're here, will that stay that way? Absolutely. Because you get calls all the time. Yeah, messages, emails, Instagram messages. People DM to buy the company. Basically, <laughs> yes. Not interested in franchising? No. <laughs> what about an IPO? No. It's staying in the family and the menu staying simple, except for those in the know. Their famous secret menu includes animal style burgers and fries, named for the rowdy teens who would order extra spread pickles and grilled onions back in the day. Another favorite, the famous Flying Dutchman. You know, the Flying Dutchman was my dad's burger. Two meat patties with two slices of cheese and um, his nickname was the Flying Dutchman. What's your order? Mine is double meat with pickles, spread, and chopped chilies only. A burger that keeps customers coming back for more. Looking at 75 years, so many customers that have made us who we are today. It's just incredible. So there's just so much gratitude. 
So the big question, where will they head next? I asked about expanding to the East Coast. Lindsay said as long as she's around, the answer is probably never. But the company does confirm to us that they are going to move into Washington State. And as for the legacy of the company, Lindsay's oldest son has now jumped into the family burger business. By the way, you can learn more secrets of their business in Lindsay's book, The Ins and Outs of In and Out Burger. Vicki, back to you. Savannah, Savannah, what a great conversation. And man, you and I got to team up to try to bring her to the East Coast. Stay with us. I'm Vicki Wynn. You're watching NBC News Daily. What's going to happen? Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Hello, everyone. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zingle Asamoa. NBC News Daily starts right now. Today, Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, breaking news, historic sentence. For the first time, the parents of a school shooter will serve years in prison for their roles in a deadly attack. The message they had for the victim's families before they were sentenced. Stern message, Israel's prime minister saying no force in the world can stop plans for a ground operation in Rafa, a city where civilians have fled to. What it could mean for the stalled ceasefire negotiation. Show them the money, the deadline faster approaching to file your taxes, how you can crunch those final numbers and make sure you get the best refund possible. Plus, cozy cardio. What if you could do your workout without getting out of your pajamas? Yeah, we'll take you inside the growing exercise trend, giving more people a chance to move. I would do that. Right? Cozy <laughs> yes. clothes, nice drink. Cozy workout, Can't sounds go good wrong. to me. Uh, we do need to begin, though, with the breaking news. And this is an historic moment inside a Michigan courtroom. The parents of a school shooter have both been sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. Jennifer and James Crumbly were found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in separate trials earlier this year. They were sentenced together just a short time ago. They are the first parents in the United States to be convicted in connection with their child's mass school shooting. Their son is spending life in prison after killing four people at a high school back in 2021. Both Jennifer and James Crumbly spoke to the victim's families before learning their fate. We were good parents. We were the average family. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son and each other tremendously. I am truly very sorry 
I am sorry for your loss as a result of what my son did. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa covered both trials. She's outside the courthouse in Pontiac, Michigan. Now, Maggie, 10 to 15 years is what the prosecution was asking for and what happened. Can you tell us more about the sentences and, and those emotional moments in court today? Yeah, so those sentences, Kate and Sinclair, are the maximum allowed under Michigan law for involuntary manslaughter charges. There were four deaths. There were four counts that each parent was convicted on. But because they stem from the same shooting, the sentences will be served concurrently, meaning at the same time. So we're talking 10 to 15. The parents will be eligible for parole in 10. Uh, the sentences were handed down after both parents, in a surprise twist, as you saw, spoke to the court. We also heard really powerful victim impact statements from all uh, families of the four students killed, including Nicole Beausoleil. She is the mother of Madison Baldwin, and she told me yesterday that she really wanted to talk specifically to Jennifer Crumbly in her words, mom to mom. Take a listen. When you texted, Ethan, don't do it. I was texting Madison, I love you, please call mom. <laughs> When you found out about the lives your son took that day, I was still waiting for my daughter in a parking lot. The lack of compassion that you have shown is outright disgusting. Not only did your son kill my daughter, but you both did as well. And I asked Nicole just moments ago after the sentence was handed down, after she made that tearful speech, if the maximum sentence in this case was enough. And Kate Sinclair, she said no, because I am serving a life sentence. Mm, just painful testimony, Maggie. What are the Crumbly's lawyers saying about appealing the sentence here? Yeah, the judge made it clear that definitely is their right, especially given that they have uh, received the maximum and it's outside state guidelines. It's harsher than state guidelines actually stipulate in this case, but those are guidelines and the judge has a discretion. Uh, at this point, uh, Jennifer Crumley's attorney has written in court memos that she does plan to appeal her conviction and her sentence. James Crumley's team, because remember, they have different defense teams, they have not said either way. So they've left that door open effectively. And we asked both defense teams for comment after today's sentencing hearing. We were told no comment at this time. So we will, of course, wait and see, guys. Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. Former President Donald Trump and special counsel Jack Smith appear to be heading for a legal clash at the Supreme Court. Overnight, the special counsel filed a brief. He asked the justices to reject Trump's claims of presidential immunity in the federal January 6th election interference case. So let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Angela Senadella. Angela, I want to dig into one specific part of this filing where the special counsel wrote, quote, the framers never endorsed criminal immunity for a former president and all presidents from the founding to the modern era have known that after leaving office, they faced potential criminal liability for official acts. What do you make of that argument? I think, Clay, that is a very strong argument. There is literally no indication that there has ever been a president or any branch of government that believed that presidents are totally above any criminal prosecution. And one example that's often given is that Nixon was actually pardoned. Why? Because there was a possible expectation of criminal prosecution. Now, I think from his side, what, the, what Trump's team will be saying is that also the framing fathers have never were never intended for outgoing presidents to be prosecuted by new incoming teams. So that will likely be their main argument. But this whole idea that presidents are above criminal liability is a novel one and not one that many people expect to succeed in the Supreme Court. So I think I know the answer to this already, but is there any precedent for the opening arguments that are going to start, what, April 25th? So specifically, there's no precedent because there's obviously never been a president like this who has been attempted to be held criminally liable for anything. However, both sides will rely on case law because that's what happens in front of the Supreme Court. And we hear from Jack Smith's team a lot of strong arguments about how separation of powers exists for a reason, and that's been upheld by the Supreme Court multiple times, and that is because no branch of government is total. No, no branch of government is absolute. There's always limits. So that is one that is going to be powerfully used to attempt to prove here that Trump has limits. And Angela, let's talk about a separate Trump case, the criminal hush money case. Trump had asked for a delay that was rejected. Do we have a sense of why? 
So it appears that this has to do with a lawsuit that Trump has now brought against a judge. The lawsuit is under seal, so we don't know the details. But with regards to that lawsuit, he then asks an appeals court to stop and delay this trial until his lawsuit proceeds. Now, that was a long shot anyway. We didn't really expect that to succeed. The next step is to go to the entire appellate court. That would be five people and attempt to ask there for another delay. And then also we expect a possibility on Tuesday for him to ask the judge himself to recuse himself again another long shot but at this point look on monday this trial is supposed to start and that's what we expect to happen all right angela senadella for us angela thanks thank you right now tens of millions of people in the southern u.s are dealing with some dangerous weather yeah some people in texas have already seen golf ball size hail and now the storms are growing tornadoes are possible through the evening from east texas to louisiana and all of this could turn into flash flooding as the storms head east meteorologist bill karens is with us to track all of it so bill uh, what are you watching right now where is it all headed yeah, busy next 48 hours. We're watching the chance of isolated tornadoes this afternoon. I think this evening things may ramp up a little bit and then definitely tomorrow. So tornado watch until 5 o'clock. This is in central into eastern Texas, Corsica, Canada, Waco, or to Austin. We've had no reported tornadoes so far. We actually haven't even had much in the way of any severe weather. We're not even showing much rotation with these storms. Just a lot of heavy rain. We've already had some flash flooding issues, especially around Waco. We've had one strong thunderstorm with some ping pong ball sized hail reported with it, and that is going to head to the north. I don't think it's going to make it up towards the Fort Worth area, but we'll keep an eye on it. Then as we go throughout the rest of the evening, we'll take these storms and we will push them eventually into East Texas and into Louisiana. Isolated strong tornadoes are still a possibility, especially if we can get some heating going during the rest of the afternoon. That would actually provide more energy for the storms. Right now, there's been a lot of clouds and rain in this region here, especially in Central Texas. So as far as tomorrow goes, tomorrow looks like to be the more dangerous of the two days. This area of red in here is a moderate risk of severe weather, a large area of enhanced risk, and we are going to see possibly a tornado outbreak, meaning more 10 or possibly more tornadoes, and a few of those do have a chance of being on the strong side. That's in the hatched area, which is a very large area, Lake Charles to Jackson, good southern half of Mississippi, New Orleans, and in the southern Alabama, and if that's not all bad enough, even if we don't get the severe weather, we're definitely going to have flooding concerns. Flood watchers are up for at least 8 million people throughout much of the deep south. All right, Bill Karens for us. Bill, thank you. Let's turn now to today's CNBC Money Minute. The U.S. is going all in on microchip production. And self-driving cars are returning to a major American city. CNBC's Steve Kovac is with us now. Hi, Steve. Hey, Kate and Zikle. Yeah, the Biden administration will award Samsung more than $6 billion to expand its chip manufacturing in Texas. Two people familiar with the matter told Reuters the subsidy for the South Korean company will go toward construction of four facilities. The announcement is part of a larger push to produce more chips here in the U.S. General Motors' robo-taxi unit will reportedly resume testing in Phoenix. It comes after Cruise grounded its entire fleet of driverless cars last year following an accident involving a pedestrian in San Francisco. According to Bloomberg, the testing in Phoenix could restart as early as today. And a new report finds Americans are happier when they spend at least some time in the office. That's according to a survey from Morning Consult. And for the first time since the pandemic, more workers said they prefer hybrid work arrangements to fully remote setups. Those who work partially in the office and partially at home also reported higher engagement with their work. Kate and Zinclay, send it back over to you. I see that. I like the mix. Like yeah. a little time at home, a little time senior co-workers. You can't really anchor from home I was about anymore. to say, I don't relate, but it I, doesn't I apply appreciate it. TV. <laughs> it used to during, during the pandemic, yeah. but not now. Steve Kovac, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, coming up, talk about an unwanted house guest, how this eight-foot-long gator, yeah, gator, ended up inside a woman's home. Plus, a major court decision in Arizona, the new ruling surrounding abortion rights and what it could mean for people across the state of Arizona. You're watching NBC News Daily.
NBC News Daily is number one for afternoon news across all of television. I'm Morgan Radford. I'm Vicki Wynn. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zinclair Samoa. What's happening around the world? Israel's military is building up there along the border. And what matters here at home? New numbers are out today showing more encouraging signs for our economy. Let's zero in on exercise. We know we're supposed to be doing it. What does it do for our health? What needs to change for social media to be a safer place? NBC News Daily, weekdays from 12 to 4 on NBC News Now. Following breaking news in the state of Arizona, a dramatic decision from that state's Supreme Court. A short time ago, the justices issued a ruling that a near total ban on abortion is enforceable. The ruling strikes down a law from 2022, which allowed abortions up to 15 weeks in favor of much more restrictive legislation from the Civil War era. The ruling makes Arizona the latest state to join a growing list of places where abortion care is effectively banned. Moments after the ruling was announced, the state's Democratic governor made this pledge. My executive order removing the ability of county attorneys to prosecute women and doctors for performing abortions remains. I refuse to allow extremist county prosecutors to use this abortion ban to lock up women and doctors seeking or providing needed health care. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard is here to break down the ruling. So Vaughn, what does this mean for those seeking an abortion in the state of Arizona? And what did the justices say about their decision? Right, Sinclair, this was a major decision that the Supreme Court of Arizona was wrestling with. We are talking about a law that was put on the books 50 years before Arizona even became a state, back when it was still a territory. And this 1864 law forbids abortions in the state of Arizona completely, except in the situation in which a woman's life is in danger. It also allows for the prosecution, the imprisonment of abortion providers from two to five years of penalty. For the state of Arizona, a Republican legislature and a Republican governor back in 2022 uh, signed a separate piece of legislation that barred abortions past 15 weeks. But what the Supreme Court decided is that that 1864 law was never repealed. Of course, this has significant impacts, not only on families, on women, but there's a 14-day uh, stay in which a superior court could potentially hear further constitutional appeals. But that is a question that is still pending here in the courts. And Vaughn, we're hearing from an abortion rights group that says they've collected hundreds of thousands of signatures to put forward a constitutional amendment on abortion. What exactly would that include? Right, we're seven months away from the general election, and these organizations say that they have collected enough signatures to put a constitutional amendment in the state of Arizona on the ballot that would grant abortion protection, abortion rights up to 24 weeks here. This is, of course, a political element of this here. About two-thirds of Arizona voters back in the 2022 midterm elections told exit poll reviewers that they supported a, a woman's reproductive rights. And so there are questions here, if this does in fact get on the ballot here, whether Arizona voters would go and sign on to that constitutional amendment. Of course, this is a conversation and uh, an active uh, uh, political effort across the country and states after Roe v. Wade was overturned that has left this decision up to state legislatures, but also voters, if they're able to get these sorts of measures on the ballots. Sinclair. We'll see how it plays out in November. Von Hilliard, thank you. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says, quote, no force in the world will stop his plan for a ground operation in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. That's where a majority of displaced Gazans have fled to. Netanyahu has said Israel has a date for the Rafah operation, but has not told the public when that date is. NBC News correspondent Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv, Israel for us. Hala, good to see you. This sharper rhetoric from Netanyahu seems to come as peace negotiations remain underway in Cairo, Egypt. Where do those talks stand now? So uh, we're hearing conflicting uh, reports, Kate, about where we stand. Uh, um, over the weekend, Egyptian media reports uh, seem to suggest uh, that we're, we're nearing some sort of deal for a uh, cessation of hostilities, allowing for the release of some of the hostages, at least, and also for more aid to go in. But then we heard from Hamas representatives who had made the trip to Cairo that, in fact, the two sides were still very far apart. Uh, the sticking points uh, center around how long any ceasefire would be, how many hostages would be released. Obviously, the Israeli side would want all of them released. And we understand also from a source we've been speaking to in the Israeli government, who's been privy to some of these uh, war cabinet negotiations and talks, um, that another obstacle is 
Uh, who would be allowed back to the north? There are more than a million people were displaced, you'll remember, Kate, after October 7th, when uh, the Israeli military started it, uh, its offensive and were displaced to the southern half of the Gaza Strip. The Israeli government would want some very strict security checks, uh, we are being told, in order to allow uh, those people to go back uh, to their homes. And this is all happening just as we are now discovering the extent of the damage and devastation left behind when the Israeli military withdrew from the south after that surprising announcement uh, that its ground troops were going to go back north, leaving only one brigade in the entirety of the besieged enclave. Some residents who were hoping to find their homes still standing have gone back to Khan Yunus in particular. This uh, used to be the Gaza Strip's second largest city. They're saying there's really nothing left to go back to, that if they're lucky, they can get a few belongings in destroyed homes and then head straight back to the tents that they've been crowded in at the Rafah border, Kate. Mm. And Hala, just quickly, Vice President Harris is expecting to meet with families of Americans taken hostage by Hamas today. Pope Francis also having a meeting. What do we know? Mm -hmm. Well, um, obviously, this is going to be a very emotional discussion with these families, and they're going to be wanting, just as they do here in Israel, answers as to what the strategy is to get the uh, hostages out. I was at one of these uh, demonstrations where um, uh, the family members and Israeli protesters said at this point they're willing to pay any price to get them out, including a permanent ceasefire, Kate. Hala Garani for us in Israel. Hala, thanks so much. Coming up, a truly offbeat story. The European Republic that is banning songs for being too fast or too slow. You're watching <laughs> For Real, NBC News Daily. Can't wait to see that one. morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. We report live from Tel Aviv from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas streaming weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Newly released video from Washington State shows a wild encounter caught on camera. A man tried to intervene as thieves were allegedly trying to steal his car right from his driveway. NBC's Dana Griffin spoke with him about the dangerous confrontation.
just seconds after getting a notification in the middle of the night. Eric Smith captured on his own ring camera tackling a suspected car prowler who had been sitting in the passenger side of his truck. I put my hands on him and grabbed him. Uh, at that point, he started screaming, yelling for um, the driver of the vehicle. Uh, to help him out, help, help. Then the driver of this getaway car backs up, angles toward them, and accelerates. Felt kind of like a movie, you know. I, I just end up on the hood, held on, turned around to see where I was going to impact. I saw I was going straight for my truck. Saw my truck door was open. Uh, just having to pick up my legs um, and kick my door closed. After being hurled off the vehicle and slamming into his own truck, Smith stands up without a scratch to snap a photo before the suspect sped away. I was a little shaky, so the photos came out a little blurry. The incident happened last month outside his Pierce County, Washington home. His family now sharing it online to help authorities identify the suspects. And I give a lot of credit to social media. The Pierce County Sheriff's Department tells NBC News those images led to a potential arrest in a different city, but they have yet to confirm if the suspect is tied to their investigation. The department writing in a statement in part, we have seen a significant rise in motor vehicle thefts with juvenile suspects. This incident is particularly scary since it shows how bold these suspects are getting and at what costs they will take to get away. According to the department, motor vehicle thefts were up 27% in the county last year. Just 30 minutes prior to, you know, another person on social media reached out and provided footage of them uh, hitting their vehicles. Deputies say it's likely the suspects were casing nearby homes, but no other reports were filed with the department. They got nothing out of it. I have nothing. I don't keep anything in my vehicle, um, but they were certainly lucky. Lucky, Eric says, because everyone involved could have been hurt. Would you have done anything different? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, absolutely not. You know, there's so many different ways this could have gone, and I think I had probably the best outcome. Dana Griffin, NBC News. What a story, Dana. Thank you. Well, artificial intelligence is growing by leaps and bounds, and now it's coming to advertising. Some companies are using AI models with flawless skin and no imperfections to promote their products. Some critics say those fake models are making beauty standards totally unrealistic. NBC's Kaylee Hartung takes a closer look. As part of their Keep Beauty Real campaign, personal care brand Dove has released this two-minute video. It features images of AI-generated women that pop up online when you search terms like perfect skin and the most beautiful woman in the world. They then compare those to images generated under Dove's beauty standards, as well as the faces of real women. It's part of the company's pledge to never use AI to create or distort images of women, a pledge they hope other companies will also consider signing on to. A global beauty study by Dove found that 9 out of 10 women and girls say they've been exposed to harmful beauty content online. And 1 in 3 say they feel pressure to alter their appearance because of what they see online, even when they know it's fake. AI-generated images in the beauty space is a growing concern, especially for parents. I'm disgusted, horrified. Naveen Rodwan says she believes altered images of women on social media contributed to her teenage daughter's anorexia. What are they going to do to themselves when they try to attain a level of perfection that doesn't even exist? Earlier this year, more than 12,000 parents signed an online petition urging TikTok to more clearly label AI-generated influencers over concerns that showing things like flawless skin and perfect bodies creates extreme and utterly unattainable beauty standards for children. Clothing brand Levi Strauss reversed course after facing major backlash over an announcement it planned to experiment with AI-generated body-inclusive avatars like this image on their app and website. Coca-Cola-owned sports drink Body Armor poked fun at AI content in a recent Super Bowl ad. Major fashion brands like Revolve are using AI-generated models on some billboards. Ad agencies say this trend is growing, mostly because it saves brands big bucks. But some wonder at what cost. Kaylee Hartung, NBC News. So interesting. Coming up now that the eclipse is over, what you can do with those special glasses. All ahead on NBC News Daily.
It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> I apologize to for Jackson the many now. questions. We'll never be questioned. <laughs> Bottom of the hour now. Here are some of the stories making headlines on NBC News Daily. Norfolk Southern has agreed to pay $600 million in a class action lawsuit settlement following last year's train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. The company says if the agreement is approved by the court, it will resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of that accident. The agreement would give additional compensation to those who live within 10 miles of the derailment for any past, current, or future injuries. The company says the settlement does not include any admission of liability, wrongdoing, or fault. Take a look at this shocking image. Mary Hollenbach says she was watching TV when she heard her front door rattle. And when she went to check on it, well, she saw a nearly eight-foot alligator had broken through her screen door. She called 911, and Florida Fish and Wildlife officers soon came after and quickly removed the gator. Hollenbach, who had just moved from Indiana a few years ago, says she believed the gator came from a pond across the street, telling our Fort Myers affiliate it makes life in Florida a whole lot more interesting. Wow. <laughs> the Russian Republic, Chechnya, could be banning popular songs from playlists. It comes after the Republic instituted limits on musical tempos. Seriously, the culture minister says songs should be between 80 and 116 beats per minute. For example, songs like the Beatles' Hey Jude would be too slow. Huh. Songs like Taylor Swift's Shake It Off yeah. are too fast. Huh. But a song with a beat like Beyonce's Texas Hold'em would be just right. Uh, so, look, anything Beyonce <laughs> is just right. To I know, but isn't that a strange thing That's to... A... Legislate. It's a very specific rule. Very yeah. specific rule. <laughs> well, speaking of things that rule, let's talk basketball. Yes. Teams ruling. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the University of Connecticut is celebrating its second straight men's college basketball championship. The Yukon Huskies reached the top of the March Madness Mountain after knocking off fellow top seed, the Purdue Boilermakers. This back to back national title now launches Yukon into some elite company. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent and basketball lover Sam, Sam Brock is with us. Uh, Sam, you've been <laughs> doing all these stories right so last <laughs> night's championship game really a memorable march madness moment from the year at, in, in both men's and women's yeah it, absolutely kate and Zinkley, i'm just sad that it's now ended that the tournament is over but here is a little bit of madness for you the yukon huskies they didn't just win this game wasn't even close the question becomes was it the most dominant tournament run we have ever seen they've outscored their opponents by 140 points over six games that's the most in NCAA history. They also became the first school to win back-to-back -back titles in almost 20 years. It was as sweet and about as close to a sure thing as you can get. It is a UConn coronation. The Huskies make history. Back-to-back -back national champions. A storied basketball power, UConn, putting a bow on a dominant tournament run. Oh, yeah, we... we... Uh, set out to make this a goal and go back to back and you know that's what we did tonight. The Huskies vanquishing Purdue 75-60 with rim rocking slams and crafty play clinching the program's sixth national title all time tying with North Carolina and now one more than Duke and Indiana. In the process becoming the first men's squad to win consecutive trophies since the Florida Gators in 2007. What a special group of people a special coaching staff uh, an incredible group of players. Overnight in stores, Connecticut, students packing Gamble Pavilion for an on-campus watch party, cheering their team to victory and overcoming 37 points from seven foot four National Player of the Year, Zach Eady. The Huskies leaving no doubt about their on-court bona fides. The victory coming as South Carolina's women's team returning to their Columbia campus, champions. They did it in a way in which they lifted up each other. After defeating the Hawkeyes, though Iowa superstar Caitlin Clark still racked up points and eyeballs. That game shattering records, the most watched sporting event outside of the Olympics or football since 2019. We need three things in sports, household names, rivalries, and games of consequence, and March Madness had all of that. Now the UConn men claiming their victory after a banner year for college hoops.
I mean, what a season, Sam. And we know the women's tournament has exploded in popularity, right? But now there are some new numbers backing that up. Yeah, think about this for a second. Almost 19 million viewers for the women's national title game. It's up 89% year over year. It's up 285% from just two years ago. Explosion does not even do it justice. The women's game is front and center, and people are enjoying every second of it. Well, let's keep it going, right? Let's keep that going. Yes. Sam Brock, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well, tax day, in case you missed it, is officially less than one week away. So if you haven't filed your taxes or your extension, you are running out of time. Here with some last minute advice is Jackson Hewitt's chief tax information officer, Mark Stevers, with us. Mark, good to see you again. Be here, time the is tax running out. The tax man. Time is running out. All right, so we have, what, six days left? 120 odd hours, yeah. <laughs> not not you're, not you're, counting. you're counting, totally. So what do procrastinators do? if they haven't done it yet. Don't panic. Don't shortcut the process. Don't guesstimate or estimate. You've got mm -hmm. your documents, or you should have them, or you should be able to get them now. Mm -hmm. Find a pro or find the software you want to do it yourself and just get a plan. Six days sounds like a short amount of time, but it's going to take you one or two or three hours unless you're one of these huge complex guys, and you can get an extension of time to file. But you need to work up your amount, and you need your data to do that, and you need a plan to start. So don't panic. Find last year's stuff, your last year mm -hmm. tax return. That can be your roadmap. Yeah. Find who you used last Last year, and if you did it yourself, use what you used last year if that worked. But find that current year information. It should have been there by January. That may have made itself to some other place by now. So you need to get on that right away. Right. It's so important to stay organized. I mean, you mentioned that extension. Some people may need that. So how can they file for one? And uh, what goes into that? Well, the extension is a pretty simple process. It's guaranteed. In fact, the title of it's automatic six-month extension. But you have to file it. Now, you can file it with paper, and you can postmark that. Registered mail is the best way. Or you can file it online or just walk into a tax pro shop and say, hey, I want to extend. What do I need? Now, need some data because you have to do a good faith estimate of your taxes. And if you owe, you have to pay that. So it's an extension of time to file your paperwork, not to pay the money. So well, if you think, I'm going to owe, I'm going to extend, that's not how it works. And you can get caught in an underpayment penalty. But you mm. can still file your extension and not pay and at least avoid the fail to file penalty because there's two well, penalties. Yeah. So if you don't file an extension at all, mm -hmm. if you just don't tell the government and then later you send them a check or whatever, are you okay? No, then no. you have two penalties, failure to file and failure to pay. But you can take one off the table just by sending in either your tax return, which should be pretty easy to do if you've got all your data, or the extension, federal and state, so it's really compounded. And quite frankly, we're a third of the way through this year, so you need to right. start thinking about next year because uh -huh. estimates are due if you've got a side hustle, <laughs> right. a lot of things going on. But it's not just about owing money, right? A lot of tax experts oh. tell us that many people leave money on the table. So what are some life events or credits, credits Excuse me, that people might be eligible? For. Yep, seven out of ten people are getting a refund right now, and refunds are up this year. So if you've got money coming to you, riddle me why you'd ever wait to file <laughs> for that. But yeah, there's over a dozen credits and hundreds of deductions. And here's the thing that many people don't understand. If you leave off a credit, education credit, opportunities, uh, EITC credit, child tax credit, dependent credit, there's a dozen of them, even some of the new energy credits. If you leave them off, the government does not add that back and just send you more money like yeah. a retailer might. You leave it off, it stays off. So if you've had any type of life event, home improvement, bought a new Tesla, taking care of a family member, elder parent, for example, talk with a pro and find out if you've got a new credit, possibly some more money, because if you leave it off, it stays off. And in these last hours, panic leads to overlooking something, and it does not automatically fix itself. All right, Mark Stever, thank you so much. Yeah. Really good tips there. Plenty Very of time. Useful. <laughs> Plenty of time. Well, a lot of us think of workouts as exhausting, intense, maybe even Mark's nodding yeah. along. Yes, maybe even <laughs> dreadful sometimes, uh -huh. but what about describing your workout as cozy? Yeah, exercise doesn't have to be such a heavy lift, you could say. If you're having a hard time getting your workouts going or feeling intimidated by the thought of working out, there's a growing trend that just may be for you making cardio a whole lot cozier. Whether your workout includes strength training, cardio, or high-intensity intervals, it can also be cozy. Now let's do some cozy cardio. Today, fitness fiends are reinventing workouts with a new trend. Here's how it works. You grab your favorite cozy loungewear, you want to set the mood, grab a drink, beverage, and then put on your favorite TV show or podcast and get started with your low-impact mood. It's a practice Megan Ruth, now in her 30s and a mother of two, has leaned heavily on for her postpartum recovery. 
you are not new to fitness, but when did Cozy Cardio get on your radar? I saw this trend happen on TikTok, and it really resonated with me, especially in that postpartum phase that I was in. It just felt like less of a hurdle to get dressed. I was already in my pajamas. I was already in my sweats. Roop has always been active. Once a professional dancer and fitness instructor, she says she worked to deal with her views of body image in her 20s. But when she got pregnant, a lot of those feelings came up for me again. How were you dealing you know, and feeling? I struggled in pregnancy and postpartum with all the changes and um, someone who's super active. I'm not able to do everything I used to do. Ooh. This new kind of workout was a welcome reframe. For it, and you're ready to go. Lighting a candle, having my warm cup of coffee, standing by, music that I enjoy with my workout. Those are things that just create an atmosphere, an environment that I look forward to. I always say too, like the movement also needs to be something that resonates with you, right? We can feel when we're enjoying movement or not. On a treadmill, counting every calorie as I ran in my early 20s, I, my, my body could tell I didn't enjoy that. The term was popularized by health and wellness creator Hope Zucker Brown. I really want Cozy Cardio to be a movement where people can reclaim their relationships with exercise. Let's do some Cozy Cardio before work. The trend encouraging people to view fitness as a joyful experience. It was meant for you to just enjoy yourself, to take a little bit of time to do the things that feel good for you. The trend comes as mounting research finds being sedentary increases your risk of illness, including dementia, cancer, and heart disease. Cozy Cardio is a great way for people to kind of get started with exercise. Cozy Cardio is not always a high enough intensity to actually meet our physical activity guidelines. The Center for Disease Control currently recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week with at least two days of strength training. For Megan Roop, this new trend has revolutionized her ongoing fitness work. People are so compelled to this cozy form of working out. It's just removing that barrier to entry, right? So if you can roll out of bed, be in your sweats, be in something comfortable, it feels like you can show up to it. Yeah, I can do that. It doesn't feel so overwhelming. Hmm. I do feel like I could do that, Zinkley. And we just met Hope zucker Brow, who you reported popularized the term cozy cardio. She's clearly created kind of an online community. 100%, Kate. So one of Hope zucker Brow's first videos on cozy cardio actually racked up nearly 2 million views. And she told us she really wants those who participate in the practice to lean into doing things that feel good and said it's turned into a form of meditational self-love for her and for others. I have to say my favorite part is the walking pad. I actually have it oh, here yeah. in the office. But I like, know. it's just fun to have a lower stake workout. Yeah, and it's not that you're not working out. It's just that you're, you're being a little less intense about less it, maybe intense. getting more out of it. Yes, being a little more gentle with yourself. Yeah. So it was Love a fun it. one. Thank you for that piece. Of course, and coming up, we've all been at a gathering where someone's kid is acting out, but should you say something to their parents or even step in yourself to discipline that kid? We'll ask an expert. You're watching NBC News Daily. I don't know, but first time for today's Daily Snapshot. This little boy was fascinated by oh. his new lizard friend. And the shot was taken at Pet Fiesta in India this week. The event draws animal lovers like this guy and all kinds of pets from lizards to dogs to exotic birds. That is a marbled water monitor, Zinkley, in the ah. photo. It's native to the Philippines. It can grow up to six feet long. Ooh. But good news, Zinkley, since I know you're looking for a pet, <laughs> it is not illegal to own one of those in New York if you have a license. Oh. So there you go. Oh. Just an idea. I didn't know that. Wow. You learn new things on this show every day, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Much more ahead.
Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. In today's modern parenting, a recent Reddit thread is sparking a big conversation around criticizing someone's parenting skills. It started when one woman who doesn't appear to have children made a post asking if she was wrong to tell a friend that her four-year-old son had no manners. She says it happened after the kid threw a wedding ring that belonged to her partner out of the window. Psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig joins us now. So, Dr. Robbie, we should say that Reddit post has since been removed, but yeah. I think the larger question here is, is it Ever appropriate to critique or give feedback on someone else's parenting. It's always a gamble because you're criticizing somebody's beloved child. And, you know, parents are not easy to forgive. Plus, a lot of parents are guilty anyway about whether they're parenting correctly. Mm -hmm. And especially for somebody who's not a parent, you're not going to have the same empathy as somebody who has kids. It's like your kids wear you down and you have more of an understanding. So it's all how it's handled. It sounds like this person who may not have had kids was highly reactive and that did not help the situation. So if, if you're trying to give feedback, what do you uh, avoid saying? Like, mm -hmm. what, what's your best tips? So you want to be a positive role model and basically be creative about it. So let's say you invite your, your friend over and the child is taking their teddy bear and bashing it against the wall. And you can say, you know what, we're going to go in a different direction and we're going to put the teddy bear aside and let's read a book. Mm -hmm. So you switch the direction, or you have some intuitive knowledge. Let's say your friend has a, a child like mine who wasn't socialized at a restaurant. Maybe the friend would say, you know what, let's have lunch on the go and do something outside. So it's a way of redirecting without critiquing. Mm -hmm. And we were talking during the break about sort of the generational and cultural differences between parenting. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of African families, it's common for like the aunties and the cousins to join in, but how should someone respond if maybe they're getting some unsolicited, maybe unwelcome advice about parenting? Well, if it's a stranger, you could say, Thank you for sharing. Thank you for letting me know. So that you say you've heard them, mm. but you don't have to engage. Right. I don't know what well, you to uh, answer. Oh, go, 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 I just go. don't know if I would be capable of just being that nice and I, being like, thank you for sharing. I know. Listen, this is what I did. My daughter was kicking on an airport when in, a, oh, in an airplane, yeah. and, and this woman's like, can you stop her? I'm like, what do you want me to do? Throw yeah. her out a window? So I should take my own <laughs> advice. I, I thank was like, what do you want? Thank you for sharing. Yes, yes. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Okay. What so if, receive, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What if you you have a, a friend's child over? Mm -hmm. I'm asking hypothetically. Yes. This did not happen 20 years ago yeah. in, in, at a party that we held. But <laughs> and you feel like you want to the kids out of control and you want to punish or, or give yeah. consequences. Exactly. So a common feeling, and what you can set boundaries, but it's the way in which you do it. So you can say, you know what, in our house, mm. we use our inside voice, or we don't name call in this house. And so you try to send the message about the behavior without shaming the child. So it's all about the behavior may not be ideal, but the kid is still good. Mm -hmm. And you can always share with a parent this, I just want to let you know what happened when you you weren't around, so you give the parent the space to make an intervention. Yeah, I love that. It's like emphasizing the culture of the home, but also yes. making it a teachable moment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's about, as you said, the act, the actions, not, yes. not the kid, the person. And the pause moment. So if you're mm -hmm. highly reactive and you're screaming, that's not ideal, but think of yourself as a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you get this message across and bring out the best in this child? Dr. Ravi Ludwig, always great to have you. Yeah, Thanks so much. You. Great being here. Well, Thanks. we got a lot more news ahead. You're watching NBC News Daily.
NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Millions of Americans looked to the sky yesterday to see something extraordinary, a total solar eclipse. I got to view a partial eclipse here in New York City while Kate watched from Holton, Maine, one of the last U.S. cities in the path of totality. Yeah, I think we all felt a collective sense of awe, right, that, that made the experience unforgettable and deeply moving. We wanted to show you some of those moments. It's a rare event, right? I mean, why not take a, a chance to see something we may never see again? The glasses are off. We are in the Umbra. The great North American eclipse is happening right now above us. Oh, my God. It's way better than school. Oh, look at this. Look at this. It's amazing! Better than we could <laughs> ever imagine. That is so beautiful. I've been looking forward to this for the last however many years and encouraging all my friends to go. A lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is, uh, this is magical. Amazing, like we are not going to be able to see one of these in a long time. Wow. We see Venus in the middle of the afternoon. I have chills even now. I know. Just watching it again, I'm getting emotional yeah. all over again. It was just uh, incredible. Oh, incredible. And so special to have that collective experience. Yeah. 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 So let's take a look at some of the eclipse stories that are trending today. All right. So hopefully you were one of the people who used, you know, these, those special mm -hmm. eclipse glasses. So what should you do with them now? Well, solar eclipse glasses do not expire. So if you're an eclipse chaser who wants to catch the 2026 solar eclipse in Europe, or you're waiting for your, our next eclipse in 2044, mm. you can keep the glasses yeah. or you can donate them. Volunteer centers around the country will collect and distribute your glasses so someone in Africa, Asia, and South America can safely watch the solar eclipse when it passes over their country. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah, these are my main glasses. Oh, I like them. I, I like them. Can't see that, but, uh, I'm pretty proud that this was my second eclipse, As you should full be. total eclipse, but I have nothing on Letitia Ferrer. This 63-year-old Texas woman has not missed a solar eclipse since 1998. Wow. She has traveled around the world to see 21 
eclipses, even witnessing a couple over the ocean. She told NBC what it's like to see them. It makes me feel immense sense of gratitude for even being here. At the same time, like a little itty bitty ant, because this is going to happen with or without me. <laughs> Since this eclipse was right in her backyard, she was able to do outreach in the Dallas area, teach people about the eclipse. She even got to watch it with her 90-year-old parents. Oh, love it. Love so it. special. Yeah. I'm Kate Snow. I'm Zinkley. You are watching Daily. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Hi everyone, I'm Zinkley Asimov. And I'm Kate Snow. NBC News Daily starts right now. Today, Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, breaking news, historic decision. Arizona Supreme Court rules that a Civil War era abortion law is enforceable. Why this could be the most consequential ruling since Roe v. Wade was overturned. Also breaking sentencing day, parents whose children were killed in a school shooting speak out as the gunman's parents are sentenced to more than a decade behind bars. The emotional wounds still raw more than two years later. Calls for clemency, a convicted double murderer is scheduled to be executed today. Why dozens of prison guards and relatives of the victims say his life should be spared. And cozy cardio. How does working out in your pajamas sound? We're talking no spandex, no gym, no sweat required. Zinkley tries out the hottest new fitness trend. <laughs> yes, can't wait to share that with you, making fitness a lot more accessible. I'm looking forward to that. But we do begin this hour with that breaking news, the historic abortion ruling in Arizona. The state Supreme Court has just declared that a near total ban on abortions is enforceable. The ruling strikes down a law from 2022, which allowed abortions up to 15 weeks in favor of a law from the Civil War era. It bans the procedure under almost any circumstances. Moments after today's ruling was announced, Arizona's Democratic governor made this pledge. My executive order removing the ability of county attorneys to prosecute women and doctors for performing abortions remains. I refuse to allow extremist county prosecutors to use this abortion ban to lock up women and doctors seeking or providing needed health care. 
The state of Arizona now joins a growing list of states where abortion care is effectively banned after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade two years ago. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard is here to break down this ruling. So, Vaughn, what does this mean for those seeking an abortion in the state of Arizona, and will voters have a chance to have their say? Hey, guys, yeah, there's a 14-day stay that is currently implemented here before potentially a, 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 another appeal on constitutional grounds could go forward. But as of now, the Arizona Supreme Court made the determination that the territorial ban signed back in 1864, 50 years before Arizona was even a state, is the one that is going to go on the books because it was never actually repealed. Uh, the state legislature and the governor, they signed back in 2022 another bill that banned abortions after 15 weeks, and you noted a potential constitutional amendment that could be on the ballot this November, which is significant. Just last week, organizations uh, announced that they had garnered more than 500,000 signatures to place a ballot measure on November's ballot that would, uh, would create a constitutional right in Arizona to uh, abortion access up to 24 weeks. And so here in the state of Arizona, at least for the next seven months here, until that ballot measure were to be voted on by Arizona voters, are looking at this territorial ban, which bans abortion entirely in the state of Arizona, except when a woman's life is in danger, is what is going to be going on the books. And one other note is that as part of that 1864 law, there is punishment of two to five years in prison for those who provide abortions under this law, guys. And any reaction yet from the White House? We just heard from Vice President Kamala Harris, who is actually going to be going to Arizona. We are now told this upcoming Friday for an abortion access event. And part of her statement from the vice president says, in part, quote, Arizona just rolled back the clock to a time before women could vote. And by his own admission, there's one person responsible, Donald Trump. Of course, Donald Trump has touted his overturning of Roe v. Wade through the U.S. Supreme Court and the three justices who he nominated to the bench. Of course, he just released a statement yesterday saying that he believes that the state and voters should ultimately make the determinations. But, of course, this is a repercussion of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And now that state court, the Arizona Supreme Court, making this determination that that 1864 law that was on the books in Arizona is the one that will now go into effect. Guys. Vaughn Hilliard for us. Vaughn, thank you. Well, a teenager from Idaho is under arrest today. He's accused of trying to provide material support to the terror group ISIS. Authorities say they arrested him just one day before he planned to attack churches in Idaho. NBC News national law enforcement and intelligence correspondent Tom Winter is with us now. Tom, walk us through what the government is alleging here. Right, so this investigation apparently uh, took place over the last several weeks, and they were looking into, according to the FBI, cryptocurrency and its use in funding ISIS, specifically ISIS-K. This individual, Alexander Mercurio, age 18, from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, is somebody that they found in the course of that investigation. They say that his plan was on April 7th, so just on Sunday, was to attack a church or churches in that part of Idaho with explosives with guns, with weapons that had fire on them, with a machete, and basically draw law enforcement to him when then they would then start firing upon them. He would get those guns from his father, who he planned to actually handcuff, incapacitate, and handcuff. So there's this big, large plot that they say they uncovered in the course of this, and they stepped in prior to him uh, creating any harm for his father or obviously for anybody else here. And I mean, Tom, the details on their own are terrifying, but outside of that, we're hearing about a new bulletin from the FBI and Department of Homeland Security warning about large gatherings, threats to large gatherings right here in the United States. Sure. What more can you tell us about that? Right, so this stems from something that happens when the FBI and other law enforcement agencies look at what happens overseas. And obviously, we just saw the recent ISIS-inspired terrorist attack in Russia. And so they look at that and they say, okay, Based on the fact that ISIS is touting this attack, that it was successful, that they are now calling to action more people to go out and commit these types of attacks, we want law enforcement agencies in the United States to be aware of these calls to action that they have at times and more often than not been heeded by people who are uh, believing in this type of ideology, this ISIS, uh, ISIS ideology. So we want you to be aware of it. We want you to reach out to us. If you see anything, let the FBI know. There's all sorts of internal systems and databases they have that they can put somebody's name into and begin an investigation. And that's really their focus here. All right, Tom Winter, thanks so much. You got it. And we will have much more reporting on this story tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt.
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says, quote, no force in the world will stop his plan for a ground operation in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. That's where a majority of displaced Gazans have fled to. Netanyahu has said Israel has a date for the Rafah operation, but has not told the public when that is. NBC News correspondent Hala Garani is in Tel Aviv, Israel, and joins us now. So, Hala, this sharpening of rhetoric does come as peace negotiations are ongoing in Cairo, Egypt. Where do those talks stand? Well, Zinkley, we're hearing uh, conflicting reports. Over the weekend, there was a little bit more optimism. We were hearing from uh, officials involved in the talks, quoted by Egyptian media, that we were nearing some sort of deal. But then Hamas representatives left Cairo, and they were quoted as saying that the two sides were still very far apart. We believe the sticking points center around just the number of hostages that would be released in any kind of ceasefire deal, the length of any pause and cessation and hostilities. But also, what happens to all the people who were displaced from the north and who were evacuated then south? Would they be able to go back with, you know, north? The Israelis seem to want some sort of very strict security check mechanism. And Hamas representatives want the return of these evacuees to be unfettered and free. So we do have some sticking points there. Um, obviously, we know that the U.S. administration and President Biden want some sort of ceasefire to take effect because of the extent of the devastation in the Gaza Strip, this besieged enclave. After that surprise announcement that um, Israeli troops were evacuating the southern part of the Strip, we've seen on NBC News video as well, sent to us here, uh, just shocked and bewildered Palestinians going back to their homes in Khan Yunus and saying that there's really nothing left of their homes and no place for them to go back to Zinkle. And Hala, preparations are underway in Gaza today, I know, for the Muslim holiday that marks the end of Ramadan. We know that food, basic necessities have been hard yeah. to come by there. Uh, and according to the Israeli Prime Minister's office, I think 741 humanitarian aid trucks have entered Gaza in the past couple of days. So what is the reality right now when it comes to aid? So that's already many more trucks than we've seen cross into Gaza over the last several months. But um, many of our viewers will remember uh, that before October 7th, about 500 vehicles were crossing every single day into Gaza. And that number dwindled on some days to just a couple dozen. Uh, and we're talking about a population in the north that is in near famine conditions. Um, Eid is a big, uh, it's meant to be a joyous celebration to mark the end of the Ramadan period where families get together and eat together and visit family members. But in Gaza, clearly, it's not going to be the case uh, this year, especially with the amount of, of devastation and the number of people who've been killed and injured uh, in this war since October. Back to you. Yeah, the turmoil continues. Halagrani in Israel. Thank you. Time for today's CNBC Money Minute. Now, Boeing is slowing down production. And Uber Eats is delivering a new feature. CNBC's Contessa Brewer joins us now. Hey, Contessa. Hi, Zinkley. Hi, Kate. Boeing's announced that today's airplane deliveries fell to the lowest number since mid-2021. Of course, the manufacturer is dealing with a safety crisis. The company says it handed over 83 planes in the first quarter, 47 fewer than the same period last year. The tally comes after a door plug blew out of a Boeing plane on an Alaska Airlines flight in January. And of course, that prompted several investigations. Small business optimism has dropped to a more than 11 year low in March. That's according to the National Federation of Independent Business. While inflation is the biggest concern, owners are also concerned about a sticky labor market with only 11 percent of small businesses saying they plan to hire in the next three months. And Uber Eats is launching a a short form video feed, a lot like TikTok, to help restaurants boost visibility and showcase their menus. It's according to TechCrunch. Uber Eats emphasized that the videos are not ads and the feature is being tested in New York, San Francisco, and Toronto, which sounds like a delicious way to get somebody to choose your restaurant. I mean, they do say you eat with your eyes first, uh, right? So, makes sense. Do that. Hey, phone eats first. Contessa Brewer, thank you.
Coming up, you can't visit the West Coast without a stop at an In-N-Out. We're going to introduce you to the woman behind the burger brand with a cult following. Plus, here's a bracket for you. Airport versus airport. The clash over a proposed name change in the state of California that could end up in court. You're watching NBC News Daily. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. We are back with breaking news. The parents of a school shooter have each been sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. Jennifer and James Crumbly were found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in separate trials earlier this year. They are the first parents in the country to be convicted for their child's mass shooting. Mass school shooting, I should say. Their son is serving life in prison without parole after killing four people at a Michigan high school back in 2021. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us from the courthouse in Pontiac, Michigan. Shaq, this sentence is in line with what prosecutors wanted, right? Can you tell us about the punishment and, and what did we hear from the victims' families today in court? That's right, Kate. This sentence was right in line with what the prosecution was calling for, but notably it was significantly more than what the sentencing guidelines suggested. And the judge earlier this afternoon explaining her reasoning a little bit, saying that it was partially because of the lack of remorse that she saw and that this was not about bad parenting, but rather the inaction of those parents and in in not taking the appropriate actions when they saw problems with their child. And you, this sentence followed what was an emotional day. We heard emotional statements, heartbreaking statements from the family members of those four students who were killed in that October 2021 school shooting. I want you to listen to what we heard from those parents directly. You say you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says on what type of parents you are, because there's a lot of things I would do different. I didn't say goodbye. I never got to say goodbye. I never got to remind her that I love her, that she's my everything. You have failed your son and you have failed us all. This failure had deadly consequences that can never be undone. 
for many of those parents, this is now the second time that they've had to come out in open court for a victim impact statement, the first being for Ethan Crumbly, who committed the school shooting. But the judge, again, sentencing the parents 10 to 15 years for the involuntary, involuntary manslaughter involving those four deaths. As Shaq, both Jennifer and James Crumbly, the parents, spoke in court before they were sentenced. What did they have to say? Yeah, it was actually the first time that we heard from James Crumbly in open court. He did not testify during his trial. He was pretty emotional. He heard you heard his voice cracking. He said he apologized essentially for what his child did. You heard both James and Jennifer Crumbly put the action on uh, or the responsibility on the shooting and the shooter himself, their son, not acknowledging the point that you heard from the prosecution and the judge that their inaction made that shooting possible. Shaq Brewster for us covering that. Thank you, Shaq. In Missouri, a death row inmate will be executed today after the governor declined to grant him clemency. Brian Dorsey was convicted of murdering his cousin and her husband in 2006. But more than 70 former and current corrections officers, along with some members of the victim's family, asked the state to commute his sentence. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro is following this one for us. So, Valerie, this seems like a pretty unusual situation. What more can you tell us about Brian Dorsey and his case here? Well, Zinkley, you said it. What's unusual about this case is the group of people who are calling for the stay of execution in this case. The corrections officers say they have gotten to know Dorsey over the years. They call him a model inmate. His attorneys have filed a couple of appeals on his behalf, saying he has a spotless record of good behavior. They believe he is rehabilitated. And some of the victim's family members, now remember, some of those are also related to Brian Dorsey. They say that his execution, uh, that there should be a stay of execution in this case. Take a listen to what his cousin had to say. I just don't. I just don't understand how anyone or God or the powers that be your fate or whatever is run in this world could allow that special light to be extinguished. And I also mentioned that group of corrections officers that have been showing their support. One of them wrote an op-ed for the Kansas City Star uh, calling for the governor to grant clemency in this case, calling the execution pointless cruelty. He also said that Dorsey would continue to follow a path of transformation and redemption if he is allowed to serve out the rest of his sentence behind bars. Sinclair. Wow. Of course, the death penalty remains controversial throughout the country. Valerie, and the clock is ticking here. So is there any recourse left for Dorsey to get a stay of execution? Well, the Supreme Court has already denied two appeals for a stay of execution. The governor has also denied clemency. He issued a statement saying the execution would deliver justice and provide closure. There are some last-minute legal challenges that are still pending, but if those fail, Dorsey is expected to be executed this evening around 6 p.m. local time by lethal injection. Sinclair. All right, Valerie Castro, thank you. Coming up, New York City struggling to manage fears around crime. What the city's police commissioner wants New Yorkers and visitors to know. You're watching NBC News Daily. And you can keep watching us streaming free 24-7 right here on our streaming network, NBC News Now. Watch us wherever you stream live on all those places you see. The news continues after this.
Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. Newly released video from Washington State shows a wild encounter caught on camera. A man tried to intervene as thieves were allegedly trying to steal his car right from his driveway. NBC's Dana Griffin spoke with him about the dangerous confrontation. Just seconds after getting a notification in the middle of the night, Eric Smith captured on his own ring camera tackling a suspected car prowler who had been sitting in the passenger side of his truck. Why? Put my hands on him, grabbed him. Uh, at that point, he started screaming, yelling for um, the driver of the vehicle uh, to help him out. Help, help. Then the driver of this getaway car backs up, angles toward them, and accelerates. Felt kind of like a movie, you know? I, I just end up on the hood, held on, turned around to see where I was going to impact. I saw I was going straight for my truck. Saw my truck door was open, uh, just happened to pick up my legs um, and kick my door closed. After being hurled off the vehicle and slamming into his own truck, Smith stands up without a scratch to snap a photo before the suspect sped away. I was a little shaky, so the photos came out a little blurry. The incident happened last month outside his Pierce County, Washington home. His family now sharing it online to help authorities identify the suspects. And I give a lot of credit to social media. The Pierce County Sheriff's Department Department tells NBC News those images led to a potential arrest in a different city, but they have yet to confirm if the suspect is tied to their investigation. The department writing in a statement in part, we have seen a significant rise in motor vehicle thefts with juvenile suspects. This incident is particularly scary since it shows how bold these suspects are getting and at what costs they will take to get away. According to the department, motor vehicle thefts were up 27% in the county last year. Just 30 minutes prior to, you know, another person on social media reached out and provided footage of them uh, hitting their vehicles. Deputies say it's likely the suspects were casing nearby homes, but no other reports were filed with the department. And they got nothing out of it. I have nothing. I don't keep anything in my vehicle, um, but they were certainly lucky. Lucky, Eric says, because everyone involved could have been hurt. Would you have done anything different? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, absolutely not. You know, there's so many different ways this could have gone, and I think I had probably the best outcome. Dana Griffin, NBC News. What a story, Dana, thank you. Well, artificial intelligence is growing by leaps and bounds, and now it's coming to advertising. Some companies are using AI models with flawless skin and no imperfections to promote their products. Some critics say those fake models are making beauty standards totally unrealistic. NBC's Kaylee Hartung takes a closer look. As part of their Keep Beauty Real campaign, personal care brand Dove has released this two minute video. It features images of AI generated women that pop up online when you search terms like perfect skin and the most beautiful woman in the world. They then compare those to images generated under Dove's beauty standards, as well as the faces of real women. It's part of the company's pledge to never use AI to create or distort images of women, a pledge they hope other companies will also consider signing on to. A global beauty study by Dove found that 9 out of 10 women and girls say they've been exposed to harmful beauty content online. And 1 in 3 say they feel pressure to alter their appearance because of what they see online, even when they know it's fake. AI-generated images in the beauty space is a growing concern, especially for parents. I'm disgusted, horrified. Naveen Rodwan says she believes altered images of women on social media contributed to her teenage daughter's anorexia. What are they going to do to themselves when they try to attain a level of perfection that doesn't even exist? Earlier this year, more than 12,000 parents signed an online petition urging TikTok to more clearly label AI-generated influencers over concerns that showing things like flawless skin and perfect bodies creates extreme and utterly unattainable beauty standards for children. 
Clothing brand Levi Strauss reversed course after facing major backlash over an announcement it planned to experiment with AI-generated body-inclusive avatars like this image on their app and website. Coca-Cola-owned sports drink Body Armor poked fun at AI content in a recent Super Bowl ad. Major fashion brands like Revolve are using AI-generated models on some billboards. Ad agencies say this trend is growing, mostly because it saves brands big bucks. But some wonder at what cost. Kaylee Hartung, NBC News. Mm, so interesting. Coming up now that the eclipse is over, what you can do with those special glasses. All ahead on NBC News Daily. The state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Bottom of the hour now, here are some of the stories making headlines on NBC News Daily. Nor Norfolk Southern has agreed to pay $600 million in a class action lawsuit settlement following last year's train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. The company says if the agreement is approved by the court, it will resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of the accident. The agreement would give additional compensation to those who live within 10 miles of the department for any past, current, or future injuries. The company says the settlement does not include any admission of liability, wrongdoing, or fault. San Francisco is threatening to sue the city of Oakland over the name of its airport. The Oakland airport says it wants to add San Francisco Bay to its name to provide more clarity on their location. A San Francisco city attorney says if, the Oak if Oakland changes the name, they will then pursue legal action. They say the potential new name imposes on the, imposes on the San Francisco's airport trademark and could cause confusion for travelers. The Oakland Board of Commissioners will meet about changing the name this week. And the Russian Republic of Chechnya could be banning popular songs from playlists. It comes after the Republic instituted limits on musical tempos. Get this, the culture minister says songs should be between 80 and 116 beats per minute. For example, songs like the Beatles' Hey Jude would be too slow. Songs like Taylor Swift's Shake It Off are too fast. But, of course, a song with a beat like Beyonce's Texas Hold'em, well, just right. <laughs> you like that, don't you? I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, in New York City, recent videos of unprovoked violence on subways, attacks on women, and the shocking killing of an NYPD officer have fueled concerns about safety in the most populous city in America. But the city's police commissioner says those fears do not reflect reality. Top Story anchor Tom Yama says the exclusive interview. Stop. Stop from mayhem on the subways to unprovoked attacks on women to a young police officer shot and killed in the line of duty. These headlines and viral videos paint a picture of a big city with a big problem. New York City went from clean and safe to dirty and dangerous. What happened in New York City? January 2022, New York City was up in crime over 48 percent, up in violence. And we looked at just making more felony arrests. And slowly, by slowly, the violence began to come down. Edward Caban is in charge of the NYPD and it's more than 35,000 police officers. In an exclusive interview with NBC News, he says crime is trending down in New York City, but not fast enough because of repeat offenders. We're seeing that we're locking up the same people over and over again. In his most forceful statements yet, the NYPD commissioner calling bail reform laws ineffective. We lock someone up, district attorney puts bail on them. The judges let them go to walk our streets again. It's a broken system. A system that has come into sharper focus after the killing of Detective Jonathan Diller, allegedly by two career criminals with long records. How many more police officers and how many more families need to make the ultimate sacrifice before we start protecting them? Is she right? Absolutely. You know, that's the one thing that no police commissioner wants to do during their tenure is bury one of their own. Whether it's a family of blood or a family of blue, it hurts to the core. Part of Commissioner Caban's mission now, separating perception versus reality. According to NYPD stats, overall crime is down in the city and subways, but that's not how many New Yorkers feel about their own safety. I want my legacy to be that New Yorkers felt not only that they were safe, but that they felt safe too. If they don't feel that way, I'm not doing my job. Tom Yamas, thank you. And you can see much more of Tom's exclusive interview with the NYPD commissioner tonight on NBC Nightly News on your local NBC station and more on Top Story streaming on News Now. In and out, it is a West Coast staple, whether it's a double-double or maybe even some animal-style fries. The brand and their burgers have been a fan favorite for more than seven decades. And while you're likely familiar with the menu, you might not know the story behind the company or the woman running it. NBC Morning News Now anchor Savannah Sellers introduces us. Lindsay Snyder is not your average president of a multi-billion dollar company, but in and out Burger, is not your average fast food chain. That's what a hamburger is all about. Founded in 1948 by Harry and Esther Snyder, it all started as a little hamburger stand with a pioneering drive through speaker system. My grandparents, you know, came from very humble beginnings. Now, they have 402 stores across eight states, and they've amassed quite the following, even with the rich and famous. They all have a plain cheeseburger with light onions. Current President Lindsay Snyder grew up at In-N-Out, but her path to leadership has no shortage of twists and turns. It really was like that family pain and tragedy that really put each leader in its place. After Harry died in 1976, Esther handed control to Lindsay's uncle, Rich, but he was killed in a plane crash. The next leader, Lindsay's father, died of an overdose. At just 17, Lindsay was the only blood relative left. She started just like every other employee. You waited two hours to apply to work at a new store in Redding, California, even though your family began in and out. Is that right? I think that there's a stigma that can come with being, you know, the owner's kid and just wanting to be respected like others, doing it the right way and not having the special treatment. At 27 years old, Lindsay stepped into the role of president of In-N-Out Burger. You were very young when you come in to this now multi-billion dollar corporation. What's this been like for you? In the earlier days, I actually wore um, pantsuits and I did that because I felt like I was supposed to and then I finally you know just was confident in who I am and who I'm not you're gonna get judged either way so you might as well be judged for being who you are she's made specific and strategic choices especially in an age of inflation and increasing minimum wage 
How do you keep those prices and keep a profit margin? I was sitting in VP meetings going toe to toe saying we can't raise the prices that much. We can't, you know, because I felt such an obligation to look out for our customer. When everyone else was taking these jumps, we weren't. When you think about innovation or tech or artificial intelligence, where does that intersect with in and out No to mobile ordering um, because that greatly impacts the customer service experience. There's a lot of things that could be cheaper, easier, and all, but that's not that's not the system we go through. I know your faith is important to you. It is proudly a part of this company, a Bible verses on most pieces of packaging. Well, my uncle started it with the verses on the packaging and, you know, he felt we're a family company, we're a private company, and, you know, this is who we are, and I'm unashamed of my faith. You're a private company. <laughs> as long as you're here, will that stay that way? Absolutely. Because you get calls all the time. Yeah, messages, emails, Instagram messages. People DM to buy the company. Basically, <laughs> yes. Not interested in franchising? No. <laughs> what about an IPO? No. It's staying in the family and the menu staying simple, except for those in the know. Their famous secret menu includes animal style burgers and fries, named for the rowdy teens who would order extra spread pickles and grilled onions back in the day. Another favorite, the famous Flying Dutchman. You know, the Flying Dutchman was my dad's burger. Two meat patties with two slices of cheese, and um, his nickname was the Flying Dutchman. What's your order? Mine is double meat with pickles, spread, and chopped chilies only. A burger that keeps customers coming back for more. Looking at 75 years, so many customers that have made us who we are today. It's just incredible. So there's just so much gratitude. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. A lot of us think of workouts as exhausting, intense, maybe even dreadful. But how about describing your next workout as cozy? That's right. Exercise does not have to be such a heavy lift, folks. If you're having a hard time getting your workouts going or feeling intimidated by the thought of working out, there's a growing trend that just may be for you, making cardio a whole lot cozier. Whether your workout includes strength training, cardio, or high intensity intervals, it can also be cozy. Now let's do some cozy cardio. Today, fitness fiends are reinventing workouts with a new trend. Here's how it works. You grab your favorite cozy loungewear, you wanna set the mood, grab a drink, beverage, and then put on your favorite TV show or podcast and get started with your low impact mood. It's a practice Megan Ruth, now in her 30s and a mother of two, has leaned heavily on for her postpartum recovery. You are not new to fitness, but when did cozy cardio get on your radar? I saw this trend happen on TikTok and it really resonated with me, especially in that postpartum phase that I was in. It just felt like less of a hurdle to get dressed. I was already in my pajamas, I was already in my sweats has always been active. Once a professional dancer and fitness instructor, she says she worked to deal with her views of body image in her 20s. But when she got pregnant, a lot of those feelings came up for me again. How were you dealing you know, and feeling? I struggled in pregnancy and postpartum with all the changes and um, someone who's super active. I'm not able to do everything I used to do. This new kind of workout was a welcome reframe. For it, and you're ready to go. Lighting a candle, having my warm cup of coffee, standing by, music that I enjoy with my workout. Those are things that just create an atmosphere, an environment that I look forward to. I always say too, like the movement also needs to be something that resonates with you, right? We can feel when we're enjoying movement or not. On a treadmill, counting every calorie as I ran in my early 20s, I, my, my body could tell I didn't enjoy that. The term was popularized by health and wellness creator Hope Zucker-Brown. I really want cozy cardio to be a movement where people can reclaim their relationships with exercise. Let's do some cozy cardio before work. The trend encouraging people to view fitness as a joyful experience. It was meant for you to just enjoy yourself, to take a little bit of time to do the things that feel good for you. The trend comes as mounting research finds being sedentary increases your risk of illness, including dementia, cancer, and heart disease. Cozy cardio is a great way for people to kind of get started with exercise. Cozy cardio is not always a high enough intensity 
to actually meet our physical activity guidelines. The Center for Disease Control currently recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week with at least two days of strength training. For Megan Roop, this new trend has revolutionized her ongoing fitness work. People are so compelled to this cozy form of working out. It's just removing that barrier to entry, right? So if you can roll out of bed, be in your sweats, be in something comfortable, it feels like you can show up to it. Yeah, I can do that. It doesn't feel so overwhelming. And it's important to note, as we reported, Hope Zuckerbrow popularized that term, Cozy Cardio, and she's created a vibrant online community. One of her first videos on Cozy Cardio actually racked up nearly 2 million views. She told us she really wants those who participate in the practice to lean into doing things that feel good and said it's turned into a form of meditational self-love for her and others. Kate. Well, coming up, a new documentary is tackling the misconceptions of life on the autism spectrum. We'll speak with the filmmaker and hear about his very own journey. You're watching NBC News Daily. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. My name is Scott Steindorf, and I'm autistic. I struggle with social cues, organization planning, emotional regulation, and it's made my journey in life a struggle. In today's Daily Health, April is Autism Acceptance Month, and today we're highlighting a new documentary film called Understanding Autism. In it, filmmaker and advocate Scott Steindorf opens up about his personal journey with autism, tackles the misconceptions and challenges surrounding life on the spectrum. And Scott, we are happy to say, is here with us now, as well as Dr. Roseanne Kup, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. Kapana Hodge. Did I get it right? You got okay. it right. <laughs> She's a licensed professional counselor and founder of the Global Institute of Children's Mental Health. It's great to have both of you with us. Thank you so much. Yeah. I was saying in the commercial break, Scott, I really admire what you've done with this film. And tell us about why you decided to make the documentary in the first place. And what do you want people to take away from it? I think with my own autism, 
I was, had so many misconceptions and did so much work. And then I thought, nobody really knows a lot about autism. So I went all around the world to investigate, to understand myself. And my adult children have autism. Mm. Right. So everybody in my family has been touched by this. And so many pediatricians and doctors and therapists, they don't understand it. Yeah. And they don't know how to help. And I just think there's a lot of solutions and possibilities. Here. Yeah. And Scott, you know, you mentioned misconceptions. No group is a monolith, right? Not everyone is the same. But what do you feel like some, some of the biggest misconceptions about your group? That we don't feel. Mm -hmm. And we feel too much. Mm -hmm. It's expressing how we feel and how do we understand our emotions. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work we can do with children and adults mm -hmm. on, on helping with that. Another misconception is we're not intelligent. Mm. There's Silicon Valley and most inventions and in Hollywood are autistic people. Mm. It, it's massive amounts of creativity. Doctor, you're nodding along. There, yeah. there really are misconceptions out there. What, what would you say to people about not only understanding, but being supportive yeah. of people around us who might have autism? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions that leads to di differences and challenges in working and supporting and loving people with autism is there's only one way of autism. I mean, it's called a spectrum for a reason. And there's so many variations in abilities not disabilities and differences, but really what happens is and how we best can support them probably more than anything is supporting their needs for differences in communication and also sensory needs, which we don't talk a lot about yeah. because their difficulties with sensory processing can lead to a lot of dysregulation, emotional and behavioral dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And if we can put supports into place earlier, not just with children, but in the work environment. We really can have um, so many beautiful components to autism out in the world helping individuals thrive and less mental health issues for neurodivergence. Scott, I know you, you talked to a lot of people for the film, um, and you talked to people who we should say are neurodivergent, which just means that they have a different, their brain has a different way of processing information, essentially, right? So right. there's a saying that I've heard, when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Correct. Can you speak to how unique people with autism can be and how much they do? I, I want to talk about the positives, like yeah. how much they do have to contribute. Well, I think so many people with autism think outside the box. Mm -hmm. We think differently. That's why you have so many great inventions and movies and TV shows yeah. and, and computer systems <laughs> and mm -hmm. cars. And so we already have a head start. So how do you take those kids that are having emotional or behavioral issues and resolve those that, so they can utilize their brains? Because autistic brains really are creating a massive amount of innovation in yeah. this world. And there's power in that innovation. Yes. Thank you both so much for sharing your insights with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and for more, you can go to pbs.org to watch the film. Thank you.
the state of emergency here in Baltimore. How is it that traffic was stopped in time? State law enforcement officers, they undoubtedly save lives. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Millions of Americans looked to the sky yesterday to see something extraordinary, a total solar eclipse. I got to view a partial eclipse here in New York City while Kate watched from Holton, Maine, one of the last U.S. cities in the path of totality. Yeah, I think we all felt a collective sense of awe, right, that, that made the experience unforgettable and deeply moving. We wanted to show you some of those moments. It's a rare event, right? I mean, why not take a, a chance to see something we may never see again? The glasses are off. We are in the Umbra. The great North American eclipse is happening right now above us. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's way better than school. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Whoa. Yeah. Yes, this is so incredible. It's amazing. been looking forward to this for the last however many years and encouraging all my friends to go. A lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is, uh, this is magical. see Venus in the middle of the afternoon. I have chills even now. I know. Just watching it again, I'm getting emotional yeah. all over again. It was just incredible. Oh, incredible. And so special to have that collective experience. Yeah. 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 So let's take a look at some of the eclipse stories that are trending today. All right. So hopefully you were one of the people who used, you know, these, those special mm -hmm. eclipse glasses. So what should you do with them now? Well, solar eclipse glasses do not expire. So if you're an eclipse chaser who wants to catch the 2026 solar eclipse in Europe, or you're waiting for your, our next eclipse in 2044, mm. you can keep the glasses yeah. or you can donate them. Volunteer centers around the country will collect and distribute your glasses so someone in Africa, Asia, and South America can safely watch the solar eclipse 
when it passes over their country. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah, these are my main glasses. Oh, I like them. I, know you I like can't them. See that, but, uh, I'm pretty proud that this was my second eclipse, as you should full be. total eclipse, but. I have nothing on Letitia Ferrerer. This 63-year-old Texas woman has not missed a solar eclipse since 1998. Wow. She has traveled around the world to see 21 oh. eclipses, even witnessing a couple over the ocean. She told NBC what it's like to see them. It makes me feel a immense sense of gratitude for even being here. At the same time, like a little itty bitty ant, because this is going to happen with or without me. <laughs> Since this eclipse was right in her backyard, she was able to do outreach in the Dallas area, teach people about the eclipse. She even got to watch it with her 90-year-old parents. Oh, love it. Love so it. special. Yeah. I'm Kate Snow. I'm Zinclay. You are watching Daily. lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. If it's Tuesday, Arizona Supreme Court says a near total ban on abortions dating back to the 19th century is enforceable. A bombshell decision in yet another battleground state as the fight over reproductive rights pushes further to the forefront of 2024. Plus, Vice President Harris meets with the families of American hostages taken by Hamas as talks to reach a ceasefire deal appear to hit a major sticking point over the future of northern Gaza, why Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu again vows to invade Rafa no matter what. And booked and busy, both chambers are back in session on Capitol Hill with foreign aid funding and a speechership threat looming over the House as Senate Republicans look to move forward with the impeachment trial of a top Biden administration official. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Yami Sendor in Washington, where we're following a bombshell ruling from the Arizona State Supreme Court. A Civil War era abortion ban still on the books is now enforceable. The 1864 Arizona law makes it a felony to perform an abortion or help a woman obtain an abortion in Arizona. The law had been on hold following the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The 160-year-old 
law will remain, remain stayed for another two weeks, but Arizona joins a growing list of states banning or essentially banning this procedure. Currently, abortions are illegal in Arizona after 15 weeks. This afternoon, Arizona's Democratic governor reacting, calling it a dark day. She also emphasized that an executive order protecting abortion seekers and providers from prosecution remains in effect. My executive order removing the ability of county attorneys to prosecute women and doctors for performing abortions remains. I refuse to allow extremist county prosecutors to use this abortion ban to lock up women and doctors seeking or providing needed health care. I am calling on the legislature to do the right thing right now and repeal this 1864 ban and protect access to reproductive health care. But this November, Arizona voters could have the chance to expand abortion access. Organizers behind a proposed constitutional amendment say they have the signatures needed for the 2024 ballot. Arizona would join three other states already set to vote on similar measures. And abortion right advocates in at least seven more states are also seeking ballot measures. Democrats hope these kinds of abortion ballot measures will drive voters to turn out in support of their party at the state level and in the presidential race. Former President Donald Trump acknowledged the issue could hurt Republican candidates in November, even as he took credit for overturning Roe v. Wade. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. You must follow your heart of this issue, but remember, you must also win elections to restore our culture and, in fact, to save our country. This is the latest version of Trump's many positions on abortion, and he did not say whether he would sign a national abortion ban if Congress passed one. In the past, he has hinted that he might sign one as his Republican allies have voiced support for a federal abortion ban. That includes South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, who told my colleague Sahil Kapoor that Trump's current position on abortion was a mistake. The idea that Dobbs prevents the federal government from acting, I think, is an error. For the pro-life movement, it's about the child, not geography. So if you're turning the pro-life movement into a geographical movement, I think you make a mistake. Trump responded by bashing his critics on social media. He also did so during an interview with a right-wing network last night. We took a great victory, and guys like Lindsey Graham... Uh, they make it controversial, and it's not controversial. It goes back to the states where all legal scholars on both sides want it. It was a great victory. Meanwhile, President Biden is seizing on Trump's comments as he looks to tie state-level bans to his Republican opponent. Yesterday, the Biden campaign releasing an emotional ad featuring Amanda Zerkowski. She is a woman who sued Texas over its abortion restrictions after she almost died from a miscarriage, she said. Take a listen. Gonna maybe wear home from the hospital. All of these. Um, this is... The blanket that she was in. And they took her little footprints. Joining me now on the ground in Arizona's NBC News campaign event, Alex Tabit. And also for the potential legal fallout, I'm joined by Michelle Goodwin, a professor of constitutional law and health policy at Georgetown University. Also with us, NBC News' Vaughn Hilliard. And we have senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Alex, I want to start with you. Take us through Arizona's state Supreme Court decision here. And what's been the reaction there on the ground? Well, Yamish, it's been an emotional and tense day here in Arizona as reproductive rights advocates have been learning in real time about this Supreme Court decision. The Arizona Supreme Court, which is right behind me, decided that, it, that the 1864 ban could, in fact, be enforced. And that's led a lot of reproductive rights advocates to come out and to make their voice heard about what their experience is like having an abortion 
already here in Arizona, where the, the ban is currently 15 weeks. I want to take a listen to State Senator Ava Birch. She uh, gained national headlines last month when she came out on the state Senate floor here in Arizona, told the people of Arizona about her own struggles with pregnancy, her own miscarriages, and her decision to get an abortion after, after learning that her fetus was not viable. Take a listen to what Birch had to say earlier this afternoon. Less than three weeks ago, I had an abortion, a baby that I would have loved to have had with a husband who I love very much. And what I had to go through to receive that care was unconscionable as it was. And now I cannot believe that we are even talking about what we might do to doctors if they care for women in this way what we might do to patients if they experience these hardships. And State Senator Birch has vowed to continue the fight regardless of the Supreme Court decision today. Yamish. And Alex, this ruling is stayed for 14 days. So what does that mean in practicality for women in Arizona, especially, of course, those women who are seeking abortions? Well, Yamish, that means for the next 14 days, the status quo will remain here in Arizona. Uh, that means that abortions will remain legal up until 15 weeks of pregnancy. There will be uh, no exceptions after 15 weeks for rape or incest. There will be an exception in the event that a mother's life is in danger. Uh, after those 14 days, Attorney General Chris Mays just recently said she's going to do whatever she can to fight to extend that stay. But after those 14 days, after those two weeks, uh, we may start seeing that 1864 territorial ban enforced here in Arizona. Thank you so much for reporting, Alex. Uh, Michelle, I want to go to you. What is your reaction to this ruling? It's quite a draconian ruling to put this in context. The 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States, was ratified in 1865, a year after this law. So this is a law that is rooted in a time in which slavery was legal in the United States. It's a time in which women who were married were considered the property of their husbands. It was a time in which marital rape was legal and domestic violence. All of that it's an interesting thing. It's a four to two opinion. And the majority in the case said that even though the state's 15 week abortion ban went into effect after Dobbs, they essentially said that that really didn't matter, that what Dobbs did was to provide the window, the open door for this 1864 law to prevail. Now, in this case, there's a very strong dissent, and it's a dissent that's signed on by the chief justice. It's written by the vice uh, justice of the uh, court, and it's nearly as long as the majority opinion. And here are a couple of things that they noted, which is that given that the 15 week abortion ban went into effect after the Dobbs decision, that that should be prevailing and that there was no time when the legislature was working on that 15 week abortion ban that they said that the 1864 law should prevail. Although what the majority uh, did say is that this law, which comes after Dobbs, basically has no effect on the validity of this 1864 law. I want to also ask you, Michelle, this ruling, it says it stayed for 14 days, but I imagine there will be some providers who are going to be immediately worried about providing abortion care. So what's the legal reality here and the legal implications, really? Well, the legal implications are that doctors in that state and others who aid in the termination of a pregnancy risk to at least two years incarceration if they happen to be prosecuted. There's a possibility that the state's attorney general uh, will tell, and my understanding is that she is telling uh, prosecutors in the state do not prosecute with this law, but that's not to say that prosecutors will abide by what she has said. So there's going to be chaos and fear. And if there's anything to learn from what has taken place in Texas, we know then that there would be doctors who may be so fearful mm -hmm. of criminalization or losing their medical licenses to practice that they will not intervene, even in cases where life is at risk for the pregnant person. 
And it's really interesting when you talk about chaos and fear because, of course, there's also that the fact that the Florida Supreme Court, they recently ruled on abortion restrictions, but the six-week ban is a more recent ban. So I wonder, what do you think is the significance here when you think about comparing those two abortion bans? Well, the these bans are actually quite similar in that they really provide no significant room for people who um, need to terminate a pregnancy because they're seeking to manage a miscarriage. The exceptions for the life of the pregnant person, we've seen in the past that those are more illusory than real because it makes it very, very difficult. Sometimes patients have to bleed for any number of days be in sepsis, be in such life-threatening circumstances that they end up leaving the state. And it's worth noting, and something that we don't hear in these news cycles, is that these pre-1865, um, that's the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, these abortion bans passed during that time were really in response to this fear that slavery would be coming to an end, that there would be the browning of the United States. And this was seen as a means of making sure that white women would do, as one famous doctor noted, spread their loins north, east, west, and south in order to combat the fear that the United States would become a place where there would be more freed black people. And so it's not surprising this law was passed before the abolition of American slavery. Wow, when you think about the fact that it was passed before slavery ended, and then when you think about that history, that is all really important context. So thank you so much for your analysis, Michelle. Thank you. Now, Vaughn, of course, you're one of our resident Arizona experts, maybe the best Arizona expert that I've met. Um, how big of a deal, though, do you, do you think this will be for Arizona politics when you think about 2024 during this election year? Right. It's going to be significant. Look, from exit polling, Yamish, in the 2022 midterm elections, more than two-thirds of Arizona voters said that they believe that abortion rights uh, should be a constitutional right of Arizonans. And so now we have a situation in which multiple reproductive rights organizations have gathered what they say is more than 500,000 signatures to put that potential constitutional amendment granting abortion rights up to 24 weeks on the ballot in this November's election. And and if, in fact, that is on the ballot, then seven months from now, we'll have a good understanding of how Arizona voters view this. But, you know, politically here, you've also got to look at the fact that, look, you've got a Democratic governor, a Democratic attorney general, and this sets at the heart of what is being deliberated around the country, a patchwork of laws. And you're looking at the potential of Republican county attorneys who want to uphold this territorial ban in the state of Arizona, who could very well sue the Democratic attorney general to, in fact, prosecute the law that is technically on the books. And so this is where it becomes complicated, not just here in the year of 2024, but well beyond, Yamish. It's, it is really complicating because you could have an attorney general who doesn't agree with the law ha being forced to enforce it. I want to ask you, though, also about Team Trump. We saw the former president release a statement uh, talking about abortion laws should be, should be left right. to the states. What is Team Trump saying now? And, and what do you think they're, they're thinking right now as Arizona now that's going to be a big issue there come November? Right. In that video that Donald Trump posted on his social media account yesterday, he really didn't say much new other than the fact that he touted the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Three of the conservative justices on the Supreme Court bench were nominated by him. And though he said that it should be up to states, whether it be the voters or state legislatures, governors, to determine the laws that they have on the books. Of course, he got pushback not only from his own uh, former vice president, Mike Pence, who said that this should be a, a, a federal uh, a, a ban of sorts uh, on abortion. This should not be a patchwork. This should not be a geographical issue, as you heard Lindsey Graham discuss it. But we even, if you take Arizona as an example here, this is the issue for Republican candidates because Carrie Lake is running for the U.S. Senate seat in Arizona, the open Senate seat. And when I talked to her about this Arizona ter territorial ban back in 2022, she told me that if she were to have won that governor's race, she would stand by and uphold the territorial ban. Fast forward to today, she now says that she opposes the territorial ban and that Arizona voters should make it clear at the ballot box where they stand on this issue. So there is an acknowledgement politically that a majority of voters, at least in Arizona, but we also see this nationally, are supportive of reproductive rights or at least access to abortion care. And that is going to be an issue here that is going to complicate others who say that this is a hard, fast moral conviction that they have. And yet the 
question is, do a majority of the voters side with them? And that is really where these states, including Arizona, could make that very clear in the months ahead. Vaughn, it's so interesting to see Carrie Lake fall in line. We've also seen Republicans in, in Pennsylvania and Nevada also be falling in line and echoing Trump's language now. So very interesting reporting. Thanks, Vaughn. Thanks. Now, of course, there's Kelly O'Donnell. Of course, I want to talk to you about the White House stance here. Vice President Harris came out just really within minutes of this ruling saying she's heading to Arizona on Friday. She's been front and center on this issue. Does the White House see her really as their best messenger on this issue? And what do we expect to hear from her, Wesh, as she goes to Arizona? Well, they definitely view the vice president as having a unique role to play here as uh, the highest ranking woman in American history in elective politics and being a voice on this issue. And she has been making it uh, a, a central piece of some of her outreach. And so she will be going back to Arizona on Friday. She was in Phoenix earlier, now heading to Tucson and being a key messenger on this. Part of what they are seeing here is that the views that the Biden administration and the Biden campaign have are very much in alignment. And we don't always see official policy and campaign policy running as easily on parallel as we do in this instance. And so certainly from all the official acts of the White House, uh, the administration believes strongly that it has made a commitment to the American voter that they want to restore the protections that were in Roe v. Wade. They'd like to do that through a Congress that would be a majority Democrat after voters go to the polls. They also want to do things like using executive powers to protect access to different care and to try to make movement between states more easy for women who are facing some of these difficult circumstances. Now, in the campaign lane, you're getting a lot of the messaging now. You uh, showed a piece of one of the new ads from the Biden campaign, and you'll see a lot of that kind of deeply personal experience put through this message because they are trying to galvanize women and the people in their families who also agree that these deeply personal decisions should be in the hands of families with their doctors. And this, of course, has long been a volatile issue, and there are people who have very strong feelings in support of the fact that Roe v. Wade was overturned, but for the Biden campaign, they view this as a way to motivate voters and to try to get support in places where perhaps we hadn't seen the potential for uh, these battleground states to have movement. This is an area where the president believes there is strength because these issues motivate voters. Yamish? As you talk about motivating voters, after the Florida abortion ruling, uh, the Biden campaign said, and a number of Democrats said that they believe now that that state, which is my native state, but it's become really a lot of ruby red and it's not really a swing state anymore. Um, they said that they, they thought that that might be putting Florida in play. Do you have that same sentiment coming from the Biden campaign when you look at Arizona with this ruling? They certainly believe that there is the potential here because this does cut across in ways that some other issues, whether it's the economy or taxes or the border, this cuts differently. And there are certainly some of the Nikki Haley type voters from the Republican Party, independents and so forth, who choose to vote differently when an issue like uh, access to this kind of medical care, access to abortion rights is put before them. So convincing voters to tie this to a presidential vote is part of what the Biden campaign wants to do over the next several months. Well, thank you, Kelly O'Donnell, for breaking it all down from the White House. Coming up, we have new developments in the ceasefire negotiations as the withdrawal by the IDF from a key southern Gaza city lays bare the, the war's devastating toll. We're live in Israel with the latest developments. Plus, winning over Wisconsin. I'll talk to a Wisconsin House Democrat about the president's political standing in the must-win state and why progressives are pushing back on U.S. military support of Israel. That's ahead. You're watching Meet the Press Now.
I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, Soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> My I apologize to for Jackson the many questions. Will never be I questioned. <laughs>Today, Vice President Harris met with the families of some of the Americans taken hostage by Hamas during the October 7th attack. It's the second time she has met with hostage families. According to the White House, the Vice President expressed her continued support for the families and provided an update on the ongoing talks to release the remaining hostages in Gaza. But any deal on a ceasefire in exchange for the release of more hostages remains out of reach. One of the biggest sticking points is centered on whether displaced Palestinians will be able to return to northern Gaza. The leaders of Jordan, Egypt, and France, some of the key players in those talks, just published a new op-ed in the Washington Post. They joined together to call for an immediate ceasefire and lasting peace through a two-state solution. That comes as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says a date has been set for the start of the military offensive into Rafah in southern Gaza. Today, Netanyahu said, quote, no force in the world will stop us. Joining me now from Tel Aviv is NBC News international correspondent Hala Gorani. So thank you so much for being here. What are the remaining obstacles in those cease talks and how likely is it that these two sides will be able to work through them? Well, you, you mentioned one of them, and we spoke to one of our sources close to the prime minister's office who's briefed on some of the discussions in the war cabinet. And what they said was that that return of Palestinians to the north is one of the sticking points. The Hamas representatives would have wanted a completely uh, limitless um, uh, return of all of the Palestinians, including uh, Hamas operatives, potentially to the north of the Gaza Strip. And uh, Israeli representatives were against that, wanting a limited number to return with very strict security checks. But of course, there are many, many more disagreements, uh, namely how long a ceasefire would last, how many hostages can and would be uh, released. So the two sides appear still to be far apart, though we're hearing some conflicting reports, Yamich, because over the weekend, uh, there were uh, some of the participants quoted by Egyptian media quoted as saying that um, uh, really we had uh, made more progress this time round than in previous rounds. Um, it is now in the hands of Hamas, we understand. And we are waiting for their response to the proposal that was put forth in Cairo. Uh, and so that's something we'll be keeping a close eye on, Yamish. And as you keep a close eye on that, on that, what more do we know about Israel's plans for Rafah and whether they have a solid plan to protect the millions of civilians that are sheltering there? So um, we do know that rhetorically, at least, the Israeli government, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the defense minister in this country, are all still very much vowing uh, to go ahead with this rough offensive that President Biden has publicly said is not a good idea. Um, however, with the retreat of ground troops uh, in the south over the weekend to the north and the fact that these ceasefire negotiations are still um, still very much alive, hopefully, and that any ceasefire, of course, would delay uh, a full-scale ground offensive in Rafa. It doesn't seem as though anything is imminent. Now, when it comes, Yamish, to the protection of civilians, Palestinians will tell you they don't believe that the Israeli government will protect civilians. They will point to how they've been treated in the Gaza Strip, to how they've been told to go to safe zones that were then subsequently bombed. And so, therefore, um, there is zero trust on the Palestinian side. I can tell you that, that the Israeli government or that the Israeli military will protect civilians in any offensive, Yamish. Certainly a heartbreaking situation. Thank you so much for your reporting. And a programming note, tonight on NBC News Now, a conversation with the families of Americans still being held hostage by Hamas. They join Lester Holt for a sit-down tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. And coming up, trouble at the polls, why so many election workers are quitting and what the historic turnover rates could mean for November. That story is next. You're watching Meet the Press Now.
is going to happen now? Going back and forth, because they... Go ahead, this is it, right? Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. News lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand, and officials say an entire town is cut off. This book to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now. It's NBC News Now. Welcome back. Voter turnout may be a key factor this November, but another potential issue, whether there will be enough election workers to execute the election. NBC News has exclusive new reporting that election worker turnover has reached historic highs. According to new data, at least 36% of local election offices have changed hands since 2020. And in 2022, 39% of jurisdictions had new top election officials compared to four years earlier. NBC News senior reporter Jane Tim joins me now for more. So this is really a fascinating story and so important. Why has there been so much turnover in election workers? You know, what we're learning from this data out of the Bipartisan Policy Center is that there's a couple of things happening here. First, of course, we can't ignore 2020. There was a pandemic, election denialism, uh, conspiracy theories abounded. Election workers faced enormous scrutiny while overhauling their elections. And since then, we've all overhauled our election codes as a country in most states. Now, that, of course, has driven a lot of election workers to say, you know what, this is too much. I got to get out. Uh, but it's not the only trend. So we're also seeing in the data that smaller jurisdictions, the ones that are, have fewer voters and usually less staff running these elections, the, that turnover in those districts started well before President Donald Trump ever ran for office. So we know that there are both contemporary problems, like election denialism and the harassment and the scrutiny, as well as longstanding systemic problems, probably funding, lack of resources that helps these people in smaller jurisdictions run, uh, run their elections. But when I talk to officials across the country, election denialism fi figures really strongly in how they talk about their experiences. Let's play the sound of someone in Cobb County, Georgia. I have had hours long conversations with voters, explaining every single thing and answering every single question and showing them every everything I can. And they'll stand up and they'll say, thank you for your time, but I still don't believe you. Now, Tate turned 30 this month. She's part of like a new generation of election workers. She feels really strongly that it's her duty to her community to count the votes and to count them accurately. But it still figures into her every day. She said he checks her, she checks her, her rear view mirror when she drives home every day to make sure she's not getting followed. And it's it's striking and heartbreaking to think that someone is so scared um, when she's really just trying to be a, a person who's working for our democracy. But I also want to ask you, of course, what are the potential consequences of all, of all this? If you have less election workers, could these elections be affected? Yeah, you know, a lot of the incoming officials, they do have similar levels of experience to past uh, elections uh, based on the data we have. But we do know that when you when you have new people doing jobs, there's a learning curve. You know, these jobs rely heavily on institutional knowledge. Uh, I've seen firsthand in areas where they've had complete overhauls of the staff, running future elections has been hard. I followed a county in Virginia, Buckingham County, where the entire staff all resigned last year. 2022 was tough for them. They were the last county in the state to report their results. They had to make corrections. It wasn't easy to get it done when you have a brand new staff. Well, Jane, Tim, this is really great exclusive reporting and such an important topic that we'll definitely keep an eye on. Thank you so much. Thank you. And still ahead, the House gets back to work on an ever-growing to-do list. And Wisconsin Democrat Mark Pocan joins me to talk about his party's priorities and why he and his dozens of other progressives are calling on the president to halt weapons transfers to Israel. You're watching Meet the Press Now.
lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Welcome back. For the first time in more than two weeks, both the House and the Senate are back in session. Today, House lawmakers return to Capitol Hill. Funding for Ukraine is likely to be a key focus in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, minutes ago, House Speaker Mike Johnson's office confirmed that he delayed, that he will be delaying sending articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas until next week. The House voted to impeach Mayorkas nearly two months ago, but that impeachment effort will likely die in the Democrat-controlled Senate, where an impeachment trial likely won't even happen. Joining me now is Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill. So what exactly is Mike Johnson, Speaker Mike Johnson, saying about this delay? Well, Yamish, there has been a change of plan here. Uh, Speaker Mike Johnson and House Republicans were all set to transmit the articles of impeachment for DHS Secretary Mayorkas to the Senate tomorrow evening. That has now changed, and Johnson's office just put out a statement moments ago saying that it will now happen next week. Uh, I'll read a portion of it from uh, the Speaker's spokesman saying, quote, to ensure the Senate has adequate time to perform its constitutional duty, the House will transmit the articles of impeachment to the Senate next week, unquote. And he goes on to call on the Senate uh, not to abdicate its responsibility to hold an impeachment trial. Now, this comes after multiple Senate Republicans had advised Speaker Johnson to do just that. They worried that if Johnson had transmitted the articles on Wednesday evening, then it would leave just Thursday for the Senate to start acting on them. And this is going to sound absurd, but it's true. A lot of those Republicans feared that the Senate would be very motivated to immediately dismiss those articles so they can leave on Thursday for a long weekend. Senators really value that extra time, those long weekends. And what these Senate Republicans said was the best way to try to pressure Democrats to hold a trial to move forward with this and give it full consideration was to uh, transmit it next week when there are several extra days for the Senate to be in session before that long weekend. Now, we got some reactions to this. Chuck Schumer the Democratic majority leader said simply we're ready to go whenever they are we're sticking with our plan we're going to move this as expeditiously as possible unquote and Ian Sams a spokesman for the White House released a uh, somewhat mocking and dismissive statement noting that House Republicans waited two months to send these articles already um, now he says they're delaying it for another week he says quote it lays bare how baseless and devoid of substance this whole PR stunt is referring to the impeachment of Marcus strong language there. We also heard from some Senate Republicans, Sahil, in the last hour. What can we expect from them once this impeachment trial begins? Well, a couple of things. Senate Republicans are going to do everything they can to try to pressure Democrats to do a full trial. This can go one of two ways. There can be a trial and full consideration and then a vote to convict or acquit. Or the other way this could go is uh, any one senator can call up a motion to dismiss the trial, and all it takes is 51 senators to dismiss the trial, and the entire thing is over. Republicans tried to do this exact same thing with the trial of Donald Trump after January 6th. Uh, most Republicans voted for it, but they couldn't find a majority. If Democrats have 51 votes in the Senate right now. If they all stick together and vote to dismiss this, it could go away very quickly, Amish. And at this moment, there's not a single Democrat who says they necessarily believe there should be a trial. There's some who haven't taken a position yet. So all Senate Republicans can do is try to pressure Democrats uh, to, you know, to keep this going. And the reason they want to do that is because they see this as a winning political issue. Senator Mitt Romney made clear that this is not going anywhere. Let's play what he said. I think there's no question but that uh, this is not going to uh, result in a conviction uh, because the test of uh, a high crime or misdemeanor being uh, committed has not been alleged and as a result of that uh, there will not be a conviction. So it's either a dismissal or an acquittal, Yamish. A dismissal or an acquittal. It's going to be very interesting to watch whenever those articles finally make it over to the Senate. Thanks so much, Shahil. And joining me now is Democratic Congressman from Wisconsin, Mike, Mark Pocan. Thank you so much for being here. So I want to, of course, start with the news of the day, Congressman. Arizona Supreme Court upheld a near total abortion ban in that state. What's your reaction to this ruling? You know, it's it's similar to what we have in Wisconsin, quite honestly, when uh, Roe versus Wade got overturned thanks to 
Donald Trump's picks on the Supreme Court, uh, we went back to 1849 law in Wisconsin. In 1849, we were taxing you know horses with horses and buggies, and uh, that law now is the law of the land in a place like Wisconsin. So it's it's seen as ridiculous by people, um, and I, I hope that they find every way to deal with it electorally or otherwise this year to overturn it. Yeah. Well, I also now want to turn to another topic, and that, of course, is Israel. Yesterday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said a date has been set for Israel's ground offensive into Rafah. What should the consequences be if Israel does launch that offensive into, into Rafah without a legitimate plan to protect the millions and millions of civilians that are sheltering there? Yeah, I just was home for two weeks uh, for getting around the district with town halls and meetings and some of the smallest communities in my my district. And it was interesting, this issue kept coming up about Gaza and people can't believe uh, the carnage uh, and the way that Benjamin Netanyahu has conducted his uh, alleged response to Hamas. Instead, you know, people see it as a collective punishment, as being overly broad, killing uh, 34,000 people, 70% of which are women and children. And I think if he does this, you know, a lot of us are asking for, and we did just do a letter with 56 members of Congress to the president uh, to have conditions and uh, no additional weapons transfers uh, until we know what's going on, especially with the killings of the most recent aid workers uh, from Chef Andreas's organization. You know, over 200 aid workers have been killed just trying to get food and water to people who are starving in Gaza. And, and this is not something that can be done in any way with the United States involvement. So, um, you know, I think uh, he should tread very carefully. Uh, our support of Israel uh, is a support of Israel, but it's not uh, just a blind support of Benjamin Netanyahu in doing what I think people back in Wisconsin anyway don't support. Well, I also, I mean, as you talk about sort of the, those aid workers and that, you're calling for the Biden administration to withhold the transfer um, of, of more military aids to Israel. Why is this strike, you think, on aid worker, workers seemingly the last straw for so many in your party? Yeah, you know, I think it really changed probably six, eight weeks ago among the mass uh, numbers of folks in the district um, where people just can't understand anymore the continued killing and the amount of carnage and the death destruction in Gaza. It's just this happens to be the most recent really a foul example of an execution of a response to Hamas, because this clearly wasn't responding to Hamas. And it's just an overly broad attempt to, I think, clear out Gaza. And and I think people have just had enough. And, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, make sure we don't have any additional uh, weapons transfers. We want an investigation of this. We want to know aid workers are protected. And we certainly don't want U.S. weaponry or equipment used if there is going to be an invasion of Rafa. And I think those are all things that we're trying to express to the president. He has the, the ability to do a number of those things on his own. Congressman, I, I want to ask you specifically, though, because Jose Andras has said he really is heartbroken that it took the death of foreigners for there really to feel like there was this shift after you had thousands and thousands, more than 30,000 civilians, um, Palestinians killed. So I wonder, could you talk a bit more about why this was different and why what you make of Jose Andreas saying that maybe there should have been a shift earlier when there were so many kids and, and Palestinians killed? Yeah, I, I mean, part of it, please don't take this the wrong way, but as media coverage of what happened, I had these town halls prior to the bombing of the, his aid vehicles, and I heard these things. So honestly, it's not like people suddenly saw that and changed their opinion in the rural parts of my district where I was doing town halls. They already uh, had a different opinion of what's going on. This is just one more really unbelievable example when you look at this aid workers who told the, uh, the 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 military where they're at said who they were and this still happened to them uh, you know that's just unacceptable at every level uh and i think that's yeah. why just you know right a full attentions on it but honestly before you all covered it before this happened i've already seen the turn happen in my district yeah, well, of course, we have been covering here at NBC News very closely before this aid workers were killed. But I, t I take your point, Congressman. How concerned are you that this position on aid to Israel, um, pushing for conditions to possibly be put on it, that that could backfire on Democrats, especially during an election year? I'll tell you, it backfires if we don't do anything. Um, you know, we just had uh, the presidential primary for Joe Biden. But we had 48,000 people vote uninstructed, which is the, the protest vote to say they're not happy with what's going on in Gaza. He only won by just under 21,000. We're a purple state and every vote matters. And if people stay home or vote a third party, we have real problems. But this isn't just 
you know, those those wards that near the campus where 30 and 40 percent of the people voted uninstructed. Uh, like I said, I went to rural parts of my district. I went to Edgerton and Monroe, Sauk City, Mazomany, places that probably most people uh, listening to your program have never heard of. Uh, and this is what I heard from, you know, older folks who are coming to town halls. They have the same concerns. So I think we make a mistake if we don't listen to where the public's at. I think people are leading. Now we need to follow. And I think once we do, we're going to be in a much better place. I also want to ask you, Congressman, among the lawmakers behind that letter to Biden pushing for conditions on aid to Israel was Congressman Jim McGovern. He is also behind a discharge petition to bring the Senate passed foreign aid bill to the floor. You have not signed so far as we can tell yet. Um, do you plan to do that? Do you support the Senate version that includes money for Israel, Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific? I completely support the funding for Ukraine. In fact, I think three quarters of Congress would if we can get it to the floor. The problem is uh, that resolution has zero conditions on aid to Israel right now. That's why we're hoping that the White House can provide some assurances on that so that we can move forward or just completely take the Ukraine funding up on its own. Like I said, I think 100 Republicans and virtually every Democrat would support that, including myself. It's being hung up right now because of the aid to Israel and what's happening. And we shouldn't let Benjamin Netanyahu essentially hold up funding that's needed in Ukraine. So we hope that there can be some direct action by the White House to help uh, get it across the finish line by providing some conditions on that aid. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Congressman Mark Pocan. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll dig deeper into the conflicts on Capitol Hill and the political fallout of today's Arizona abortion ruling. The panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. For the generation of now is NBC News Now. Welcome back. More now on the political fallout from today's major news out of Arizona and the state Supreme Court's ruling that a law banning nearly all abortions can be enforced. The White House announced that Vice President Harris will travel to Arizona on Friday for an event on reproductive freedom. And today's ruling also comes a day after Donald Trump released a statement saying abortion restrictions should be left to the states. For more, I'm joined by Eugene Scott, senior politics reporter at Axios, Megan Hayes, former special assistant to President Biden, and Carlos Carbello, of course, former Republican congressman from Florida and now an NBC News political analyst. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to start with you, uh, Carlos, if I can. Tr President, former President Trump said yesterday that abortion access should really be left up to the states here. Um, but now, of course, you have a battleground state that is reaching all the way back to before the Civil War to ban 
all abortions. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, Republicans fear the abortion issue. Donald Trump is leading the charge and demonstrating that fear, right? Doing this extraordinary video, trying to really distance himself from these abortion restrictions. Look, there's some states like Florida where abortion is going to be more prominent due to a ballot question. I don't think it's going to have an impact on the result of races on the top of the ticket. But in a state like Arizona, it's a completely different story. You, of course, have the presidential race, which was very close there in 2020. You have a Senate race that could decide control of the Senate, and you have a House race that was decided by a few hundred votes in 2022. So those are the kinds of races where this can really make a difference, and I think you're going to see Arizona Republicans, if they haven't already, running away from this they issue. Have. They have. I mean, we've seen Carrie Lake come out. Uh, oh, we've, wow. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we've seen uh, Representative Juan Siscomani come out, right? He represents, I believe, Southern uh, Arizona, where Tucson is, University of Arizona, lots of young voters where the vice president is going to speak this week. Uh, this is a state where swing voters, young voters, suburban voters will determine who wins. And an issue like this, a stance like this, is not going to be helpful for Donald Trump. I mean, what do you, what do you make, think this makes this, the impact of this could have on the Senate race in Arizona there. There's not only the presidential race, but there's, of course, the down-ballot races. I think that it has a huge impact on the down-ballot races. And one thing to just to add to what's going to happen in November, this is going to have an immediate impact now in fundraising. Mm -hmm. And that is going to impact the, the calendar or the, the, the map writ large and not just in Arizona. And every time Republicans bring this up, this is a huge fundraising opportunity for Democrats. And it just continues to put a finer point that Trump took took credit for this some, for something that is polling terribly for Republicans, and it is a winning issue for Democrats. Yeah. And I think this also deflects attention from the immigration issue, which is obviously a big deal in Arizona. We know we, Republicans want immigration to be prominent. Yeah, as we get closer to the election, Democrats want abortion. This uh, helps Democrats Absolutely. at this time. Yeah. yeah. I also want to ask, of, of course, about the way as you bring up immigration. Eugene, is this impeachment trial, maybe even no, is the articles, are, are they ever going to even make it to the Senate? Are we ever going to even see this trial happen, you think? It doesn't seem like it. I mean, the reality is what far-right Republicans have said, uh, they, the proof they have that should justify or move forward uh, in, impeachment articles, they just haven't produced that yet. Uh, they got the talking points they wanted in conservative media. I don't know that that was as helpful and fruitful as they thought it would be. Uh, and to your point earlier, obviously there are now other things that they're now being fo forced to focus on. But respectfully, Mike Johnson is just trying to hold things together right now. <laughs> Well, that's one way to put it. He's definitely trying to hold things together. But, Megan, is there anything you think that Republicans can do to try to make this harder on Democrats and to try to sort of really hammer home the point that they want to make here? I mean, they... they... <laughs> They need to come together and create more of a coalition, but they have their right, their far right is leading the leading the message here. And they didn't even send the articles to the Senate until there wasn't even a talk of sending them until there was a threat that he was going to lose his speakership. So it's just it's, there's just not a lot of there there for them. And I mean, Senator Schumer is just like, why are we doing this? This is kind of ridiculous. And Secretary Mayorkas is just sort of playing, you know, he, he just is a a ping pong basically yeah. in their game right now. And so it's just, they need to coalesce around actual issues that are that the American people care about or they are going to really see the impacts in November. And Carlos, I mean, there are some Democrats who say that this is actually embarrassing for Republicans, but what do you, what, how do you see this? Well, think about it. Republicans politically were gifted the issue of immigration. I mean, most of the country, we've seen the polling, it's very bad for President Biden. This is their best issue politically and they have managed to really muddy it. I mean, they abandoned a compromise that really would have tied the executive's hands when it comes to immigration, a pretty conservative bill uh, on Donald Trump's orders. And now they're sending all these mixed messages on New Yorkers where people know most Senate Republicans don't even want to take up this case because it's a waste of time. So here's an issue where Republicans have had a very clear shot and they're managing to squander a lot of that political capital and not uh, put Democrats' feet to the fire. Do you think there is something that Republicans could do to sort of wrestle this issue back in a way that would be effective for them? Because when I talk to voters out there you know, on focus groups, even when I go out to different states, they bring up immigration, mm -hmm. including some Democrats right, who say right. that this issue, they see this issue as out of hand, even if they live in a state like, like Michigan that's mm -hmm. thousands of miles away. So what should Republicans be doing better? Well, a very easy thing to do would be to bring forward and to pass 
the bill that Senator Lankford negotiated with Senators Murphy and Cinema, because then it would show that Republicans are actually serious about doing something about the border crisis. But instead, they listened to uh, President Trump, who said, don't do this. It's going to be bad for me politically. And Republicans, again, they're in the Trump trap. They know what they want to do. They know what's the right thing to do. But Donald Trump won't let them do it, and they don't want to get sideways with Donald Trump. Yeah, well, I'm going to start the Trump trap. I think we could use that, <laughs> that, that phrase a couple more times. It's yours. <laughs> but, uh, Eugene, I want to ask you, of course, about the other issue, because there is this long to-do list for Capitol Hill. How confident are you that there could be an aid package passed here, including aid that goes to Ukraine? You mean how soon or just in general, right? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, what, one day it could happen. Yeah. Uh, if it's going to happen anytime soon, it doesn't look like it. What's going to be interesting is uh, everyone's obviously thinking about November. And there are far-right lawmakers who are going to work as hard as possible to keep it from moving forward. There are people who are in swing districts who know that their voters want to see something happen, some type of compromise. There are obviously people uh, left of these individuals who not only want to see more humanitarian aid uh, for Ukraine, but, I mean, for Haiti, for Sudan. You know, there, there's a real ideologically, ideological diversity within the House in terms of what should be our role, America's role in the world. And whether or not uh, these lawmakers are going to get on the same page in the next couple of months, it just seems highly unlikely. Do you think this could cost House Speaker Mike Johnson his job? It's looking like it. I mean, within the last, I think it was a week or two ago, he was referring to uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene as a friend. Uh, and, you know, she was fundraising or campaigning this past week and saying some very unfriendly things about him. And so if he doesn't move in a direction that seems to be winsome to her and people like her, uh, she's made it clear that she's going to try her best to get him out of there. Uh, should Democrats, Megan, you think help Mike Johnson in his job? I was, we had on Representative SB out yesterday. I said, would you vote to help Mike Johnson keep his job? He said, no, I would vote for Hakeem Jeffries. Right. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the Democrats are going to hold true to their values and want a Democratic, you know, speaker when they're back in leadership. I'm not sure that they're going to to help Mike Johnson. I do think that there are things legislatively that they want to get done, like a Ukraine package, like, you know, Israel funding. They wanted to get a comprehensive immigration bill, but I'm not sure that they're going to tie themselves to, to, Mike, to Speaker Johnson. I will bet that Democrats will, of course, be loyal to Hakeem Jeffries, but that <laughs> enough of them will not be as disciplined as they were last time to not push the House into another two to three week um, fiasco like just, last time. So that's just not good for anyone, it's right? It's like anyone. it's not good for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like so I... if Johnson moves the Ukraine package, I do think maybe not explicitly, but I think Democrats will uh, give him a pass and let him stay. And I'll really quickly in the last 30 seconds that we have here, Donald Trump is of course talking again about Jewish Americans who vote mm. for Democrats, attacking them. Is that smart for him? And is this just something that people get used to with from Trump? I mean, it's bigoted to assume that someone, because of their race, ethnicity, or religion, should only vote for one party or the other is just um, completely absurd. People in both parties have done it. In this case, Trump is doing it, and it's just totally wrong. Does it hurt him at all, though? I mean, look, it probably hurts him with a lot of the voters that he's been losing and that Republicans have been losing since Donald Trump emerged on the national stage, right? Uh, college-educated suburban women really get turned off by these kinds of racial, ethnic messages. So, yes, it'll hurt them uh, on the margins, and the margins matter in these races. Yeah. So, we think that this will be a gift to Democrats, or do we think that it's, it's sort of the people who are going to not be with Trump aren't going to be with him anyway? I think right now it's people who it's just people turn it off, and I think when it comes to October, November, when this kind of hateful rhetoric is coming out of his mouth, it's a gift to Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for another spirited conversation, Eugene, Megan, Carlos. Thank you all. And we're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. coming on the air with the all-out scramble tonight in Arizona with an explosive ruling banning nearly all abortions in the state, a law from the Civil War era now brought back by a court, putting millions of women at risk of losing abortion access, doctors technically at risk of prison time. The questions tonight in that state and beyond, plus the big political fallout in this critical battleground just ahead. Plus, we're live in Michigan with a sentence making history. The parents of a school shooter headed to prison for their role in the deadly attack. The emotional reaction from the victims' families who say this is just the first step. 
Then, a case that captured the world's attention now back in the spotlight. Why Amanda Knox may have to clear her name again in an Italian court. Plus, in tonight's original, why a disease that was pretty much wiped out of this country for good is now the most prevalent it's been for seven decades. What's behind this surprising syphilis surge? And the numbers we're just getting in showing the women's basketball final for the first time ever beating the men's when it comes to rating. Why it's evidence star power matters a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we start tonight with that bombshell abortion ruling in one of the most important battleground states in the country, with new fallout now on a decision that effectively bans abortion in Arizona. No exception for rape, no exception for incest, the only exception to save a mother's life. The ruling says that the state has to abide by a law from the year that Abraham Lincoln was reelected, 1864, before women had the right to vote, before Arizona was even a state. The Democratic governor, today, emotional. I am I'm devastated by this decision, and I know that many Arizonas, Arizonans are as well. So a couple big implications for this ruling, right? First, obviously, women's health. This is set to go into effect in two weeks. Many women would presumably have to travel out of state for abortion care. And for doctors, a whole lot of question marks, since this makes abortion a felony, punishable by as many as five years behind bars. Now, the Arizona Attorney General today is making clear she is not going to enforce this. Watch. Let me be completely clear. As long as I am attorney general of the state of Arizona, no woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this draconian law. But there's still the other big piece of fallout here. Okay, the political consequence. Because yes, while Arizona is now poised to join Texas, Alabama, Mississippi as states with the toughest anti-abortion laws in the country, Unlike those other very red states, Arizona is very much a major battleground in the race for control of the Senate and the White House, with President Biden calling this court decision today a result of the extreme agenda, in his words, of Republican elected officials who are committed to ripping away women's freedom. You see his statement here. Still already in Arizona tonight, some Republicans are now distancing themselves from this ruling, including controversial Senate candidate Carrie Lake, who's up against Democrat Ruben Gallego in one of the most high-profile Senate races in the country. There's a lot to unpack tonight, so let's get to it with Laura Jarrett, who is joining us now. Let's talk about this in two buckets, right, just as we laid it out. Implications on women's health, the nuts and bolts, what this ruling does, and then the political fallout. Start with what this law actually will and won't do. So we just got off the phone with a bunch of doctors in the state who were saying, look, we don't really know where this goes because the court has obviously taken us back to 1864 on the one hand, Hallie, but they also recognize that what they're doing is likely to prompt more legal challenges. And so they put their own decision on hold for at least the next couple days to allow those challenges to play out. So it's possible that this doesn't even go into effect for quite some time. In fact, it could be up to two months, but just because the way the court structured its order. But let's play it out for a second that this actually goes forward and this becomes the law of the land. I think people at home might think, how is it that we could go back to 1864 in 2024? And the reason of because is all about Roe versus Wade, right? That was the constitutional right. Supreme Court struck it down nearly two years ago. And as a result of that, everything went back to the states. And if there is no constitutional right to an abortion, then any state can restrict it at two weeks, six weeks, 15 weeks, they can do whatever they want, essentially, Hallie. And that's sort of why you see it revert back to these old laws that were on the books so long ago. So part of this, too, you've laid out the health implications here. There are political implications. We know that the White House is saying that the vice president will travel to Arizona now later on in the week. It'll be her second trip in just a matter of weeks to that state to talk about this issue, one that she's really made her own. We also know that there are abortion rights groups working all over the country, including in Arizona, where they're trying to get it on the ballot. They're trying to give yeah. voters a chance to decide what the state's law should be. It is hard to overstate how important Democrats think this issue is going to be come November, particularly in a state that's real purple and real consequential. Democrats see it as a huge way to have voter turnout on an issue that they think works in their favor among voters who might otherwise be a little apathetic to the environment, Hallie. I think they see this as a winning issue for them. And it's interesting to think about sort of the snapback, right? You see all these court decisions popping up around the country at the state level only to have state ballot initiatives, perhaps, if they pass, undo all of them. But we should point out these state ballot initiatives that we're seeing in Arizona, it looks like it's going to go on the ballot there 
Florida. We saw that last week in mm -hmm. other places around the country. In those cases, voters would be essentially undoing what the court did by constitutional amendment. It's not easy to have a constitutional amendment. Anytime you need a super majority, usually, which means more than just the majority of people. Sometimes you need almost 60 percent of the vote. So it will be interesting to see how this fuels turnout and whether once people actually go to the polls, sort of what they do to make their voice heard on this issue. And I think it speaks to why you see so many people on Capitol Hill in Washington being so careful because they don't want to be perceived as being out of step with what the voters want. Laura Jarrett, thank you very much for that. Lots to follow. Appreciate it. Yep. It's taken out of the historic sentencing of the first parents ever to go to prison because of the mass shooting their child carried out in a case that essentially put parenting on trial. And the emotional plea tonight from victims' families who say this does not and cannot end here. Right here on the screen, you're seeing James and Jennifer Crumbly being led out of the courtroom in just the last couple of hours after learning they will spend up to 15 years behind bars after a conviction on four counts of involuntary manslaughter. They're accused of not doing enough to stop their son from killing four teenagers and hurting seven other people at Oxford High School in Michigan. Their son's already in prison for life without parole. With the judge here in the parents case acknowledging she had to go beyond the guidelines with this sentence because of the unprecedented territory they're all in. The Crumbleys today apologizing to the parents whose kids were killed, but defending their own parenting. We were good parents. We were the average family. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son and each other tremendously. If there's anything the general public can take away from this is that this could happen to you too. The families of the four victims, Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Juliana, Justin Schilling. You see their faces here, all of their families, very emotional, obviously, and really slamming the Crumblies for what they say is a lack of remorse. You say you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says on what type of parents you are. You have failed your son and you have failed us all. And I live every day with pain, anger, heartache, regret, anxiety, stress. You name it. To me, that makes a maximum sentence being 15 years too short. How did they even have 15 years to live? Shaquille Brewster is covering this for us in Pontiac, Michigan. And let's pick up on that, that question of remorse here that you heard some of those family members talking about. It was really important with some of the families saying they didn't even want the max sentence until they, until they saw how the Crumbleys acted during trial. Yeah, Hallie, that lack of remorse was a key factor for the prosecution. It was a key factor for the judge as she was announcing her sentence. And it was clearly a key factor for the families of the four victims who pointed to it repeatedly. And what they were talking about really goes to the timeline and what happened in the hours and days before that shooting in 2020 in 2021 it was that friday before that james crumbly bought his son the weapon that was ultimately used the day after jennifer crumbly took her son to the shooting range and then that monday and tuesday the first day is back to class you saw ethan uh, crumbly was caught searching online for ammunition the next day his parents were told about violent depictions, literally pictures of Ethan shooting people that he put on his homework papers. They were told about that and they did not act. And uh, during the trial, we heard Jennifer Crumbly essentially say and testify that there was not much that she would have done differently. That clearly struck the parents the wrong way. And I want you to listen to what we heard from one of the parents of, the, of one of the victims uh, during the victim impact statements today. The remorse that they were showing has nothing to do with taking accountability for their actions. I'm sure they're sad their son is in jail. I'm sure they're sad that they're in jail. That's not what's important. That was after the sentencing, but you heard him mention that in open court directly to James and Jennifer Crumbly. Jennifer Crumbly, during her statement, did acknowledge that uh, her testimony rubbed people the wrong way and tried to explain it by essentially saying she said she couldn't foresee the actions that her son were going to take. Uh, but that clearly did not have a strong impact on the judge yeah. who ultimately, as you mentioned, sentenced them to 10 to 15 years in prison. You talk about the judge here. Let me talk about the prosecutors and how they're reacting. Let me play a bit of that. Most parents don't need a message like that. Most, most parents don't need to have a message sending to, that don't buy your, your son a, who's explain, um, exhibiting signs of distress, um, a 9 millimeter deadly weapon, and, and make it accessible. 
So help us understand this accountability factor here, because the families of these victims say they want this to be really just the beginning. Yeah, and they're making it clear that they're not done yet. They want legal changes. They're going to be talking to lawmakers, trying to get those changes. For one, they want some legal protections and immunity for school officials and for schools to go away, and they want to shift in that law. They also want uh, mandatory investigations after uh, these kind of shootings. Listen to a little bit of what we heard from those family members. This is the low-hanging fruit. Now it's time to turn our focus to Oxford schools who played a role in this tragedy. Many, many don't know that our government has not investigated this murder. So they believe they have more work to do. This is essentially the third instance where we've seen them in court. They've had to have a part and played a part in Ethan's trial, the shooter, 15-year-old, who uh, is now behind bars serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And remember, James and Jennifer Crumbly had two separate trials. Yeah. They're saying the families of those four victims are saying they're not done yet. There's more work that they want to do to make sure that no other families feel the way that they're feeling now, Hallie. Shaq Brewster, live for us there at Michigan. Thank you. New warnings tonight, new urgent warnings about ISIS threats at home and overseas, where the big soccer championship in Europe is stepping up security for quarterfinal games in the UK, Spain, and France. In a statement, the Champions League says it's aware of alleged terror threats and that what they call appropriate security arrangements are in place for all of these matches. That's happening is back here at home. U.S. officials are sounding the alarm about so-called lone wolf extremists inspired by ISIS, potentially targeting big events in this country. Just tonight, we're learning the FBI has arrested an 18-year-old from Idaho for allegedly planning to kill people at a church in his hometown in the name of ISIS. Let's bring in Ryan Riley now with more. What else do we know about this teenager from Idaho? So it's, this is one of those cases that involves sort of an FBI sting. So there are multiple okay. confidential human sources uh, who are signed up with the FBI who are talking uh, to this individual here and essentially offering him any support that he needs in, in furtherance of this plot. You know, the reason that this is a lot easier to charge individuals who are supporters of an idea, foreign ideology is because there's different laws that are in place for individuals who are associated with far, designated foreign terrorist, uh, uh, terrorist organizations versus just, you know, your run-of-the-mill sort of domestic organization. So ma a material support charge is something that they can bring here. It makes it essentially easier to charge people in this scenario. This scenario involves a teen, just an 18-year-old, who actually had contact with the FBI or FBI confidential human sources when he was 60. He was apparently formerly a white supremacist who said he drank the Kool-Aid of white supremacy at one point and then sort of has now wandered more recently into this more foreign terrorist ideology involved with ISIS. So, you know, clearly I think there are even in the document signs that he had some mental health issues here. Yeah. This is sort of links into the story you're uh, talking about before. You know, it's very similar in terms of these teens who have these mental health issues what are, what are the steps that law enforcement can take to prevent this from happening in the future? This Idaho <clears throat> situation, what we're learning now about this teenager in Idaho, this is all coming out after that warning, right, about the potential for ISIS-inspired attacks. Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of a separate sort of issue. That is a broad, broadly, that's something that law enforcement yeah. is very concerned about, these potential for lone wolf attacks. But in this instance, you have somebody who, you know, appears to be, um, you know, accepting of these ideologies and um, isn't, you know, is someone basically who the FBI it seems like was maybe potentially targeting here. You know, in this case, you have someone with a flag, actually, that was paid for by the FBI. So mm. these sting operations the FBI launches, particularly against young Muslim teens, tend to gather a lot of scrutiny about whether or not what the tactics exactly were here and whether, you know, this was something that could have been an off-ramp, some sort of way of eliminating the threat without mm. necessarily just going straight to indictment and, you know, yeah. the, for bringing this case to the, uh, the end safely. Ryan Riley, thank you very much for that update. Appreciate it. Tonight, in a new explosive court filing, prosecutors are painting Alec Baldwin as a man with absolutely no control of his own emotions on the set of Rust. You remember, of course, cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed after Baldwin was holding a prop gun that went off on the set of Rust. Now, prosecutors say Baldwin was not attentive during his firearm training, that his relentless rushing of the crew on the movie set routinely compromised safety and that he was often screaming and cursing at himself and others for no real reason. Baldwin's trial on involuntary manslaughter is scheduled to start in July. He's pleaded not guilty. Now, NBC News has reached out for comment on this latest filing. We have not heard back. The film's armorer 
Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter last month. She's expected to be sentenced next week. Elwin Lopez is covering this for us. What's interesting here, this was just the, this information, everything that we just talked about here, was in response to Baldwin's attorneys trying to get these charges dropped, but included some pretty intense language. Talk us through what has come out now in just the last, you know, eight hours or so. Yeah, Holly, that's right. Prosecutors are slamming Baldwin after his team tried to throw out the indictment against him. In that filing, they claimed that the actor has, quote, absolutely no control over his own emotions and absolutely no concern for how his conduct affects those around him, adding that, quote, it was this exact conduct that contributed to safety compromises on set. Now, remember that there's been a lot of back and forth between the state and the defense here. This one, just the latest, and it's been made public just a week before the sentencing of the armor, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who was found guilty, as you mentioned, of involuntary manslaughter last month. Gutierrez also mentioned in that filing where prosecutors claimed that the, quote, combination of our negligence and inexperience and Baldwin's complete lack of concern for the safety of those around him would prove deadly for Helena Hutchins. Hallie? This is going to give us some insight, perhaps, on what we can expect in trial, yeah? Yeah, so prosecutors here are alleging that Baldwin changed his story and provided misleading information. He says in one interview with law enforcement that the cinematographer who was killed, Helena Hutchins, was turned talking to someone when she was shot. And in another interview, he says that she was giving him instructions as to where to point the gun. That first interview was right after that fatal incident, and the other one was with OSHA a few months later. Also important to point out, Hallie, that in those filings, of both parties raised issues with information shared with the media including NBC News. Elwin Lopez live for us there in L.A. Lots to follow over the course of the next few weeks on this one. Thank you. Let's take it down south where they're bracing for some pretty scary spring weather with the possibility of tornadoes, big hail, maybe flooding for some 22 million people from Louisiana over to Texas. That's where you're seeing some of this hail overnight. Look at that dropping. In Atlanta, a flight that may have been hit by lightning earlier, according to airline officials, had to land with the pilots declaring an emergency. I want to bring in meteorologist Bill Karens, who's joining us now. All right, where is this thing hitting and when, critically? Yeah, so far so good, Hallie, but tomorrow is okay. kind of the big day. Tomorrow is the day we expect possibly a tornado outbreak and maybe even a few strong tornadoes, you know, the type that can actually, you know, go through and ruin a town. Uh, so we'll deal with that tomorrow. Now we have two tornado watches. We've had no tornadoes today. Haven't actually had a lot of severe weather either. We've had thunderstorms, ton of rain. We got flash flooding issues. We'll show you that in a second. But this area of strong thunderstorms is right over Interstate 49, Shreveport, southwards. And when you see a kind of, we call it Boeing, when you look at the thunderstorms, it kind of looks like a bow right here. That's when you know you have very strong winds, and that's why we have this severe thunderstorm warning. They're saying the wind gusts could be 60 to 70 miles per hour. So that's just now crossing Interstate 49. That'll be heading up here towards Interstate 20 East or Shreveport in about a half hour from now. So for the rest of this evening, the area of concern is as these storms continue into Louisiana, new storms are going to be forming over the top of Waco and Austin, maybe Dallas and Fort Worth, but so far most of the storms have been south of that. And then during the early morning hours, we think Houston could get into some of the action. And we do have at least favorable conditions for maybe one or two strong tornadoes. That's these hatched lines here. So from College Station, Lufkin, the Fort Polk. Hopefully not but at least it's a possibility in this area. Tomorrow, though, is another upgrade higher. This means the confidence is there for strong thunderstorms. That'll spin. That could produce strong tornadoes. That's this red coloring in here. So that's a moderate risk. We only can go one category higher, which is called a high risk. And we only get a couple of those events each year, maybe like two or three. And so we'll see if this gets upgraded tomorrow. But it's a very good chance that there will be some strong tornadoes in this vicinity of southern Mississippi near the Louisiana border. Uh, obviously, we have to keep a close eye on areas like Mobile and New Orleans, heading to Jackson. Uh, it looks like southern Alabama has the best chance of getting the strong storms tomorrow. Montgomery to Birmingham, more isolated storms. And I mentioned the flash flooding is already an issue. This huge area, including Shreveport, under flash flood warnings, most spots two to three inches of rain. And the flash flood watches now continue all the way to Panama City. So this area is going to get drenched round after round of thunderstorm. And someone has a chance of getting up to eight inches of rain. So you know, tornadoes always get the headlines. You, you see them on TV. They look incredible. The damage is just you can't believe what they did. But flooding kills more people every year, flash flooding, than yeah. tornadoes do. So we have to remember that flash flooding doesn't get the headlines, but can be very dangerous throughout this region. And as we head towards the, the evening and the, the rest of the day today and tomorrow, this area in central Alabama, Hallie, this is under a moderate risk of flash flooding, too. So we'll watch it all tomorrow, and uh, hopefully we'll get through it unscathed. But uh, there will be dangerous storms. Well, you sound like you have a busy 24 hours ahead of you, Bill. Thank yeah. you. I'm sure we'll see you back uh, throughout the course of the day. Thanks.
To the investigation now tonight by the FAA after some new claims from a Boeing whistleblower who says he's got some quality concerns about a couple of Dreamliner models that could be catastrophic. This whistleblower, he's an engineer, says he found problems in the production of the company's 787 and 777 aircraft, and that instead of listening to his warnings, he alleges Boeing retaliated against him. Now, the FAA says voluntary reporting without fear of reprisal is a critical component in aviation safety. Boeing, for its part, says there's nothing wrong with the structure of these planes, saying they're fully confident in their words in the Dreamliner. Leslie Josephs is joining us now. Okay, walk us through these whistleblower claims. What specifically are they, and where does this go from here? Hi, Hallie. Nice to talk to you. So what we're hearing from the whistleblower is that Boeing, uh, this whistleblower is alleging that Boeing uh, did not address uh, properly small gaps that are not even visible to the eye um, in the body of the, the plane, the fuselage. Uh, Boeing has had issues with their 787s with quality problems for years uh, built out of Charleston. The planes were Pretty much uh, deliveries were halted for the better part of two years through 2022 from uh, pretty early in the pandemic. Um, and Boeing has put in certain things like sh shims, um, and they've had other methods to kind of close those gaps. And this whistleblower is alleging that over time, that there it could be a uh, risk to safety of flight. Boeing is denying these claims, calling them inaccurate. The FAA you know, is investigating them. They've already had an interview with this whistleblower uh, who is going to be testifying in front of a Senate committee next week. Um, and this is coming at a time, and this is why it's getting a lot of attention and maybe more than it normally would, is that Boeing is under an immense amount of scrutiny over the 737 MAX, a different plane. That's its, its best seller after that door plug blew out of the Alaska Airlines plane earlier this year. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of questions about uh, quality, but Boeing is so far uh, saying that these, uh, these claims are inaccurate. There's also the business perspective, obviously, too, because Boeing today is also saying it delivered only about 29 airplanes last month, less than half of what they delivered in March of last year, right? I mean, it's clearly a slowdown. Yeah, so Boeing is facing a whole bunch of quality issues and to get a handle on that. Essentially, they ha they're having to slow down their production lines, which is not what their big airline customers, Southwest, United Airlines, want to hear. You know, summer's coming up. They want those planes. Some of them have slowed down or paused hiring altogether, um, putting United putting pilots out on um, unpaid leave, if, if um, voluntary unpaid leave, I should say. And uh, the FAA has said, Boeing, you cannot increase your production of the 737 MAX until yeah. we're satisfied. And we're going to hear more from Boeing later this month when they report on the 24th. Lots of eyeballs on that. Leslie Josephs, thank you very much. Overseas now, a new opportunity for Amanda Knox, remember her, to try to clear her image once and for all in a new slander trial set to start tomorrow in Italy. I know you remember this. This was a case that had people all over the world talking. The stunning story of this young American at the time and her Italian boyfriend, thought to have violently murdered Knox's 21-year-old roommate during what prosecutors said was a satanic sex game gone wrong. Even though Knox and her then-boyfriend were acquitted, there's still been some speculation that hasn't necessarily stopped. And that's why this new trial, this new slander trial, is such a big deal. Here's Josh Letterman. When you hear the name Amanda Knox, you probably recall the salacious details of the Italian murder case that became a years-long global tabloid extravaganza. The captivating headlines about a violent sex game gone wrong with Knox's then-boyfriend and 21-year-old British roommate, her supposedly strange and lackadaisical behavior after the murder, the nickname Foxy Knoxy thrust upon her by the media that painted her as a sex-crazed, twisted seducer and swarmed over every twist and turn. For Amanda Knox, that's a problem. It's been more than eight years since Italy's highest court overturned her murder conviction, essentially clearing her after she spent four years in prison. But most people don't remember that part as vividly. I'm sure uh, people will still hold it against me because they don't want to understand what happened and they don't want to accept that an innocent person could be gaslit and coerced into what I went through. Now Amanda Knox is facing another trial and hoping this one will clear her name for good. Amanda Knox probably realizes that even if she's completely exonerated by all Italian courts, public perception of her among many will still be that she is a killer who got away. The focus of this trial, slander. During the murder investigation, Knox had pointed the finger in a written statement at a Congolese bar owner who was jailed for two weeks but ultimately cleared. Prosecutors say that was slander. 
An earlier slander conviction against Knox was thrown out last year, but Italy's top court has ordered a new trial. Knox has said she wrote that statement under pressure after hour upon hour of interrogation. Ordinarily in the States, giving investigators a lead into who you actually thought committed the crime is hardly slander. It's usually just helping the police. This case, the latest layer of a true crime drama that's unfolded over the course of more than 16 years. Meredith Kircher was found dead in a pool of blood in the apartment she and Knox shared in November 2007. Another man from the Ivory Coast was convicted in 2008 and put in prison. But Knox and her boyfriend were tried separately and also convicted for Kircher's murder in 2009. Even after that conviction was thrown out in 2015, the publicity circus didn't stop. Knox became the subject of a series of documentaries, movies, and now a limited series on Hulu, produced by Knox herself. Knox is now 36, a mother of two young kids, and an advocate for criminal justice reform. On social media, Knox calling her new trial a good thing and a chance to prove her innocence once and for all. Josh is joining us now. So on that note, Josh, we know that Knox isn't planning to be in court tomorrow, but she is going to testify at some point, right? Yeah, that's right. So this all kicks off tomorrow in Florence, Hallie, and it's expected to be uh, behind closed doors. And while her lawyer said uh, that she's not expected in court tomorrow, Amanda Knox said on her podcast she does expect to testify during the course of this trial. And this entire case, Hallie, has one piece of evidence in it. The only evidence in this case is that four-page statement uh, that she gave while she says she was in the middle of some 53 hours of interrogation, obviously over multiple days. She says uh, that that was not the kind of conditions that she could uh, be expected to be able to testify reliably. In fact, her previous conviction on these slander charges uh, was objected to and thrown out after a European human rights court said that her human rights had been violated because she had been denied access to a lawyer uh, and that kind of a thing. But Amanda Knox hoping that this is going to make the difference for her because she says uh, that these slander allegations against her uh, have been a key reason that many people in Italy and frankly even in the U.S., Hallie, doubt her innocence. Slander, uh, unlike in the U.S. where it's a, a civil thing, you can sue somebody for money, uh, in, the U in Italy it is actually a criminal offense. Uh, but Amanda Knox hoping uh, that she will be cleared of this allegation allegation and it will finally put this entire legal and publicity scandal mm. behind her once and for all. Allie. Josh Letterman live for us with more on that I'm sure to come in the days ahead. Thanks Josh. When we come back an NBC News exclusive why the country's running out of the people who basically help our democracy function and why one man wants millions from women he says targeted him in a Facebook group set up to catch cheaters.
we're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The huge settlement for victims of that East Palestine train disaster. Why Norfolk Southern is set to pay hundreds of millions of dollars. But first to an NBC News exclusive. Finding the people who work at the polls when you go to vote. The election workers who keep the wheels on the tracks for our democracy. They are walking off the job at record rates. Partly it's because of threats. Right. Think about fallout from 2020 and what we heard after January 6th when election workers Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss publicly described the onslaught they faced, the fear they felt for their safety because of former President Trump's election fraud lies. I don't want to go anywhere. I second guess everything that I do. Um, it's affect my life in a, in a major way. In every way. All because of lies. I've lost my name and I've lost my reputation. I've lost my sense of security. But new data first released to NBC News shows that the problem goes beyond threats as elections offices try to put thousands of new officials in place ahead of November this year. Our Jane Tim, who's behind this exclusive, is joining us now. Okay, Jane, so what is it, right? If it's not just the threats, what else is involved here that's, that's creating these election workers to feel like they can't keep working? Yeah, Hallie, we've been talking about what election denialism might do to election workers for years. And for the first time, we finally have data that tells us what's going on. And what we're seeing is that in larger jurisdictions, which you remember were definitely some of the biggest targets of President Donald Trump and his allies, places like Detroit and Atlanta and Phoenix, that those are the jurisdictions where you're starting to see enormous turnover. Between 2018 and 2022, 46 percent of large jurisdictions, and let's be clear, 80 percent of Americans live in what's large jurisdictions had election official turnover. That's huge. These are the most complex elections they're running. But what we also learned in the data, and I think we have some numbers we can put on the screen, we see that election official turnover actually started before Donald Trump was a candidate, before he started talking about fraud. So there's some long-term systemic problems. You can see that it was rising gradually since 2004. Uh, there's definitely some issues that, including funding, staffing for election officials uh, that, are, that are at play here. This is not a, a one problem issue. What about the elections workers coming in, right? I wonder what you, what others are hearing from them, these folks who are now stepping into these important jobs, right, often like under the radar jobs, ahead of this very critical election in November after everything that we've seen over the last few years related to threats and harassment. Yeah, you know, this issue plays heavily election denialism on election officials who are leaving the job as well as coming in. I think we have some sound from an official who left in December 2020 and just said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Why don't we play that? It does break my heart a little bit because there's some really super great people across this country who put their heart and soul into what they do. And for them to walk out means that there's this huge gap of knowledge that um, maybe the next folks coming in don't even have information from or know who to contact or how to build those programs, continue to make the office successful. But the officials who are coming in, I've talked to a lot of them, including Debney's successor in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and they're, they're excited and passionate to do this work. They see this as service and they say, you know what, we're not going in with blind. We know how bad this can be. We know how hard this job can be. But they say, if not me, then who? And believe this is part of their democratic duty. So there's definitely some, some reason to be optimistic when you see some of these new fresh blood that's coming into these jobs, even if it is going to be tough for them to pull off a 2020 for election. Jane, Tim, thank you very much for that reporting. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Norfolk Southern Railroad says it'll pay $600 million, more than a half a billion dollars to settle a huge class action lawsuit over what you're seeing here on screen. Remember that, that massive train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, spilling toxic chemicals across that community. A lot of health concerns at the time for people there. The company now says the money should go toward things like health care and fixing up people's property. 
number two, take a look at this huge explosion at a hydroelectric power plant, a deadly one. At least three people killed in Italy. It also hurt several other people in just the last couple of hours. Rescuers right now are searching for some still missing, local officials say. One local media outlet reports the explosion totally collapsed part of the underground plant, setting off a fire and flooding. Number three, a new study says using Tylenol during pregnancy is not tied to kids' risks of things like ADHD and autism. Acetaminophen, you know, is a pretty common pain reliever for folks during pregnancy. Some earlier studies had suggested perhaps a link between its use and kids ending up with developmental disorders. This new study now refutes that. Number four, a court in LA now throwing out one man's defamation case against a woman who says he was a bad date. <laughs> There's this private Facebook group called, Are We Dating the Same Guy? They had women posting in that group that this guy was inappropriate on some of the apps. He is now suing 50 of these women for defamation and discrimination. We should note this is the first case to be thrown out, but TBD on what happens with the rest of them. Number five, Mattel is launching a new, more collaborative version of Scrabble. It's called Scrabble Together. There's a second side of the board where players work together. It could be a little less competitive. Mattel says this is the biggest change they've ever made to the classic board game. Right now, it's only available in Europe, but TBD on whether it comes to the U.S. soon. Coming up, the son of one of America's richest men now going door to door with farmers, asking them to help the Ukrainian people. This is an Andrea Mitchell original coming up in just a second. Plus, why this goat is the goat of surviving under a bridge. the message that you're trying to get out to young people. Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the FBI now investigating an attempted bombing at a satanic temple in Salem, Massachusetts, after somebody allegedly threw something explosive at it. Officials say nobody was hurt because the temple was not actually open and this bomb didn't actually go off. Somebody who works there found it like 12 hours later. The mayor called the whole thing utterly reprehensible. Also from our Northeast Bureau, take a look at this, this brush fire right along the Jersey Turnpike in just the last hour. These pictures coming into us right in the middle of rush hour traffic. You see the firefighters there, they're trying to get it under control, but apparently it spread pretty quickly. It's affected at least one car so far. We're watching this one. And out of our Midwest Bureau, pretty scary situation for this missing mountain goat who disappeared from a farm in Kansas City two months ago. And look where this little goat ended up, right under the bridge, right by the pillars. Somebody who spotted this goat managed to get a rope around its neck. Look at that. You know, keep it from falling, I guess. Firefighters eventually got the goat down, this like rocky rescue thing. Its name is Chug. 
Chug the Goat, I'm happy to report, is now in stable condition. So some news coming out of Washington and well beyond, because new money that Ukraine desperately needs is on the line as members of Congress are now back in town after being out for a couple of weeks. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says Ukraine will lose the war with Russia without this new money. But Ukraine might need more than military support. The war is hitting its land hard, crushing its farming industry. And now Howard Buffett, farmer, philanthropist, son of billionaire Warren Buffett, is going all around the country trying to get American farmers to support their counterparts in Ukraine. Here's Andrea Mitchell. Yukon, Oklahoma, known for wheat fields and cattle ranches, is nearly 6,000 miles from the battlefields of Ukraine. But people in both places may have more in common than they think. Why are you doing this? Why are you traveling across the country talking to farmers about Ukraine? Well, I'm talking to more than just farmers. I'm trying to talk to anybody who will listen, to be honest with you. What happens in Ukraine is going to have a huge impact on what happens to this country. Ukraine wants a top grain exporter before the war known as the breadbasket of Europe. But Vladimir Putin's invasion has decimated production. Fields now littered with landmines, tractors replaced by tanks, exports plummeting, farmers' livelihoods destroyed, and populations from Egypt to South Africa scrambling for grain. We joined Illinois farmer and agricultural philanthropist Howard Buffett on the third stop of a tour across the U.S bringing the plight of Ukraine's farmers to the American heartland. In partnership with the German Marshall Fund, a pro-democracy think tank, Buffett has one goal, to convince farmers here to support farmers over there, unable to till their battle-ravaged fields under constant bombardment from Russia. If Ukraine falls to Russia, I will. I, there's no other logical conclusion other than NATO ends up fighting Russia at some point. You're going to wake up one day and we're, we're going to be in it. And we're going to be in it. And our kids are going to be fighting. Our grandkids are going to be fighting. Somebody's going to be fighting. Here at the stockyards in Oklahoma, the farmers and ranchers we talk to sympathize with the farmers in Ukraine, but it feels far away. I get in my tractor. I don't worry about a bomb going off when I go to plow my field. I worry about how much fuel's in the tank, you know, what station's on the radio, and what the markets are doing. I don't have to worry about my life. And those farmers, sure enough, have to worry about their life and whether they're going to go home that night to their family. Buffett brought together Oklahoma locals, cattle ranchers, wheat farmers, and poultry producers with different perspectives. From a U.S. wheat producer standpoint, that their cheap grain is putting us at an extreme disadvantage. I think it's huge, a huge issue for the world uh, to hold the line, uh, to hold the line here and uh, protect the Ukrainians. And I say you can support them for the ethical reasons, the moral reasons, or the selfish reasons. You get to the same place. All of us get caught up in our day-to-day -day life of, you know, paying the bills and keeping the farm running and all that, and don't think about those big things that happen on a global scale. <laughs> Buffett told me that in the first two years of the war, his foundation has spent half a billion dollars supporting Ukrainian farmers, providing 70 combines, 84 tractors, planters and drills, and new grain storage facilities to replace what the Russians bombed or confiscated. They also stopped by a Ukrainian Orthodox church in Jones, Oklahoma, a parish first built by immigrants fleeing Russian oppression in the 1920s. I spoke to Father Stepan about what's at stake for his homeland. Is it difficult to explain that here in Oklahoma, where a war in Ukraine seems far away? He says even though it is far away, people in their hearts know that this war is very serious. What happens if Russia wins, if Vladimir Putin wins? He says, I think God will not allow this to happen. I believe even the United States and the European Union won't let this happen. Born into wealth, the son of the legendary billionaire Warren Buffett, Howard Buffett could remain on the sidelines, but doesn't. You could be living a very different life. Why do you do this? My mom and dad gave me this opportunity. I would say it's an obligation, but it doesn't feel like an obligation. I mean, it's something that I love to do. I mean, it, it, it's a real privilege for me to be able to do it. A son of privilege with roots on the American farm and a passion for helping farmers feed the hungry around the world. Andrea is joining us now, fresh off that reporting trip to the Midwest. Just incredible to see some of these scenes from on the ground, Andrea. And the, the devastation in Ukraine, uh, you know, is just so complete. Seven million acres are now lost to farming. 
And that grain used to go to Egypt, used to go to sub-Saharan Africa and all over Europe. Europe has managed to replace the grain. Africa has not. The poorer countries can't keep up. What's also interesting is you heard him say in, in one of the pieces there, he said you could do it for the ethical reasons, the moral reasons, or the selfish reasons, which was kind of, kind of a funny way to think about it and applicable to more than just aid to farmers. No, exactly. One of the selfish reasons is that he believes firmly, as the U.S. does, that Putin will not stop at Ukraine. If Ukraine goes under, he'll move on to other NATO countries who are much more vulnerable. And then we are in the war because we have to be. That's the NATO agreement. You know that better than anyone. So, in, you know, either we keep when our soldiers home mm. and we don't have to fight this war or we stop Putin now, help stop Putin now. And the other point is that most of the money comes back to the U.S., to our arms industries, to our defense industries. So it's helping jobs here in the U.S. If you had to handicap it, Andrea, Ukraine funding, timeline, do we have any idea? Still it's a question now more mark. more complicated because of opposition to Israel's funding, which was part of that package. So who knows? Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much for that great original piece of reporting for thank us tonight. You. It's exclusive to your show. That's so. right. And more to come, of course, tomorrow on your show over on our, the other network, MSNBC. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate it. Coming up, more here on this show, including the surprising reason behind a new surge in syphilis. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Now is raw. How hard is it to see it like this? Our house is no longer here, but we are here. Now is real. Let's break down what we know and then the big questions still outstanding. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the stunning surge in syphilis in this country. A sexually transmitted infection, once nearly eradicated, now back for reasons that might surprise you. Here's Yasmin Vasugian. Right now, syphilis cases are surging in the United States at its highest level since the 1950s. The people of America can eradicate the venereal diseases. Rates of the sexually transmitted infection, once nearly eliminated in this country, skyrocketing for every age group, with experts pointing to a bunch of different reasons for this. This is unfortunately a symptom of not investing in the American public health system and the way that we need it to be invested in. One of them, substance abuse, that's on the rise and goes hand in hand with more risky sexual behavior. And another, maybe surprising surprising one, the advent of PrEP, a highly effective drug for preventing HIV introduced in 2012. It's time to step up 
prep up that hundreds of thousands of men who have sex with men take. A national annual survey shows condoms went from the top contraceptive tool for 75% of men in 2011 to just 47% in 2022. It appears that there is this sort of false confidence that, well, I'm not going to get HIV, therefore I'm no longer going to use condoms. And this comes as we're also seeing a culture shift around sex as younger people. <laughs> Also don't remember the 1980s and 90s and the fear surrounding AIDS and HIV at the height of the AIDS crisis. And with so many health crises, this syphilis epidemic is affecting black and Latino men disproportionately. The latest data from the CDC shows cases up nearly five times as much for black men than white men. Communities of color have always and still are disproportionately affected by almost every disease. The same patterns exist with HIV as well and making things even harder for communities of color. Just 11% of black people are on PrEP, 20% of Latinos compared to 78% of white individuals, all told suggesting prevention and treatment for HIV and syphilis are not reaching black and Latino people as well as for white people. And if left untreated, STIs like syphilis can lead to long term issues, chronic pain, infertility, and can even spread to other parts of the body like your heart and your brain. But with the right antibiotics, syphilis is treatable. But we should note there's a shortage of these medications like penicillin right now, due at least in part to the rising cases of syphilis. And while cases are soaring, funding to fight it is not. Just last year, Congress cut $400 million in funds for disease intervention. There are studies that show for every dollar we put into prevention, we save a lot of money on the healthcare system side. With right now more questions than answers on how the syphilis epidemic will get under control. Yasmin is joining us now. Um, like a lot of health crises, right, this is not just one thing, as you've laid out in your piece. It's like a whole bunch of different things that kind of come together. That can sometimes make a solution harder to tease out. Yeah, I, th I think that's kind of part of the problem, right? It's this confluence of all these issues. You just heard $400 million in cuts, right? Lack of investments. Who is it affecting? Black and brown individuals mostly. That could be one of the reasons in which it's not being invested in. You talk about an increase in substance abuse. We have this use of PrEP, right? So people feel kind of immune to getting other diseases, and they're not necessarily practicing safe sex as much as they should. And then there's the culture, Hal, that I mentioned in my piece, yeah. of sex right now, right? And they're, and they're not necessarily remembering the AIDS um, epidemic. So because of all of this happening at once, it's hard to figure out why it's happening. Yasmin Vesugian, an eye-opening piece there. Thank you very much for bringing that reporting to us. When we come back, the new numbers just into us now on the Men's March Madness final. The Yukon Huskies may be the top dogs in college basketball, but not in all of the sport. We're going to explain in just a sec.
We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. So in just the last 90 minutes or so, we're getting the new ratings that show just how popular women's basketball is in this country right now. Because for the first time ever, for the first time ever, the women's final beat